Talmud, Mas Baba Metzia A C H A P T E R I Mishnah Two persons appearing before a court hold a garment. One of them says I found it, and the other says I found it. One of them says it is all mine, and the other says it is all mine. And the one shall swear that is here, and it is not less than half, and the other shall swear that is here, and it is not less than half. And the value of the garment shall then be divided between them. If one says it is all mine, and the other says half of it is mine, he who says it is all mine shall swear that is here, and it is not less than three quarters. And he who says half of it is mine shall swear that is here, and it is not less than a quarter. The former then receives three quarters of the value of the garment, and the latter receives one quarter if two ride on an animal or one rides, and the other leads it. And one of them says it is all mine, and the other says it is all mine. And the one shall swear that is here, and it is not less than half, and it. Other shall swear that is here and it is not less than half and the value of the animal shall then be divided between them if both admit each other's claims or if they have witnesses to establish their claims they receive their shares without an oath tomorrow what need is there for the Mishnah to give two pleas of the litigants and state one of them says I found it and the other says I found it one of them says it is all mine and the other says it is all mine surely one plea would have been sufficient it is only one plea one says I found it and therefore it is all mine and the other says I found it and therefore it is all mine but why not just state I found it and it will be understood that the intention is to claim the whole garment the term I found it might have been explained as denoting I saw it the mere seeing of the garment entitling him to claim it as his possession therefore the plea it is all mine is added so as to make clear that seeing alone does not Constitute a claim, but how could it be thought that one who has only seen the garment could plead? I found it does not Rabbanay say that the phrase and thou hast found it means thou hast taken hold of it. It is admitted that the scriptural use of the term found implies having taken hold, but the Tana uses popular language in which on seeing something one might use the term found it, the belief being prevalent that one acquires a lost article by sight alone for this reason it was necessary. To add the plea, it is all mine, and thus to indicate that the mere seeing of an ownerless object constitutes no claim to possession, but even so would it not have been sufficient to state it is all mine without the plea of I found it had the mission stated only the plea it is all mine. I might have said that elsewhere in the Talmud the term found is used to mean seen, and the conclusion would have been drawn that mere sight constitutes a claim to possession for this reason the mission. States first I found IT and then IT is all mine so that we may gather from the additional clause that mere sight does not constitute a claim to possession but how could you say that the two pleas are really one is not each plea introduced by the words one of them says and the other says is one of them says I found it and the other says I found it one of them says it is all mine etc. to this our papa or our shy my ashi or as some say cut he replied the first plea applies to a case of finding but the second plea applies to a case of buying and selling and it is necessary to have the two cases Talmud, Mas Baba Metziah for if the Tana had dealt solely with the case of finding I might have said that only in such a case would the rabbis impose an oath because each disputant might permit himself to claim the garment by saying to himself my neighbor loses nothing through my action as it cost him nothing to acquire the garment I shall go and take hold of it and share it with him but in the case of a bought article where this argument does not apply it might be assumed that no oath was to be imposed on the other hand had the tana dealt solely with the case of buying and selling it might be assumed that only in such a case would the rabbis impose an oath because each disputant might permit himself to claim the garment by saying to himself my neighbor has paid the price and I am prepared to pay the price seeing that I need it I shall take it and let my neighbor take the trouble to go and buy another garment but in the case of a found article where this argument does not apply it might be assumed that no oath was to be imposed therefore both cases are necessary but how could such a situation arise in the case of a bought article one could surely ascertain from the seller as to which of the two paid him the money the case is one in which the seller took money from the two purchasers willingly from one and unwillingly from the other and we do not know from whom he took it willingly and from whom unwillingly shall it be said that our Mishnah is not in agreement with the view of Ben Nanyas for does not Ben Nanyas express surprise at the decision of the sages to impose oaths on disputants one of whom is bound to swear falsely the Mishnah may well be in agreement with Ben Nanyas for in the case where Ben Nanyas objects to the oath it is certain that if both parties take the oath one of them will commit perjury but in our Mishnah it may well be assumed that no perjury will be committed even if both parties swear for it is possible that both of them picked up the garment simultaneously again shall it be said that our Mishnah is not in agreement with the view of Simicus for does not Simicus in another case maintain that disputed money of doubtful ownership should be divided among the disputants without an oath but would not the same difficulty arise if we compare the decision of our Mishnah with that of the rabbis who are opposed to Simicus 4 have these rabbis not declared that the claimant must bring evidence to substantiate his claim while in our mission the disputed article is divided on oath what a comparison in the case in which the rabbis apply the principle that the claimant must bring evidence the contending parties had not taken hold of the disputed object but here in our mission since both disputants hold the garment it is rightly divided after both have taken the oath but in regard to Simicus the argument is the other way for if he decided in the case referred to where no party is in possession of the disputed property that the amount should be divided among the litigants without an oath how much more readily would he give this decision in a case like ours where both disputants are equally in possession of the article in question and thus the query remains shall it be said that our mission is not in agreement with Simicus it can still be maintained that the mission is in agreement with Simicus for Simicus expressed his view that the property in dispute should be divided without an oath only in a case where both litigants are uncertain as to the true facts and it would therefore be wrong to make either of them swear but where both parties assert their claims with certainty as in our Mishnah he would take a different view but does not rather the son of Arhuna maintain that Simicus's decision applies also to a case where both parties are certain and definite in their claims it can still be maintained that our Mishnah is in agreement with Simicus for Simicus expressed the view as quoted only in a case where a verdict in favor of one would involve a loss to the other but where no actual monetary loss is involved as in our Mishnah he would take a different view but then again can we not infer by means of a KALWA homer that Simicus would disagree with our Mishnah for if even in the case where the party entitled to the verdict loses money by being awarded only half of the disputed amount Talmud, Mas Baba Metziah and where it could be maintained that the whole amount is due solely to that party Simicus abides by the principle that disputed money of doubtful ownership should be divided without an oath how much more readily would he abide by that principle in a case where as in our Mishnah it can be said that the disputed object belongs to both and that therefore it should be divided between them without an oath it can still be maintained that our Mishnah is in agreement with Simicus for the oath imposed upon disputants in our Mishnah is only rabbinical not biblical this is expressly maintained by our Yohanan for our Yohanan says this oath is an institution of the sages intended to prevent anyone from going out and seizing a neighbor's garment declaring it to be his own shall it be assumed that our Mishnah is not in agreement with our Jose for does not our Jose say if so what loss does the fraudulent claimant incur? Therefore let the whole amount be retained by the court until the coming of Elijah but as a counter question would not the same difficulty arise in regard to the rabbis who are opposed to our Jose foreseeing that these rabbis maintain that the balance should be retained by the court until the coming of Elijah would they not accordingly give the same decision concerning the disputed garment in our case which is like the disputed balance in the other case what a comparison in the other case where it is certain that the disputed balance belongs to one of the claimants only those rabbis rightly decided that the amount in question should be retained till the coming of Elijah whereas here in our mission where it can be assumed that the garment belongs to both the same rabbis would agree that it should be divided among the two claimants when they have taken the oath but in regard to our Jose the argument is the other way if our Jose decided in his case where each claimant is Undoubtedly entitled to 100 zoos that the money should be retained till the coming of Elijah how much more readily would he decide so in our case where it can be assumed that only one of the disputants is entitled to have the garment the mission can still be in agreement with our Jose for in his case one of the disputants is bound to be a fraud whilst in our case no one can say for sure that one of the disputants is a fraud as it is possible that both picked up the garment. Simultaneously if you wish it I could argue thus in his case our
Believe him therefore they both swear and receive payment from the householder are high taught if one says to another you have in your possession a hundred zoos belonging to me and the other replies I have nothing belonging to you while witnesses testify that the defendant has fifty zoos belonging to the plaintiff the defendant pays the plaintiff fifty zoos and takes an oath regarding the remainder for the admission of a defendant ought not to be more effective than the evidence of witnesses a rule which could be proved by KALWA Homer and Artana teaches this when two hold a garment and one of them says I found it etc both have to swear now this is just the same as the case where there are witnesses for when we see a person holding a garment we presume that it is his and we are in the position of witnesses who can testify that each claimant is entitled to the half he is holding and yet each claimant has to swear now why is it necessary to prove by means of KALWA Homer that the admission of a defendant ought not to be more effective in imposing an oath on the defendant than the testimony of witnesses it is necessary for this reason in the case of a partial admission of a claim you might say that the divine law has imposed an oath upon him for the reason indicated by Rabbi for Rabbi said the reason the Torah has declared that he who admits part of his opponent's claim must take an oath is the presumption that nobody would take up such an impertinent attitude towards his creditor as to give a complete denial to his claim the defendant in this case would have liked to give a complete denial but he has not done so because he has not been able to take up such an impertinent attitude Talmud Mas Baba Mitzvah on the other hand it may be assumed that the defendant would have been ready to admit the whole claim and that he has not done so because of a desire to put the claimant off for a time thinking when I shall have money I shall pay him Therefore the divine law imposes an oath upon him so that he may admit the whole claim but as regards the testimony of witnesses where this argument does not apply I should have thought that no oath ought to be imposed therefore it is necessary to prove by KALWA Homer that in this case also an oath is to be imposed and what is the KALWA Homer it is as follows if the words of his own mouth which do not oblige him to pay money make it necessary for him to take an oath how much more ought the evidence of witnesses which obliges him to pay money make it necessary for him to take an oath but is it right to say that the words of his own mouth do not oblige him to pay money in view of the established principle that the admission of a defendant is equal to the testimony of a hundred witnesses what is meant by the payment of money is the payment of a fine and the KALWA Homer is as follows if the words of his own mouth which do not oblige him to pay a fine make it necessary for him to take an oath how much more ought the evidence of witnesses which obliges him to pay a fine make it necessary for him to take an oath but then it could be argued does not a person's own mouth carry more weight than the evidence of witnesses in that it can oblige him to bring an offering while the evidence of witnesses does not oblige him to bring an offering this objection is not valid our high is of the same opinion as our mayor who says that witnesses do make it necessary for the offender to bring an offering and he infers it by means of KALWA Homer for we learned when two persons say to a third person you have eaten forbidden fat unawares but he says I have not eaten any our mayor maintains that he is obliged to bring an offering but the sages declare him free our mayor argues if two witnesses can bring upon an offender such a severe penalty as death should they not be able to bring upon him the light penalty of an offering to this the sages oppose the argument had he desired to prevaricate he could have said I did it deliberately and he would have been free from bringing an offering but the argument continues does not a person's own mouth carry more weight than witnesses in that it can oblige him in a case of confession after denial on oath to bring a guilt offering but it is immediately objected a guilt offering is also an offering and this argument has already been dealt with then put it this way does not a person's own mouth in a case of confession after a denial on oath carry more weight than witnesses in that it can oblige him to pay a fifth this objection is not valid our high is of the same opinion as our mayor who says that just as witnesses oblige the offender to bring an offering because of the KALWA Homer inference they also oblige him on the same ground to bring a fifth but it can still be objected does not a person's own mouth in the case of the admission of a debt carry more weight than the evidence of Witnesses in that it cannot be refuted by a denial or an alibi proof on the part of witnesses while the evidence of witnesses can be refuted by a denial or an alibi proof on the part of other witnesses the KALWA Homer must therefore be derived from one witness if one witness whose evidence does not oblige a defendant to pay money obliges him to take an oath how much more should several witnesses whose evidence does oblige a defendant to pay money oblige him to take an oath but it can be objected the oath that is imposed by the evidence of one witness refers only to the part of the debt to which the witness testifies and which the defendant denies Talmud Mas Baba Mitzia, while the oath that you would impose by the evidence of several witnesses refers to the remainder of the debt not included in the evidence which is denied by the defendant in consequence of this refutation our Papa says the inference is really drawn from an attached oath caused by the evidence of one witness but to this also it could be objected is not the attached oath of one witness more weighty in that in this case one oath carries with it another oath while several witnesses only oblige the defendant to pay money the case of his own mouth will prove it but it is again objected is not his own mouth more weighty in that it cannot be refuted by a denial on the part of witnesses the case of one witness will prove it in that he can be refuted by other witnesses and yet he obliges the defendant to take an oath but it is objected once more the oath imposed by one witness refers only to the part of the debt to which the witness testifies and which the defendant denies while the oath that is imposed by several witnesses refers to the remainder of the debt not included in the evidence and denied by the defendant again the case of his own mouth will prove it but it is again objected is not his own mouth in the case of admission more effective in that it cannot be refuted by denial on the part of witnesses the case of one witness will prove it in that he can be refuted by the denial of other witnesses and yet he obliges the defendant to take an oath but it is objected once more the oath that is imposed by several witnesses refers to the remainder of the debt denied by the defendant and not included in the evidence again the case of his own mouth will prove it and the former argument resumes its force it is true that the aspect of one case is not like the aspect of the other case but both cases have the common characteristic that they arise through claim and denial and therefore the defendant has to swear so I just that also in the case of witnesses arising as it does through claim and denial the defendant has to swear but it is again argued have not the other analogous cases the common characteristic that the defendant is not presumed to be a liar while in the case of witnesses he is presumed to be a liar the objection However is at once raised is the defendant really presumed to be a liar when contradicted by witnesses has not R.E.D.B. Aben said that R.S. Da said he who denies alone can still be accepted as a witness but he who denies a deposit cannot be accepted as a witness therefore argue this way have not the other cases the common characteristic that they are not subject to the law of retaliation in case of an alibi while several witnesses are subject to the law of retaliation in case of an alibi. This presents no difficulty R.I. attaches no importance to the argument from the law of retaliation in case of an alibi there is however another difficulty how could it be said that Artana teaches the same as R.I. are the two cases at all alike there is in the case of R.I. the creditor has witnesses for half the amount claimed but the debtor has no witnesses regarding the other half that he does not owe him if or if the debtor had witnesses that he did not owe him. Anything of the other half claimed our high would not require the debtor to swear regarding the other half but here in our mission we are witnesses for the one party as much as for the other in regard to the right of either to one half of the garment and yet both have to swear it must therefore be assumed that the statement and Artana teaches the same refers to another decision of our high for our high says if one says to another you have in your possession a hundred zoos belonging to me and the other says I have only got fifty and here there he has to swear concerning the disputed amount for what reason because the offer implied in the words here there is like a partial admission which necessitates an oath and Artana teaches the same to hold a garment etc and although here each one holds a garment and we are witnesses that the part that each one holds is like the part of the debt which the defendant in the other case is ready to deliver yet it says that he must swear our she's hate however says that the offer implied in the words here there relieves the debtor of the oath for what reason because the declaration here they are made by the debtor enables us to regard those 50 zoos which he has admitted to be owing as if they were already in the hands of the creditor while the remaining 50 zoos the debtor does not admit to be owing and therefore there is no partial admission that necessitates an oath but according to our she's hate there is a difficulty about our mission our she's hate may reply the oath in our mission is an
Not involve an oath, no, I could quite well maintain that when he says two, he also has to take an oath, and the reason why three is stated is to express disagreement with our Akiba who maintains that the debtor who says three is like a restorer of lost property and free from taking an oath. We are thus informed that he is like one who admits part of the claim and that he has to take an oath, but if this is so and two also involves an oath, should not our Simeon be Eliezer who says seeing that he has admitted part of the claim he must take an oath have said instead he also must swear therefore it must be assumed that two is free and here there involves an oath but our present case is different because the written document supports him or because the written document has the effect of pledging the debtor's landed property to the creditor and no oath is taken in a dispute connected with mortgage land some construe the objection from the latter clause our Akiba says he is only like the restorer of lost property and he is free from taking an oath now the reason is presumably that he said three but if he had said two he would have had to swear and seeing that the admission of two for which the note is sufficient evidence is like the offer here there it follows that here there necessitates an oath no I could quite well maintain that when he says two he is also free from taking an oath and the reason why three is stated is to express disagreement with R. Simeon B. Eliezer who says that the debtor is like one who admits part of the claim and he has to take an oath we are thus informed that he is like the restorer of lost property and he is free from taking an oath and indeed this stands to reason for if we were to assume that two necessitates an oath how could our Akiba dispense with the oath in the case of three this debtor could surely employ a reason that he might think if I say two I shall have to swear I will say three so that I shall be like a restorer of a loss and I shall be free therefore we must conclude that if he says two he is also free but does not a difficulty arise as regards our high there it is different for the written document supports him or because the written document has the effect of pledging the debtor's landed property and no oath is taken in a dispute connected with mortgage land marzitra the son of Arnam and then ask we learned if one claims vessels and land and the claim in regard to the Vessels is admitted but the claim in regard to the land is disputed or the claim in regard to the land is admitted but the claim in regard to the vessels is disputed the debtor is free from taking an oath in regard to the disputed claim if he admits part of the claim in regard to the land he is free from taking an oath if he admits part of the claim in regard to the vessels he is obliged to take an oath now the reason why he is free when the claim concerns both land and vessels is presumably that an oath does not apply to land but where the claim concerns two sets of vessels in the same way as the claim regarding the land and the vessels he is obliged to take an oath how is this to be understood is it not that the debtor said to the creditor here they are so it follows that here they are necessitates an oath no I can quite well maintain that when two sets of vessels are claimed he is also free from taking an oath but the reason why vessels and land are mentioned is to let us know that when the debtor admits part of the claim in regard to the vessels he is obliged to take an oath even as regards the land what new information does he proffer us the law of extension of obligation we have learned this already chattels which do not offer security are attached to chattels which offer security in regard to the imposition of an oath upon the debtor the mission quoted here is the principal place for this law there it is only mentioned incidentally talmud mas baba Mitzia, now according to him who says that here there does not require an oath why is it necessary to derive from a scriptural verse the exemption of land from the law of oath since all land available to the creditor is as if the debtor said here there he can answer you the derivation from the scriptural verse is necessary where the debtor has dug pits ditches and caves thereby destroying the value of the land or where one claims vessels and land and the claim in regard to the vessels is admitted while the claim in regard to the land is disputed. Come and hear Rami Bihama teaches four kinds of bailees required to put forward a partial denial and a partial admission in order to be liable to an oath. The gratuitous bailee, the borrower, the paid bailee, and the hired. How is it to be understood? Is it not that the bailee says to the claimant here it is no? It refers to a case where the owner says to the bailee, I handed you over three cows and they have all died through your negligence. While the bailee says to the owner, One I never received, one died through an accident, and one has died through my negligence for which I am willing to pay you so that it is not like an offer to return the animal by saying here it is come and hear what the father of our Apata Riki taught as a refutation of the first law of our high. If one says to another, You have a hundred zoos in your possession belonging to me, and the other says, I have nothing. Belonging to you and witnesses testify that the defendant owes the plaintiff fifty zoos. I might think that the defendant ought to swear regarding the rest. Therefore, the scriptural text tells us for any matter of lost thing whereof he said that it is this indicating thereby that you impose an oath on him in consequence of his own admission, but you do not impose an oath on him in consequence of the evidence of witnesses. Do you wish to refute our high by citing a beritha that contradicts his view? Our high is a tana and he may disagree with it, but the beritha quotes a scriptural text. The text refers to one who admits part of the claim and the father of our apotariki. He will answer you. The text says it, and it also says this one term is meant to apply to him who admits part of the claim, and the other is meant to indicate that in the case of witnesses giving evidence regarding part of the disputed claim, the defendant is free from taking an oath and it. Other he applies one term to him who admits part of the claim and the other he utilizes for the purpose of proving that the admission of part of the claim involves an oath only if the admission refers to the same kind of object as is claimed by the plaintiff and the other he does not share the view that the admission has to refer to the same kind of object for he is of the opinion of Rabban Gamaliel as we have learned if the plaintiff claims we and the defendant admits barley the defendant is free from taking an oath but Rabban Gamaliel obliges the defendant to take an oath there was a shepherd to whom people entrusted cattle every day in the presence of witnesses one day they handed it over to him without witnesses subsequently he gave a complete denial of the receipt of the cattle but witnesses came and testified that he had eaten two of the cattle said Arzara if the first law of Arhai is valid the shepherd ought to swear regarding the remainder of a However, answered him if the law were valid, would the shepherd be allowed to swear? Is he not a robber? Our zero replied, I mean, his opponent should swear, but even if our high's law is rejected, should we not impose an oath upon the claimant because of the view of our nomin? As we have learned, if one says to another, You have in your possession a hundred zoos belonging to me, and the other says, I have nothing belonging to you, he is free from taking an oath, but our nomin adds, We make him take an oath of inducement. Our nomin's rule is only a rabbinical provision made irrespective of the law Talmud, Mas Baba Mitzia B, and we do not add one provision to another provision, but why not consider the fact simply that he is a shepherd? And Rab Judah says that a shepherd, generally speaking, is unfit to take an oath. This presents no difficulty that case referred to by Rab Judah is one of a shepherd who feeds his own flock and is therefore tempted to let them trespass, but this case. Regarding which Abbe asks his question is one of a hired shepherd who keeps other people's flocks and has no occasion to trespass for if this were not so how could we entrust cattle to any shepherd is it not written thou shalt not put a stumbling block before the blind but the presumption is that a man will not commit a sin unless he stands to profit by it himself he shall then swear that his share in it is not less than half etc does he swear regarding the part which is his or regarding the part which is not his or who not answers he has to say I swear that I have a share in it and that it is not less than half but let him say I swear that it is all mine do we give him all of it then let him say I swear that half of it is mine he would impair his own words but does he not now also impair his own words no he says it is all mine and he adheres to his claim but he adds according to you who do not accept my contention I swear that I have a share in it and that it is not Less than half, but it is again asked since each one stands before the court holding the garment. What need is there for this oath? Are Yohanan answered this oath is an institution of the sages intended to prevent people from going out and seizing their fellow's garment, declaring it to be their own. But should we not say that since he is suspected of fraud in money matters, he ought also to be suspected of swearing falsely? We do not say that one who is suspected of fraud in money matters must also be suspected of swearing falsely. For if you do not concede this, how could the divine law lay it down that one who admits part of a claim shall swear regarding the rest? We ought to say that since he is suspected of fraud in money matters, he must also be suspected of swearing falsely. There he just tries to put the claimant off for a time. According to the view of Rabbi, you may infer this from what our EDB Avin says in the name of our Hista, he who denies alone can still be accepted as a witness but he who denies a deposit cannot be accepted as
Not covet is understood by people to apply only to that for which one is not prepared to pay Talmud, Mas Bagamatia Talmud, Mas Bagamatia. But then in the case in which our Naman said we make him take an oath of inducement, why do we not say that since he is suspected of fraud in money matters, he must also be suspected of swearing falsely? Moreover, there is the case where our Hayat taught both of them swear and receive payment from the employer. Why do we not say that since he is suspected of fraud in money matters, he must also be suspected of swearing falsely? And furthermore, there is the case where our Shis hate said we make him take three oaths. I swear that I did not cause the loss willfully. I swear that I did not use the animal for myself. I swear that it is not in my possession. Why do we not say that since he is suspected of fraud in money matters, he must also be suspected of swearing falsely? Therefore, we must conclude that we do not say since he is suspected of fraud in. Money matters he must also be suspected of swearing falsely. Abbe says we apprehend that he may be claiming the repayment of an old loan, but if so, let him take it without an oath. Therefore, say that we apprehend that he may be claiming the payment of a doubtful claim of an old loan, but do we not say that if he appropriates money on the strength of a doubtful claim, he will also swear falsely in regard to a doubtful claim? Arshis hate the son of Aridi said in reply, people will desist from taking an oath in regard to a doubtful claim, while they will not desist from appropriating money, their right to which is doubtful. For what reason money can be given back later? An oath cannot be taken back. Arzera asked if one of the litigants sees the garment in our presence, what is the law? But it is immediately objected. How could such a situation arise if the other litigant remained silent? He really admitted his opponent's claim, and if he protested, what more could he do? Arzera has in. Mind a case where the aggrieved litigant was silent at first but protested later and the question is do we say that since he was silent at first he really admitted his opponent's claim or do we perhaps say that as he protests now it has become apparent that the reason why he was silent at first is that he thought it unnecessary to protest because the rabbis of the court saw what happened our and answered come and here a very the ruling of our mission refers only to a case where both litigants hold the garment but if the garment is produced in court by one of them only then we apply the principle that the claimant must bring evidence to substantiate his claim now let us consider how could the case of one litigant producing the garment arise if we say that it was just as stated then it is self-evident it must therefore be that one of them sees the garment in our presence no here we deal with a case where both of them came before us holding the garment and we said to them go and divide it they went out and when they came back one of them was holding it one said he really admitted my claim and the other said I let him have it on condition that he pays me for it now we say to him hitherto you implied that he was a robber and now you dispose of the garment to him without witnesses if you prefer I could also say that the very that deals with the case where as stated one of them was holding it and the other was just hanging on to it. In such a case it is necessary to inform us that even Simicus who maintains that disputed money of doubtful ownership should be divided among the disputants without an oath would agree from mere hanging on to a disputed article counts for nothing if you deem it right to say that in the case of one litigant seizing it in our presence we take it away from him it is clear that if he dedicates it to the temple the dedication does not take effect but if you will say that in the case of one litigant seizing it in our presence, we do not take it away from him. What would be the law if he dedicated it without seizing it? Seeing that a master says elsewhere, dedication to the most high by word of mouth is like delivery in a secular transaction. Do we say that the dedication of the garment is like seizing it, or do we say after all he has not seized it and it is written, and if a man shall sanctify his house to be holy, etc., from which we might conclude that just as his house is in his possession, so must everything that he may wish to dedicate be in his possession, which would exclude this case of the garment which he has not seized and is not in his possession. Come and hear the following: There was Talmud, Mas Bagamati, a B.A. bathhouse about which two people had a dispute. One said it is mine, and the other said it is mine, and one of them rose up and dedicated it to the temple. In consequence of which, our Hananiah and our Ashiah and the rest of the rabbis kept. Away from it, Arashai then said to Rabbi, When you go to Kafri to see Arhista, ask him for his opinion on this matter. When Rabbi came to Surah on his way to Kafri, Arham Nana said to him, This is made clear in the Mishnah as regards doubtful firstborn, whether a human firstborn or an animal firstborn, and as regards the latter, whether a clean or unclean animals, the principle holds good that the claimant must bring evidence to substantiate his claim, and in regard to this, a very teaches such animals must not be shorn nor work. Now it is obviously assumed here that if a priest seizes the firstling, we do not take it away from him, for it is laid down that we must apply the principle that the claimant must bring evidence to substantiate his claim, and thus if the priest has not seized it, the very the teaches that it must not be shorn or work, but Rabbi answered him, You speak of the sanctity of a firstling, this proves nothing I could well maintain that even. If the priest has seized it, we take it away from him, and still it would be forbidden to shear or to work this animal because the sanctity that comes of itself is different. Our Hananiah said to Rabbi, There is a very the thought supporting your view. The sheep with which the doubtful firstlings of asses have been redeemed enter the stall to be tithed. Now, if the view were held that when the priest has seized a doubtful firstling, we do not take it away from him, why does the very the teach? That sheep with which doubtful firstlings of asses have been redeemed enter the stall to be tithed, would not the result be that this Israelite who owns the stall would relieve himself of his liability involved in the tithe with the property of the priest who has a claim on it? Abbe answered him, There is really nothing in that very to support the master Rabbi, for it deals with a case where the Israelite has only nine sheep, and this makes the tent so that in any case the Israelite is justified if he is obliged to tithe the sheep he has tithed them rightly but if he is not obliged to tithe them because the tenth sheep is not really his then he has had no advantage as he only owned nine sheep and nine are not subject to tithe later Abbe said my objection is really groundless for in a case where the liability of an animal to be tithed is in doubt tithing does not take place as we have learned if one of the sheep which were being counted for the purpose of tithing jumped back into the stall the whole flock is free from tithing now if the viewer held that doubtful cases are subject to tithe the owner ought to tithe the remaining sheep in any case if he is obliged to tithe them he will have tithed them rightly but if he is not obliged to tithe them those already counted will be free because they were properly numbered for Rabbi said proper numbering frees the sheep from being tithed Talmud, Mas Bagamatia, you must therefore Conclude that the decision of the mission is prompted by another consideration is that the divine law states the tenth which means the certain tenth but not the doubtful tenth the same consideration applies here the divine law states the certain tenth but not the doubtful tenth Arahav Difti said to Rabbin what kind of doubtful cases does the above very refer to if it refers to doubtful firstlings the divine law says the tenth shall be holy excluding the animal which is already holy it must therefore refer to the lamb which has been used for the redemption of the doubtful firstling of an ass and in accordance with the view of Arnaman for Arnaman said in the name of Rabbi Abu if an Israelite has ten doubtful firstlings of asses in his house he sets apart ten lambs as substitutes for them and he tithes these lambs and they belong to him what was the ultimate decision concerning the bathhouse come and hear what Arhav Abin said a similar case came before Arhista and Arhista brought it before Arhuna and he gave his decision on the ground of what Arnaman said property that cannot be reclaimed by legal proceedings cannot be dedicated to the temple and if it has been dedicated the dedication is invalid but it is asked would the dedication be valid if the property could be reclaimed by legal proceedings even though the rightful owner has not obtained possession of it does not Aryohanan say that property which has been acquired by robbery and which the rightful owners have not given up as lost cannot be dedicated either by the robbers or by the owners the former cannot do it because it is not theirs and the latter because it is not in their possession you evidently think that the case under discussion is of a bath that is movable no the discussion concerns a bathhouse which is a movable property and therefore where it can be reclaimed by legal proceedings it is regarded as being in the possession of the claimant. Our Talafa the Palestinian recited in the presence of Arabab two people cling to a garment the decision is that one takes as much of it as his grass reaches and the other takes as much of it as his grass reaches and the rest is divided equally between them Arabab pointed heavenward and said but with an oath but if so our mission which teaches that the value of the garment shall be divided between the two litigants and which does not teach that each
A bill the lender saying it is mine I dropped it and found it again and the borrower saying true it was yours but I paid you the validity of the bill has to be established by its signatories verifying their signatures this is the view of Rabbi Rabin Simeon B. Gamaliel says they shall divide the amount if it, the bill fell into the hand of a judge it must never be produced again R. Jose says it retains its validity the master said above the validity of the bill has to be established by its signatories does he mean that the creditor may demand payment of the whole amount and does he disapprove of the mission to hold a garment etc. Robert replied in the name of our nominee if the document has been endorsed in court all are agreed that the litigants divide the amount between them the difference of opinion only arises in the case of an unendorsed document Rabbi is of the opinion that even when one IE debtor acknowledges the writing of a bill it still requires endorsement at court and if it is endorsed the amount is divided but if it is not endorsed the amount is not divided for what reason it is merely Potsherd who renders the document valid only the borrower but he says it is paid Rabin Simeon B. Gamaliel however is of the opinion that when one acknowledges the writing of a bill it does not require endorsement at court and therefore even if it is not endorsed the litigants divide the amount if it, the bill fell into the hands of a Judge, it must never be produced again. Talmud, Mas Baba Metzia B.Y. is it different if the bill fell into the hands of a judge? Rabbi says the meaning of the clause is this if a third person finds a bill which has already been in the hands of a judge, that is when it bears a legal endorsement, it must never be produced again. And thus we learn that a found bill must not be returned to the claimant not only when it bears no legal endorsement so that it can be assumed that it was written for the purpose of securing a loan, but the loan did not take place. But even when it bears a legal endorsement as when it has been verified in court, because we apprehend that payment may have been made, but our Jose says it retains its validity, and we do not apprehend that payment may have been made, but does not our Jose really apprehend that payment may have been made? Has it not been taught in a very in the case of a marriage contract found in the street if the husband admits that he has not? Paid her the amount specified in the contract it shall be returned to the wife but if the husband does not admit it it must not be returned either to him or to her our Jose says that if the wife is still with the husband it shall be returned to her but if she has become a widow or has been divorced it must not be returned either to him or to her reverse the very and read it this way if a bill fell into the hands of a judge it must never be produced again this is the view of our Jose and the sages say that it retains its validity but if so the two opinions of the rabbis contradict each other the very which deals with the lost marriage contract conveys in its entirety the view of our Jose but a clause is omitted and the very should read thus if the husband does not admit that he has not paid the wife the amount specified in the contract it must not be returned either to him or to her this however only applies to the case of a widow or a divorced woman but in the case of a wife who is still with her husband it shall be returned to the wife this is a view of our Jose for our Jose says if the wife is still with the husband it shall be returned to her but if she has become a widow or has been divorced it must not be returned either to him or to her our papa says there is really no need to reverse the very our Jose only states the case in accordance with the views of the rabbis and he says to them according to me we do not apprehend that payment may have been made even in the case of a widow or a divorced woman but according to you admit at least that when the wife is still with the husband the marriage contract should be returned to her as she is not entitled to receive payment as long as she is his wife but the rabbis answered him say he handed her over bundles of valuables and security and she has retained them Rabbi says by all means reverse the first period and the reason why the rabbis decide here that if it Husband does not admit liability the marriage contract must not be returned either to him or to her is that we apprehend lest the wife had two marriage contracts and as to our Jose he does not apprehend lest the wife had two marriage contracts our Eliezer says the division takes place when both claimants cling either to the form of the bill or to the operated part thereof but if one claimant clings to the form and the other clings to the operated part one takes the form and it other takes the operated part and our Yohanan says they always divide equally what even if one clings to the form and the other to the operated part was it not taught each one takes as much as his hand grasps yes but it is necessary to have our Yohanan's decision in a case where the operated part is contained in the middle of the document but if so what need is there to state it, it is necessary to state it that it may be applied to a case where the operated part is nearer to one of the claimants you might assume that one could say to the other divide it this way therefore we are informed that the other may say to him what makes you think of dividing it this way divide it the other way Araha of Dipti said to Rubin according to our Eliezer who says one takes the form of the bill and the other takes the operated part of what use are the parts to either of them does one need them to use as a stopper for one's bottle he Rubin answered him it is the estimated value thereof that has to be considered we estimate how much a dated document is worth as compared with one undated with a dated document the debt may be collected from mortgage property but with the other document no debt can be collected from mortgage property and one gives the other the difference in the value of the two documents also the decision previously given in the words they shall divide as quoted refers to the value of the bill for if you do not assume this how explain to hold a garment etc. would you say that here also they divide the garment in half they would surely render it useless this presence no difficulty Talmud, Mas Baba Metzia as it would still be suitable for children but what of the case of Rabba who said that even if the garment was embroidered with gold it should be divided could they here also divide the garment in half they would surely render it useless this presence no difficulty either as it would still be suitable for royal children but there is a clause in our mission if to ride on an animal etc. would you say that here also they divide the animal in half they would surely render it useless although it may be granted that in the case of a clean animal its carcass may be cut up and used for food what if it is an unclean animal they would surely render it useless by slaying it and cutting it up it must therefore be said that it is the value of the animal that is divided so here also it is the value of the bill that is divided Rami Bihama said this decision of our mission enables us to conclude that when one picks up a found object for his neighbor the neighbor acquires it for if he were to say that the neighbor does not acquire it this garment ought to be regarded as if one half of it were still lying on the ground and also as if the other half were still lying on the ground so that neither the one claimant nor the other should acquire it it must therefore follow that when one picks up a found object for his neighbor the neighbor acquires it said Rabbi I could still maintain that when one picks up a found object for his neighbor the neighbor does not acquire it but here in our mission the reason why he does acquire it is that we say since he takes possession for himself he may also take possession for his neighbor you may learn it from the law that if one said to a messenger go and steal something for me and he went and stole it he is Free but if partners stole for each other they are guilty for what reason is it not because we say since he takes possession for himself he may also take possession for his neighbor this proves it said Rabbi now that it has been proved that we base our decisions on the sense argument it must be assumed that when a deaf mute and a normal person have picked up a found object the normal person acquires it by reason of the fact that the deaf mute has acquired it but it is at once objected we may grant that the deaf mute acquires it because a rational person has lifted it up for him but how does the normal person acquire it I must therefore say the deaf mute acquires it the normal person does not acquire it and how does the sense argument come in here since two other deaf mute persons would acquire a found object by lifting it up this deaf mute also acquires it but how is this even if you say that when one lifts up a found object for his neighbor the neighbor acquires it this is true only when one lifts it up on behalf of his neighbor but in this case the normal person lifted it up on his own behalf now if he himself does not acquire it how can he enable others to acquire it but say seeing that the normal person does not acquire it the deaf mute does not acquire it either and if you will argue in what way does this case differ from that of the two other deaf mute persons previously referred to I will answer you there are rabbis made this provision in order that the deaf mutes may not have to quarrel with persons who may be ready to snatch the object from them but here the deaf mute will say to himself the normal person does not acquire it how should I acquire it or aha the son of our Ada said to our Ashi once does Rami Biham derive his conclusion if we say that he derives it from the first clause of our mission to hold a garment etc the objection would arise that there one pleads to the effect it is all mine and I lifted up the whole of it and the other pleads to the same effect it is all mine and I lifted up the whole of it therefore we must say that he derives it from the clause which reads one of them says it is all mine and the other says it is all mine what need is there again for this it must therefore be that we are to
I will say thus so that I shall be like a restorer of a lost object and I shall be free from taking an oath therefore we must say that he derives it from this clause if to ride on an animal etc. What need is there again for this it must therefore be that we are to learn from the additional clause that if one lifts up a found object for his neighbor the neighbor acquires it but perhaps this clause is to let us know that a rider also acquires found property therefore we must say that he derives it from the last clause if both admit each other's claims or if they have witnesses to establish their claims they receive their shares without an oath to which case does it refer if it refers to a case of buying and selling is it necessary to state it it must therefore refer to a case of finding and this proves that if one lifts up a found object for his neighbor the neighbor acquires it and Rabbi he will explain the decision in the last clause of our mission by the principle adopted by him since he takes possession of it for himself he may take possession of it also for his neighbor if you ride etc our joseph said rab judah told me talmud mas baba mitzia b i heard two laws from mar samuel if one rides on an animal and another leads it one of them acquires the animal and the other does not acquire it but i do not know to which of the two either decision was meant to apply but how is this to be understood if it refers to two cases in one of which there was a man riding on an animal by himself and in the other there was a man leading an animal by himself is there anyone who would say that he who leads an animal by himself does not acquire it if therefore it is to be said that one does not acquire the animal it can only be said of the one that rides on it thus it must be assumed that the doubt expressed by rab judah concerns a case where one rides on an animal and simultaneously someone else leads it the question then is the rider to be given preference because he holds it or is perhaps the leader to be given preference because it moves through his action our joseph then said rab judah said to me let us look into the matter ourselves for we learned he who leads a team composed of an oxen and ass receives 40 lashes and likewise he who sits in the wagon drawn by such a team receives 40 lashes our mayor declares him who sits in the wagon free and since samuel reverses the mission and reads and the sages declare him who sits in the wagon free it follows that according to samuel he who rides on an animal by himself does not acquire it and this would apply with even greater force to one who rides on an animal while someone else leads it said abay to our joseph have you not told us many times the argument headed by the words let us look into the matter and yet you never told us it in the name of rab judah our joseph answered him truly it is rab judah's argument i even Remember saying to him how can you sir derive the decision regarding the case of one who rides on an animal from the case of one who sits in the wagon seeing that he who sits in the wagon does not hold the reins while he who rides on the animal does hold the reins and he answered me both Rab and Samuel agree that one does not acquire an animal by holding the reins some give another version of a said to our Joseph how do you sir derive the law regarding one who rides on an animal from that concerning one who sits in a wagon pulled by an animal seeing that he who sits in the wagon does not hold the reins while he who rides does hold the reins our Joseph answered him thus he learned one does not acquire an animal by holding its reins it has also been reported our Helbo said in the name of our one who buys an animal may acquire it by taking over the reins from the neighbor who sells it but one who finds an animal and one who seizes an animal which was the property of a proselyte who died without ears does not acquire it in this way. What is the derivation of the term Moserai used for reins? Rabbi said he explained it to me. It is derived from Masar to hand over and it indicates the handing over of the reins by one person to another. Such action rightly enables a person who buys an animal from his neighbor to acquire it as the neighbor transfers to him in this way the possession of the animal but in the case of a found animal. And in that of an animal that was the property of a proselyte who died without ears who transferred it to him that he should have a right to acquire it an objection was raised if to ride on an animal etc. Whose opinion is that if I should say that it is our mayors the question presents itself if the sitter acquires it need I be told that the rider acquires it it must therefore be said that it is the opinion of the majority of the rabbis which would prove that the rider acquires it. Here we deal with one who drives the animal with his feet but if so then it is the same as leading there are two ways of leading you might say that the rider has a preference because he drives it and holds it at the same time therefore we are informed that leading is the same as riding come and here if two persons were pulling a camel or leading an ass or if one was pulling and one was leading Talmud, Mas Baba Metzia, they acquired it by this method our Judah says one never acquires a camel except by pulling it and one never acquires an ass except by leading it in any case it is taught here or if one was pulling and the other was leading from which we may infer that pulling and leading are legitimate methods of acquiring an animal but not riding the same law applies also to riding but the reason why pulling and leading is given here is that it was desired to exclude the view of our Judah who says one never acquires a camel except by pulling it and one never Acquires an ass except by leading it. We are thus informed that even if the methods are reversed, they the animals are also legitimately acquired. But if so, let the Tana combine them and teach if two persons were pulling and leading either a camel or an ass. There is one side which prevents the combination as one of the two actions mentioned is invalid in the case of one of the animals. Some say it is the act of pulling in the case of an ass, and others say it is the act of leading in the case of a camel. There are some who construe the objection to the validity of riding as a means of acquiring an animal from the conclusion of the quoted passage. They acquire it by this method. What are the words by this method intended to exclude? Are they not intended to exclude riding? No, they are intended to exclude the reverse methods. But if so, this view is identical with that of Arjuna. There is a difference between them insofar as according to the first. Tana, there is only one side which is invalid. Some say it is the act of pulling in the case of an ass, and others say it is the act of leading in the case of a camel. Come and here, if one rides on an ass and another holds the reins, one acquires the ass and the other acquires the reins. This proves that one acquires an animal by means of riding. Here also it is understood that the rider drives it with his feet, but if so, let the rider also acquire the reins. Say one acquires the ass and half of the reins, and the other acquires half of the reins. But it is argued the rider rightly acquires his part, seeing that a rational person lifted up for him the other end of the reins from the ground. But he who holds the reins, how does he acquire his part? Say one acquires the ass and nearly all of the reins, and the other acquires what he holds in his hand. But how is this? Even if you say that if a man lifts up a found object for his neighbor, the neighbor acquires it. He could only. Apply to a case where he lifted it up on behalf of his neighbor, but this one lifted up one end of the reins on his own behalf. If he himself does not acquire it by this action, how is he to enable others to acquire it? Said Arashi, the one acquires the ass with the halter, and the other acquires what he holds in his hand, but the rest of the reins neither of them acquires. Arabab said, In reality, we may leave it as taught at first, and the reason is that he who holds the reins can pull them violently and bring the other end also to himself. But Arabab's view is a mistake, for if you do not say so, how would you decide in a case where one half of the garment lies on the ground and the other half rests upon a pillar, and one person comes and lifts up the half from the ground, while another person comes and lifts up the half from the pillar? Will you maintain here also that the first one acquires it, but the last one does not acquire it for the reason that the first one can? Pull it violently and bring the other half also to himself. We must therefore say that the view of Arabah is a mistake. Come and here, Arabah says one who rides on a found animal in the country or one who leads a found animal in the city acquires it. Here also the rider drives the animal with his feet. But if so, it is the same as leading. There are two ways of leading. But if so, why does not he who rides on an animal in the city acquire it? Arkahana said it is because people are not in the habit of riding in a city. Arashi then said to Arkahana, according to this, he who picks up a purse on a Sabbath should not acquire it either, seeing that people are not in the habit of picking up a purse on a Sabbath. But in fact, he does acquire the purse because we say what he has done is done. So here also we ought to say what he has done is done, and he acquires the animal by riding on it in the city. It must therefore be that we deal here with the case of buying and selling. Where he says to him acquire it in the way people usually acquire a bought article Talmud, Mas Baba Metzia B so that if the buyer rides on the animal in the open street he acquires it or if he is an important person he acquires it or if the buyer is a woman she acquires it or if the buyer is a mean person he acquires it or Eliezer inquired if one says to another pull this animal along so that you may acquire the vessels that are placed upon it what is the law but it is at once. Objected by saying so that you may acquire does he
Writing on an animal sees a lost article and says to his neighbor give it to me the latter takes it up and says I acquired it for myself then it is his but if after giving it to him that person says I acquired it first there is nothing in what he says tomorrow we have learned elsewhere if one gleaned the corner of a field and said this is for that poor person our Eliezer says he conferred possession of the gleaning on that person but the sages say he must give it to the first poor person. That comes along Ola said in the name of our Joshua Bili by the difference of opinion between our Eliezer and the sages concerns a case where a rich person gleaned for a poor person our Eliezer is of the opinion that I since if he had wished he could have declared his possessions public property so that he would have become a poor man himself and would have been entitled to the gleanings of the corner he is entitled to them even now and too since he might thus take possession of them for himself he could also confer possession of them upon his neighbor but the sages are of the opinion that we can use the since argument once but not twice but in a case where a poor person gleaned for another poor person all are of the opinion that he could confer possession of the gleanings upon that person for since he could take possession of them for himself he could also confer possession of them upon his neighbor Arnaman said to Allah and why not say master? That the difference of opinion between our Eliezer and the rabbis concerns even a case where a poor person gleaned for a poor person seeing that in regard to a found object all are in the same legal position as the poor are in regard to the corner of the field and we learned if one riding on an animal sees a lost article and says to his neighbor give it to me the latter takes it up and says I acquired it for myself then it is his now it is all correct if you say that the Difference of opinion between our Eliezer and the rabbis concerns even a case where a poor person gleaned for a poor person for Talmud, Mas Baba Metzia our Mishnah would then be in accord with the rabbis but if you say that the difference of opinion concerns a case where a rich person gleaned for a poor person but that all agree in the case of a poor person gleaning for a poor person that one transfers possession upon the other with whose view is our Mishnah in accord it agrees. Neither with the view of the rabbis nor with that of our Eliezer he will answer him our Mishnah speaks of a case where the person who picked up the article said I took possession of it first this also stands to reason since the second clause teaches if after giving it to him that person says I acquired it first there is nothing in what he says what need is there to state first in the second clause surely even if he did not say first it would be assumed that he meant first it must. Therefore be concluded that it was intended to let us know that in the first clause also he stated first and the other the wording of the second clause is intended to throw light on the first in the second case he said first but in the first case he did not say first both our nomin and our histah say if a man lifts up a found object for his neighbor the neighbor does not acquire it for what reason because it is like one who seizes a debtor's property on behalf of a creditor thereby causing loss to the debtor's other creditors and one who seizes a debtor's property in behalf of a creditor causing loss thereby to the debtor's other creditors does not acquire the property Rabba asked our nomin a very that teaches a laborer's fine belongs to himself this decision only applies to a case where the employer said to the laborer weed for me today or hoe for me today but if he said to him do work for me today the laborer's fine belongs to the employer he our nomin answered him a laborer is different as his hand is like the hand of his employer but does not rap say the laborer may retract even in the middle of the day he or Naman answered him again yes but as long as he does not retract and he continues in the employment he is like the hand of the employer when he does retract he can withdraw from the employment for another reason for it is written for unto me the children of Israel are servants they are my servants but not servants to servants are high. Be Abba said in the name of our Yohanan if one lifts up a found object for his neighbor the neighbor acquires it and if you will say our mission differs it is because our mission deals with the case in which he said give me it and did not say acquire it for me mission if one sees an owner less object and falls upon it and another person comes and seizes it he who has seized it is entitled to its possession tomorrow Resh said in the name of Abaco and Bartolo a man's four cubits acquire property for him everywhere for what reason the rabbis instituted this law in order that people might not be led to quarreling Abbe said our high be Joseph raised an objection from the tractate of P.E. Rabbi said our Jacob B.E. raised an objection from the tractate of Nezekin Abbe said our high be Joseph raised an objection from the tractate of P.E. if he a poor man takes part of the gleanings of the corner of a field and throws it over the rest of the gleanings he cannot claim anything if he falls upon it or if he spreads his garment upon it he may be removed from it and the same law applies to a forgotten chief now if you say that a man's four cubits acquire property for him everywhere let the four cubits of the poor man acquire for him the gleanings on which he fell here we deal with the case where the man did not say I wish to acquire it but if the rabbis instituted this law what does it matter if he did not say I wish to acquire it since he fell Upon it he made it clear that he wished to acquire it by falling upon it but did not wish to acquire it by means of his four cubits Talmud, Mas Baba Metzia B. Our Papa said the rabbis instituted the law of the four cubits only in a public place but the rabbis did not institute such a law in a private person's field and although the divine law gave the poor person a right therein it gave him the right to walk in it and glean its corners but the divine law did not give him the right to regard it as his ground Rabbi said our Jacob B. E. raised an objection from the tractate of Nezikin if one sees an ownerless object and falls upon it and another person comes and seizes it he who sees it is entitled to its possession now if you will say that the four cubits of a person acquire for him an ownerless object everywhere let his four cubits acquire it for him in this case also here we deal with the case where he did not say I wish to acquire it but if the rabbis instituted the right of the four cubits what does it matter if he did not say it as he fell upon the object he made it clear that he wished to acquire it by falling on it but did not wish to acquire it by means of the four cubits Arshis hate said the rabbis instituted the law of the four cubits in regard to a side street which is not crowded but in regard to a high road which may be crowded the rabbis did not institute this law but does it not say everywhere the term everywhere is to include the ground on both sides of the high road Rush Lakish said further in the name of Abaco and Bartolay a girl who is still a minor has neither the right to acquire an object by means of her ground nor the right to acquire an object by means of her four cubits but our Yohanan said in the name of Arjana she has the right both in regard to her ground and in regard to her four cubits wherein do they differ one is of the opinion that the scriptural term ground is included in her hand just as her hand acts for her so her ground also acts for her but the other is of the opinion that ground acts in the capacity of agent and as she has not the power while she is a minor to appoint an agent to act for her neither can her ground act for her but is there anyone who says that ground is regarded as agent was it not taught if the theft be found at all in his hand alive from this I would gather that the law applies only when it is found in his hand how do we know that the same law applies when the theft is found on his roof in his courtyard and in his enclosure because we are told if the theft be found at all which means wherever it may be found now if your view is that ground acts because it is regarded as agent then we must conclude that there is an agent for a simple act whereas it is held by us that there is no agent for a simple act Robin answered we say there is no agent for a simple act only when the agent is subject to the law prohibiting the act but in regard to a thief's ground which cannot be said to be subject to the law prohibiting the act of stealing the responsibility does not lie with the agent but it lies with the originator of the deed but if so what if one says to a woman or a slave go and steal from me seeing that they are not subject to the law prohibiting the act of stealing does the responsibility in this case also lie with the originator of the deed I will tell you a woman and a slave are subject to the law prohibiting theft only they are temporarily unable to pay as we learned when the woman has been divorced and the slave set free they are obliged to pay our sama said when do we say there is no agent for a simple act only in a case where the agent is at liberty to choose to do it if he wishes and not do it if he does not wish but in regard to a ground where e.g. a stolen animal is found seeing that it has no will but must receive what is deposited therein the responsibility lies with the originator e.g. of the theft wherein do they differ they differ in the case where a priest says to an Israelite go and betroth for me a divorced woman or where a man says to a woman cut around the corners of the hair of a minor according to the version which says that whenever the agent has the choice to do it if he wishes and not to do it if he does not wish the responsibility does not lie with the originator here also he has the choice to do if he wishes and not to do it if he does not wish and therefore the responsibility does not
regarding a female minor and the other says we do not derive the law regarding a male minor from the law regarding a female minor and if you wish I will say one deals with one case and the other deals with another case and they do not really differ as regards a law mission if a man sees people running after a lost article e.g. after an injured stag or after unfledged pigeons and says my field acquires possession for me it does acquire possession for him but if the stag runs normally or the pigeons fly naturally and he says my field acquires possession for me there is nothing in what he says Gemara Rab Judah said in the name of Samuel this is provided he is present by the side of his field but ought not his field to acquire it for him in any case seeing that our Jose son of Arhanan said a man's ground acquires property for him even without his knowledge these words apply only to a piece of ground that is guarded but when the piece of ground is not guarded then the law is that if the owner is present by the side of his field he does acquire the property but if he is not present he does not acquire it and whence do you derive that when the piece of ground is not guarded the owner does acquire the property if he is present by the side of the field but that he does not acquire it if he is not present from what was taught if one stands in town and says I know that the sheep which I have in the field has been forgotten by the laborers and it is my wish that the sheep shall not be regarded as forgotten I might think that it shall not in any circumstances be regarded as forgotten the scriptural verse therefore tells us and thou hast forgotten a sheep in the field etc implying only if thou hast forgotten it while thou wast in the field does the law of the forgotten sheep apply and not if thou hast forgotten it when thou hast returned to town now this seems self-contradictory first you say I might think that it shall not be regarded as forgotten from which it would appear that in fact it is regarded as forgotten and then the Gemara concludes only if thou hast forgotten it while thou wast in the field does the law of the forgotten chief apply but not if thou hast forgotten it when thou hast returned to town from which it would appear that in the case discussed it is not regarded as a forgotten chief it must therefore be assumed that what is meant is this in the field i.e. if it was forgotten at the outset while the owner was still in the field it must be regarded as a forgotten chief but if it was remembered by the owner in the field and was subsequently forgotten by the laborers it is not regarded as a forgotten chief for what reason since he was standing near it in the field the field acquires it for him but when the owner is again in town even if the chief was at first remembered by him and was forgotten later by the laborers in the field it must be regarded as a forgotten sheep for what reason because he is not there beside it so that the field does not require possession of the sheep for him but how does it follow perhaps it is a biblical decree that only that which is forgotten by the owner while he is in the field shall be subject to the law of the forgotten sheep but that when the owner is in town again the sheep is no more subject to that law the scriptural verse says further thou shalt not go back to fetch it this is to include the sheep which has been forgotten by the owner on his return to town but is not this needed to indicate that disregard of the law involves the transgression of a negative command if that were so the scriptural verse would only have to say thou shalt not fetch it why does it say thou shalt not go back obviously in order to include the sheep which has been forgotten by the owner on his return to town but is not this additional phrase still required for the rule which we have learned that which is in front of him who is engaged in reaping is not subject to the law of the forgotten sheep that which is behind him is subject to the law of the forgotten sheep as it is included in the prohibition thou shalt not go back to fetch it this is the general rule all that can be included in the prohibition thou shalt not go back to fetch it is subject to the law of the forgotten sheep all that cannot be included in the prohibition thou shalt not go back to fetch it is not subject to the law of the forgotten sheep or as she said the scriptural verse says it shall be for the stranger etc so as to include that which has been forgotten by the owner when he is back in town Allah also said this is provided that he is present by the side of his field and Rabbi Barhan said likewise this is provided that he is present by the side of his field or Abba placed before Allah the following objection it happened once that Rabbi Gamaliel and some elders were going in a ship Rabban Gamaliel then said the tithe which I shall measure off when I come home is given by me to Joshua Talmud, Mas Baba Metziah B and the place where it lies is leased to him by me and the other tithe which I shall measure off is given by me to Akiba B Joseph that he may acquire possession of it for the poor and the place where it lies is leased to him by me now where are Joshua and our Akiba standing by the side of the field of Rabban Gamaliel. When the latter made that declaration he then said to him Arabah the student seems to imagine that people do not study the law when he Arabah came to Surah he related to those at the college this is what Ola said and this is the objection that I placed before him one of the rabbis then answered him Rabban Gamaliel made them acquire the movable property through the immovable property Arzara accepted it Arabah did not accept it said Rabbah he Arabah did right in not accepting it. For had they not a cloth by which to acquire from him the tithes as exchange it must therefore be said that the enjoyment of the right to give the tithes to whom one likes is not regarded as something that has a money value by which one could acquire goods as exchange in the same way it must be said that the enjoyment of this right is not regarded as something that has a money value for the purpose of being acquired through immovable property but this is not so in regard to the priestly perquisites the term giving is used in scripture exchange is a commercial transaction whereas the acquisition of movable property through immovable property is a transaction to which giving may be legitimately applied our papa says in a case where there is a person bestowing upon the recipient the right to the property it is different and whence do you derive this from what we have learned in our mission if a man sees people running after a lost object etc and in Regard to this, our Jeremiah said in the name of our Yohanan, this is provided that if he runs after them and can overtake them, our Jeremiah then asked, What is the law regarding a gift? Our Abu Bikahana approved of the distinction implied in this question, and he answered, If the objects are given to the owner of the field, they become his, even if he runs after them and cannot overtake them. For what reason is it not because where there is a person bestowing upon the recipient the right to the property, it is different, said our Shimai to our Papa. Behold, there is a case of a bill of divorcement thrown by the husband into the wife's house or courtyard where there is a person bestowing upon the recipient the right to its possession, and yet Ola said that is provided that she is present in the vicinity of her house or her courtyard. The case of a bill of divorcement is different as it may be given even against her will, but can it not be concluded the other way by means of KAL? W. A. Homer, if in the case of a bill of divorcement which may be given against the wife's will, it is valid if she is standing by the side of her house or her courtyard, but not otherwise. How much more should this be so in the case of a gift for which the recipient's consent is necessary? Therefore, our Ashi said Talmud, Mas Baba Metziah, a person's ground acts for him because it is included in the term hand and is no less effective than a human agency in the case of a bill of divorcement where the agency would work to her disadvantage. We say that one may not do anything to a person's disadvantage except when the person is present, but in the case of a gift where the agency would work to the advantage of the recipient, we say that one may do something to a person's advantage when the person is absent to revert to the above text. If a man sees people running after a lost article, etc., our Jeremiah said in the name of our Yohanan, this is provided that if he runs after. Them he can reach them or Jeremiah asked what is the law in the case of a gift our Abu Bikahana approved of the distinction implied in the question and answered even though if he runs after them and cannot reach them now Rabbah asked if one throws away a purse through one door and it falls through another door what is the law do we say that even when a thing does not come to rest in the air it is regarded as being come to rest there or not our Papa said to Rabbah and according to some are Adabi Matina said to Rabbah while according to others Rabbah said to Rabbah is not this the same as the case in our mission if a man sees people running after a lost article etc and our Jeremiah said in the name of our Yohanan this is provided that if he runs after them he can reach them and our Jeremiah asked what is the law in the case of a gift and our Abu Bikahana approved of the distinction implied in the question and answered even though if he runs after them and cannot reach them Rabbah Answered him, you speak of a case where the objects were moving on the ground, moving on the ground is different as it is like resting mission. An object found by a man's son or daughter who are minors or by his Canaanite bondman or bondwoman or by his wife belongs to himself. An object found by his son or daughter who are majors or by his Hebrew manservant or maidservant or by his wife whom he has divorced, although he has not paid her the amount due to her according to her marriage. Contract belongs to the finder. Gamara Samuel said, For what reason has it been laid down that an object found by a minor belongs
Minor may not be taken away from them as the law of robbery is applied to them out of consideration for the public good. Our Jose says it is actual robbery and Arista says it is actual robbery because of an enactment by the rabbis. The difference is as regards reclaiming the object by law. Therefore, Abbe said the field is treated as if the last cleaners had passed through it so that the poor themselves dismiss it from their minds thinking that the son of that laborer would gather it. Cleaning our Abbe Matina then said to Abbe is it permissible for a man to cause a lion to lie down in his field in order that the poor may see it and run away. Therefore, Rabbi said Talmud, Mas Baba Matia B. In this case, the right to take possession has been conceded to one who really has no such right for what reason because the poor themselves are pleased with this concession so that when they are hired as laborers, their children may also be allowed to glean after them now this. Samuel's view differs from that of our high B. Abba for our high B. Abba said in the name of our Yohanan by major we do not mean one who is legally a major nor do we mean by minor one who is legally a minor but a major who is maintained by his father is regarded as a minor and a minor who is not maintained by his father is regarded as a major an object found by his Hebrew man servant or maid servant belongs to the finder why ought not the servant to be regarded as a hired laborer and it has been taught an object found by a hired laborer belongs to himself this is a law only when the employer said to him we for me today ho for me today but if the employer said to him do work for me today the object found by him belongs to the employer our high B. Abba said in the name of our Yohanan the servant referred to here in our mission is one who does highly skilled work such as perforating pearls so that his master does not wish to change him over to any other kind of Work Rabbi says we deal here with a servant who picked up a found object while doing his work. Our Papa says the object found by the hired laborer belongs to the employer when the employer hired him to collect ownerless objects as for instance when a meadow was flooded with fish. What kind of a maid servant is it that our Mishnah speaks of if it is one who has grown two hairs? What business has she with him who claims to be her master and if she has not grown two hairs then if she has a father the found object belongs to her father and if she has no father she should have been released on the death of the father for Rish Lakish said the Hebrew maid servant gains her liberty from the master through the death of her father which law may be derived by means of a KALWA homer but was not Rish Lakish refuted yes but does not this law of our Mishnah provide additional refutation no you may assume that our Mishnah refers to a case where the father is alive but the words IT Belongs to the finder mean in her case that the master is excluded an object found by his wife whom he has divorced etc. If he has divorced her it is self-evident that the object found by her belongs to her. Here we deal with the case of a woman who has been divorced and yet is not divorced for our Zara said in the name of Samuel wherever the sages have said that a woman is divorced and yet not divorced her husband is obliged to maintain her now the reason why the rabbi said that an object found by a wife belongs to her husband is that he may entertain no ill feeling towards her. Here it is obvious that the husband entertains intense ill feeling towards her mission. If one finds notes of indebtedness containing a mortgage clause pledging the debtor's property one shall not return them because the court will enforce payment on the strength of them. If they contain no such mortgage clause one shall return them because the court will not enforce payment on the strength of then this is a view of our mayor, but the sages say one shall not return them in either case as the court will enforce payment in both cases tomorrow with what kind of circumstances do we deal here if the debtor admits that the debt is due then even if there is a mortgage clause in the documents why shall the finder not return them seeing that the debtor admits that he has not paid the debt and if the debtor does not admit why should the finder return the documents where they do not contain a mortgage clause granted that the creditor may not exact payment from encumbered property but he may certainly exact payment from unencumbered property yes it is indeed a case where the debtor admits his debt but the reason why the documents are not to be returned is this we apprehend that they might have been written to secure a loan say in this and whereas the loan was not granted until tishri so that the lender would come to seize unlawfully the property bought by others from the borrower during that space of time but if so we ought to entertain the same fear as regards all documents that come before us ordinary documents are not suspect but these are suspect then the question arises regarding the law that we learned in a mission a note of indebtedness may be written for the borrower even when the lender is not present how do we write it deliberately seeing that we ought to apprehend that the note might have been written with the intention of borrowing in this and whereas the loan was not granted until tishri so that the lender would seize unlawfully the property which others will have bought from the borrower during that space of time said rc talmud mas baba Matia, the mission deals with deeds of transfer in which case he pledged himself that his property would be at the disposal of the lender from the date given in the note but if this is so how do we understand our mission which teaches that if there is a clause in the Mortgaging the debtor's property they shall not be returned and which has been explained as dealing with a case where the debtor admits the debt and for the reason that the documents might have been written to secure a loan in this and while the loan was not granted until Tishri and the lender would seize unlawfully the property bought by others from the borrower during that space of time why should not the documents be returned we ought to see if it is a case of a deed of transfer then he has pledged himself to let the lender have the property from the date of the deed if it is not a deed of transfer there is nothing to apprehend for you have said that if the lender is not present with him we do not write the note of indebtedness RC answered although ordinarily we do not write notes which are not deeds of transfer when the lender is not present in our mission which deals with a document that has been dropped and has consequently become suspect we do apprehend that by some chance it might have been written in the absence of the lender Abbe says the witnesses acquire for him the right to the property by affixing their signatures to the document even if it is not a deed of transfer Abbe's reason for this explanation being that he objected to RC's version if you say that notes which are not deeds of transfer are not written when the lender is not present then there is no ground for the apprehension that by some chance they may have been written in the absence of the lender but it may be asked what of the other mission which we learned if one has found bills of divorcement given to wives deeds of liberation given to slaves wills of dying persons deeds of gifts and receipts one need not return them as they may have been written and then cancelled without being handed over to the persons mentioned in the deeds now even if they have been cancelled what does it matter in view of your statement that the witnesses acquire for him the right to the property by affixing their signatures to the document the statement only applies to a case where the documents came to his the creditor's hand but in a case where they did not come to his hand it does not apply the question arises however as regards our mission which teaches if one has found notes of indebtedness if they contain a clause mortgaging the debtor's property one shall not return them and we explain that it refers to a case where the debtor admits the debt and the reason why the notes are not returned is that they may have been written with a view to granting a loan in this and while the loan may not actually have been granted until tishri it is right according to rc who says that the first side admission refers to deeds of transfer as this latter mission can then be explained as referring to documents which are not deeds of transfer as previously stated but according to Abe who says the witnesses by their signatures Acquire for him the lender the right to the property. How can it be explained? Abe will answer you the reason for the teaching of our mission is the fear that the debt may have been already paid and that a fraudulent agreement may have been reached between the lender and the borrower. But how could it be explained according to Samuel who says that we are not afraid that the debt may have been already paid and that a fraudulent agreement may have been reached between the lender and the borrower? It would be right if he Samuel shared the view of RC who says that the first side admission is to be understood as referring to deeds of transfer as he could then explain our mission as referring to documents which are not deeds of transfer. But if he Samuel shared the view of Abe who says the witnesses by their signatures acquire for him the right to the property, how can it be explained? Samuel explains the mission as referring to a case where the debtor does not admit the genuineness of the document but if so why should the document be returned when it does not contain the clause mortgaging the borrower's property granted that he the lender may not exact payment from encumbered property he may surely exact payment from unencumbered property samuel has his own reason for samuel stated our mayor used to say a note of indebtedness which has no clause mortgaging property does not entitle the creditor to exact payment from either encumbered or unencumbered property but since it does not entitle one to exact payment why should it be returned our nathan b ashai said that the lender may use it as a stopper for his bottle then let us give it back to the borrower that he may use it as a stopper for his bottle it is the borrower talmud mas baba Matiabi, who denies the whole transaction
entitle him to exact payment from unencumbered property but in a case where the debtor does not admit his indebtedness all agree that the document should not be returned because we are afraid that it may have been already paid it has been taught in support of our Yohanan and in refutation of our Eliezer in one point and of Samuel in two points if one has found notes of indebtedness in which there is a clause mortgaging the debtor's property even if both the debtor and creditor admit the genuineness of the documents one should not return them either to the one or to the other but if they contain no clause mortgaging the debtor's property then as long as the borrower admits the debt they should be returned to the lender but if the borrower does not admit the debt they should not be returned either to the one or to the other this is a view of our mayor for our mayor maintained that notes of indebtedness which contain a clause mortgaging the debtor's property entitled it lender to exact payment from encumbered property and that those that contain no clause mortgaging the debtor's property entitle the lender to exact payment from unencumbered property only but the sages say in either case does the document entitle the lender to exact payment from encumbered property this is a refutation of our Eliezer in one point as he maintained that according to our mayor a document that contains no clause mortgaging the debtor's property does not entitle the lender to exact payment either from encumbered or unencumbered property and he further said that both our mayor and the rabbis agree that we are not afraid of a fraudulent agreement between the lender and the borrower to exact payment from the purchasers of the borrower's property while the very the teaches that a document which contains no clause mortgaging the debtor's property does not entitle the creditor to exact payment from encumbered property but does entitle him to exact payment from Unencumbered property and it further proceeds to indicate that both our mayor and the rabbis agree that we are afraid of a fraudulent agreement for it teaches that even if both parties admit the debt one must not return the documents either to the one or to the other which shows that we are afraid of a fraudulent agreement between the parties to rob the purchasers of the borrower's property but are not these two points Talmud, Mas Baba Metziah, they are really one for there is one reason. For both views as it is because our Eliezer says that the difference of opinion in our mission concerns a case where the debtor does not admit his indebtedness that he interprets it thus the view of Samuel is refuted in two points the one point is the same as that which applies to our Eliezer for he also interprets our mission as referring to a case where the debtor does not admit his indebtedness and the other point is that Samuel says if one finds a deed of transfer in the street. One should return it to the owners and we are not afraid that the debt may have been already paid the refutation is that here in the very that we are taught that even if both parties admit the genuineness of the documents one should not return them either to the one or to the other which shows that we are afraid that the debt may have been paid and it follows with even greater certainty that in a case where the borrower does not admit the genuineness of the document we are afraid that the debt may have been paid Samuel said what is the reason of the rabbis who maintain that a document which contains no clause mortgaging the debtor's property entitles the creditor to exact payment even from encumbered property they are of opinion that the omission of the clause mortgaging the debtor's property is due to an error of the scribe said Rabbi B to our EDB Abin and has Samuel really said thus has not Samuel said as regards improvement of the field the claim to the Best property and mortgaging the debtor's property it is necessary for the scribe to consult the seller of the field shall we say that he who stated the one view of Samuel did not state the other there is no contradiction between the two views the first view was stated in connection with a note of indebtedness in which case it is assumed that no man will advance money without adequate security the second view was stated in connection with buying and selling in which case it is assumed that a man may buy land for a day as for instance Abu Abihi did who bought a garret from his sister and a creditor came and took it away from him he appeared before Mar Samuel who said to him did she write you a guarantee he answered no whereupon Samuel said to him if so go in peace so he said to him is it not you sir who said that the omission of a clause mortgaging the debtor's property is due to an error of the scribe he Samuel answered him this applies only to notes of indebtedness but it does not apply to documents drawn up in connection with buying and selling for a man may buy land for a day of a said if Reuben sold a field to Simeon with a guarantee and Reuben's creditor came and took it away from him the law is that Reuben may go and sue him the creditor and he the creditor cannot say to him Reuben I have nothing to do with you for he Reuben may say to him the creditor what you take away from him Simeon comes back on me some say that even if the field has been sold without a guarantee the law is the same for he Reuben may say to him the creditor I do not wish Simeon to have a grudge against me I also said if Reuben sold a field to Simeon without a guarantee and claimants appeared contesting Reuben's title to sell the land he Simeon Talmud Mas Baba Metziah B may retract as long as he has not taken possession of it but if he has taken possession of it he cannot retract for he Reuben may say to him Simeon you bought a bag sealed with knots and you got it when is he deemed to have taken possession when he has set his foot upon the landmarks but some say that even when the field is sold with a guarantee the buyer may not retract for he the seller may say to him the buyer show me your document legalizing the seizure of the field and entitling you to demand your money back and I shall pay you it was stated if one sells a field to his neighbor and it turns out not to be his own rap says he the buyer is entitled to the return of the money which he paid for the field and to compensation from the seller for the improvement which he made in the field but Samuel says he is entitled to the money he paid but not to compensation for the improvement Arhuna was asked if he the seller expressly stated that he would compensate the buyer for the improvement if the field were taken away what is the law then is Samuel's reason for withholding compensation that the Seller did not expressly state that he would compensate the buyer for the improvement then it would not apply to this case for here the seller did state expressly that he would compensate the buyer or is Samuel's reason that in view of the fact that he the seller really had no land to sell the money received by the buyer as compensation for the improvement would appear like usury Arhuna answered yes and no for he was hesitant it was taught Arnam and said in the name of Samuel he the buyer is entitled to have returned to him the money paid for the field but not to compensation for improvement even if he the seller stated expressly that he would compensate the buyer for the improvement the reason being that in view of the fact that he the seller really had no land to sell he the buyer would be taking profit for his money rather than asked Arnam and from the following mission we may not collect from encumbered property for the purposes of usufruct Improvement of land the alimentation of wife and daughters out of consideration for the public good this would show that it is only from encumbered property that we do not collect but we do collect from unencumbered property and it is stated that this law applies to the improvement of land now may it not be assumed that it refers to land bought from one who acquired it wrongfully no it refers to land seized by a creditor but note the first part we may not collect etc for the purpose of use of now if it refers to land seized by a creditor is the creditor entitled to the produce of the land has not Samuel said a creditor collects his debt from an improved field and does it not mean that he only collects it from an improved field but not from the produce of the field it is therefore obvious that it refers to one who acquired a field wrongfully and to the one who has been deprived of it and seeing that the first part deals with one who acquired a field wrongfully and one who has been deprived of it the second part surely also deals with such a case how does it follow this first part deals with one case and the second part deals with another case but are we not taught differently in a very the relating to the above mission how does it happen that payment is exacted for improvement of the land if one has taken away a field by violence from a neighbor and he has had to give it up again in consequence of legal action then the one that is entitled to compensation may collect the original value of the field from encumbered property and the value of the improvement may be collected from unencumbered property now how is this to be understood if we say that it is to be understood as stated what right has the person who acquired the field wrongfully to claim compensation from anybody it must therefore be understood as referring to a case where a person wrongfully took away a field from a neighbor and sold it to Another person and this other person has improved it Arnam and answered him had you not to remove the difficulty in the very the by explaining that it refers to an unlawfully acquired field you may as well remove the difficulty by saying that it refers to a field seized by a creditor after it has been improved by the buyer come and here how does it happen that payment is exacted as compensation for the use of the produce of the field if one has wrongfully taken away a field from a neighbor and he has had to give it up again in consequence of legal action then the one that is entitled to compensation may collect the capital value of the field itself from encumbered property and the value of the produce may be collected from unencumbered property now how is this to be understood if we say that it
Unencumbered property only Rabbah does not give the same explanation as Rabbah son of Arhunah because it says he has had to give it up again which obviously means through the intervention of the court and Rabbah son of Arhunah does not give the same explanation as Rabbah because it says he has had to give it up again which obviously means in its original condition and not full of holes or as she said it refers partly to one and partly to the other as if one violently took away from a neighbor. A field full of fruit and ate the fruit and sold the field when the buyer comes to demand the capital value of the field itself he may exact payment from encumbered property when the robbed neighbor comes to demand the value of the fruit he may exact payment from unencumbered property only the question now arises both according to Rabbah and according to Rabbah son of Arhunah this is like a debt contracted verbally and a verbally contracted debt does not entitle the creditor to exact. Payment from encumbered property here we deal with the case where the robber first stood his trial and then sold the field but if so the produce of the field should also be recoverable from encumbered property the case is one where the robber has stood his trial as regards the capital value of the field itself but has not stood his trial as regards the produce but how can this be determined it is the usual practice when a person sues he sues first for the principal but does Samuel really hold the view that he who bought a field from a robber is not entitled to compensation for the improvement he made in the field did not Samuel say to our high nabisha the scribe consult the seller when drawing up a deed of sale and write best property improvement and produce now to what kind of transaction does this apply if it applies to a creditor claiming the field for his debt is he entitled to the produce of the field has not Samuel said the creditor exacts Payment from the improvement which means from the improvement only but not from the produce it must therefore be said that it applies to one who bought a field from a robber or Joseph said here we deal with the case where the robber owns land said Abbe to him is it permitted to borrow a measure of corn and to repay the loan with the same measure when the borrower has land here Joseph answered him there it is a loan here it is a sale some say our Joseph said here we deal with a case where there was a formal act of acquisition whereby the seller pledged himself to be immediately responsible to the buyer for the improvement but Abbe said to him is it permitted to borrow a measure of corn and to repay the loan with the same measure when there was a formal act of acquisition whereby the borrower pledged himself to be immediately responsible to the lender for an increase in price here Joseph answered him there it is a loan here it is a sale to revert to. The above text Samuel said a creditor exacts payment from the improvement said Rabbi you may know that this view is correct for the seller writes in the deed of sale the following guarantee to the buyer I shall confirm satisfy clear and perfect these purchases and the gains resulting from them and the improvements to be made in them and I shall stand as surety for you and this purchaser agrees to it and accepts it or high and then said to Rabbi if this is so would you say that? In the case of a gift regarding which the donor writes no such guarantee a creditor who has a previous claim to the property may indeed not appropriate the improvement he Rabbi answered him yes but our high then asked does a gift confer a greater right on the recipient than a sale does on the buyer the former answered yes it undoubtedly does our nom and said the following very the corroborates the view of Mar Samuel but our colleague who not explains it is referring to a different Matter for it was taught if one has sold a field to a neighbor and then the buyer has to surrender it to another claimant he the buyer may when seeking redress exact repayment of the capital value of the field itself from encumbered property and the refund of the cost of the improvement he collects from unencumbered property but our colleague who not explains it as referring to a different matter is to that of one who has bought a field from a person who acquired it wrongfully. Another very the taught if one has sold a field to his neighbor and he the buyer has improved it and then a creditor of the seller comes and seizes it he the buyer when seeking redress is entitled in a case where the value of the improvement is greater than the cost thereof to collect the value of the improvement from the owner of the land and the cost thereof from the creditor but in a case where the cost of the improvement is greater than the value of that improvement he the buyer is only entitled to collect from the seller's creditor the amount of the cost which corresponds to the value of the improvement. Now, how does Samuel explain this very thing? If he explains it as referring to one who bought the field from a person who acquired it wrongfully, then the first part of the very thing contradicts him. For Samuel said above, he who buys a field from a person who acquired it wrongfully is not entitled to compensation for the improvement he made in the field. And if he explains it as referring to the seller's creditor seizing the field, then both the first part and the second part of the very thing contradict him. For Samuel said above, a creditor exacts payment from the improvement made in the field by the buyer. If you like, I shall say that Samuel will explain the very thing as referring to one who bought the field from a person who acquired it wrongfully and where the latter owns land or where there was a formal act of. Acquisition whereby he pledged himself at the sale that he would pay for the improvement and if you like I shall say that Samuel will explain the very as referring to the seller's creditor seizing the field nevertheless there is no contradiction to Samuel's views for here the reference is to an improvement Talmud, Mas Babamitzia B which has matured and is ready to be carried away but there the reference is to an improvement which has not yet matured and is not ready to be carried away but do not cases occur daily where Samuel allows creditors to collect their debts even from improvements which have matured and are ready to be carried away there is no contradiction these are cases where the creditor claims from him the seller an amount equal to the combined value of the land and the improvement the other is a case where the creditor claims from him the seller an amount equal to the value of the land alone in which case the Creditor compensates him the buyer for the value of his improvement and dismisses him but it is asked this is right and proper according to the view of him who says that when the buyer has money to pay the seller's debt he cannot dismiss the creditor by paying him the money but according to the view of him who says that when the buyer has money to pay the seller's debt he can dismiss the creditor by paying him the money let him say unto him the creditor if I had money I would have kept you away from the whole field by paying the amount due to you now that I have no money give me a piece of ground in the field corresponding to the value of my improvement here in the very though we deal with the case where he the seller had made it the field in hypothecate and that he said to the creditor you shall receive payment only from this if the buyer knew that the field did not belong to him who sold it and yet he bought it rap says he is entitled to the purchase price but not to the value of the improvement but Samuel says he is not entitled even to the purchase price wherein do they differ rabbis of the opinion that a person knowing that the seller has no land will make up his mind and give him the money as a deposit but then he should say to him that it is to be regarded as a deposit he is afraid that he the seller will not accept it as such but Samuel is of the opinion that a person knowing that the seller has no land will make up his mind and give him the money as a present but then he should say to him that it is to be regarded as a present he the recipient might be bashful but has not this difference of opinion between rab and Samuel been expressed once already has it not been stated if a man betrothed his sister to himself by giving her money rab says the money has to be given back but Samuel says the money is to be regarded as a present rab says that the money has to be given back because he is of the opinion that a person knowing that one's betrothal to one's sister is not valid will make up his mind and give her the money as a deposit but then he should say to her that it is to be regarded as a deposit he is afraid that she will not accept it as such but Samuel says that the money is to be regarded as a present because he is of the opinion that a person knowing that one's betrothal to one's sister is not valid will make up his mind and give her the money as a present but then he should say to her that it is to be regarded as a present she might feel bashful it is necessary to have the difference of opinion recorded in both cases for if it were taught only in that case we might think that only in such a case does Rab say that the money is to be returned because people do not usually give presents to strangers but as regards a sister we might think that he agrees with Samuel and if it were taught only in this case we might think that only in such a case does Samuel say that the money is not to be returned but as regards the other case we might think that he agrees with Rab therefore it is necessary to state both cases now behold both according to Rab who says that the money is to be regarded as a deposit and according to Samuel who says that the money is to be regarded as a present how does the person who has given the money go down to the field and how does he eat the fruit thereof he thinks I shall go down to the field and work in it and shall eat the fruit thereof just as he who acquired it wrongfully would have done and when the rightful owner of the field will come and claim it my money will be treated as a deposit according to Rab who says that it is to be regarded as a deposit and as a gift according to Samuel who says that it is to be regarded as a gift said Rab the law in regard to the above
The difference would be seen in a case where the buyer died according to the view of Marzitra as he wished that he should not call him a Robert Talmud. Mas Baba Matia, it could not be applied to this case as he the buyer is dead, but according to the view of Arashiv as he wished to vindicate his honesty, it could be applied even to this case as he the robber would wish to vindicate his honesty before the buyer's children also, but it is argued would not the buyer's children. Call him who sold the field to their father a robber, therefore we must say that the difference between them would appear in a case where the robber died according to the view of Marzitra as he wished that he should not call him a robber, it could not be applied to this case as he the robber is dead, but according to the view of Arashiv as he wished to vindicate his honesty, it could be applied even to this case as he the robber would wish that his honesty should be vindicated. Even when he is dead, but it is argued would not his children after all be called the children of a robber. Therefore, we must say that the difference between them would appear in a case where he the robber gave the field as a present according to the view of Arashiv as he wished to vindicate his honesty. It could be applied even to a present in regard to which he would also wish to vindicate his honesty. But according to the view of Marzitra, as he wished that he should not call him a robber, it could not be applied to this case. For he could say to the recipient of the gift, "What have I taken away from you that I should be called a robber?" It is obvious that if he who robbed the field and sold it subsequently sold it to another person or bequeathed it to his heirs or gave it away as a present and then bought it from the original owner, we must assume that he did not in buying the field intend to secure it thereby for the first buyer if it came to him as an Inheritance we must assume this too for an inheritance comes of itself and he did not trouble himself to get it if he took it in payment of a debt due to him from the original owner of the field then our attitude is as follows if the original owner had other land and the robber said I want this we assume that the robber in acquiring the field intended to secure it thereby for the first buyer but if not we assume that he merely wanted to be paid his money in a case where the original owner gave him the robbed field as a present our Abba and Robin a different one says gifted property is like inherited property and in that it also comes of itself but the other says gifted property is like bought property for if the recipient had not exerted himself to win the favor of the donor the latter would not have given him the present and the reason why he the recipient exerted himself to win the favor of the original owner of the field was that he the recipient who first Rob the field might vindicate his honesty until when does he wish to vindicate his honesty? Arhuna says until the buyer of the robbed field is summoned to appear in court. Hayabirab says until he the buyer receives the decree of the court entitling him to seize the robber's property. Arpapa says until the days of the announcement of the public sale of the robber's property begin to this Rami Bihamad emerged seeing that this buyer acquired this land from the robber only by the deed of sale is not the sale invalid because the deed is a mere pots heard. Rob answered him it is a case where the buyer believes him the robber because of the pleasure it gives the robber that he the buyer said nothing to him but trusted him implicitly he the robber exerts himself to acquire the field for him the buyer and determines to confer upon him the rightful ownership of the field. Arshis hate then asked it has been taught if one says to another what I am to inherit from. My father is sold to you or what my net is to bring up is sold to you it is as if he had said nothing but if he says what I am to inherit from my father today is sold to you or what my net is to bring up today is sold to you his words are valid Rami Bihama said to that there is a man and there is a question robber retorted I see the man but I do not see the force of the question here he the buyer relied on him the seller there he did not rely on him here he relied on him that he would exert himself and acquire the robbed field for him the buyer so that he might not call him a robber there he did not rely on him the question of Arshi's hate was then submitted to our Abu Zabda and he said this question does not need to be brought inside the college robber said it does need to be brought inside and even to the innermost part here he the buyer relied on him the seller there he did not rely on him a case occurred in Pumadiva and the question of our She's hate was asked our Joseph and said to them who asked the question this does not need to be brought inside the college but Abbe said to him our Joseph it does need to be brought inside and even to the innermost part here he the buyer relied on him the seller there he did not rely on him and wherein does the first part of the teaching quoted by our she's hate differ from the last part our Yohanan said the last part is what I am to inherit from my father today because of his father's honor what my net is to bring up today Talmud, Mas Baba Matiyabi because of the need to support himself or who not said in the name of Rab if one says to his neighbor the field which I am about to buy shall when I have bought it be sold to you from now the neighbor acquires it Rabbi said it stands to reason that Rab's decision is right when applied to a case where the seller refers to a field in general but in a case where the seller points out the land sold by saying this field it would not be right for who can say whether the owner of that field will sell it to him but by God Rab himself did maintain that even when the seller says this field the sale is valid seeing that Rab stated his law in accordance with the view of Armeir who said that a man may convey to another person a thing which has not yet come into existence as it has been taught if one says to a woman be betrothed to me after I shall become a proselyte or after thou shalt become a proselyte or after I shall be set free or after thou shalt be set free or after thy husband will have died or after thy brother-in-law will have given thee halis or after thy sister will have died the woman is not betrothed Armeir says she is betrothed now the woman in this case is like this field and yet Armeir says that she is betrothed Samuel said if one finds a deed of transfer in the street one shall return it to the owners for even if this were objected to on the ground that Deed may have been written for the purpose of a loan and the loan may in fact not have been granted the objection would not be valid because the borrower pledged himself and if this were objected to on the ground that the loan may in the meantime have been repaid the objection would not be valid either because we are not afraid of repayment having taken place as we assume that if the borrower had repaid the loan he would have torn up the deed Arnam and said my father was among the scribes of Mar Samuel's court when I was about six or seven years old and I remember that they used to proclaim deeds of transfer which are found in the street should be returned to their owners Aram Rome said we have also learned so in the mission all documents executed by a court of law shall be returned when found which shows that we are not afraid of repayment but Arzara said to him our mission treats of documents containing decrees of the court which confirm the creditors Right to belongings appropriated from the debtor and of documents authorizing a creditor to search for the debtor's belongings and to seize them wherever they may be found which documents are not concerned with repayment Rabba then said and are not such documents concerned with repayment have not the Niharti and said property assigned in valuation returns to the debtor until the end of 12 months and Amimar said I am from Nihartia and I am of the opinion that the property assigned in valuation always returns therefore Rabba said there the reason is this we say he has himself to blame for the loss for at the time when he paid the debt he should have torn up the document or he should have asked for another document to be written entitling him to claim the property as according to law the creditor need not return the property and it is only because of the command and thou shalt do that which is right and good in the sight of the Lord that the rabbis Declared that it should be returned, therefore he the debtor is in the position of one who is buying the property anew and he ought to ask for a deed of sale to be written and given to him. But in regard to a note of indebtedness, what may be argued in favor of the return thereof is that if it had been paid, he should have torn up the note to this. I say he the creditor may have given an excuse by telling him the debtor I shall give it to you tomorrow as I have not got it with me. Just now, or he the creditor may have kept it back until he is refunded. The scribes fee are said in the name of Aryohan, and if one finds a note of indebtedness in the street, even if it contains the endorsement of the court, it shall not be returned to the owners. It is undoubtedly so when it does not contain the endorsement of the court, as it may then be said that it was written for the purpose of a loan and that in fact the loan was not granted, but even if it does contain the endorsement. Of the court, which means that it is officially confirmed, it shall not be returned because we are afraid that the loan may in the meantime have been repaid. Our Jeremiah objected to the ruling of Arabah from the following mission: all documents executed by a court of law shall be returned when found. Arabah answered him, Jeremiah, my son, not all documents executed by a court of law are alike. Indeed, the mission refers to a case where the debtor has been found to be a liar. Rabbah then said, and because he has been found to be lying, once must it be assumed that he would not pay his debts any more. Therefore, Rabbah said, our mission treats of a document containing a decree of the court which confirms the creditor's right to belongings appropriated from the debtor, and of a document authorizing a
To be written the decree may not be written and given to him if therefore the wording of the court's decision is to make a difference at all the difference can only apply to the following cases if they, the members of the court said to him the debtor go and give him what you owe him and he the debtor said later I have paid as ordered and witnesses testify that he did not pay him while he repeats his assertion that he did pay then we say he has been found to be a liar in regard to this money but if the court said to the debtor you are obliged to give him what you owe him and he the debtor said later I have paid and witnesses testify that he did not pay while he repeats his assertion that he did pay then we say he has not been found to be a liar in regard to this money for what reason we say that the debtor was just trying to put him off thinking to gain time until the rabbis would consider their decision more carefully Rabbi Barhana said in the Name of Aryohanan if one says to another you have in your possession a hundred zoos belonging to me and the other replies I have nothing belonging to you while witnesses testify that he the defendant has the money and he the defendant again pleads I paid it then we say he has been found to be a liar in regard to this money such was the case of Sabbathai the son of Armorinus he assigned to his daughter-in-law in her Kethuba cloak of fine wool and he pledged himself to it her Kethuba. Got lost whereupon he Sabbathai said to her I deny altogether having assigned to you the cloak but witnesses came and said yes he did assign it to her in the end he said I gave it to her he then appeared before our high and our high said to him you have been found to be a liar in regard to this cloak our said in the name of Arlay who said in the name of Aryohanan if one was due to take an oath in regard to a claim of his neighbor and he said I took the oath but witnesses. Testify that he did not take the oath while he repeats the assertion I did take the oath we say he has been found to be a liar in regard to this oath this decision was conveyed to Arabah whereupon he said Arabah's decision seems right in a case where the oath was imposed upon the defendant by a court of law but in a case where the defendant imposed an oath upon himself he is believed for it happens that a person talks like this when this observation was conveyed back to Arabah. He said I also spoke of a court case and it was also stated so in another place Arabah said in the name of Arlay who said in the name of Aryohanan if one was due to take an oath in a court of law in regard to a claim of his neighbor and he said I took the oath but witnesses testify that he did not take the oath while he repeats the assertion I did take the oath we say he has been found a liar in regard to this oath RC said in the name of Aryohanan if one finds in the street a Note of indebtedness which contains the endorsement of the court and the date of that very day it shall be returned to the owners for if the objection is raised that it may have been written for the purpose of a loan and the loan may in fact not have been granted the objection is not valid as the note contains the endorsement of the court and if the objection is raised that the loan may have been repaid the objection is not valid as we are not afraid of a loan having been repaid on the day on which it was granted our then said to our seed did Aryohanan really teach this did you not yourself teach in the name of Aryohanan as follows a note which was given for a loan that was subsequently repaid cannot be used for the purpose of another loan because the obligation incurred by the first loan was cancelled on it being repaid now when was the note to be used again if on the following day or on any day later than that given in the note why state is a Reason the fact that the obligation incurred by the first loan was cancelled the invalidity of the note follows from the fact that it is antedated for we have learned in a mission antedated notes of indebtedness are invalid it must therefore be assumed that the note was to be used a second time on the same day as that given in the note so we see that people do pay on the same day as they borrow RC answered him did I say that one never pays a debt on the day it is incurred I said people do not usually pay on the same day our Kahana said the lost document is to be returned to the owner when the debtor admits that he has not paid but if so it is asked why need we be told this because you might say this debtor has really paid and the reason why he says he has not paid is that he wishes to have the note returned to the creditor so that he may borrow on it again and thus save the scribes fees therefore we are told that we do not say this the reason being that in such circumstances the lender himself would not permit it thinking the rabbis may hear of it and make me lose my money but why is this case different from the one we have learned it? if one has found notes of indebtedness which contain a clause pledging the debtor's property one shall not return them and it is explained as referring to a case where the debtor admits the debt and the note has not to be returned for the reason that it may have been written for the purpose of a loan to be granted in this and while in reality the loan may not have been granted till tishri with the result that the creditor may come unlawfully to seize property bought by people from the debtor between this and tishri now why do we not say there also that in such circumstances the lender himself would not permit the note to be used in tishri but would say to him the borrower write another note in tishri as otherwise the rabbis may hear of it and make me lose my money it was said in Reply there in the Mishnah seeing that he the lender would profit by seizing property sold by the debtor between this and Antishri he the lender would be content and would say nothing but here seeing that he the lender would have no profit as after all the note has only just been written what advantage is there in that note as regards seizing sold property therefore we may assume that the lender will not permit the renewed use of a note the obligation of which expired when it first loan was paid our high B Abba said in the name of Aryohan and whoever pleads after an act of the court Talmud, Mas Baba Mitzia B says nothing what is the reason every act of the court is regarded as if it constituted a document placed in the hand of the claimant our high B Abba then said to Aryohan himself and is not this implied in our Mishnah which says if she produces a bill of divorcement unaccompanied by the Kethuba she may exact payment of the money due to her in Accordance with her Kethuba Aryohanan then answered him if I had not lifted the shirt for you you would not have found the pearl underneath Abay asked what pearl has our high B Abba found maybe we deal in the mission with a place where a marriage contract is not usually written so that her bill of divorcement serves the purpose of a Kethuba but in a place where a Kethuba is usually written the law would be that if she produces her Kethuba she may exact payment but that if she does not produce it she may not exact payment later Abay corrected himself what I said is really no argument for if you were to assume that the reference in the mission is to a place where a Kethuba is not usually written but that in a place where a Kethuba is usually written the law would be that if she produces her Kethuba she may exact payment but not if she does not how would a woman who became a widow after heiress and exact payment if by the evidence of witnesses Testifying to the death of the husband, the latter's heirs could plead and say she has been paid already. And if you will say it is really so, then what have the sages achieved by their provision? Mark Ashi saw the son of Arhistad and said to Arashi, And how do we know that a woman who became a widow after Arisen is entitled to payment of the Kethuba? If I should say that we derive it from the passage which we learned, the woman who became a widow or was divorced either after Arisen or Nisuin. Exact payment of all that is due her from her deceased husband. Perhaps this refers to a case where the betrothed man or the husband had written her a Kethuba. And if you will argue what need is there to tell us this, I will answer in order to let us know that we must reject the view of our Eliezer B. Ezrai, who says that he did write her the Kethuba except on condition that he would wed her. It is necessary to let us know that this is not so. It can also be proved that the Mishnah. Really deals with a case where there is a written kethuba before it says she exacts payment of all that is due to her. If you agree that the case is one where the husband wrote a kethuba, there is an explanation why the Mishnah uses the term she exacts payment of all that is due to her. But if you say that he did not write her a kethuba Talmud, Mas Bagamitia, what is the meaning of the term she exacts payment of all that is due to her, seeing that she is only entitled to a hundred or two hundred zoos and no more again? If you will say that we derive the law from that which our high BM I learned, if the betrothed wife of a priest dies, he the priest is not deemed a mourner, nor is he allowed to defile himself. In similar circumstances, the woman is not deemed a mourner and is not obliged to defile herself. If he dies, also if she dies, he does not inherit her property. If he dies, she exacts the payment of her kethuba. It could be objected, perhaps this. Refers to a case where the betrothed man had written her a kethuba, and if you will argue if he wrote her a kethuba, what need is there to tell us that she may exact payment? I will answer it is necessary to let us know that if she dies, he does not inherit her property. It must therefore be said that Abbe corrected himself because of what the mission itself says, and he argued thus if you held the view that we deal here with a place where no kethuba is usually written, the production of the bill of divorcement having there the same effect as the production of her kethuba, it could be refuted by the question does a bill of divorcement contain the figures 100 zoos or 200 zoos?
decided not to hand them over then we must assume that if he who lost the document says to those who found it give it to the wife it is given to her even after a long time but the following contradicts it if one has brought a bill of divorcement in order to deliver it on behalf of the husband and has lost it the law is that if it is found immediately it is valid if not it is invalid Rabbi said it is no contradiction there the reference is to a place where caravans pass. Frequently here in our mission the reference is to a place where caravans do not pass frequently and even in a place where caravans pass frequently this law only applies to a case where two persons called Joseph and Simeon are known to be in the same town for if you did not maintain this there would be a contradiction in Rabbi's own words as the following incident shows a bill of divorcement was once found in Arhunas courthouse and in it was written at Jair a place situated by. The canal Rakiz Arhunas said Talmud, Mas Bagamatia we apprehend that there may be two places called Shire Arhistav and said to Rabbi go and consider it carefully for in the evening Arhuna will ask you about it so he went and examined it thoroughly and he found that we had learned in a mission every document endorsed by the court shall be returned now Arhunas courthouse is surely like a place where caravans pass frequently and yet Rabbi decided that the document should be returned. We must therefore say that only if two persons called Joseph and Simeon are known to be there it is so but if not it is not so Rabbi decided an actual case where a bill of divorcement was found among the flax in Pumadiva in accordance with his teaching some say where flax was sold and it was a case where two bearing the same name were not known to be in the place although caravans were frequent there others say it was a place where flax was steeped and even though two persons bearing the same name were known to be in the place the bill had to be returned because caravans were not frequent there are zero pointed out a contradiction between our mission and the Beritha and then explained that we learned in the mission if one has brought a bill of divorcement in order to deliver it on behalf of the husband and has lost it the law is that if it is found immediately it is valid if not it is invalid this contradicts the following Beritha if one finds in the Street a bill of divorcement it shall be returned to the woman when the former husband admits its genuineness but if the husband does not admit its genuineness it shall not be returned to either of them at all events it says when the husband admits its genuineness it shall be returned to the woman obviously even after a long time and Arzera explained it by saying there the reference is to a place where caravans pass frequently but here the reference is to a place where caravans do not pass frequently some say that it is only when two persons bearing the same name are known to be in the place that we do not return the bill and this is in accordance with the view of Rabbi others say that even if two persons bearing the same name are not known to be in the place we do not return the bill contrary to the view of Rabbi now we can well understand why Rabbi did not argue like Arzera as he Rabbi deemed it more important to point out the apparent Contradiction between our mission and the other mission, but why did not Arzera argue like Rabbi? He will answer you. Does our mission teach expressly? But if he says give it to the wife, it is given to her. Even after a long time, it may be that the meaning is if he says give it to the wife, it is given to her. But only immediately, as we have assumed all along, according to the version of him who says that the view of Arzera is that in a place where caravans are frequent, the document shall not be returned, even if there are no two persons known to be in the place where the document was issued, and that Arzera thus differs with Rabbi. Wherein do they differ? Rabbi holds that when the mission states that every document endorsed by the court shall be returned, it deals with the document which was found in court. And since a court of law is like a place where caravans are frequent, we must conclude that only if two persons of the same name are known to be in the place where. The document was issued the law is that the document shall not be returned but that if two persons of the same name are not known to be there the law is that it shall be returned and Arzera he will answer you does the mission state every document endorsed by the court which has been found in court shall be returned it only states every document endorsed by the court shall be returned but in reality it has been found outside the court our Jeremiah says the very that deals with the case. Where the witnesses say we never signed more than one bill of divorcement with the name of Joseph and Simeon but if so what need is there to tell us that in such a case the document has to be returned you might say that we ought to apprehend that by a peculiar coincidence the names of the husband and wife as well as the names of the witnesses were identical in two bills of divorcement therefore we are told that we do not apprehend such a coincidence our Ashi says the very that deals. With the case where the husband says there is a hole near a certain letter and provided he states definitely near which letter the hole is to be found but if he just says there is a hole in the document without indicating the exact place the document is not returned to the wife or as she was in doubt whether the validity of a claim to lost property put forward by one who describes the lost articles distinguishing marks is derived from biblical law or rabbinical law rabbi bar. Hannah Talmud, Mas Bagamitia lost a bill of divorcement in the Beth Hamidrash when it was found he said to the finders if you attach importance to a distinguishing mark I have one on it if however you attach importance to recognition by sight I am able to recognize it whereupon the bill was returned to him he then said I do not know whether it was returned to me because of the distinguishing mark I indicated and the view was held that the indication of distinguishing marks entitles a loser to recover his property in accordance with biblical law or whether it was returned to me because of my ability to recognize it by sight and such recognition would be accepted from a rabbinic scholar only but not from an ordinary person the above text states if one finds in the street a bill of divorcement the law is that when the former husband admits its validity it shall be returned to the woman but if the husband does not admit its validity it shall not be returned to either of them at all events we are taught that when the husband admits the bill of divorcement is to be returned to the woman ought we not to apprehend that the husband may have written it with the intention of giving it to the wife in Nissan, but in reality did not give it to her till Tishri and the husband may have gone and sold the fruit of his wife's property between Nissan and Tishri and she may then come produce the bill of divorcement that was written in Nissan and Take away the fruit from the buyers unlawfully this would be right according to him who says that as soon as the husband has made up his mind to divorce her he is no more entitled to the fruit of her property and it would be in order for her to reclaim the sold fruit but according to him who says that the husband is entitled to the fruit of her property until the date on which he hands her the bill of divorcement how is it to be explained when she comes to take away the sold fruit from the buyers we say to her bring proof when the bill of divorcement came to your hand but why is a bill of divorcement different from notes of indebtedness regarding which we have learned if one finds notes of indebtedness the law is that if they contain a clause pledging the debtor's property one shall not return them and this is interpreted as applying to a case where the debtor admits the debt and the reason why the notes are not returned is that they may have been Written in this and the loan may not have been granted till Tishri so that the creditor may take away the debtor's sold property from the buyers unlawfully why do we not say there also that the documents should be returned and that when the creditor will come to take away the debtor's sold property from the buyers we shall tell him bring proof when the note of indebtedness came to your hand the answer is in the case of a bill of divorcement the person who bought from the husband. The fruit of the wife's property will come and demand of her the proof saying the reason why the rabbis gave her back the bill of divorcement is that she may not be condemned to permanent widowhood but now that she has come with the bill to take away the fruit of her property which I bought from her husband let her go and bring proof when the bill of divorcement came to her hand but in the case of a note of indebtedness the buyer will not come to demand proof he will say to himself. As the rabbis gave him back the note of indebtedness it is obvious that the purpose for which they gave it to him was to enable him to take away the debtor's sold property from the buyer and this shows that the rabbis made sure of the matter and that the note of indebtedness came to the hand of the creditor before my purchase deeds of liberation of slaves etc. Our rabbis taught if one finds a deed of liberation in the street the law is that when the master admits its validity one shall return it to the slave but when the master does not admit its validity one shall not return it to either of them thus we are taught that when the master admits the deed of liberation is to be returned to the slave why is this so ought we not to apprehend that the master may have written it with the intention of giving it to the slave in Nissan but in reality did not give it to him till Tishri and the slave may have gone and bought property between Nissan and Tishri and it. Master may have gone and sold it and the slave may then produce the deed of liberation which was written in Nissan and take away the property from the buyers unlawfully this would be right according to him who says that it is an advantage to a slave to be liberated from his master regard being had to obey who says the witnesses acquire it for him by affixing their signatures and it
regarding which it is written in the document conferring it from today but after my death the reason why the documents named in the mission are not returned is that as indicated in the mission the persons who lost them did not say give them to the persons named in the documents but if they said give them they would have to be given does not this contradict the following verita if one finds wills mortgage deeds and deeds of gift even if both parties concerned admit their validity one shall not return the documents to either of them or abu bimel answered it is no contradiction talmud mas baba mitzi one law refers to a gift made by a healthy person and the other law refers to that of a dying person our mission which teaches by implication that if the person who lost the document says give it, it is given refers to a gift made by a dying person who is in a position to retract for we say what is there to apprehend that he may originally have written the deed for this person and then changed his mind and not given it to him and that he may then have written a deed again for another person and given it to him but now he has made up his mind not to let him have it if he gave it to the latter as a gift of a healthy person the latter suffers no loss as a result of the donor's present change of mind for when the two documents are produced the later document confers possession as he retracted from the former if however he gave it also to the latter as a gift of a dying person the latter suffers no loss either as in such a case the last person acquires a gift because the donor withdrew it from the former but the Beretha which teaches that even if both parties admit the validity of the found document it shall not be returned to either party deals with a healthy person who cannot withdraw and the reason why the document is not returned is that we say maybe the donor wrote it originally for this person and then he changed his mind and did not give it to him. He then wrote another document for another person and gave it to him. But now he has made up his mind not to let him have it. And he argues thus, I cannot legally withdraw the gift from him. I will therefore tell them the judges that I gave it to this person so that they will return the document to him. And when he produces this earlier document, he will be entitled to the gift. We therefore say to him, the donor, we cannot give this document to this person as it may be that you did write it for him, but did not give it to him, and that you gave it to a different person instead. And now you have changed your mind again. Now if you have not really given it to a different person and you now wish to give it to this person, write him now another document and give it to him. For if you formerly did give a document to another person, he will suffer no loss because of the document you will write now as the person who holds it. Document with the earlier date will be entitled to the gift, but ask Arzibid do not both the mission and the bury the deal with last wills. Therefore, Arzibid said both teachings deal with the gift made by a dying person, and there is no contradiction. One deals with the donor himself, and the other deals with his son. Our mission, which implies that if the person who lost the document says give it to the person named in the document that is given to him, refers to the donor himself who is entitled to withdraw. And the reason why the document is thus given is that we say even if the donor had given it to another person, that person would suffer no loss as a result of the donor's change of mind. For if the first document and the last are produced, the last is valid as the first was withdrawn. But the bury the which teaches that even if both parties admit the validity of the document, it shall not be returned to either party. Refers to the son, and the reason why the document. Is not returned is that we say maybe the father wrote it for this person and he changed his mind and did not give it to him and that after the father's death he the son wrote another deed for another man and gave it to him but now he has made up his mind not to let him have it and he argues thus I cannot legally withdraw the gift from him I will therefore tell them the judges that my father gave it to this person so that they will give the document to him and we shall go and take the gift away from this other person as he this person will be legally entitled to it and we shall both share in the gain we therefore say to him the son we cannot give this document to this person as it may be that your father did write it for him but did not give it to him and that you gave it to a different person instead and have now changed your mind now if you speak the truth in saying that your father gave it to him go now and write him another deed for then even if you're Father did not give it to him and you wrote it for a different person that other person will suffer no loss for if the first document and the last are produced the first is valid our rabbis taught if one finds a receipt the law is that when the wife admits its genuineness one shall return it to the husband and that when the wife does not admit its genuineness one shall not return it to either party it is thus taught that when the wife admits the document shall be returned to the husband ought we not to apprehend that she may have written it with the intention of giving it to the husband in Nisan and that in reality she did not give it to him until Tishri and that in the interval between Nisan and Tishri she went and sold the value of her Ketuba for a consideration while the husband may produce the receipt showing that it was written in Nisan and he will thus be able to deprive unlawfully those who bought the value of the Ketuba of what is due to them. Rabba answered Talmud, Mas Baba Mitzia, from this we may infer that Samuel's law holds good for Samuel said if one sells a note of indebtedness to one's neighbor and then renounces the debt it is renounced and even the heir of the lender may renounce it Abbe maintained you may even say that Samuel's law does not hold good for here we deal with the case where the deed of the Ketuba marriage is produced by her Rabba however says that the production of the deed of the Ketuba makes no difference for we apprehend that she may have had two copies of the Ketuba Abbe again says in reply firstly we do not apprehend that she may have had two copies of the Ketuba and secondly receipt has validity from its date this is consistent with Abbe's view for he says the witnesses acquire it for him by their signatures mission if one finds deeds of valuation deeds of maintenance documents of Eliza or refusal documents of Berwin or any other document issued by a court of law one shall return them if one finds documents in a small bag or in a case or if one finds a roll or a bundle of documents one shall return them and how many documents constitute a bundle three fastened together Rabin Simeon B. Gamaliel says if they belong to one person who borrowed from three lenders one shall return them to the borrower if they belong to three persons who borrowed from one lender one shall return them to the lender if one finds a document among one's papers and does not know how it came there it shall remain with him until Elijah comes if there are notes of cancellation among them one must abide by the contents of the notes tomorrow what are documents of Berurin here in Babylonia it has been interpreted as meaning documents containing records of pleadings are Jeremiah said documents stating this party chose one judge and that party chose another judge or any other deed issued by a court of law one shall return in the court of Arhuna there was once Found a bill of divorcement in which was written in Chaire the town which is situated by the canal where he said Arhuna Talmud, Mas Baba Mitzia B. We apprehend that there may be two towns called Chaire Arhistad and said to Rabbi go and consider it carefully for in the evening Arhuna will ask you about it. So he went and examined it and he found that we learned any deed issued by a court of law one shall return Aram Rome and said to Rabbi how does the master derive a law relating to a religious prohibition from a civil law Rabbi answered him idle talker the Mishnah taught this law also in regard to documents of Eliza and refusal whereupon the cedar column of the college split into one said it split because of my lot and the other said it split because of my lot if one finds documents in a small bag or in a case what is Hafiz Rabbi B. said a small bag what is Deluskam Rabbi Bar Samuel said a case used by old people a roll of documents or a bundle of documents. Etc. Our rabbis taught how many documents constitute a roll three roll together and how many constitute a bundle three tied together will you deduce from this that a knot is a distinguishing mark no for behold our high taught three roll together but if so this is the same as a roll a roll is made up of documents placed end to end and then roll together a bundle is made up of documents placed on the top of each other and then roll together what does the finder announce it? Number of documents found and why does the Mishnah mention three would not the same law apply also to two but as Rabbin says he announces that he found coins here also he announces that he found documents Rabbin Simeon B. Gamaliel says if they belong to one person who borrowed from three one shall return them to the borrower etc. For if you were to assume that they belong to the lenders how did they the documents come to be together but may not the lenders have gone with? Them to the clerk of the court to have them endorsed they were already endorsed but may they not have been dropped by the clerk who endorsed them people do not leave their endorsed documents with the clerk if they belong to three persons who borrowed from one lender one shall return them to the lender etc for if you were to assume that they belong to the borrowers how did they the documents come to be together but may not the persons mentioned in the documents as borrowers have gone to the same clerk to have them written they were written in three different handwritings but may not the borrowers have gone with them to the clerk of the court to have them endorsed the lender gets his document endorsed but not the borrower if there are notes of cancellation among them
Documents so here also it was found among torn documents come and here we swear that our father has not instructed us or said anything to us and that we have not found any note among his documents to the effect that this note of indebtedness has been paid our Safra answered if it is found among his torn documents come and here a note of cancellation which bears the signatures of witnesses must be corroborated by the signatory say it must be corroborated through the evidence of it. Signatories Talmud, Mas Babamitzia we ask the witnesses whether the debt is paid or not come and here a note of cancellation which bears the signatures of witnesses is valid the witnesses refer to our witnesses to the endorsement of the note by the court this is also conclusive for the final clause teaches but if it does not bear the signatures of witnesses it is invalid now what is the meaning of the words it does not bear the signatures of witnesses if I should say that it means that there are no signatures of witnesses on it at all is it necessary to say that is invalid therefore we must assume that they are witnesses to the endorsement of the note by the court the main text states a note of cancellation which bears the signatures of witnesses must be corroborated by the signatories but if it does not bear the signatures of witnesses and is produced by a third person or if it is found below the signatures of the notes of indebtedness it is valid if it is Produced by a third person, it is valid because the lender trusted the third person. If it is found below the signatures of the notes of indebtedness, it is also valid because if the debt had not been paid, the lender would not have invalidated the note. C H A P T E R I I Mishnah. Some fines belong to the finder, others must be announced. The following articles belong to the finder. If one finds scattered fruit, scattered money, small sheaves in a public thoroughfare round cakes oppressed, figs of baker's loaf, strings of fishes, pieces of meat, fleeces of wool which have been brought from the country, bundles of flax and stripes of purple colored wool, all these belong to the finder. This is the view of our Meir Arjuna says whatsoever has in it something unusual must be announced. As for instance, if one finds a round of figs containing a pot or a loaf containing money, our Simeon B. Eliezer says new merchandise need not be announced. Tomorrow, if one finds scattered fruit, etc. What? Quantity of fruit in a given space is meant or Isaac said a cab within four cubits but what kind of a case is meant if the fruit appears to have been dropped accidentally then even if there is more than a cab it should also belong to the finder and if it appears to have been deliberately put down then even if there is a smaller quantity it should not belong to the finder our Akbabi Hama answered we deal here with the remains of what has been gathered on the threshing floor to collect a cab scattered over a space of four cubits is troublesome and as people do not trouble to come back and collect it the owner also abandons it but if it is spread over a smaller space the owner does come back and collect it and he does not abandon it or Jeremiah inquired how is it if one finds half a cab scattered over the space of two cubits is the reason why a cab within four cubits belongs to the finder that it is troublesome to collect and therefore half a cab within Two cubits which is not troublesome to collect is not abandoned and should not belong to the finder or is the reason in the case of a cab within four cubits that it is not worth the trouble of collecting when spread over such a space and therefore half a cab within two cubits which is still less worth the trouble of collecting is abandoned and should belong to the finder again how is it if one finds two cabs scattered over the space of eight cubits is the reason why a cab within four cubits belongs to the finder that it is troublesome to collect and therefore two cabs within eight cubits which are still more troublesome to collect are even more readily abandoned and should certainly belong to the finder or is the reason in the case of a cab within four cubits that it is not worth the trouble of collecting and therefore two cabs within eight cubits which are worth the trouble of collecting are not abandoned and should not belong to the finder again how is it if one finds a cab of poppy seed scattered over a space of four cubits is the reason why a cab of fruit within four cubits belongs to the finder that it is not worth the trouble of collecting and therefore poppy seed which is worth the trouble of collecting is not abandoned and should not belong to the finder or is the reason in the case of a cab within four cubits that it is troublesome to collect and therefore poppy seed which is even more troublesome to collect is abandoned and should belong to the finder again how is it if one finds a cab of dates within four cubits or a cab of pomegranates within four cubits is the reason why a cab of ordinary fruit within four cubits belongs to the finder that it is not worth the trouble of collecting and therefore a cab of dates within four cubits or a cab of pomegranates within four cubits which also is not worth the trouble of collecting is abandoned and should belong to the finder or is the reason in the case of a cab within four cubits that it is troublesome to collect and therefore a cab of dates within four cubits or a cab of pomegranates within four cubits which are not troublesome to collect are not abandoned and should not belong to the finder the questions remain unanswered it has been stated Talmud, Mas Babamitzia be anticipated abandonment of the hope of recovering a lost article is Abe maintains no abandonment but Rabba maintains it is an abandonment if the lost article is a thing which has an identification mark all agree that the anticipation of its abandonment by the owner is no abandonment and even if in the end we hear him express regret at his loss in a way that makes it clear that he has abandoned it it is not deemed to be an abandonment for when the finder took possession of it he had no right to it because it is assumed that when the loser becomes aware that he lost it he will not give up the hope of recovering it but says to Himself, I can recognize it by an identification mark. I shall indicate the identification mark and shall take it back if the lost article is found in the intertidal space of the seashore or on ground that is flooded by a river. Then, even if it has an identification mark, the divine law permits the finder to acquire it, as we shall explain further on. They differ only where the article has no identification mark. Abe says it is no abandonment because the loser did not know that he lost it. Rabba says it is an abandonment because when he becomes aware that he lost it, he gives up the hope of recovering it, as he says to himself, I cannot recognize it by an identification mark. It is therefore as if he had given up hope from the moment he lost it. Mnemonic PMG SHMMKGTYKKSC come and here scattered fruit is not this a case where the loser did not know that he lost it. Our Bobby Hama has already explained that we deal here with the remains of what has been gathered on it. Threshing floor so that the owner is aware of his loss come and here scattered money etc belong to the finder why is it not a case where the loser did not know that he lost it there also it is even as our Isaac said a man usually feels for his purse at frequent intervals so here too we say a man usually feels for his purse at frequent intervals and soon discovers his loss come and here round cakes of pressed figs of baker's loaves etc belong to the finder why is it not a case where the loser did not know that he lost it there also he becomes aware of his loss because the lost articles are heavy come and here stripes of purple etc they belong to the finder why is it not a case where the loser did not know that he lost them there also he becomes aware of his loss because the articles are valuable and he frequently feels for them even as our Isaac said come and here if one finds money in a synagogue or in a house of study or in any other place where many people Congregate it belongs to him because the owner has given up the hope of recovering it is not this a case where the loser did not know that he lost it or Isaac answered people usually feel for their purse at frequent intervals come and here from what time are people allowed to appropriate the gleanings of a reap field after the gropers have gone through and whereupon we asked what is meant by the gropers and are you had answered old people who walk leaning on a stick while rush lakish answered the last in the succession of gleaners now why should this be so granted that the local poor give up hope of finding any gleanings there are poor people in other places who do not give up hope I will say seeing that there are local poor those in other places give up hope straight away as they say the poor of that place have already gleaned it come and here cut fix found on the road even if found beside a field covered with cut fix and also fix found under a fig tree that Overhangs the road may be appropriated by the finder without him being guilty of robbery and they are free from tithing but olives and carabines are forbidden now the first part of the mission implies no contradiction to Abe because cut fix being valuable are under constant observation whole fix also are known to drop but the last part of the mission which teaches that olives and carabines are forbidden implies a contradiction to rob our about answered olives are different from other fruit because one can recognize them by their appearance and although olives drop to the ground the place of each one is known but if so the same should apply to whole fix in the first part of the mission our papa answered fix become filthy when they drop to the ground come and here if a thief takes from one and gives to another or if a robber takes from one and gives to another Talmud, Mas Babamitzia or if the Jordan takes from one and gives to another then what has been taken is taken and what has been given is given now this
The knowledge of the owner the offering is valid if one goes down into a neighbor's field collects the produce and sets apart the heave offering without permission if the owner objects to the action and considers it robbery the offering is not valid but if not it is valid and how can one tell whether the owner considers it as robbery or not if the owner on arriving and finding the person in the field says to him you should have gone and taken the better kind of the produce for the heave offering the offering is valid if there is a better kind to be found in the field but if not it is not valid if the owner collected more of the produce and added it to the offering it is valid in any case thus we see that if there is a better kind in the field the offering is valid but is this so surely at the time when the offering was set apart the owner did not know it Rob explained it according to Abay the owner made him who set apart the offering as agent this is conclusive indeed for if you were to assume that he did not make him his agent how could the offering be valid did not the divine law instead of yes a also to include your agent as much as to say as you set apart your offerings with your own knowledge so must your agent set apart your offerings with your knowledge therefore we must deal here with a case where the owner made him his agent and said to him go and set apart the heave offering but did not say to him set it apart from this kind and usually an owner sets apart the heave offering from the medium kind but that other person went and set it apart from a better kind whereupon the owner arrived and finding him in the field said to him you should have gone and taken it from a still better kind in such a case the law is that if a better kind can be found in the field the offering is valid but if not it is not valid Amimar Marzitra and Arashi once entered the orchard of Mari B. Isaac whereupon his factor brought dates and pomegranates and offered them to the visitors Amimar and Arashi ate them but Marzitra did not eat them meanwhile Mari B. Isaac arrived and he found them he then said to his factor why did you not bring for the rabbi some of those better kinds of fruit whereupon Amimar and Arashi said to Marzitra why does the master not eat now has it not been taught if better ones can be found the offering is valid Marzitra answered them thus said rabbi you should have gone and taken Better ones has been declared to be a valid observation only in regard to a heave offering because it is the fulfillment of a divine command and he really wishes to offer better ones but here he may have said it out of courtesy come and here if the dew is still upon them and the owner is pleased then the scriptural term if water be put upon the seed applies to it if it turned dry then even if the owner is pleased that the dew came upon it at first Talmud, Mas Babamitia be the term. If water be put upon the seed does not apply to it is not the reason for this ruling that we do not say because it appears that he is pleased now it is as if he had been pleased originally there it is different it is written if one puts which means only when he puts the water on but if so this should apply also to the first case that can be explained according to our Papa for our Papa pointed out a contradiction it is written if one puts and we read if it be put how is it to be? Explain being put must be like putting as putting can only be done with the knowledge of him who put so being put must happen with the knowledge of the person concerned come and hear our Yohanan said in the name of our Ishmael B.J. Hosea Dakwins do we learn that an article lost through the flooding of a river may be retained by the finder it is written and so shalt thou do with his ass and so shalt thou do with his garment and so shalt thou do with every lost thing of thy brothers which he hath lost and thou hast found which means to say that only if the object has been lost to him and may be found by any person has it to be returned to him and it follows that a case like this is exempt from the biblical law since it is lost to him and cannot be found by any person moreover the object which is forbidden to be kept by the finder is like the object which is permitted to be kept by the finder just as the permitted object may be kept irrespective of whether it has an Identification mark or not so the forbidden object may not be kept irrespective of whether it has an identification mark or not this is a complete refutation of Rabbah and the law is in accordance with Abay in the cases indicated by the initials while KGM Araha the son of Rabbah said to Arashi seeing that Rabbah has been refuted how is it that we eat dates that have been shaken down from the tree by the wind Arashi answered him the owner gives them up straight away because there are vermin and creeping creatures that eat them but what if they belong to orphans who are minors and cannot legally renounce their possessions Arashi answered him we do not assume that every piece of ground is the property of orphans but what if it is known to be the property of orphans or if the tree is surrounded by a fence Arashi answered him and they are forbidden small sheep in a public thoroughfare belong to the finder Rabbah said even when they have an identification mark Consequently, it must be assumed that Rabbah is of the opinion that an identification mark which is liable to be trodden on is not deemed to be an identification mark. Rabbah said, on the other hand, the mission refers only to things which have no identification mark, but things which have an identification mark have to be announced. Consequently, it must be assumed that Rabbah is of the opinion that an identification mark that is liable to be trodden on is deemed to be an identification mark. Some teach this as an independent controversy in regard to an identification mark which is liable to be trodden on. Rabbah says that it is not deemed to be an identification mark, but Rabbah says that it is deemed to be an identification mark. We have learned small sheep which are found in a public thoroughfare belong to the finder, but if found on private grounds, they have to be taken up and announced. How is this to be understood if the sheep have no identification mark? What is there? To be announced if they are found on private grounds it must therefore be that they have an identification mark and still it is stated that if found in a public thoroughfare they belong to the finder consequently it must be assumed that an identification mark which is liable to be trodden on is not deemed to be an identification mark which is a refutation of Rabba Rabba may answer you in reality they have no identification mark and as to your question what is there to be announced if they were found on private grounds the answer is the place where they were found is announced but Rabba says that the place is no identification mark for it has been stated in regard to the place Rabba says it is not considered an identification mark but Rabba says it is an identification mark come and hear small sheets which are found in a public thoroughfare belong to the finder but if found on private grounds they have to be taken up and announced big sheets however whether they are found in a public thoroughfare or are found on private grounds have to be taken up and announced. How does Rabbi explain it and how does Rabbi explain it? Rabbi explains it according to his view by the identification mark. Rabbi explains it according to his view by the place. Rabbi explains it according to his view by the identification mark. And the reason why small sheets found in a public thoroughfare belong to the finder is that Talmud, Mas Baba Metzia, they are trodden. On while on private grounds the finder has to take them up and announce them because there they are not trodden on big sheets. However, whether they are found in a public thoroughfare or on private grounds the finder has to take up and announce because being raised one does not tread on them. Rabbi again explains it according to his view by the place. And the reason why small sheets found in a public thoroughfare belong to the finder is that they are pushed along while on private. Grounds the finder has to announce them because they are not pushed along big sheets however whether they are found in a public thoroughfare or on private grounds the finder has to take up and announce because being many they are not pushed along come and here baker's loaves etc belong to the finder but homemade loaves have to be announced now what is the reason in the case of homemade loaves obviously that they have an identification mark and one can tell that the bread belongs to this person or that person and no matter whether they are found in a public thoroughfare or on private grounds the finder has to take them up and announce them it therefore follows that an identification mark which is likely to be trodden on is a valid mark which is a refutation of rabba rabba will answer you there the reason is that one may not pass by eatables but there are heathens heathens do not pass by eatables because they are afraid of witchcraft but are there not cattle and dogs the Mishnah speaks of places where cattle and dogs are not frequent are we to maintain that this difference of opinion between Rabbah and Rabbah is the same as the following difference between the ten name of our Mishnah our Judah says whatsoever has in it something unusual must be announced as for instance if one finds a round of fix containing a pot's herd or a loaf containing money this implies that the first ten of the Mishnah holds that these articles belong to the finder. In spite of their unusual feature now the prevalent opinion was then that all would agree that an identification mark which might have come of itself was a valid mark and that one might pass by eatables it must therefore be assumed that the ten name differ regarding an identification mark which is likely to be trodden on one holds that it is not a valid mark and the other holds that it is a valid mark Arzibid replied in the name of Rabbah if you assume that the first ten of the Mishnah is of the opinion that an identification mark which is likely to be trodden on is not a valid mark and that one may pass by eatables why should one have to announce the finding of homemade loaves therefore our said in the name of Rabbah that
Rabba, if you assume that the first tana holds that an identification mark which is likely to be trodden on is not a valid mark and that one may pass by eatables, why should one have to announce the finding of homemade loaves? Therefore, our said in the name of Rabba that all are of the opinion that an identification mark which is likely to be trodden on is a valid mark and that one may pass by eatables, but here in our mission the tanaim differ regarding an identification mark which may have come of itself. The first tana being of the opinion that an identification mark which may have come of itself is not a valid mark and our Judah being of the opinion that it is a valid mark, Rabba on the other hand will tell you that all agree that an identification mark which is likely to be trodden on is not a valid mark and that one may not pass by eatables, but that the tanaim differ here regarding a mark which may have come of itself. The first tana being of the opinion that an Identification mark which may have come of itself is not a valid mark and Arjuta being of the opinion that it is a valid mark Arzibit said in the name of Rabba the general principle in regard to a loss is if the loser has said woe I have sustained a monetary loss he has given it up Arzibit also said in the name of Rabba the law is small sheets if found in a public thoroughfare belong to the finder if found on private grounds they belong to the finder when discovered in the position of things dropped accidentally but if found in the position of things laid down deliberately the finder has to take them up and announce them both rulings apply only to a case where the lost article has no identification mark but in a case where the lost article has an identification mark it has to be announced irrespective of whether it has been found in the position of things dropped accidentally or whether it has been found in the position of things laid down deliberately Talmud, Mas Baba Mitzia B and strings of fishes why do they belong to the finder should not the knot serve as an identification mark the mission speaks of a fisherman's knot which is tied so universally but should not the number of fishes on the string serve as a distinguishing mark the mission speaks of a fixed number of fishes Arshis hate was asked is the number a distinguishing mark or not Arshis hate answered you have learned it if one finds a vessel of silver or copper or tin of lead or any other kind of metal one shall not return it unless the loser indicates a mark or unless he states accurately its weight and seeing that weight is an identification mark measurement and number are also to be deemed identification marks and pieces of meat etc why do they belong to the finder should not the weight serve as a distinguishing mark the mission speaks of a fixed weight but should not the piece itself whether it be of the neck or of the loin serve as an Identification mark has it not been taught if one finds pieces of fish or a fish which has been bitten into one has to announce the fine barrels of wine, oil, corn, dry figs or olives belong to the finder. Here we deal with the case where there is an identification mark in the cut. Thus, Rabbi son of Arhu now used to cut pieces of meat in the shape of a triangle. There is also a proof for this, for he mentions cut pieces as if they were like the fish which has been bitten into. This is conclusive. The master said, as quoted above, barrels of wine, oil, corn, dry figs or olives belong to the finder. But have we not learned jars of wine and jars of oil have to be announced? Our Zara answered in the name of Rabbi Mishnah deals with sealed barrels. It must thus be assumed that the berry that deals with open barrels, but open barrels constitute a deliberate loss. Our Jose answered it deals with barrels which have been stopped up. Abbe says you may even say that both the Mishnah and the Bury the deal with sealed barrels, yet there is no contradiction here. The law refers to the time before the opening of the cellars, there it refers to the time after the opening of the cellars. Thus, our Jacob B. Abba found a barrel of wine after the opening of the cellars, and when he appeared before Abbe, the latter said to him, Go and take it for yourself. Or BB asked of Arnaman, Is the place where an article is found an identification mark or not? Arnaman answered him, You have learned it. If one finds barrels of wine or of oil or of corn or of dry figs or of olives, they belong to him now. If you were to assume that the place where an article is found is an identification mark, the finder ought to announce the place. Arzibit answered, Here we deal with barrels found on the riverbank. Armari said, For what reason did the rabbis maintain that the riverbank does not constitute an identification mark? Because we say to him, As it happened to you, so it may have happened to your. Neighbor, some have another version. Armari said, For what reason did the rabbis maintain that the place constitutes no identification mark? Because we say to him, As it happened to you in this place, so it may have happened to your neighbor in the same place. Once a man found some pitch in a wine press, so he appeared before Rab, and the latter said to him, Go and take it for yourself. When Rab saw that he hesitated to do so, he said to him, Go and share it with my son. Hi, shall we then say that? Rab is of the opinion that the place where an article is found does not constitute an identification mark. Arab answered, It was appropriated because it was deemed to have been abandoned by the owners, as it was seen that weeds had grown upon it. Our Simeon B. Eliezer says, etc. What is meant by inferior Rab Judah said in the name of Samuel, new vessels which one's eye has not yet sufficiently noted in what circumstances if there is on them an identification mark, what does it matter if the eye has? Not yet sufficiently noted them if there is no identification mark on them what does it matter if the eye has sufficiently noted them admittedly there is no identification mark on them but the point as explained by Rab Judah is important in regard to the question whether the lost vessels should be returned to a claimant who is a learned man and who recognizes the vessels by sight if it is a case where the eye has sufficiently noted the lost vessels he is sure to know them and we give them back to him but in a case where the eye has not sufficiently noted them he cannot be sure to know them and we do not give them back to him for Rab Judah said in the name of Samuel in the following three matters learned men do conceal the truth in matters of a tractate bed Talmud, Mas Baba Mitzia, hospitality what is the point in this observation Marzutra said it is important in regard to the question of returning a lost article recognized by sight if we know that the Claimant conceals the truth in those three matters only we give it back to him but if he does not speak the truth also in other matters we do not give it back to him. Marzitra the pious once had a silver vessel stolen from him in the hospice when he saw a disciple wash his hands and dry them on someone else's garment he said this is the person who stole the vessel as he has no consideration for the property of his neighbor the disciple was then bound and he confessed it has been taught R. Simeon B. Eliezer admits that new vessels which the eye has sufficiently noted have to be announced and the following new vessels which the eye has not sufficiently noted have not to be announced such as poles of needles knitting needles and bundles of axes all these objects mentioned above are permitted only if they are found singly but if found in twos one must announce them what are bad poles rods and why are they called bad poles because an object on which things hang is called bad. As is stated there one leaf on one branch bad are Simeon B. Eliezer also said if one rescues anything from a lion, a bear, a leopard, a panther or from the tide of the sea or from the flood of a river or if one finds anything on the high road or in a broad square or in any place where crowds are frequent it belongs to the finder because the owner has given it up the question was asked did Arsimian B. Eliezer say this with regard to things found in places where the majority of the people are heathens but not where the majority are Israelites or did he say this also with regard to things found in places where the majority are Israelites and if you come to the conclusion that he said this also where the majority are Israelites do the rabbis differ from him or not and if you come to the conclusion that they differ from him they would certainly differ where the majority are Israelites do they differ where the majority are heathens or not and if you come to the conclusion that they differ even where the majority are heathens is the law in accordance with his view or not and if you come to the conclusion that the law is in accordance with his view does this apply only to the case where the majority are heathens or also to the case where the majority are Israelites come and here if one finds money in a synagogue or a house of study or in any other place where crowds are frequent it belongs to the finder because the owner has given it up now who is the authority that lays it down that we go according to the majority if not our Simeon B. Eliezer you must therefore conclude that he applies this principle also to a case where the majority are Israelites here we deal with a case where the money found was scattered but if the money was scattered why refer to places where crowds are frequent it would apply also to places where crowds are not frequent admittedly therefore the reference is to money found in bundles but we deal here with synagogues of Heathens, but how can this be applied to houses of study? The reference is to our houses of study in which heathens stay now that you have arrived at this conclusion. The reference to synagogues can also be explained as meaning our synagogues in which heathens stay come and here. If one finds there in a lost object, then if the majority are Israelites, it has to be announced. But if the majority are heathens, it has not to be announced. Now, who is the authority that
and which the owner unexpectedly decided to clear away Talmud, Mas Baba Metziah B Talmud, Mas Baba Metziah B and if you wish I will say admittedly this is the view of the rabbis but is it stated they belong to the finder it merely says he has not to announce the meaning that he lets it lie and when an Israelite comes and indicates an identification mark and if he receives it come and your RC said if one finds a barrel of wine in a town where the majority are heathens he is permitted to keep it as a fine but he is forbidden to derive any benefit from it if an Israelite comes and indicates an identification mark in it the finder is permitted to drink it now this is obviously in accordance with the view of our Simeon B. Eliezer it therefore follows that our Simeon B. Eliezer only says this where the majority are heathens but not where the majority are Israelites no in reality I will tell you our Simeon B. Eliezer says this also where the majority are Israelites but RC agrees with him in the one case but differs from him in the other case but if the finder is forbidden to derive any benefit from the barrel of wine what purpose does Allah serve by permitting him to keep it or as she answered in regard to the vessel a certain man once found four zoos which had been tied up in a cloth and thrown into the river Byron when he appeared before Rab Judah the latter said to him go and announce it but is not this like retrieving an object from the tide of the sea it. River Byron is different as it contains obstacles the owner does not give up hope but does not the majority consist of heathens hence it must be concluded that the Halachah is not in accordance with our Simeon B. Eliezer even where the majority are heathens the position in regard to the River Byron is different for Israelites dam it up and Israelites dredge it as Israelites dam it up it may be assumed that an Israelite dropped the coins and as Israelites dredge it the loser did not give them up Rab Judah once followed Mar Samuel into a street of wholemeal vendors and he asked him what if one found here a purse Mar Samuel answered it would belong to the finder what if an Israelite came and indicated an identification mark Mar Samuel answered he would have to return it both Mar Samuel answered he should go beyond the requirements of the law thus the father of Samuel found some asses in a desert and he returned them to their owner after a year of twelve months he went. Beyond the requirements of the Lorabah once followed Arnaman into a street of Skinner some say into a street of scholars and he asked him what if one found here a purse Arnaman answered it would belong to the finder what if an Israelite came and indicated its identification mark Arnaman answered it would still belong to the finder but that one keeps protesting it is as if one protested against his house collapsing or against his ship sinking in the sea once a vulture sees a piece of meat in the market and dropped it among the palm trees belonging to Barmeri and when the latter appeared before Abbe he said to him go and take it for yourself now the majority in that case consisted of Israelites hence it must be concluded that the Halachah is in accordance with our Simeon B. Eliezer even where the majority are Israelites the position in regard to a vulture is different for it is like the tide of the sea but did not rap say that meat which has disappeared from Side is forbidden he stood by and watched it our Hannibal once found a slaughtered kid between Tiberius and Sephoris and he was permitted to appropriate it or am I said he was permitted to appropriate it as a find according to our Simeon B. Eliezer and as regards the method of slaughter it was deemed proper according to our Hanania the son of our Jose the Galilean for it has been taught if one lost his kids or chickens and subsequently found them slaughtered our Judah forbids them and our Hanania. The son of our Jose the Galilean permits them to be eaten Rabbi said the words of our Judah seem right in a case where the lost kids or chickens were found on a dung heap while the words of our Hanania the son of our Jose the Galilean seem right when they were found in a house now seeing that they were permitted in regard to the method of slaughter the majority must have consisted of Israelites hence it must be concluded that the Halachah is according to our Simeon B. Eliezer even where the majority. Our Israelites robber replied that was a case where the majority of the inhabitants were heathens and the majority of the slaughterers were Israelites RMI once found some slaughtered pigeons between Tiberius and Sephoris when he appeared before RC some say before our Yohanan others again say in the house of study he was told go and take them for yourself or Isaac the blacksmith once found some balls of string which were used for making nets when he appeared before our Yohanan some say in the house of study he was told go and take them for yourself mission the following objects have to be proclaimed if one finds fruit in a vessel or a vessel by itself money in a purse or a purse by itself heaps of fruit heaps of coins Talmud, Mas Baba Metziah three coins on the top of each other bundles of sheep's in private premises homemade loaves fleeces of wool from the craftsman's workshop jars of wine or jars of oil they have to be proclaimed Kamara obviously it is only when Fruit is found in a vessel or money in the purse that they have to be proclaimed but if the fruit is in front of the vessel or the money in front of the purse they belong to the finder our mission thus teaches the same as our rabbis taught in another place if one finds fruit lying in front of a vessel or money in front of the purse they belong to the finder if the fruit is partly in the vessel and partly on the ground or if the money is partly in the purse and partly on the ground they have to be proclaimed but the following contradicts it if a man found an object lacking an identification mark at the side of an object possessing it he is bound to proclaim them if the identifier of the mark came and took his own the other sc the finder is entitled to the object without a mark said rz but there is no difficulty the former berry refers to a cask and flax the latter to a basket and fruit our papa said both refer to a basket and fruit yet there is no difficulty the Latter bury the holds good if something was still left there in the former if nothing was left there in alternately both bury this mean that nothing is left there and yet there is no difficulty in the latter it's sc the basket's mouth is turned towards the fruit in the former it is not another alternative in both its mouth faces the fruit yet there is no difficulty the former bury the treats of baskets with rims the latter of the baskets without heaps of fruit heaps of coins this proves that number is an identification mark no read a heap of fruit and it proves that place is a means of identification no read heaps of fruit three coins on top of each other are Isaac said provided that they lie pyramid wise it has been taught likewise if a man finds scattered coins they belong to him if they are arranged pyramid wise he is bound to proclaim them now is not this self-contradictory first you state if a man finds scattered coins they belong to him thus implying but if they overlap he must proclaim them and consider the latter clause if they are arranged pyramid wise he is bound to proclaim them implying however that if they merely overlap they are his all coins not arranged conically the tana designates scattered Arhanna said this was taught only of coins of three kings but if of one king he need not proclaim them how so if they lie pyramid wise then even if they are of one king the proclamation should be made if they do not lie pyramid wise even if they are of three kings there should be no need to proclaim them but if stated it was thus stated this was taught only of coins of one king yet similar to those of three how so when they lie pyramid the broadest at the bottom the medium sized upon it and the smallest on top of the middle one in which case we assume that they were placed thus if however they are of one king all being of equal size then even if they are lying upon each other they belong to him the finder we assume that they Fell thus together by mere chance or Yohanan however maintained even if of the same king he must proclaim them now what does he proclaim the number then why particularly three even if two it should be the same said Rabbana he announces coins are Jeremiah propounded what if they were disposed in a circle in a row triangularly or laterwise solve at least one problem for Arnaman said in Rabbi Abba's name wherever a chip can be inserted whereby the coins may be lifted. Simultaneously a proclamation must be made Arashi propounded Talmud, Mas Baba Metziah what if they are arranged as the stones of a Merkulis Waymark come and here for it has been taught if one finds scattered coins they belong to him but if they lay as the stones of a Merkulis Waymark he must proclaim them and thus are the stones of a Merkulis Waymark arranged one at each side and a third on top of both our rabbis taught if one finds a seller in the marketplace and then his neighbor. Accost him and says it is mine it is new a coin or of such and such an emperor he is ignored moreover even if his name is written upon it his claim is still rejected because an identification mark is of no avail in respect to a coin for one can say he may have expended it and someone else lost admission if a man finds fledglings tied together behind a fence or wall or in the pathways through fields he must not touch them if a man finds a vessel in a dung heap if covered up he must not touch it if uncovered he must take and proclaim it tomorrow what is the reason because we say a person hid them here and if he the finder takes them their owner has no means of identifying them therefore he must leave them until their owner comes and takes them but why let them not be a means of
refers to a dung heap that is regularly cleared away, the other to one that is not cleared away regularly, a dung heap which is regularly cleared away, but then it is a voluntary loss, but it refers to a dung heap which was not regularly cleared away, but he its owner decided to clear it out now. As for our papa, it is well on that account it is stated because it is the nature of a dunghill to be cleared away, but according to our zebad, what is meant by because it is the nature of a dunghill to be cleared away this because it is the nature of a dunghill that small articles should be cleared therein mission if he finds an article amidst debris or in an old wall they belong to him if he finds hot in a new wall if in the outer half thereof it is his in the inner half it belongs to the owner of the house but if it the house used to be rented to others even if he finds articles in the house itself they belong to him Amara Atanita because he the finder can say to him they belong to Amorites do then only Amorites hide objects and not Israelites this holds good only Talmud, Mas Babamitzia if it the find is exceedingly rusty in a new wall if in the outer half thereof it is his in the inner half it belongs to the owner of the house or as she said a knife follows its handle and a purse its straps then when our mission states if in the outer half thereof it is his in the inner half it belongs to the owner of the house let us see whether the handle or the Straps point outwards or inwards. The mission refers to cotton and bar metal. A tanned if the wall cavity was filled there with the divide, but is that not obvious? It is necessary to state this only when if the cavity or the wall slopes to one side. I might have thought that if the article found there had slid down, therefore we are taught otherwise. But if it the house used to be rented to others, even if one finds articles in the house itself, they belong to him. Why so left? It be assigned to the last tenant. Did we not learn money found in front of cattle dealers at all times is accounted as tithe on the temple mount? It is hollen in the rest of Jerusalem. At any other part of the year, it is hollen at the festival season. It is tithe and our shimei of Zeira observed thereon. What is the reason? Because the streets of Jerusalem were swept daily. This proves that we assume the earlier losses have gone and these coins are different ones. So here too the earlier. Deposits have gone and these belong to the last tenant said Rush Lakish on the authority of Barkabra it means e.g. that he the owner of the house had let it as a temporary lodging to three people simultaneously then you may infer that the Halacha agrees with our Simeon B. Eliezer even in respect to a multitude of Israelites but said our Manasseh B. Jacob it means e.g. that he had let it as a temporary lodging to three Gentiles are and said in Rabbi Abba's name it may even refer to three Jews what then is the reason it is because the man who lost it despairs thereof arguing thus let us see no other person but these was with me now I have many times mentioned it in their presence so that they should return it to me but they did not do so will they now return it had they intended to return it they would have returned it to me hence the reason of their not returning it to me is that they intend stealing it now our and follows his general reasoning for our and said Person sees a cell Talmud, Mas Babamitia befall from one of two people who are together, he must return it. What is the reason he who dropped it does not despair thereof, for he argues, Let us see no other person, but this one was with me, then I will seize him and say to him, You did take it, but in the case of three, he need not return it. What is the reason? Because he who dropped it certainly abandons it, arguing to himself, Let us see there were two with me. If I accuse the one, he will deny it, and if I accuse the other, he will deny it. Rabbi said, As for your ruling, that in the case of three, he need not return it, that holds good only if it the coin loss lacks the value of a parata for each of the three, but if it contains the equivalent of a parata for each person, he is bound to return it. What is the reason they may be partners, and therefore do not abandon it? Other state, Rabbi said, Even if it is worth only two parutas, he must return it. What is the reason they may have been partners? And one renounced his portion in the owner's favor. Rabbi also said, If a man sees a cell fall, if he takes it before abandonment, intending to appropriate it, he transgresses all the following injunctions: Thou shalt not rob, thou shalt restore them, and thou mayest not hide thyself. And even if he returns it after abandonment, he merely makes him a loser a gift. Whilst the offense he has committed stands, if he picks it up before abandonment, intending to return it, but after abandonment decides to appropriate it, he violates the injunction: Thou shalt restore them. If he waits until the owner despairs thereof and then takes it, he transgresses only: Thou mayest not hide thyself. Rabbi also said, If a man sees his neighbor drop a zoo in sand and then finds and takes it, he is not bound to return it. Why he from whom it fell abandons it? And even if he is seen to bring a sieve and sip the sand, he may merely be reasoning: Just as I dropped something, so may another have lost an article, and I will. Find admission if a man finds an article in a shop it belongs to him between the counter and the shopkeeper as seed to the shopkeeper if he finds it in front of a money changer it belongs to him the finder between the stool and the money changer to the money changer if one buys produce from his neighbor or if his neighbor sends him produce and he finds money therein it is his but if they, the coins are tied up he must take and proclaim them Gemara our Eliezer said even if they, the articles found are lying on the money changer's table they belong to the finder we learned if he finds it in front of a money changer it belongs to him this implies but if it was on the table it belongs to the money changer then consider the second clause between the stool and the money changer to the money changer implying but if on the table it is his the finders but in truth no inference can be drawn from this and whence does our Eliezer know this said Rabbi Presented to him a difficulty why teach particularly between the stool and the money changer it belongs to the money changer let it stay on the table or if one finds an article in the money changer's shop just as the first class teaches if one finds an article in a shop it belongs to him hence it must follow that even if it lay on the table it is his if one buys produce from his neighbor etc. Resh Lakish said on Arjane's authority this refers only Talmud, Mas Babamitzia to one who purchases from a merchant but if one buys from a private individual he is bound to return the coins and Atana recited likewise before Arnaman this refers only to one who purchases from a merchant but if from a private individual he is bound to return the coins thereupon Arnaman observed to him did then the private individual thresh the grain himself shall I then delete it he inquired no he replied interpret the teaching of one who threshed the grain by his heathen slaves and Bunt's women mission and now the garment too was included in all these why then was it singled out that an analogy might be drawn there with teaching just as a garment is distinguished and that it bears identification marks and is claimed so must everything be announced if it bears identification marks and is claimed tomorrow what is meant by in all these said Rabbah in the general phrase and in like manner shalt thou do with every lost article of thy brother Rabbah said why should the divine law have enumerated ox ash sheep and garment they are all necessary for had the divine law mentioned garment alone I would have thought that is only if the object itself can be attested or the object itself bears marks of identification but in the case of an ass if its saddle is attested or its saddle bears marks of identification I might think that it is not returned to him therefore the divine law wrote as to shoe that even the ass too is returned in virtue of the identification of its saddle for what purpose did the divine law mention ox and sheep ox that even the shearing of its tail and sheep that even its shearings must be returned and the divine law should have mentioned ox to shoe that even the shearing of its tail must be returned from which the shearings of a sheep would follow a fortiori but said Rabbah as mentioned in connection with the pit on our Judah's view and sheep in connection with the lost article on all views are unanswerable difficulties but why not assume that it comes to teach that the dung too must be returned the ownership of dung is renounced but perhaps its purpose is to teach the law of identification marks for it is a problem to us whether identification marks are biblically valid as a means of proving ownership or only by rabbinical law therefore scripture wrote sheep to shoe that it must be returned even on the strength of identification marks thus proving that these are biblically valid I will tell you since the tanner refers to Identification marks in connection with garment for he teaches just as a garment is distinguished in that it bears identification marks and is claimed so must everything be announced if it bears identification marks and is claimed it follows that the purpose of sheep is not to teach the validity of identification marks our rabbis taught and so shalt thou do with all lost things of thy brothers which shall be lost to him this excludes a lost article worth less than a parata our Judah said and thou hast found it this excludes a lost article worth less than a parata wherein do they differ said obey they differ as to the texts from which the law is derived one master deduces it from which shall be lost to him the other from and thou hast found it now he who derives it from which shall be lost to him how does he employ and thou hast found it he requires it for
According to him who deduces it from and thou hast found it there is not a find of a parita now he who emphasizes which shall be lost surely and thou hast found it must also be applicable which is not the case here but they differ in respect of an article now worth a parita having appreciated on the view that it is deduced from and thou hast found it there is a find of a parita whereas according to him who deduces it from which shall be lost there is not the loss of a parita. Now he who emphasizes and thou hast found it surely which shall be lost must also be applicable which is not the case here but they differ in respect of an article worth a parita which fell and then rose in value again on the view that it is derived from which shall be lost there is a loss of a parita but according to the opinion that it is inferred from and thou hast found it it must have had the standard of a find from the time of being lost until found the scholars propounded are. Identification marks legally valid by biblical or merely by rabbinical law. What is the practical difference? Talmud, Mas Bagometsia B. In respect of returning a woman's divorce on the strength of identification marks, should you say that they are biblically valid? We return it, but if only by rabbinical law, the rabbis enacted this measure for civil matters only, not for ritual prohibitions. Come and here now, the garment too was included in all these. Why then was it singled out that an analogy might be drawn there with teaching just as a garment is distinguished in that it bears identification marks and is claimed? So must everything be announced if it bears identification marks and is claimed? The tanner really desires to teach that there must be a claimant. Identification marks are mentioned only incidentally. Come and here, therefore, scripture wrote as to shoot that even the as to is returned in virtue of the identification marks of its saddle read in virtue of the witnesses. Attesting to the ownership of its saddle, come and here and it sc the article found shall be with thee until thy brother seek after it and thou shalt return it to him. Now would it then have occurred to thee that he should return it to him before he sought after it? But it means this examine him the claimant whether he be a fraud or not, surely that is by means of identification marks. No, by means of witnesses come and here testimony may be given only on proof afforded by the face with. The nose, even if the body and the garment bear identification marks, this proves that identification marks are not biblically valid. I will tell you in respect to the body, the proposed identification marks were that it was short or long, whilst those of his garments are rejected because we fear borrowing. But if we fear borrowing, why is an ass returned because of the identification of the saddle? I will tell you people do not borrow a saddle because it chafes the ass back. Alternatively, the Garments were identified through being white or red, then what of that which was taught if he found it tied up in the purse money bag or to a ring, or if he found it amongst his household utensils even a long time afterwards it is valid. Now should you think we fear borrowing if he found it tied up in his purse, etc. Why is it valid? Let us fear borrowing. I will tell you a purse wallet and signet ring are not lent a purse and a money bag because people are superstitious about it a signet ring. Because one can commit forgery there, which shall we say that this is disputed by Tanaim for it was taught testimony may not be given on the strength of a mole, but Eliezer B. Mahabai said testimony may be so given, surely then they differ in this. The first Tana holds that identification marks are only rabbinically valid, whilst Eliezer B. Mahabai holds that they are biblically valid, said Rabbi all may agree that they are biblically valid, they differ here as to whether a mole is to be found on. One's affinity one master maintains that a mole is generally found on a person's affinity whilst the other holds that it is not alternatively all agree that it is not they differ here as to whether identification marks are liable to change after death one master maintains identification marks are liable to change after death the other that they are not alternatively all agree that a mole is not liable to change after death and identification marks are valid only by rabbinical law they differ here as to whether a mole is a perfect mark of identification one master maintains that a mole is a perfect mark of identification whilst the other holds that it is not Rabbi said if you should resolve that identification marks are not biblically valid why do we return a lost article in reliance on these marks because one who finds a lost article is pleased that it should be returned on the strength of identification marks so that should he lose anything it will likewise be returned to him through marks of identification said our Safra to Rabbi can then one confer a benefit upon himself with money that does not belong to him but the reason is this the loser himself is pleased to offer identification marks and take it back he knows full well that he has no witnesses therefore he argues to himself everyone does not know its perfect identification marks but I can state its perfect identification marks and take it back but what of that which we learned our Simeon B. Gamaliel said if it was one man who had borrowed from three he the finder must return them to the debtor if three had borrowed from one he must return them to the creditor is then the debtor pleased that if the promissory note is returned to the creditor in that instance he replied to him it is a matter of logic if it was one man who had borrowed from three he must return them to the debtor because they are to be found together in the debtor's possession but not in the creditor's hence the debtor must have dropped it if three had borrowed from one it must be returned to the creditor because they are to be found in the creditor's possession but not in the debtor's talmud, mas babamitzia but what of that which we learned if one finds a roll of notes or a bundle of notes he must surrender them here too is then the reason because the debtor is pleased that they should be returned to the creditor but said rabbi identification marks are biblically valid because it is written and it shall be with thee until thy brother seek after it now would it then have occurred to you that he should return it to him before he sought it but it means this examine him the claimant whether he be a fraud or not surely that is by means of identification marks that proves it rabbi said should you resolve that identification marks are biblically valid should you resolve but he has proved that they are biblically valid that is because it can be explained as was answered above if two sets of Identification marks are offered by two conflicting claimants. If the lost article must be left in custody, if one state's identification marks and another produces witnesses, if the lost article must be surrendered to him who has witnesses, if one state's identification marks and another also state's identification marks and produces one witness, one witness is as non existent, and so it must be left if one produces witnesses of weaving and another witnesses of dropping, it must be given to the latter because we are you, he the first may have sold and another lost it. If one state's its length and another its breadth, it must be given to him who states its length because it is possible to conjecture the breadth when its owner is standing and wearing it, whereas the length cannot be well conjectured. If one state's its length and breadth and another its comes, it must be surrendered to the former if the length, breadth, and weight are stated by different claimants. It must be given to him who states its weight if he the husband states the identification marks of a bill of divorce and she does likewise it must be given to her wherewith is it identified shall we say by its length and breadth perhaps she saw it whilst he was holding it but it had a perforation at the side of a certain letter if he identifies the ribbon with which the divorce was tied and she does likewise it must be given to her wherewith is it identified shall we say by its color white or red perhaps she saw it whilst he was holding it hence by its length if he states it was found in a valise and she states likewise it must be surrendered to him why she knows full well that he places whatever he has of his documents in a valise mission now until when is he the finder obliged to proclaim it until his neighbors may know thereof this is our mayor's view our judah maintained until three festivals have passed and an additional seven days after the last festival giving Three days for going home, three days for returning, and one day for announcing Gamara eight taught the neighbors of the loss are referred to in the mission. What is the meaning of the neighbors of the loss? Shall we say the neighbors of the loser? But if they know him who lost it, let them go and return it to him. But it means the neighbors of the vicinity wherein the lost article was found are Judah maintained, etc. But the following contradicts this on the third day of Markishman. We commence to pray for rain. Our Gamaliel said on the seventh, which is fifteen days after the festival, so that the last of the pilgrims in Eretz Israel can reach the river Euphrates. Said our Joseph, there is no difficulty. The latter refers to the days of the first temple, the former SC, our mission to the second during the first temple when the Israelites were extremely numerous, as it is written of them, Judah and Israel were many as the sand which is by the sea in multitude, such a long period was. Required, but during the second temple, when the Israelites were not very numerous, as it is written of them, the whole congregation together was forty and two thousand three hundred and three score. Such a long time was unnecessary. Thereupon have they protested to him, but is it not written? So the priests and the levites and the porters and the singers and some of the people and the Nathanims and all Israel dwelt in their cities. And that being so, the logic is the reverse. During the first temple, when the Israelites were very numerous, the people united for traveling purposes and caravan companies were to be found traveling day and night. So long a period was
Unreasonable trouble in respect of a lost article our rabbis taught at the first festival of proclamation it was announced this is the first festival at the second festival it was announced this is the second festival but at the third a simple announcement was made why so let him announce it is the third festival so that it should not be mistaken for the second but the second to Talmud, Mas Baba Matiyah B1 might mistake for the first in any case the third is still to come our rabbis. Taught in former times whoever found a lost article used to proclaim it during the three festivals and an additional seven days after the last festival three days for going home another three for returning and one for announcing after the destruction of the temple may it be speedily rebuilt in our own days it was enacted that the proclamation should be made in the synagogues and schoolhouses but when the oppressors increased it was enacted that one's neighbors and acquaintances should be informed and that sufficed what is meant by when the oppressors increased they insisted that lost property belonged to the king rmi found a purse of denarii I now a certain man saw him displaying fear whereupon he reassured him go take it for thyself we are not persians who rule that lost property belongs to the king our rabbis taught there was a stone of claims in jerusalem whoever lost an article repaired thither and whoever found an article did likewise the latter stood and proclaimed and the former submitted his identification marks and received it back and in reference to this we learned go forth and see whether the stone of claims is covered Mishnah if he the claimant states the article lost but not its identification marks it must not be surrendered to him but if he is a cheat even if he states its marks of identification it must not be given up to him because it is written and it shall be with thee until the seeking of thy brother after it meaning until thou hast Examine thy brother whether he be a cheat or not. Gemara, it has been stated. Rab Judah said he proclaims I have found a lost article. Arnaman said he proclaims I have found a garment. Rab Judah said he proclaims a lost article. For should you say that he proclaims a garment, we are afraid of cheats. Arnaman said he proclaims a garment. For we do not fear cheats as otherwise the matter is endless. We learned if he states the article lost but not its identification marks, it must not be surrendered. To him now, if you say that he proclaims a loss, it is well. We are thus informed that though he states that it was a garment, yet since he does not submit its identification marks, it is not returned to him. But if you say that he proclaims a garment, then if one the finder states that it was a garment and the other the claimant states likewise a garment, is it necessary to teach that it is not returned to him unless he declares its marks of identification? Said Arsafra, after all he proclaims a. Garment the mission means that he the finder stated that he had found a garment whilst the other the claimant submitted identification marks what then is meant by he did not state its identification marks he did not state its perfect identification marks but if he is a cheat if he states its identification marks it must not be given up to him or rabbis taught at first whoever lost an article used to state its marks of identification and take it when deceivers increased in number it was enacted that he should be told go forth and bring witnesses that thou art not a deceiver then take it even as it once happened that our papa's father lost an ass which others found when he came before rabbis son of Arhuna he directed him go and bring witnesses that you are not a fraud and take it so he went and brought witnesses said he to them do you know him to be a deceiver yes they replied I a deceiver he exclaimed to them we meant that you are not a fraud they answered him it stands to Reason that one does not bring witnesses to his disadvantage said Rabbi son of Arhuna Mishnah everything see an animal which works for its keep must be kept by the finder and earn its keep but an animal which does not work for its keep must be sold for it is said and thou shalt return it unto him which means consider how to return it unto him what happens with the money Artarfan said he may use it therefore if it is lost he bears responsibility for it or Akiba maintained he must not use it therefore if it is lost he bears no responsibility Gemara forever said Arnaman in Samuel's name until twelve months have elapsed it has been taught likewise as for all animals which earn their keep e.g. a cow or an ass he the finder must take care of them for twelve months after that he turns them into money which he lays by he must take care of calves and foals three months sell them and lay the money by he must look after geese and cocks for thirty days sell them and put the money by. Arnaman B. Isaac observed the fowl ranks as large cattle it has been taught likewise as for a fowl and large cattle he must take care of them twelve months and sell them and put the money by for calves and foals the period is thirty days after which he sells them and lays the money by geese and cocks and all which demand more attention than their profit is worth he must take care of for three days after which he sells them and lays the money by now this ruling on calves and foals contradicts it. Former one and likewise the rulings on geese and cocks are contradictory the rulings on calves and foals are not contradictory the former refers to grazing animals the latter to those that require feeding stuffs the rulings on geese and cocks are likewise not contradictory the former refers to large ones the latter to small but an animal which does not work for its keeper rabbis taught and thou shalt return it unto him deliberate how to return it unto him so that a calf may not be given as Food to other calves, a foal to other foals, a goose to other geese, or a cock to other cocks. What happens with the money? Artarfan said he may use it, etc. Now this dispute is Talmud. Mas Baba Matiyah, apparently only if he the finder did use it, but if not all would agree that if it is lost, he is free from responsibility. Shall we say that this refutes our Joseph? For it has been stated a of lost property rabbi ruled he ranks as an unpaid billiard. Joseph maintained as a paid billiard. Joseph can answer us for theft and loss. All agree that he is responsible. They differ only in respect to unavoidable accidents for which a borrower alone is responsible. Artarfan holds the rabbis permitted him the finder to use it, therefore he is a borrower in respect thereto. Whilst our Akiba holds that the rabbis did not permit him to use it, therefore he is not a borrower in respect thereto. If so, why does our Akiba say therefore for if you agree that they differ concerning theft and loss? It is well hence it is taught our Akiba maintained he must not use it therefore if it is lost he bears no responsibility for I might think he is a paid billy in accordance with our Joseph's view and responsible for theft and loss hence we are informed therefore etc i.e. since you say that he may not use it he is not a paid billy nor is he responsible for theft and loss but if you say that all agree that he is responsible for theft and loss whilst they differ only in respect of unpreventable accidents for which a borrower alone is responsible what is the meaning of our Akiba's therefore surely he the Tana should have stated thus our Akiba maintained he must not use it and no more than I would have known myself that since he may not use it he is not a borrower hence not responsible what then is the need of our Akiba's therefore on account of our Tarfons therefore and what is the purpose of our Tarfons therefore he means that since the rabbis permitted him to use it it is as though. He had done so and he is therefore held responsible for it but it is taught if it is lost Talmud, Mas Baba Matiyah B it is in accordance with Rabba for Rabba said elsewhere they were stolen by armed robbers whilst lost means that his ship foundered at sea Rab Judah said in Samuel's name the Halachagas as Artarfan Reuba had in his charge an orphan's money he went before our Joseph and inquired may I use it he replied thus did Rab Judah say in Samuel's name the Halachagas as Artarfan. Thereupon Abbe protested but was it not stated thereon our Helbo said in Arhuna's name this refers only to the purchase price of a lost article since he took trouble therein but not to money which was itself lost property and these are likewise as lost money go then said he to him they do not permit me to give you a favorable ruling mission if one finds scrolls he must read them every thirty days if he cannot read he must roll them but he must not study a subject therein for the first time. Nor may another person read with him if one finds a cloth he must give it a shaking every thirty days and spread it out for its own benefit to be aired but not for his honor silver and copper vessels may be used for their own benefit but not so much as to wear them out gold and glassware may not be touched until Elijah comes if one finds a sack or a basket or any object which it is undignified for him to take he need not take it tomorrow Samuel said if one finds phylacteries in a sack he must immediately turn them into money i.e. sell them and lay the money by rub and objected if one finds scrolls he must read them every thirty days if he cannot read he must roll them thus he may only roll but not sell them and lay the money by set of a are obtainable at bar Habi, whereas scrolls are rare rabbis taught if one borrows a scroll of the Torah from his neighbor he may not lend it to another he may open and read it providing however that he does not study a subject. Therein for the first time nor may another person read it together with him likewise if one deposits a scroll of the Torah with his neighbor he the latter must roll it once every twelve months and may
Reads it that is permitted, but if he opens it in his own interest, it is forbidden. Simica said in the case of a new one every 30 days, in the case of an old one every 12 months, our Eliezer B. Jacob said in both cases every 12 months, but our Eliezer B. Jacob is identical with the first Tana, but say thus our Eliezer B. Jacob said in both cases every 30 days, but he must not study a subject therein for the first time, nor may another person read with him, but the following contradicts it. He may not read a section therein and revise it, nor read a section therein and translate it. He may also not have more than three columns open simultaneously, nor may three read out of the same volume. Hence, two may read said of a. There is no difficulty here. The reference is to one subject there to two. If one finds a cloth, he must give it a shaking every 30 days. Are we to say that a shaking benefits it? But our Yohanan said he who has a skilled weaver in his house has to shake his garment. Every day I will tell you shaking every day is injurious once in 30 days is beneficial there too. Alternatively, there is no difficulty. This our mission refers to shaking by one person, the other are your hand and stick them by two persons. Another alternative this the mission refers to a shaking, i.e. beating by hand the other with a stick, or again one refers to wool, the other to flax, are your hand and set a cupful of witchcraft, but not a cupful of tepid water, yet that applies only to a metal utensil. But there is no objection to an earthen where one and even of a metal utensil this holds good only if it, the water is unboiled, but if it is boiled it does not matter. Moreover, that is only if he throws no spice with therein, but if he does, there is no objection, are your hand and said if one is left a fortune by his parents and wishes to lose it, let him wear linen garments, use glassware and engage workers and not be with them, let him wear linen garments. This refers to Roman linen, use glassware of his wife. Glass and engage workers and not be with them refer this Talmud, Mas Baba Metzieh to workers with oxen who can cause much loss and spread it out for its own benefit but not for his honor the scholars propounded what if it is for their mutual benefit come and here he may spread it for its own benefit this proves only for its own benefit but not for their mutual benefit then consider the second clause but not for his honor thus it is forbidden only for his own honor but permitted for their mutual benefit hence no inference can be drawn from this come and here he may not spread it a lost article upon a couch or a frame for his needs but may do so in its own interest if he was visited by guests he may not spread it over a bed or a frame whether in his interest or in its own there it is different because he may thereby destroy it either through an evil eye or through thieves come and here if he took it the heifer into the team and it accidentally did some threshing. It is fit, but if it was in order that it should suck and thresh, it is unfit. But here it is for their mutual benefit, and yet it is taught that it is unfit. There it is different because scripture wrote, which hath not beats wrought with under any condition. If so, the same should apply to the first clause too. This then can only be compared to what we learned. If a bird rested upon it, the red heifer it remains fit. But if it copulated with a male, it becomes unfit. Why so? In accordance with our papa's dictum, for our papa said, had scripture written yabat and we read it yabat, I would have said that the law holds good even if it were of itself. Whilst if it were written about and we read it about, I would have said it becomes unfit only if he himself wrought with it. Since however it is written about active, whilst read yabat passive, we require that it was wrought which shall be similar to he wrought with it. Just as he wrought with it must mean that he approved of it. So also it was wrought. With refers only to what he approved, silver and copper vessels may be used, etc. Our rabbis taught if one finds wooden utensils, he may use them to prevent them from rotting copper vessels, he may use them with hot matter but not over the fire, because that wears them out silver vessels with cold matter but not with hot, because that tarnishes them, trials and spades on soft matter but not on hard, for that injures them gold and glassware, however, he may not touch until Elijah comes, just as they the sages ruled in respect of lost property. So also with reference to a bailment, what business has one with a bailment said our Abihama in our Sheshit is named the streets of a bailment, the owner of which has gone overseas. If one finds a sack or a basket or any object which it is not dignified for him to take, he need not take IT. How do we know this for our rabbis taught and thou shalt hide thyself sometimes thou mayest hide thyself and sometimes not, e.g. if one was a priest whilst it did. Lost animal was in a cemetery or an old man and it was inconsistent with his dignity to lead the animal home or if his own work was more valuable than his neighbor's therefore it is said and thou shalt hide thyself in respect of which of these instances is the verse required shall we say in respect of a priest when it the lost animal is in a cemetery but that is obvious one is a positive whereas the other is a negative and a positive injunction and a positive injunction cannot set aside a negative together with a positive injunction moreover a ritual prohibition cannot be abrogated on account of money if again it is required where his own work was more valuable than his neighbor's that may be inferred from Rab Judas dictum in Rab's name for Rab Judas said in the name of Rab save that Talmud, Mas Baba Metzia there shall be no quorum among you this teaches thine takes precedence over all others hence it is needed in respect of an old man for whom it is. Undignified to return the lost article, Rabbi said, if he the old man smote it, the lost animal, he is henceforth under an obligation in respect thereof. Abbe was sitting before Rabbi when he saw some lost goats standing whereupon he took a clot and threw it at them, said he, Rabbi to him, you have thereby become bound in respect of them, arise and return them. The scholars propounded, what if it is dignified for one to return a lost animal in the field but not in town, do we say? Complete return is required, and since it is undignified for him to return it in town, he has no obligation at all, or perhaps in the field at least he is bound to return it, and since he incurs the obligation in the field, he is likewise obligated in town. The question stands, Rabbi said, where one would lead back his own, he must lead back his neighbors too, and where one would unload and load his own, he must do so for his neighbors. Our Ishmael, son of our Jose, was walking on a road when he met a man. Carrying a load of faggots, the latter put them down, rested, and then said to him, Help me to take them up. What is it worth? He inquired, Half a Zeus was the answer, so he gave him the half Zeus and declared it Hefker. Thereupon he the carrier reacquired it. He gave him another half Zeus and again declared it Hefker, seeing that he was again about to reacquire it. He said to him, I have declared it Hefker for all but you, but is it then Hefker? In that case, have we not learned Beth Shem? I maintain Hefker. For the poor only is valid Hefker, whilst Beth Hillel rule it is valid only if declared Hefker for the poor and the rich as the year of release. But Arishmael, son of Arhose, did in fact render it Hefker for all, and he stopped the other from taking possession again by mere words. Yet was not Arishmael, son of Arhose, an elder for whom it was undignified to help one to take up a load. He acted beyond the requirements of the law for our Joseph learned, and thou shalt chew them. This refers to there. House of life the way that means the practice of loving deeds they must walk to sick visiting therein to burial and the work to strict law that they shall do to acts beyond the requirements of the law the master said they must walk this refers to sick visiting but that is the practice of loving deeds that is necessary only in respect of one's affinity for a master said a man's affinity takes away a sixtieth of his illness yet even so he must visit him therein to burial but that too is identical with the practice of loving deeds that is necessary only in respect of an old man for whom it is undignified that they shall do this means acts beyond the requirements of the law for our Yohan and said Jerusalem was destroyed only because they gave judgments therein in accordance with biblical law were they then to have judged in accordance with untrained arbitrators but say thus because they based their judgments strictly upon biblical law and did not go beyond the requirements of the Lamishna what is lost property if one finds an ass or a cow feeding by the way that is not considered a lost property but if he finds an ass with its trappings overturned or a cow running among the vineyards they are considered lost if he returned it and it ran away returned it and it ran away even four or five times he is still bound to restore it for it is written thou shalt surely restore them if his lost time is worth sl he must not demand give me a cell but is paid as a laborer if a beth din is present he may stipulate in their presence but if there is no beth din before whom to stipulate his own takes precedence Gemara and all these that were mentioned already are they then not lost property said Rab Judah it means this what is the general principle of lost property for which one is responsible if one finds an ass or a cow feeding by the way that is not considered lost property and he bears no responsibility toward it but if he finds an ass with its Trappings overturned or a cow running among the vineyards they are considered lost and he is bound to return it and forever said Rab
Soil I might think since beneath the soil the air as the soil itself therefore we are informed otherwise if one finds an ass or a cow etc. This is self-contradictory you say if one finds an ass or a cow feeding by the way it is not considered lost property hence only when feeding by the way are they not regarded as lost but if running on a road or feeding among the vineyards they are considered lost and consider the second clause but if he finds an ass with its trappings overturned or a cow running among the vineyards they are considered lost hence only if running among the vineyards are they lost but if running on the road or feeding among the vineyards they are not lost said Abbe his companion tell it concerning him he the tanda mentions feeding by the way that it is not a lost animal and the same applies to a cow feeding among the vineyards he states that if running among the vineyards it is lost and the same holds good if it was running on the road Rabbi said to him if his companion tell it of him let the lighter aspects be taught from which the graver ones would follow a force you arrive thus let him the tanda teach that if it was running on the road it is considered lost how much more so if running among the vineyards and let him teach that when feeding among the vineyards it is not considered lost how much more so when feeding by the way but said Rabbi the two statements on running are not contradictory in the one case its face is towards the field in the other towards the town the two statements on feeding are likewise not contradictory the one treats of the loss of itself the other of the loss of the soil thus when he the tanda teaches that if it is feeding by the way that is not considered lost property implying that if it is feeding among the vineyards there is a loss the reference is to the loss of the soil and when he teaches that if it is running among the vineyards there is a case of loss implying that if it is feeding among the vineyard there is none the reference is to the loss of itself for when running among the vineyard it becomes lacerated but not when feeding among the vineyards now if it is feeding among the vineyards granted that it does not become lacerated yet it should be necessary to expel it on account of the loss of the soil this refers to a heathen's vineyard yet should it be necessary to drive it out on account of its own loss lest the heathens kill it this refers to a place where a Warning is first given and only then is it slain but perhaps a warning has already been given on its account if they gave warning and care was not taken thereof to prevent it from trespassing it certainly ranks as a self-inflicted loss if he returned it and it ran away returned it and it ran away etc. One of the rabbis said to Rabba perhaps Hashab indicates once Teshivim denotes twice he replied Hashab implies even a hundred times as for Teshivim I know only that he must return them to his the owner's house how do I know that he can return them to his garden or his ruins therefore scripture writes Teshivim implying in all circumstances how so if they the garden or ruins are guarded is it not obvious whilst if not why can one return them thither in truth it means that they are guarded but we are informed this is that the owner's knowledge is not required in accordance with our Eliezer who said all require the owner's knowledge excepting in the case of the return of lost Properties in scripture extended the law to many forms of return if a bird's nest chance to be before thee in the way in any tree on the ground whether they be young ones or eggs and the dam sitting upon the young or upon the eggs thou shalt not take the dam with the young but Shalia Teshela thou shalt surely let go the dam etc. Let us say that Shalia means once Teshela twice he replied Shalia implies even a hundred times as for Teshela I know this law only when the bird is required for a permissive purpose how do I know it when it is required for the fulfillment of a precept therefore scripture writes Teshela implying under all circumstances one of the rabbis said to Rabbi thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart Hokia Tokia thou shalt surely rebuke thy neighbor perhaps Hokia means once Tokia twice he replied Hokia implies even a hundred times as for Tokia I know only that the master must rebuke the disciple once do we know that the disciple must rebuke his master from the phrase Hokia Tokia implying under all circumstances if thou see the ass of him that hate thee lying under its burden and wouldst forbear to help him thou shalt surely help with him from this I know it only if the owner is with it once do I know the law of its owner is not with it from the verse thou shalt surely help with him in all circumstances thou shalt not see thy brother's ass or his ox fall down by the way and hide thyself from them thou shalt surely help him to lift them up again from this I know it only if the owner is with it once do I know this law if the owner is not with it from the verse thou shalt surely help him to lift them up again now why must both unloading and loading be stated both are necessary for had scripture mentioned unloading only I would have thought that is because it entails suffering of dumb animals and financial loss but as for loading where neither suffering of dumb animals nor financial Loss is involved I might have thought that one need not help whilst had we been informed in respect of loading I would have thought that is because it is remunerated but unloading which is unremunerated I would have thought one need not help us both are required but on our simians view that loading too is without remuneration what can you say in our simians view the verses are not explicit why need these two be written and also the return of the lost animal they are all needed for had scripture written these two only I would think it was because they entail the suffering of both the owner and itself see the animal but as for a lost animal which causes grief to the owner but not to itself the law would not apply and if we were informed this of a lost animal I would think it was because the owner is not with the Talmud Mas Baba Matiabi but as for these two seeing that their master is with them the law would not apply thus both are necessary he that's mode. Him shall surely be put to death. I know only that he is to be executed by the mode of death prescribed in his case. Once do I know that if you cannot execute him with the death prescribed for him, you may slay him with any death you are able from the verse. He shall surely be put to death, meaning under all circumstances thou shalt surely smite the inhabitants of that city with the edge of the sword. I know only that you may execute them with the death that is prescribed in their case. Whence do I know that if you cannot slay them with the death that is prescribed in their case, you may smite them in any manner you are able from the verse. Thou shalt surely smite, implying under all circumstances thou shalt surely return the pledge unto him when the sun goeth down from this. I know it. See that the pledge must be returned only if he the creditor dis reigned with the sanction of the court. Once do we know if of one who dis reigned without the sanction of the court from the verse thou shall surely return it implying in all cases if thou at all take to pledge thy neighbor's rhyme and thou shalt deliver it to him by that the sun goeth down from that I know it see that the pledge must be returned only if he the creditor dis reigned with sanction of the court once do we know it of one who dis reigned without sanction of the court because it is stated if thou at all take to pledge implying in all cases and for what purpose are both of these verses necessary one refers to day rhyme the other to night clothes thou shalt surely open thy hand unto thy brother to thy poor etc I know this only of the poor of thine own city once do I know it of the poor of another city from the expression thou shalt surely open implying in all cases thou shalt surely give him I know only that a large sum must be given once do I know that a small sum too must be given from the expression thou shalt surely give in all circumstances thou shalt furnish him liberally I know only that if the house of the master was blessed for his a slave sake a present must be made once do we know it even if the house was not blessed for his sake scripture teaches thou shalt furnish him liberally under all circumstances but according to our Eliezer B. Ezra who maintained if the house was blessed for his sake a present is made to him but not otherwise what is the purpose of Ta'atik the Torah employs human phraseology and thou shalt surely lend him sufficient for his need I know this only of one poor man who has not and does not wish to maintain himself at your expense and scripture saith give him by way of alone once do I know it if he possesses his own but does not desire to maintain himself at his own cost from the verse thou shalt surely lend him but according to our Simeon who maintained if he has his own but refuses to maintain himself therewith we are under no obligation toward him why state surely the Torah employs human phraseology if his lost time is worth a seller, he must not demand give me a seller, but is paid as a laborer. A tanda taught he must pay him as an unemployed laborer. What is meant by an unemployed laborer as a laborer unemployed in his particular occupation? If a in is present, he may stipulate in their presence. Isser and our safra entered into a business partnership. Then our safra went and divided the stock without Isser's knowledge in the presence of two people when he came before Rabbi son of Ar. Who now he said to him, Go and produce the three people in whose presence you made the division, or else Talmud, Mas Baba Matia, two out of the three, or else two witnesses that you did divide in the presence of three others. How do you know this? He asked him. He replied, Because we learned if a in is present, he may stipulate in their presence. But if there is no in before whom to stipulate his own takes precedence, what comparison is there? He ret
The obligation rests upon you if you desire to unload unload he the passerby is exempt because it is said with him yet if he the owner was old or infirm he is bound to do it himself there is a biblical precept to unload but not to load our Simeon said to load up to our Jose the Galilean said if it the animal bore more than his proper burden he the passerby has no obligation towards him its owner because it is written if thou see the ass of him that hate thee lying under its burden which means a burden under which it can stand Kamara Rabba said the stable referred to is one which neither causes the animal to stray nor is it guarded it does not cause it to stray since it is taught he has no responsibility towards it to return it nor is it guarded since it is necessary to teach he has no responsibility toward it for should you think that it is guarded seeing that if he finds it outside he takes it inside if he finds it inside is it necessary to state that he is not bound to return it but it must follow that it is unguarded this proves that if he finds it in a stable he has no responsibility toward it or Isaac said provided that it is standing within the tomb hence it follows that if he finds it in the street even within the tomb he is still bound to return it others refer this to the second clause in the street he is obliged to return it or Isaac observed providing that it is standing within the tomb hence it follows that if he finds it in a stable even without the tomb he is still under no obligation if it is in a cemetery he must not defile himself for it or rabbis taught once do we know that if his father said to him defile yourself or do not return it he must disobey him because it is written ye shall fear every man his mother and his father and keep my sabbaths i am the lord your god ye are all bound to honor me thus the reason is that scripture wrote ye shall keep my sabbaths otherwise however i would have said that he has to obey him but why so one is a positive command and the other is both a positive and a negative command and the positive command cannot supersede combined positive and negative commands it is necessary I might think since the honor due to parents is equated to that due to the omnipresent for it is said honor thy father and thy mother whilst elsewhere it is said honor the Lord with thy substance therefore he must obey him hence we are informed that he must not obey him there is a biblical precept to unload but not to load what is meant by but not to load shall we say not to load at all wherein does unloading differ because it is written thou shalt surely help him yet in respect to loading too it is said thou shalt surely help him to lift them up again but it means this it is a biblical obligation to unload without remuneration but not to load without payment save only for remuneration our Simeon said to load too without payment we have thus learned here what are Rabbis taught unloading must be done without pay unloading for pay our Simeon said both without payment what is the reason of the rabbis for should you think it is as our Simeon let scripture state loading and unloading becomes unnecessary for I would reason if one is bound to load though no suffering of dumb animals nor financial loss is involved how much more so unloading seeing that both suffering of dumb animals and financial loss are involved then for what purpose is it written to teach you that unloading must be performed without payment but loading only for payment and what is our Simeon's reason because the verses are not explicit and the rabbis why say the verses are not explicit here it is written if thou see the ass lying under his burden whilst there it is said thou shalt not see thy brother's ass or his ox fall down by the way which implies both they and their burdens are cast on the road and our Simeon fall down by the way implies they themselves the animals their load being still upon them, Rabbi said Talmud, Mas Baba Metziah be from the arguments of both we may infer that relieving the suffering of an animal is a biblical law for even our Simeon said this only because the verses are not clearly defined but if they were we would infer a menorah on what grounds surely we infer it on the grounds of the suffering of dumb animals no perhaps it is because financial loss is involved and the argument runs thus if one is obliged to load though no financial loss is involved how much more so to unload seeing that financial loss is involved but is there no financial loss involved when loading is required may not the circumstances be that in the meanwhile he loses the market or that thieves can come and rob him of all he has now the proof that relieving the suffering of an animal is biblically enjoined is that the second clause states our Jose the Galilean said if the animal bore more than its proper burden he the passerby has no obligation towards him the owner because it is written if thou see the ass of him that hate thee lying under its burden which means a burden under which it can stand hence it follows that in the view of the first tenet he is obligated towards him to help him why so surely because relieving the suffering of an animal is biblically enjoined no perhaps the differ as to the connotation of under its burden are jose maintaining that we interpret under its burden the burden under which it can stand whilst the rabbis hold that we do not interpret under its burden thus moreover it may be proved that relieving the suffering of an animal is no biblical injunction because the first clause states if he the owner of the animal went sat down and said to the passerby since the obligation rests upon you to unload unload he the passerby is exempt because it is said with him now should you think that relieving the suffering of an animal is a biblical injunction what difference does it make whether the owner joins him in relieving the animal or not in truth relieving the suffering of an animal is biblically enjoined for do you think that exempt means entirely exempt perhaps he is exempt from doing it without payment yet he is bound to unload for payment scripture ordering thus when the owner joins him he must serve him for not when the owner abstains he must serve him for payment yet after all relieving the suffering of an animal is biblically enjoined mnemonic animal animal friend enemy habitually lying down shall we say that the following supports him one must busy himself with an animal belonging to a heathen just as with one belonging to an israelite now if you say that relieving the suffering of an animal is a biblical injunction it is well for that reason he must busy himself there with as with one belonging to an israelite but if you say that relieving the suffering of an animal is not biblically enjoined why must he busy Himself therewith as with an Israelite's animal there it is on account of enmity logic too supports this for it states if it is laden with forbidden wine he has no obligation towards it now if you say that relieving the suffering of an animal is not biblically enjoined it is well therefore he has no obligation toward it but if you say it is biblically enjoined why has he no obligation toward it it means this but he has no obligation to load it with forbidden wine come and here in the case of an animal belonging to a heathen bearing a burden belonging to an Israelite thou mayest forbear but if you say that relieving the suffering of an animal is biblically enjoined why mayest thou forbear surely thou shalt surely help with him is applicable after all relieving the suffering of an animal is biblically enjoined the reference there is to loading if so consider the second clause in the case of an animal belonging to an Israelite and a load belonging to a heathen thou shalt surely Help, but if this treats of loading, why apply? Thou shalt surely help him on account of the inconvenience of the Israelite. If so, the same applies in the first clause. The first clause treats of a heathen driver, the second of an Israelite driver. How can you make a general assumption as a rule? One goes after his ass, but both and thou mayest forbear, and thou shalt surely help refer to unloading. Well, answer thus: Who is the authority of this? Our Jose the Galilean, who maintained that relieving the suffering of an animal is not biblically enjoined. Come and here, if a friend requires unloading and an enemy loading, one's first obligation is towards his enemy in order to subdue his evil inclinations. Now, if you should think that relieving the suffering of an animal is biblically enjoined, surely the other is preferable. Even so, the motive in order to subdue his evil inclination is more compelling. Come and here, the enemy spoken of is an Israelite enemy, but not a heathen enemy, but if you say that relieving the suffering of an animal is biblically enjoined, what is the difference whether the animal belongs to an Israelite or a heathen enemy? Do you think that this refers to enemy mentioned in scripture? It refers to enemy spoken of in the very the come and hear Talmud, Mas Baba Metziah, if thou seest the ass of him that hate thee lying under its burden, etc. lying just now, but not an animal that habitually lies down under his burden, lying but not standing under its burden, but not if it is unloaded under its burden, the burden under which it can stand now. If you say that relieving the suffering of an animal is biblically enjoined, what does it matter whether it was lying this once only habitually lay down or was standing the authority of this is our Jose the Galilean who maintained that relieving the suffering of an animal is enjoined merely by rabbinical law reason supports this too, for it is taught under its burden, the burden under which it can. Stand now whom do you know to hold this view our Jose the Galilean this proves it but can you assign it to our Jose the Galilean does not the second clause teach under its burden but not if it is unloaded what is meant by not if it is unloaded shall we say if it is unloaded there is no obligation at all but it is written thou shalt surely help to lift them up again hence it is obvious that it means if unloaded there is no obligation to help to load it without payment but for remuneration now.
Wisdom brings him to the future world but if his father is a sage his father's takes precedence if his father and his teacher were each carrying a burden he must first assist his teacher to lay it down and then assist his father if his father and his teacher are in captivity he must first redeem his teacher and then his father but if his father is a sage he must first redeem his father and then his teacher tomorrow whence do we know this Rab Judah said in Rab's name scripture says save. That there shall be no poor among you years takes precedence over all others but Rab Judah also said in Rab's name he who strictly observes this will eventually be brought to it if his father and his teacher were each carrying a burden etc. Our rabbis taught the teacher referred to as he who instructed him in wisdom not he who taught him Bible and Mishnah this is our Meir's view our Judah said he from whom one has derived the greater part of his knowledge our Jose said even if he enlightened his eyes in a single mission only he is his teacher said Rabbi E.G.R. Sira who told me the meaning of so Hamelist and Samuel rent his garment for one of the rabbis who taught him the meaning of one was thrust into the duct as far as the armpit and another key opened the door directly Ola said the scholars in Babylon arise before and rent their garment for each other in mourning but with respect to a colleague's lost article when one has his father's also to attend to he returns a Scholars first only in the case of his teacher put excellence are his dot ask are who not what of a disciple whom his teacher needs his dot his dot he exclaimed I do not need you but you need me forty years they bore resentment against and did not visit each other are his dot kept forty fasts because are who not had felt himself humiliated whilst are who not kept forty fasts for having unjustly suspected are his dot it has been stated are Isaac B. Joseph said in our Yohanan's name the Halachah is as our Judah are son of our who not said in our Sheshit's name the Halachah is as our Jose now did our Yohanan really say this but our Yohanan said the Halachah rests with an anonymous mission and we have learned his teacher who instructed him in wisdom what is meant by wisdom the greater part of one's knowledge our rabbis taught they who occupy themselves with the Bible alone are but of indifferent merit with mission are indeed meritorious and are rewarded for it with Gemara there can be nothing more meritorious yet run always. To the mission more than to the Gemara now this is self-contradictory you say with Gemara there can be nothing more meritorious and then you say yet run always to the mission more than to the Gemara said are Yohanan Talmud, Mas Baba Metziah be this teaching was taught in the days of Rabbi thereupon everyone forsook the mission and went to the Gemara hence he subsequently taught them yet run always to the mission more than to the Gemara how was that inferred even as our Judah son of our Allah. Expounded what is the meaning of Shumai people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins Shumai people their transgression refers to scholars whose unwitting errors are accounted as intentional faults and the house of Israel their sins to the ignorant whose intentional sins are accounted to them as unwitting errors and that is the meaning of what we learned our Judah said be heedful of the Talmud for an error in Talmud is accounted as intentional our Judah son of our Allah taught what? Is meant by the verse here the word of the Lord yet a tremble at his word this refers to scholars your brethren said to students of scripture that hate you to students of the mission that cast you out to the ignorant yet lest you say their hope of future joy is destroyed and their prospects frustrated scripture states and we shall see your joy lest you think Israel shall be ashamed therefore it is stated and they shall be ashamed the idolaters shall be ashamed whilst Israel shall rejoice C H A P T E R I I mission if a man entrusts an animal or utensils to his neighbor and they are stolen or lost and he the belly pays for them declining to swear since it was ruled that a gratuitous belly may swear and be quit the thief if he is found must render double and if he has slaughtered or sold the animal he must repay fourfold or fivefold to whom must he pay it to him with whom the bailment was deposited if he swears not wishing to pay the thief if found must repay Double and if he has slaughtered or sold the animal must repay fourfold or fivefold to whom must he pay it to the bailer tomorrow why must he state both animal and utensils they are necessary for if animal alone were stated I might have said that only in the case of an animal does he the bailer make over the double repayment to him because it requires considerable attention to be let in and out of its stable but as for utensils which do not require much attention I might think that he does not make over the twofold repayment to him and if utensils alone were stated I might have argued that only in the case of utensils does he the bailer make over the twofold repayment to him because their multiplication is not great but in the case of an animal for which if slaughtered or sold he the thief must repay fourfold or fivefold I might think that he the bailer does not make over the multiplied principle to him hence both are necessary Rami Biham objected but one cannot Transfer that which is not existent and even according to our Meir who maintained one can transfer that which is not existent that is only in the case of e.g. the fruit of the palm tree which will naturally come into existence but here Talmud, Mas Bagamitia who can say that if the bailment will be stolen and should you assume that it will be stolen who can say that the thief will be found and even if the thief be found who can say that he will repay double perhaps he will confess before. His guilt is attested and thus be exempt said Rabbi it becomes as though he the bailer had said to him if it be stolen and you are willing to pay me for it then my cow be yours from this moment of delivery if so even its shearings and offsprings too should belong to the billy why has it been taught accepting its shearings and offsprings but said Arzara it is as though he had said to him except its shearings and offsprings and why make this an absolute assumption it may be taken for. Granted that one gives over those improvements which come from elsewhere but not those which come from the stock itself other state Rabbah said it becomes as though he said to him if it is stolen and you are willing to reimburse me then it is yours from just before the theft wherein do they see the two versions of Rabbah's reply differ they differ in respect of the difficulty posited by Arzara or if it was standing in the meadow and he the belly pays for them declining to swear etc. Arhaya. B. Abba said in our Yohanan's name he pays is not literally meant but once he said I will pay even if he has not done so the law of the mission holds good we learned and he pays declining to swear this implies only if he actually pays but not otherwise but consider the second clause if he swears not wishing to pay which implies only if he did not consent but if he consented even if he had not actually paid the double repayment is his hence no inference can be drawn from this it has been. Taught in accordance with our Yohanan, if one hires a cow from his neighbor and it is stolen and he declares I will pay and not swear and then the thief is discovered he must pay double to the hire. Our papa said if a gratuitous bailey merely says I was negligent he the bailer assigns the twofold repayment to him since he could have freed himself by the plea of theft if a paid bailey merely says it was stolen the twofold repayment is made over to him since he could if he wished have freed himself by pleading that it was hurt or had died but if a borrower says I will pay he the bailer does not assign him the twofold repayment for how could he have freed himself by the plea it died on account of its work that is a rare occurrence other state our papa said a borrower too once he says I will pay the double repayment becomes his since he could if he wished free himself by the plea it died on account of its work thereupon RZ but observed to him thus did say as for a Borrower the twofold repayment is not his unless he has actually paid why since all the benefit of the loan is his he the lender does not make over the double repayment to him on the strength of mere words it has been taught in accordance with RZ but if one borrows a cow from his neighbor and it is stolen and the borrower hastens and pays for it and then the thief is found he must repay double to the borrower now on the first version of our papa's dictum this is certainly not a refutation but must we say that it is a refutation of the second version our papa can answer you is this stronger than our mission which states he pays yet we interpreted it as meaning he declares that he will pay so here too it means that he says that he will pay how compare there in our mission it is not stated that he hastens whilst here it says he hastens what is the meaning of he hastens he hastens to promise but since the teaching in respect of the higher is stated and he says that he will pay whilst that in respect of the borrower is stated and he hastens this proves that it is stated advisedly so were they then taught together the ten name of the schools of our high and our ashai were asked and they affirmed that they were taught together now it is obvious that if he the billy declared I will not pay and then said I will pay then he has said I will pay but what if he first declared I will pay Talmud, Mas Baba Metziah B and then declared I will not pay do we say. He has retracted or perhaps he intended keeping his word and was merely repulsing him the bailer again if he declared I will pay and died whilst his sons declared we will not pay what then do we say they have retracted or perhaps they are keeping to their father's word but merely repulsed him again what if the sons did p
was worth a sella he is free from an oath I lent you a sella on it and it was worth a shekel whilst the other maintains not so you did lend me a sella on it and it was worth three denarii he is liable to an oath if the debtor pleads you did lend me a sella on it whilst it was worth two and the other replies not so I lent you a sella on it and it was worth a sella he is free from an oath you did lend me a sella on it and it was worth two whilst the other replies not so I lent you a sella on it and it was worth five denarii he is liable to an oath now who must swear he who has the bailment i.e. the creditor lest the other swear and then this one produce the bailment to what does this refer shall we say to the second clause but that the oath rests upon the creditor follows from the fact that it is he who makes partial admission but said Samuel it refers to the first clause how can it refer to the first clause he means the second subsection of the first clause is I lent you a sell out it and it was worth a shekel whilst the other maintains not so you did lend me a sell out it and it was worth three denarii he is liable to an oath now the onus of the oath lies upon the debtor yet the rabbis ordered that the creditor should swear lest this one sc the debtor swear and then the other produce the pledge but if Talmud, Mas Baba Metzi Ar Hunas dictum be correct since the creditor must swear that it is not in his possession how can he produce it said Rabba there are Witnesses that it was burnt if so whence can he produce it but said our Joseph there are witnesses that it was stolen yet after all whence can he produce it he may exert himself and bring it if so when the creditor swears the debtor may take pains and bring it no as for the creditor as producing it it is well he knows who enters and leaves his house and so he can go exert himself and produce it but does the debtor know who enters and leaves the creditor's house Abbe said we fear lest he plead saying to him I found it after the oath Arashi said both must swear one as see the creditor that it is not in his possession and the other how much it was worth and this is its meaning who swears first the creditor must swear first that the pledge is not in his possession lest the other swear and then he produced the bailment Arhuna B. Talafa said in Rabba's name the first paragraph of the second clause refutes Arhuna you did lend me a sell on it whilst it was worth two and the other replies not so I lent you a sell on it and it was only worth a sell he is free from an oath but if Arhunas dictum is correct since the creditor must swear that it is not in his possession let him also swear in virtue of a superimposed oath how much it was worth said Arashi I repeated this discussion before Arkahan whereupon he observed to me let this apply where he believes him then let the debtor believe the creditor in this too is how much it was worth the debtor reasons he the creditor did not fully ascertain it as see the value then let the creditor believe the debtor since he does fully know it nevertheless he does not believe him wherein lies the difference that the debtor believes the creditor but not vice versa the debtor applies to the creditor the integrity of the upright shall guide them whereas the creditor applies to the debtor but the perverseness of transgressors shall destroy them a man once deposited jewels with his neighbor when he demanded Give me my jewels, he replied, I do not know where I put them. So he came before Arnaman, who said to him, Every plea of I do not know his negligence, go and pay. Yet he did not pay, so Arnaman went and had his house seized. Subsequently, the jewels were found, by which time they had appreciated, said Arnaman, let the jewels be returned to their first owner and the house to its owner. Rob observed, I was sitting then before Arnaman, and at the subject of our study was the chapter if one entrusts, etc. So I quoted to him, If he the Billy pays, declining to swear, etc. But he did not answer me, and he did well not to answer me. Why there he did not trouble him to go to court, whereas here he troubled him. Shall we say that in Arnaman's opinion, evaluation is returnable? No, there it is different because it was evaluation made in error since the jewels were in existence from the first. The Nihardian said, Evaluation is returnable until twelve months. Amimar said, Though I am of Nihardi, I Hold that evaluation is always returnable. Nonetheless, the law is that evaluation is always returnable because it is said, and thou shalt do that which is right and good. Now it is obvious if evaluation was made on behalf of a creditor and he went and valued it for his own creditor. We say to him, the second creditor, you are no better than the man in whose power you come. If he sold, bequeathed, or gifted it, these the recipients certainly entered it. The DIST reigned estate originally with the intention of possessing the land, not the money. If it was appraised in favor of a woman creditor and she married, or if evaluation was made of a woman's estate and she married and then died, the husband ranks as a purchaser in respect to a wife's property. He neither returns the estate to the debtor nor is it returned to him. For our Jose Bihana said in Ishad, it was enacted if a woman sells of her property of plucking in her husband's lifetime and then dies, her husband as heir can claim. It from the purchaser's Talmud, Mas Baba Metziah where however he the debtor himself gave it to him the creditor for his debt Araha and Rabbin a differ thereon one maintains it is returnable the other it is not he who rules that it is not returnable holds that it is a true sale since he voluntarily gave it in payment but he who rules that it is returnable holds that it is not a true sale and as for his giving it to him voluntarily and not going to court he gave it to him merely through shame and from what time can he the creditor enjoy the use of fruct Rabbi said as soon as he receives the attract Abbe said the witnesses to the attracted by their signatures acquire the right for him Rabbi said when the days of public announcement are ended mission if a man hires a cow from his neighbor lends it to another and it dies a natural death the hirer must swear that it died naturally and the borrower must pay the hirer said our Jose how shall one do business with his neighbor's cow Hence the value of the cow must be returned to its owner. Gamar R E D B Abin said to Abe, let us see how does the hire acquire the cow by his oath, then let the owner say to the hire, take yourself off with your oath whilst I bring an action against the borrower. Do you think he replied to him that the hire acquires it through his oath? He acquires it from the time of its death, the oath being only to placate the owner. Arzara said it may sometimes happen on the basis of this mission of that. The owner must render many cows to the hire house, so if a hired it an animal from him before one hundred days and then be reborrowed it from him for ninety days, then a retired it from B for eighty days out of the ninety and be reborrowed it from A for seventy days, and it died within the period of borrowing. Now on account of each separate borrowing he becomes liable for one cow or fifty said to Rubin, let us see only one animal is involved which was brought into a certain state and Taken out thence it was taken out of hiring and brought into borrowing taken out of borrowing and brought into hiring is the cow then still in existence he replied that we should say thus to him our son of Arashi said he has a claim only in respect of two cows one in respect of borrowing and one in respect of hiring for there is one designation of borrowing and one designation of hiring that in respect of borrowing belongs entirely to him the hire whilst as for that of hiring he must work therewith for the period of hiring and return it to its owner our Jeremiah said sometimes both the hire and the borrower are liable to a sin offering Talmud Mas Baba Metziah sometimes both are liable to a guilt offering sometimes the hire is liable to a sin offering and the borrower to a guilt offering and sometimes the hire is liable to a guilt offering and the borrower to a sin offering how so for denying monetary liability on oath a guilt offering is incurred for a false Statement that sin offering sometimes both are liable to a sin offering, e.g., if it died a natural death and they maintain that an accident had befallen it, thus the hire who is free from responsibility in both cases is liable to a sin offering, and the borrower who is responsible in both cases is likewise liable to a sin offering. Sometimes both are liable to a guilt offering, e.g., if it was stolen and they maintain that it had died of its work, thus both deny monetary liability since in fact they are responsible for theft whilst they free themselves. The hire is liable to a sin offering, and the borrower to a guilt offering, e.g., if it died a natural death and they maintain that it had died of its work, the hire who is free from responsibility in both cases is liable to a sin offering, the borrower who is liable if it dies a natural death but frees himself with the plea that it died of its work to a guilt offering, the hire is liable to a guilt offering, and the borrower to a sin. Offering e.g. if it was stolen and they maintain that it had died naturally the hire who is liable for theft and loss but frees himself with the plea it died naturally incurs a guilt offering the borrower who is responsible in both cases a sin offering now what does he or Jeremiah thereby inform us his purpose is to oppose our MI's dictum is for every oath which the judges impose no liability is incurred on account of an oath of utterance because it is said or if a soul swear uttering with his lips etc which implies a voluntary oath therefore he informs us that it is not as our MI it has been stated if one Billy entrusted his
that every day they themselves used to deposit their spades with that old woman now RMI was sitting and recounting this discussion whereupon our Abu raised an objection before him if a man hires a cow from his neighbor lends it to another and it dies a natural death the hirer must swear that it died naturally and the borrower must pay the hirer but if this SCR Yohanan's ruling be correct let him the owner say to him it is not my desire that my bailment should be in the hands of another person he replied the circumstances here are that the owner authorized him to lend it if so he ought to pay the owner it means that he said to him at your discretion Rami Biham objected from the following mission if one deposited money with his neighbor who bound it up and slung it over his shoulder or entrusted it to his minor son or daughter and locked the door before them but not properly he is responsible because he did not guard it in the manner of Billy's hands it is only because they were minors but if they were adults he would be free from liability yet why so let him say to him it is not my desire that my bailment should be in the hands of another person said Rabbi he who makes a deposit Talmud, Mas Baba Mitzia does so with the understanding that his Abili's wife and children may be put in charge thereof and he hardy and said this may be deduced too from the mission quoted for it states or entrusted it to his minor son or daughter he is responsible hence if to his adult son or daughter he is not responsible whence it follows that if he entrusts it to strangers whether adults or minors he is liable for if otherwise he the tana should have simply taught minors this proves it Rabbi said the law is if one Billy entrusts a bailment to another he is responsible not only if a paid Billy entrusts it to an unpaid one so weakening its care but even if an unpaid Billy entrusts to a paid one he is still responsible. Why because he the bailer can say to him you I believe on oath the other I do not it has been stated if he the bailer was negligent thereof and it went out into a meadow and died naturally Abbe in Rabbi's name ruled that he is liable Rabbi in Rabbi's name ruled that he is not liable Abbe in Rabbi's name ruled that he is liable any judge who does not give such a verdict is not a judge not only is he liable on the view that if the beginning is through negligence and the end through an accident one is liable but even on the view that one is not liable in this case he is why because we say the heir of the meadowland killed it Rabbi in Rabbi's name ruled that he is not liable any judge who does not give such a verdict is not a judge not only is he not liable on the view that if the beginning is through negligence and the end through an accident one is not liable but even on the view that he is liable in this case he is not why because we say what difference does one place or Another make to the angel of death now Abbe admits that if it returned to its owner S.C. the Billy and then died he is free why because it had returned and it could not be said that the heir of the meadow killed it whilst Rabbi admits that if it was stolen from the meadow and died naturally in the thief's house he the Billy is responsible why had the angel of death left it alone it still would have been in the thief's house Abbe said to Rabbi according to you who maintain what difference does this place or that make to the angel of death when our Abbe raised an objection before RMI and he answered him it means that the owner authorized the hire to lend it he should rather have answered him what difference does this place or another make to the angel of death he replied according to you who teach the reason of our Yohanan's ruling as being that the bailer can say I do not wish my bailment to be in the hands of another that objection of our Abbe can be raised but according to myself who maintain that it is because he can say you I believe on oath whilst the other I do not believe on oath the objection cannot be raised at all Rami Biham objected if he the bailer took it up to the top of steep rocks and it fell and died it is no accident hence if it died naturally it is accounted an accident and he is not liable yet why so let him the bailer say to him the cold mountain air killed it or the exhaustion of climbing the mountain killed it the meaning there is that he took it up to a fertile and goodly pasture ground if so it is the same even if it fell he should have supported it to prevent it from falling but did not if so consider the first clause if it ascended to the top of steep rocks and then fell down it is an accident yet there too he should have supported it that holds good only if he supported it in its ascent and supported it when it fell said our Jose how shall one do business with his neighbor's cow etc Rab Judah Said in Samuel's name the Halachah is as our Hosea our Samuel be Judah ask Rab Judah you have told us in Samuel's name that our Hosea disputed Talmud, Mas Baba Mitzia in the first Mishnah 2 now is the Halachah his view there too or not he replied our Hosea did indeed dispute in the first two and the Halachah agrees with him in the first two it has been stated likewise our Eliezer said our Hosea differed in the first two and the Halachah agrees with him there also but our Yohanan maintained our Hosea. Agreed in the first Mishnah seeing that he the Billy had already paid for it what only if he actually paid but not otherwise yet did not our high B say in our Yohanan's name he paid is not literally meant but once he says I will pay even if he has not done so the ruling of the Mishnah holds good say thus our Hosea agreed in the first Mishnah seeing that he had already declared I will pay for it Mishnah if a man says to two others I robbed one of you of Amina but do not know. Which of you or the father of one of you deposited a mina with me and I do not know whose he must give each amina since he himself confessed if two made a deposit with one person one amina and the other two hundred zuz this one said the two hundred is mine and the other said likewise the two hundred is mine he must give amina to each whilst the rest lies until Elijah comes said our Jose if so what will the deceiver lose but the whole must lie until Elijah comes likewise if two utensils are deposited one worth amina and the other one thousand zuz this one claims the better one is mine the other claims the better one is mine the inferior one must be given to one of them and out of the superior the value of the inferior is given to the second the rest remaining until Elijah comes said our Jose if so what will the deceiver lose but the whole must lie until Elijah comes Gemara this proves that money is collected as a result of doubt and we do not say let the money stand in the Presumptive ownership of its possessor, but this is contradicted by the following: If two made a deposit with one person, one amen, and the other two hundred zuz, this one said the two hundred is mine, and the other said likewise the two hundred is mine. He must give amen to each, whilst the rest lies until Elijah comes. Said he to him, Would you oppose a bailment to robbery? In the case of robbery, since he committed a transgression, the rabbis penalized him. Whereas in the case of a bailment, where no wrong was committed by him, the rabbis did not penalize him. But bailment may be opposed to bailment, and robbery to robbery. Bailment may be opposed to bailment. For the first clause teaches, or the father of one of you deposited amen with me, and I do not know whose he must give each amen. Now this is contradicted by the very that just quoted: If two made a deposit, etc. Said Rabbi, in the first clause it is regarded as though they had entrusted their money to him in two separate packages. So. That he should have paid particular attention, but in the second clause it is regarded as though they had made their deposits with him in a single package, so that he was not bound to take particular attention. How so both made their deposits with him simultaneously, so that he the Billy can say to them, You yourselves were not particular with each other, should I then have been particular? And robbery may be opposed to robbery. Here we learn if a man says to two others, I robbed one of you of a mana, but I do not know which of you or the father of one of you deposited a mana with me, and I do not know whose he must give each a mana, but the following is opposed thereto if a man robbed one out of five and does not know which one he robbed, and each claims it was me he robbed, he may place the stolen article among them and depart. This is our Tarfon's view. This proves that money is not collected as a result of doubt, but we say let the money stand in the presumptive ownership of its possessor. And whence does it follow that our Mishnah here agrees with our Tarfan because it was taught thereon our Tarfan admits that if one says to two people I robbed one of you of Amena but do not know which of you he must give each Amena there they were claiming from him here it means that he came to fulfill his duty in the sight of heaven this may be proved too for it is stated since he himself confessed this proves it the master said there they were claiming from him and what does he plead Rab? Judah said in Rab's name he is silent Armatina said in Rab's name he Talmud, Mas Baba Matiyah, be protests on the view that he protests but silence is his admission but on the view that he is silent the silence here is not an admission because he can say the reason that I was silent before each is that I thought perhaps it was this one the master said he may place the stolen article among them and depart and can all of them take it and go did not our Abubis have to say in Rab's name whenever he is. Doubtful if an article was left in a certain spot he must not take it in the first instance but if he took must not return it said our safra it is laid by a base said to Rabbi did then our Akiva say that is not the way to clear him of his crime but he must restore the theft to each one
interpreted of one who wishes to fulfill his duty in the sight of heaven. Rabbana said to our Ashi, did then Rabbana say that whenever deposits are made in two separate packages, either Bailey should have paid particular attention, but Rabbana others state our Papa said, I'll admit in the case of two people who entrusted their lambs to a shepherd that the shepherd places them between them and his quit. He replied, the circumstances there are that they deposited the lambs in the shepherd's fold. Without his knowledge, likewise, if two utensils are deposited, one worth a main and the other one thousand zuz, etc., and both instances are necessary. For if the first alone were stated, I might argue only their SC in the case of money. Do the rabbis rule thus because no loss is caused, but in the latter case where great loss is involved in the breaking of the larger utensil, they agree with our Jose. And if the latter case alone were stated, I might argue only here does our Jose rule thus. But in the former, he agrees with the rabbis thus both are necessary. Talmud, Mas Bagamitia, but our Jose's reason is that the deceiver may suffer loss, hence both are necessary on the view of the rabbis. And he the Tana teaches a case of not only this, but this two mission. If a man deposits produce with his neighbor, even if it is suffering loss, he must not touch it. Our Simeon B. Gamaliel said he must sell it by order of the court because it is like returning lost property to its owner. Gemara. What is the reason said our Kahana a man prefers a cab of his own to nine of his neighbors but our Naman B. Isaac said we fear lest the bailer had declared a terima and tithe for other produce and objection is raised if one deposits produce with his neighbor he must not touch it therefore its owner may declare a terima and tithe for other produce now on our Kahana's explanation it is well hence he states therefore but on the view of our Naman B. Isaac how state therefore it means this now that the rabbis have ruled that it may not be sold because we fear that the owner may have declared etc therefore the owner may declare a terima and tithe for other produce Rabbi B. Barhanna said in our Yohanan's name the dispute is only when there is a normal rate of decrease but when the loss exceeds the normal rate of decrease all agree that it must be sold by a court order now he certainly disagrees with our Naman B. Isaac but must we say that he differs from our Kahana to know our Kahana? Referred only to the normal decrease, but did he not say a man prefers a cab of his own to nine of his neighbors? That was a mere exaggeration. An objection is raised. Therefore, its owner may declare a terima and tithe for other produce, but let him fear lest the loss exceeded the normal decrease, so that it was sold. Hence, he the bailer eats people. A loss above the normal decrease is rare, but what if it does happen? We sell it, but let us fear lest the owner might have declared a terima and tithe for other produce. It is in fact sold to priests only at the price of terima. Then, according to our Naman B. Isaac, to let it be sold to priests at the price of terima. They differ in this. His rabbi B. Barhana holds that loss above the normal decrease is altogether rare, and when it does happen, it exceeds the usual rate only after a considerable time. Hence, if the owner declared a terima and tithe for other produce, he would have done so before its loss exceeded the normal. Therefore, when it does exceed it, we can sell it to priests at the price of Terima. Our Naman B. Isaac, however, maintains that a greater decrease than normal is quite frequent, and when it happens, it may happen immediately. Therefore, should you say that it is sold, it may happen that it is sold early, and when the owner declares a Terima and tithe for other produce, he is unaware that it is already sold, and so eats people. An objection is raised if one deposits fruit with his neighbor and it rots. Wine and it sours oil and it putrefies or honey and it turns rancid, he the bailey may not touch it. This is our Meir's ruling, but the sages maintain he effects a remedy for them by selling them on the instructions of the court, and when he sells, he must sell to strangers, not to himself. Similarly, when the charity overseers have no poor to whom to distribute their funds, they must change the copper coins with others, not themselves. The overseers of the soup kitchen, when they have no poor to whom. To make a distribution must sell to others not themselves now incidentally he the tana states fruit and it rots surely that means even more than the normal decrease no it means within the normal deterioration but wine and it sours oil and it putrefies or honey and it turns rancid are more than normal deterioration these are different having arrived at that stage they remain so now when oil putrefies or honey becomes rancid talmud mas babamitsia be for what is it fit oil is abuse to leather merchants honey for the soreness of camels but the sages maintain he must effect a remedy for them by selling them on the instructions of the court but what remedy does he effect said arashi in respect of the courts wherein do they differ one master holds we care about a great loss but not about a small one whilst the other master sc the rabbis holds that we care even for a small loss our simian begamaliel said he must sell it by order of the court because it is like returning lost Property to its owner, it has been stated. Our Abba son of our Jacob said in our Yohanan's name, the Halacha agrees with the sages, but our Yohanan has already said that once for Rabbi Barhana said in our Yohanan's name, wherever our Gamaliel taught in our mission, the Halacha agrees with him, excepting in respect to sureties and the second ruling on proof. There is a dispute of Amram on our Yohanan's views. Now from our Simeon B. Gamaliel, we may deduce that a relative is authorized to enter upon a captive's estate, whilst from the rabbis we may infer that a relative is not permitted to enter upon a captive's estate. How so perhaps our Simeon B. Gamaliel ruled thus only in this case, since the stock itself is consumed, but there he too may hold that we do not authorize possession, whilst on the other hand, the rabbis rule thus only here in accordance with either our Kahana's reason or our Naman B. Isaac S. But there it may indeed be that entry is permitted. Are we to say that these are two opinions? Independent of each other, but Rab Judah said in Samuel's name, the Halacha agrees with our Simeon B. Gamaliel. Whilst Samuel ruled, a relative is permitted to enter upon a captive's estate. Surely that is because it is one ruling. No, there are two rulings. Reason two supports this. For Rabbi said in Arnaman's name, the Halacha agrees with the sages. Nevertheless, Arnaman ruled, a relative is authorized to enter a captive's estate. Hence, this proves that there are two different rulings. This proves that it has been stated if a man is taken captive. Rab said his next of kin is not authorized to enter upon his estate. Samuel said his next of kin is authorized to enter into his estate. Now, if it was heard that he was dead, all agree that he is authorized to enter. They differ where it was not heard that he had died. Rab said we do not authorize him to enter lest he cause them the estates to deteriorate. But Samuel said we authorize him to take possession. For since a master said we value it for them as for an Eretz he will not permit deterioration and objection is raised our Eliezer said from the implication of the verse and my wrath shall wax hot and I will kill you with the sword I know that their wives shall be widows and their children fatherless why then is it stated and your wives shall be widows and your children fatherless this teaches that their wives will seek to remarry and not be permitted and their children desire to enter upon their father's estate and not be allowed said Rabba what we learned is that they are not permitted to take possession and sell now this happened in Nihartia and Arshis hate decided the matter by reference to this very the said Aram Rome to him but perhaps what we learned was to enter and sell perhaps you are from Pamadai that he retorted where they draw an elephant through the eye of a needle for these are taught side by side with the widowhood of the wives just as these are not permitted to remarry and also here too the SC the ears are not Allowed to take possession at all now whether the next of kin is permitted to enter upon a captive's estate is disputed by Tanaim for it has been taught if one enters upon a captive's estate he is not ejected thence moreover even if he there heard that they, the owners were making ready to come to reclaim the land and he anticipated it by reaping and consuming the produce he is a zealous man who profits thereby now the following are included in the term a captive's estate if one's father brother or one of his legatus went overseas and it was reported that he had died if a man enters into abandoned estate he is ejected therefrom and the following are abandoned estates if one's father brother or one of his legatus went overseas and it was not reported that he had died our Simeon B. Gamaliel observed I have heard that abandoned are as captive's estates if a man enters into forsaken property he is ejected thence and the following are forsaken estates if one's father Brother or one of his legatus is here, SC in the country, but it is not known whether he has gone now. Wherein do the former differ from the latter that the former are designated abandoned and the latter forsaken? Talmud, Mas Babamitia abandoned implies against their will as it is written, but the seventh year thou shalt let it rest and abandon it, i.e., by royal dispensation, whereas forsaken implies voluntarily as it is written, the mother shall be forsaken of her children
then the abandoned estates to deteriorate and for all of these evaluation is made as for an heiress what does all of these include it includes our nomen's dictum in Samuel's name if a man is taken captive his next of kin is authorized to enter into his estates if he leaves voluntarily his next of kin is not permitted to enter upon his estates now our nomen giving his own opinion said a fugitive is as a captive why does he flee shall we say on account of poll tax but that is voluntary but he means one who flees on account of political offenses Rab Judah said in Samuel's name if a man is taken captive and leaves standing corn to be reaped grapes to be vintage dates to be harvested or olives to be gathered Beth didn't enter his estate and appoint a steward who reaps vintages harvest and gathers after that the next of kin is permitted to take possession then let a permanent steward be appointed a steward is not appointed for bearded men are who not said a minor is not permitted to enter upon a captive's estates nor the next of kin upon a minor's estates nor a next of kin of a next of kin upon a minor's estates a minor is not permitted to enter upon a captive's estates lest he injure them nor a next of kin of a next of kin upon a minor's estates this refers to a brother on the mother's side nor a next of kin upon a minor's estates since he the minor cannot protest he may take presumptive possession thereof said Rabbah it follows from our Hunas dictum that one cannot claim presumptive ownership of a minor's estate Talmud Mas Bagamitzia B even if he attained his majority now this applies only to a brother by his father but there is no objection to a brother by his mother and even of a brother by his father this applies only to land but there is no objection in respect of houses and even in respect of land this holds good only if no deed of partition was drawn up but if a deed of partition had been drawn up it is generally known this however is not so it makes no difference whether a brother by his father or a brother by his mother whether land or houses whether a deed of partition had been drawn up or not we do not authorize them to take possession a certain old woman had three daughters she and one daughter were taken captive and of the other two daughters one died leaving a child behind said Abbe what shall we do shall we temporarily assign the estates to the third sister but perhaps the old woman is dead and a relative is not permitted to enter upon a minor's estates shall we assign the estates to the child but perhaps the woman is not dead and a minor is not permitted to enter a captive's estate said Abbe therefore half is given to the last sister and a steward is appointed in respect of the other half on behalf of the child Rabbah said since a steward is appointed for one half a steward is appointed for the other half two subsequently it was heard that the old woman was dead thereupon Abbe ruled a third is given to the Sister a third to the child and as for the remaining third a sixth is given to the sister and a steward is appointed for the other sixth on behalf of the child Rabbah said since a steward is appointed for one sixth a steward is appointed for the other sixth there came a brother to Mari B. Isaac from B. Jose saying to him divide my father's estates with me I do not know you he replied so they went before our Hizda said he to him Mari speaks truly to you for it is written and Joseph knew his brethren but they knew him not which teaches that he had gone forth without the stamp of a beard and came before them with one go then he continued and produced witnesses that you are his brother I have witnesses he replied but they are afraid of him because he is a powerful man thereupon he said to the other Mari go you and bring witnesses that he is not your brother is that just as he exclaimed the onus of proof lies on the claimant thus do a judge in your case he retorted and for all who are powerful men of your like, but after all he argued witnesses will come and not testify the truth they will not commit two wrongs he rejoined subsequently witnesses came who testified that he was his brother let him share with me the vineyards and gardens which he planted demanded he, he speaks rightly to you said he are his staff for we learned if one leaves sons adults and minors and the adults improve the property they improve it for both equally Talmud, Mas Baba Metzia and thus did. Rabbi rule likewise they improve it for both equally said Abbe to him how compare there the adults are aware of the existence of the minors and forego their labor on their behalf but here was Himari aware of him that he should forego now the matter traveled about until it reached RMI said he to them his disciples even a greater thing has been said his evaluation is made for them as for an heiress shall he then not be paid likewise in his own this observation was brought. Back to our Hizda said he to them how compare there in the case of a captive's estates he entered with authority of the court here he entered without authority moreover he the claimant was a minor when Mari first took possession and a relative is not permitted to enter into a minor's estates when this reply was taken back to RMI he said to them they did not complete it. See the narrative of this lawsuit before me by informing me that he was a minor mission if a man entrusts produce to his neighbor he the billy may when returning it make a deduction for decreases as follows for wheat and rice nine half kabs per core for barley and millet nine kabs per core for spelt and linseed three seahs per core all depends on the quantity and the time said are Yohanan Binuri what do the mice care they eat the same whether the quantity be large or small hence he may make deductions only for one core our Judah said if it is a large quantity he cannot deduct decreases at all because it Increases Gemara, but rice decreases by much more. Said Rabbi Barhan in Aryohanan's name. This refers to peeled rice for spelt and linseed. Three seahs per core, etc. Aryohanan said in Arhai's name. This refers to linseed in its calyxes. It has been taught likewise for spelt and linseed in its calyxes and unpeeled rice. Three seahs per core all depends on the quantity, etc. A tanda taught it is thus per core per annum. Said Aryohanan binuri, etc. It has been taught. The sages said to Aryohanan, much of it deteriorates and much is scattered. Tanda taught this holds good only if he the billy mixed it with his own produce. But if he assigned him a special corner, he can say to him, behold, here is yours before you. But what if he did mix it with his crops? Let him see how much his own was. It refers to one who drew his supplies therefrom. Then let us see how much he drew. He does not know. Arjuna said, if it is etc. What constitutes a large quantity? Said Rabbi Barhan in Aryohanan's. Name ten cores it has been taught likewise what constitutes a large quantity ten cores a ten recited before our nomen when was the said if he measured the corn for him out of the granary and returned it to him out of the granary but if he measured it for him out of the granary and returned it to him out of the house he may make no deduction for decreases because if the quantity increases are we dealing with imbeciles he retorted who give with a large measure and take back with a small. Perhaps you mean the season of the granary thus when is the said if he measures it out to him at the harvest season and returns it to him in the harvest season but if he measures it out to him at the harvest season and returns it to him in the rainy season winter he may make no deduction for decreases because it increases said our papa to abey if so the barrel containing produce ought to burst it did once happen that the barrel did in fact burst alternatively at the reason that the Barrel does not generally burst is on account of the tightness of the crops mission he may deduct a sixth in the case of one Arjuna said a fifth he may deduct three logs of oil per hundred which is a log and a half for lease and one and a half for absorption but if it was refined oil he may make no deduction for lease if they the containers were old barrels he may make no deduction for absorption Arjuna said even if he sells refined oil to his neighbor during the whole year the latter must accept a log and a half of lease percent tomorrow but there is no dispute each master rules in accordance with his region in the locality of the first master they covered the inside of the wine barrels with wax so there was not much absorption whilst in that of the other SC Arjuna they covered them with pitch hence they absorbed more alternatively it is on account of the clay used in making the barrels the one quality absorbed more the other less in Rab Judah's locality 48. Jukpuls went to the standard barrel. A barrel being sold at six sous and Rab Judah retailed six jukpuls per sous Talmud. Mas Bagamitia B now deduct 36 from the 48 for six sous leaves 12 deduct 8 which is the sixth allowed for absorption leaves 4 but Samuel said he who profits must not profit more than a sixth there are the barrels and the leaves if so it exceeds one sixth there is his trouble and the cost of the crier if it was refined oil he may make no deduction for leaves etc but it is impossible that it, the barrel shall not absorb said Arnaman this refers to barrels lined with pitch Abbe said you may even say that they are not pitch lined being laden they are laden Arjuna said even if he sells refined oil to his neighbor during the whole year the latter must accept a log and a half of leaves percent Abbe said when you examine the matter you will conclude that in Arjuna's opinion leaves may be mixed with the oil whilst on it. Rabbi's view leaves may not be mixed in our Judah's opinion leaves may be mixed and that is the reason that he the vendee must accept the lease because he the
Whilst in the opinion of Arjuna Lees may not be mixed up and this is the reason that he must accept it because he can say to him had I desired to mix it up it would not have been permitted to me whilst you also refuse to accept it separately if one buys and sells at the same price do you call him a merchant a tanda tata vendi and the depositor are both alike in respect of the scum what is meant by in respect of the scum shall we say just as the vendi does not accept the scum so does the depositor likewise not accept it but let him the bailey say to him what am I to do with your scum but on the contrary just as the depositor must accept the scum so must the purchaser likewise yet must the vendi accept the scum but it has been taught Arjuna said the loss due to the money oil was assigned to the vendor alone since the vendi accepts a log and a half of sediment without the scum there is no difficulty the former treats of one who pays his money in tishri and Receive the wine or oil in Nissan at Tishri prices the latter treats of one who pays his money in Nissan and receives the oil in Nissan at Nissan prices mission if a man deposits a barrel with his neighbor its owner not designating a place for it and he the billy moves it and it is broken if it is broken whilst in his hand if he moved it for his purposes he is responsible for its own need he is not responsible if it is broken after he puts it down whether he moved it for his need or for its own he is not liable if the owner designates a place for it and he moves it and it is broken whether whilst in his hand or after he puts it down if he moved it for his purposes he is responsible if for its own need he is not liable Gamara who is the authority of the mission it is our Ishmael who ruled the owner's knowledge is unnecessary for it has been taught if one steals a lamb from a fold or a seller from a purse he must return it once he stole it this is our Ishmael's view our Akiba. Said Talmud, Mas Baba Matiya, the owner's knowledge is required if our Ishmael, why particularly if he designated a place even if he did not it is still the same this is a case of it goes without saying thus it goes without saying that if he designated a place for it the owner's knowledge of its return is not required since it is its place but even if no designation was made so that it is not its place yet the owner's knowledge is not required then consider the second clause if the owner designates a place for it and he moves it and it is broken whether in his hand or after he puts it down if he moved it for his purpose he is responsible if for its own need he is not liable that agrees with our Akiba who ruled the owner's knowledge is required if our Akiba why particularly if designation is made even if noted is likewise so this is a case of it goes without saying thus it goes without saying that if he did not designate a place for it the owner's knowledge of its return is Required since it is not its place but even if designation was made so that it is its place the owner's knowledge is still required then the first clause agrees with our Ishmael and the second with our Akiba even so for our Yohanan said he who will explain me the mission of barrel so as to agree with one tanda I will carry his attire after him to the baths our Jacob B. Abba interpreted it before Rabbis meaning that he took it with the intention of stealing it our Nathan B. Abba interpreted it before Rabbis meaning that he took it with the intention of using it wherein do the S. C. R. Jacob B. Abba and our Nathan B. Abba differ in whether unlawful use must be accompanied by damage he who says he must have taken it in order to steal it holds that unlawful use must result in damage whilst he who maintains that it was in order to use it is of the opinion that unlawful use need not result in damage Arshis hate raised an objection does he the tanda state he took it he actually says he moves I.T. but said Arshis hate the streets of one who took it in order to reach down birds whilst standing upon it and he the tanda of the mission holds that a borrower without permission is regarded as a robber thus the whole of it. S.C. the mission agrees with our Ishmael the second clause meaning that he did not return it to its place and our Yohanan he puts it down implies in its own place it has been stated Rab and Levi one maintained unlawful use by the Bailey must involve damage and it. Other maintained it need not it may be proved that it was Rab who ruled that unlawful use need not involve damage for it has been taught if a shepherd who was guarding his flock left it and entered the town then a wolf came and destroyed a sheep or a lion and tore it to pieces he is free from liability if he put his staff or wallet upon it he is liable now we pondered thereon because he put his staff or wallet upon it he is liable but he also took them away whereupon our Naman said in it. Name of Rabbi Abba in Rab's name it means that it is still upon it yet even if it was still upon it what of that but he had not taken possession of it our Samuel son of our Isaac answered in Rab's name it means that he smote it with his staff and it ran before him but he had inflicted no damage upon it hence this surely proves that he Rab holds that unlawful use need not involve damage no say thus he had weakened it with his staff this follows too from the fact that he states he smote it with his staff this proves it now since Rab holds that unlawful use must involve damage it follows that Levi maintains that it does not what is Levi's reason said are you on the authority of our Jose Binire unlawful use stated in connection with the paid Billy differs from that stated in connection with the gratuitous Billy Talmud Mas Baba Matiabi but I say it is not different wherein and why is it different for unlawful use should not have been stated in connection with the paid Billy and it would have been inferred from a gratuitous Billy if an unpaid Billy who is not responsible for theft or loss is nevertheless liable if he puts it to bailment to use then a paid Billy who is responsible for theft or loss is surely liable if he puts it to use why then did scripture state them both to teach you that unlawful use need not involve damage but I say it is not different in accordance with our Eliezer who maintained both have the same purpose how say both have the same purpose because one can refute that argument as for a gratuitous Billy he may be liable if he used it because he must repay double on a false plea of theft and he who does not refute it thus is of the opinion that liability to the principal without the option of an oath is a greater responsibility than having to pay double after a false oath Robbis said unlawful use need not have been mentioned in connection with either an unpaid or a paid Billy and it could have been inferred from a borrower if the borrower who in using it acts with its owner's permission is nevertheless responsible for unpreventable accidents surely the same applies to unpaid and paid billies then why is it stated in connection with these two wants to teach you that unlawful use need not involve damage and the other that you should not say it is sufficient that that which is deduced a minority shall be as that from which it is deduced just as a borrower is exempt if the owner is in his service so also are unpaid and paid billies exempt if the owner is in their service now on the view that unlawful use must involve damage what is the purpose of these two statements on unlawful use one that you should not say it is sufficient that that which is deduced a minority shall be as that from which it is deduced and the other for what was taught if a man shall deliver unto his neighbor money or stuff to keep and it be stolen if the thief be not found and it Master of the house shall be brought unto the judges for an oath you say for an oath but perhaps it is not so the meaning being for judgment unlawful use is stated below and unlawful use is stated above just as there the reference is to an oath so here too for an oath is meant Talmud, Mas Baba Matiya mission if a man deposited money with his neighbor who bound it up and slung it over his shoulder or entrusted it to his minor son or daughter and locked the door before them but not properly he is liable because he did not guard it in the manner of billies but if he guarded it in the manner of billies he is exempt Gemara as for all it is well since indeed he did not guard it in the manner of billies but if he bound it up and slung it over his shoulder what else should he have done said Rabbah in our Isaac's name scripture said and thou shalt bind up the money in thine hand even if bound up it should be in thy hand our Isaac also said one's money should always be ready to hand for it is written and thou shalt bind up the money in thy hand our Isaac also said one should always divide his wealth into three parts investing a third in land a third in merchandise and keeping a third ready to hand our Isaac also said a blessing is found only in what is hidden from the eye for it is written the Lord shall command the blessing upon the in thy hidden things the school of our Ishmael taught a blessing comes only to that over which the eye has no power for it is said the Lord shall command the blessing upon the in thy hidden things our rabbis taught when one goes to measure the corn in his granary he should pray may it be thy will O Lord our God to send a blessing upon the work of our hands having started to measure he prays blessed is he who sent the blessing on this pile but if he measured and then prayed it is a vain prayer because a blessing is not found in that which is already weighed measured or counted but only in that which is hidden from the eye for it is said the Lord shall command the blessing upon the in the hidden thing Samuel said money can only be guarded by placing it in the earth said Rabbi yet Samuel admits that on Sabbath eve at twilight the rabbis did not put one to that trouble yet if he tarried after the conclusion of the Sabbath long enough to bury it the
Sen Raphram of Sakara one hand breadth a certain man deposited money with his neighbor who placed it in a cot of bulrushes then it was stolen Sen Arjoseph though it was proper care in respect to thieves yet it was negligence in respect to fire hence the beginning of the trusteeship was with negligence though its end was through an accident and therefore he is liable others say though it was negligence in respect to fire it was due care in respect to thieves and when its beginning is with negligence and its end through an accident he the billy is not liable and the law is that when the beginning thereof is with negligence and the end through an accident he is responsible a certain man deposited money with his neighbor on his demand and give me my money he replied I do not know where I put it so he went before Rabba who said to him every plea of I do not know constitutes negligence go and pay him a certain man deposited money with his neighbor who entrusted it to his Mother, she put it in her work basket and it was stolen. Said Rabba, what ruling shall judges give in this case? Shall we say to him, go and repay? Then he can reply, Talmud, Mas Baba Metziah, be all who deposit do so with the understanding that the wife and children of the depository may be entrusted with the bailment. Shall we say to his mother, go and pay? She can plead. He did not tell me that if the money was not his own that I should bury it. Shall we say to him, why did you not tell her? He can argue. If I told her it was mine, she was the more likely to guard it well. But said Rabba, he must swear that he had entrusted that money to his mother, and his mother must swear that she had placed that money in her work basket and it was stolen. Then he the billy is free. A certain steward for orphans bought an ox on their behalf and entrusted it to a herdsman having no molars or front teeth to eat with it. Died. Said Rami Bihama, what verdict shall judges give in this case? Shall we say to the steward? Go and pay, he can reply. I entrusted it to the herdsman. Shall we say to the herdsman, go and pay, he can plead. I put it together with the other oxen and placed food before it. I could not know that it was not eating, but why not consider the fact that the herdsman was a paid keeper of the orphans and as such should have made careful observation. Had the orphan suffered loss, it would be even so, but we treat here of a case where the orphan suffered no loss because the first owner of the ox was found and they received their money back from him. And who is the plaintiff, the owner of the ox who pleads that he, the steward, should have informed him, but what was he to inform him? He knew full well that it was a sale under false pretenses. He, the owner of the ox, was a middleman who buys here and sells there. Therefore, rules Rami, he, the middleman, must swear that he did not know of the animal's toothless condition and the herdsman must pay at the cheap price of meat a certain man. Deposited hops with his neighbor who himself also had a pile thereof. Now he instructed his brewer take from this pile, but he went and took from the other set. Aram room, what verdict shall the judges give in this case? Shall they say to him, Go and pay? He can plead. I said to him, Take from this pile. Shall we say to the brewer, Go and pay? He can argue. He did not say to me, Take from this pile, but not from that. But if he, the brewer, tarried sufficient time to bring him his own hops, yet did not do so. Then he, the billy, revealed his mind that he was pleased therewith. There was no tearing yet. After all, what losses there did he, the depository, not benefit thereby? Said our Samus, son of Rabba, the beer turned into vinegar. Our Ashi said the reference is to thorns Talmud, Mas Baba Metziah, and he must pay him the value of the thorns mission. If a man deposits money with a money changer, if bound up, he must not use it. Therefore, if it is lost, he does not bear the risks thereof. If lose, he May use it therefore if it is lost he bears the risks but if he deposits it with a private individual whether it is bound up or loose he may not use it therefore if it is lost he does not bear the risks thereof a shopkeeper is as a private individual this is our mayor's view our Judah said a shopkeeper is as a money changer tomorrow because it is bound up he may not use it said RC in Rab Judah's name this was taught of money bound up and sealed Armari said it means that it was tied with an unusual not others say Armari propounded what if it was tied with an unusual not the question stands if loose he may use it etc Arhuna said even if an unpreventable accident happened there too he is responsible but he the ten estates if lost it is as Rabba said for Rabba said elsewhere stolen means by armed robbers lost that his ship foundered at sea Arnaman however said if an unpreventable accident happened there too he is not responsible Rabba objected to Arnaman. According to you who maintain that he is not responsible if an unpreventable accident happened to it thus showing that he is not accounted a borrower in respect of it but if not a borrower he is not a paid bill either he replied to him in this I agree with you but since he may benefit therefrom he must confer benefit in return for the benefit he enjoys that should he come across a purchase showing profit he can buy it therewith he becomes a paid bill in respect thereto our nomin. Raised an objection to Arhuna's ruling if he the treasurer of the sanctuary deposits money with a money changer if bound up he may not use it therefore if he expends it the treasurer is not liable to a trespass offering if loose he may use it therefore if he expends it the treasurer is liable to a trespass offering but if you say even if an unpreventable accident befalls it the money changer is responsible why particularly if he expends it even if he does not expend it he should likewise. Be liable, he replied, the same law holds good even if he does not expend it, but since the first clause states if he expends it, the second clause teaches likewise if he expends it, mission if a man makes unlawful use of a bailment, Bethsham I maintain he is punished in respect of decrease and increase, Beth Hillel rule he must pay its value as when it is withdrawn, our Akiva said as when the claim is made, Gamar Rabba said if one steals a barrel of wine from his neighbor originally, i.e. at the time of theft worth a zoos, but now when he disposes thereof worth for zoos, if he breaks or drinks it he must pay for if it is broken of itself he must pay a zoos, why since if it were in existence it would be returnable to its owner as it is, it is precisely when he drinks or breaks it that he robs him thereof, and we learned all robbers pay according to the time of robbery if it is broken of itself he must pay a zoos, why he does nothing at all to it then for what do you declare him? Liable for the time of the robbery, but then it was worth only as we learned Beth Hillel rule he must pay its value as when it is withdrawn. What is the meaning of as when it is withdrawn? Shall we say as when it is withdrawn from the world and in what case do Beth Hillel differ if in the case of depreciation? But is there any such opinion? Did we not learn all robbers pay as at the time of robbery? And if in the case of appreciation, then it is identical with Beth Shemis ruling Talmud. Mas Baba Metziah hence it is obvious that it means as when it is withdrawn from its owner's possession. Shall we then say that Rabba rules in accordance with Beth Shemai Rabba can answer you in the case of appreciation none dispute when do they dispute in the case of depreciation Beth Shemai maintain unlawful use need involve no loss and when it depreciates it is in its possession that it does so whereas Beth Hillel maintain that unlawful use must involve loss and when it Depreciates it does so in the possession of its owner. If so, when Rabba said unlawful use need not involve damage, are we to say that Rabba ruled as Beth Shammai? But we treat here of e.g. one who moves it in order to fetch down birds whilst standing upon it, and they differ in respect to an unauthorized borrower. Beth Shammai maintained an unauthorized borrower is a robber, and therefore when it depreciates it does so in his possession, whereas Beth Hillel hold that an unauthorized borrower is not a robber, and when it depreciates it does so in the owner's possession. If so, when Rabba said an unauthorized borrower in the view of the rabbis is accounted a robber, are we to say that Rabba ruled as Beth Shammai? But there they differ in respect of the increments of a stolen article. Beth Shammai maintained the increments in the stolen article belong to the robbed person, whereas Beth Hillel hold that they belong to the robber, and they differ in the same controversy as the following ten aim for it. Has been taught if one steals a you and shears it or it bears young he must pay for that itself its shearings and its young this is our mayor's view our Judah said the stolen article returns in its original state this interpretation may also be inferred because it is stated Beth Shammai maintained he is punished in respect of decrease and increase Beth Hillel rule he must pay as when it is withdrawn this proves it our Akiva said as when the claim is made Rab Judah said in Samuel's name the Halachah agrees with our Akiva yet our Akiva admits in a case where there are witnesses why because scripture saith he shall give it unto him to whom it appertaineth in the day of his trespass offering and since there are witnesses he incurs a trespass offering at that very moment our Ashai said to Rab Judah Rabbi you say so but our Jose said in our Yohanan's name thus our Akiva differed even in a case where there are witnesses why because scripture saith he shall give it unto him to whom it appertaineth in the Day of his trespass offering,
Mas Bagamatia Gemara, how do we know if for our rabbis taught and the master of the house shall be brought unto the judges for all manner of trespass? Beth Shammai maintained this teaches that he is liable on account of unlawful intention just as for an unlawful act, but Beth Hillel say he is not liable until he actually puts it to use for it is said to see whether he have put his hand unto his neighbor's good said Beth Shammai to Beth Hillel, but it is already stated for. Any word of trespass whereupon Beth Hillel retorted to Beth Shammai, but it is already stated to see whether he have put his hand unto his neighbor's goods if so what is the teaching of for any word of trespass for I might have thought I know it only of himself whence do I know that he is liable if he instructed his servant or his agent to use it from the teaching for any word of trespass if he inclines the barrel etc. Rabbi said this was taught only if it is broken if however it's soured. He must pay for the whole of it why it was his arrows that affected it but if he lifts it and takes a rebi from it etc. Samuel said takes is not meant literally but once he lifts it up in order to take he is henceforth responsible even if he does not take it shall we say that in Samuel's opinion unlawful use need not involve loss I will tell you that is not so but here it is different because he desires that the whole barrel shall be subservient to this rebi or ashi propounded what? Then if he lifts up a person in order to take it dinar therefrom is it wine alone that can be guarded only by means of other wine whereas a Zeus can be guarded by itself or perhaps the care given to a purse is not the same as that of a single dinar the question stands C H A P T E R I B Mishnah gold acquires silver but silver does not acquire gold copper acquires silver but silver does not acquire copper cancelled coins acquire current ones but current coins do not acquire cancelled coins. Uncoined metal acquires coins but coined metal does not acquire uncoined metal mobile less acquire coins but coins do not acquire mobile less this is the general principle all mobile less acquire each other e.g. if a drew into his possession beast produce without paying him the money he cannot retract if he paid him the money but did not draw into his possession his produce he can withdraw but the SC the sages said he who punished the generation of the flood and the generation of the dispersion he will take vengeance of him who does not stand by his word Arsimian said he who has the money in his hand has the advantage Gemara Rabbi taught his son Arsimian gold acquires silver said he to him master in your youth you did teach us silver acquires gold now advanced in age you reverse it and teach gold acquires silver now how did he reason in his youth and how did he reason in his old age in his youth he reasoned since gold is more valuable it ranks as money while silver which is of lesser Value is regarded as produce, hence the delivery of produce affects a title to the money, but at a later age he reasons since silver coin Talmud, Mas Babamitia B is current and ranks as money, whilst gold, which is not current, is accounted as produce, and so the produce affects a title to the money. Our Ashi said reason supports the opinion held in his youth, since if the Mishnah teaches copper acquires silver, now should you agree that silver ranks as produce, but of gold it is well, hence it states copper acquires silver to show that though it is accounted as produce in relation to gold, it ranks as money in respect of copper, but should you maintain that silver ranks as money in respect of gold, and the question arises if in relation to gold, which is more valuable, you say that it ranks as money, is it necessary to state so in relation to copper, seeing that it is both more valuable and also current, it is necessary, I might have thought that the copper coins where they do. Circulate have greater currency than silver, therefore we are taught that since there is a place where they have no circulation, they rank as produce now. Our high two regards gold coin as money for Rab once borrowed gold denarii from our highest daughter. Subsequently, denarii having appreciated, he went before our high go and repay her current and full weight coin. He ordered now if you agree that gold ranks as money, it is well, but should you maintain that it is produce, it is the equivalent of borrowing a se offer a se to be repaid later, which is forbidden. Dash that does not prove it for Rab himself possessed gold denarii when he incurred the debt, and that being so, it is just as though he had said to her, Lend me until my son comes, or until I find the key. Rabba said the following tana is of the opinion that gold is money, for it has been taught the parata which they the sages spoke of is an eighth of an Italian is what is the practical bearing thereof in respect of a Woman's kitchen the Isar is a 24th of a silver dinar what is the practical bearing thereof in respect to buying and selling a silver dinar is a 25th of a gold dinar what is the practical bearing thereof in respect to the redemption of the firstborn now if you agree that a gold is accounted as money it is well the tana thus assesses the coins on something of fixed value but should you say that it ranks as produce can the tana give an assessment on the basis of that which rises and falls in value sometimes the priest may have to give him change whilst at others he the father will have to give an additional sum to the priest hence it is proved that it ranks as money this proof is conclusive we learned elsewhere Betcham I say one must not turn silver sellers into gold dinari but Bethilel permitted now are Yohanan and Reshlegish differ thereon one maintains that the dispute concerns exchanging sellers for dinari Betcham I holds that silver coin Ranks as money whereas gold counts as produce and money may not be redeemed by produce whilst in the opinion of Bethilel silver coin ranks as produce and gold as money and produce may be redeemed by money but all agree that actual produce may be redeemed by gold in area why so by analogy with silver coin on the view of Bethilel thus consider silver according to Bethilel though ranking as produce of gold it nevertheless counts as money in respect to real produce so is gold too according to Bethshamai though accounted as produce of silver it ranks as money in respect to real produce but the other maintains the dispute concerns the exchanging of real produce for gold in area too now on the view that the dispute concerns the exchanging of real produce for gold in area too then instead of stating their dispute in reference to the exchange of sellers for denarii let them state it with reference to actual produce for denarii of the dispute. Were thus taught I might have thought that it applies only to the exchange of produce for denarii but as for exchanging sell I am for denarii Beth Hillel concede to Beth Shammai that gold visible silver ranks as produce and that silver may consequently not be redeemed by gold therefore we are informed that it is not so it may be proved that it is Aryohanan who holds that it may not be redeemed thus for Aryohanan said Talmud, Mas Baba Matiyah a dinar may not be lent for a dinar to be returned now which dinar is meant shall we say a silver dinar for a silver dinar to be repaid but is there any view that it does not rank as money even in relation to itself hence it must obviously mean a gold dinar for a gold dinar now with whom does this ruling agree if with Beth Hillel but they maintain that it ranks as coin therefore it must surely be in accordance with Beth Shammai thus proving that it was Aryohanan who held that such redemption is not permissible no in truth I may. Assert that Aryohanan ruled that such redemption may be made but alone is different for since the rabbis treated it as produce in reference to buying and selling as we say that it is that SC gold which appreciates or depreciates it ranks as produce in reference to loans too this is reasonable too for when Rabin came he said in Aryohanan's name though it was ruled that a dinar may not be lent for a dinar to be repaid yet the second tithe may be redeemed there with this proves it come and here if one changes a seller's worth of second tithe copper coins Beth Shammai rule the full seller's worth of coins must be changed but Bethilel rule he may change only a shekel's worth into silver and retain a shekel's worth of coins now if in Beth Shammai's opinion redemption may be made with copper brutas can there be a doubt that it may be redeemed with gold copper coins are different for where they circulate they have greater currency another version puts his thus Aryohanan and Resh. Lakish differ thereon one maintains that the dispute concerns changing sellers for gold in area Beth I hold that the money implies the first money but not the second whereas Beth Hillel argue the money money implies extension thus including even a second redemption of money but all agree that actual produce may be redeemed by gold in area since it SC the gold in area is after all still the first money whilst the other maintains the dispute concerns the exchanging of real produce for gold in area too now on the view that the dispute refers only to the exchange of sellers for denarii instead of stating the dispute in reference to the exchange of sellers for denarii let it be stated in reference to the exchange of sellers for sellers if the dispute were stated thus I might have thought that it applies only there too but as for exchanging sellers for gold in area Beth concede to Beth that gold ranks as produce in respect to silver and therefore such. Redemption is not permissible hence we are taught otherwise come and here if one exchanges a se
While Speth Hillel are of the opinion that we do not fear that he may postpone his pilgrimages for even if they are insufficient to change into a dinar he will still take them up but all agree that produce may be redeemed with gold denarii for since in rods have kept long he will certainly not keep it back but the other maintains the dispute refers even to the exchange of produce for denarii now according to the version that by biblical law the exchange is indeed permitted but that the rabbis forbade it it is well hence he the tanna teaches he may turn he may not turn but according to the version that they differ in scriptural law he should have stated one can redeem one cannot redeem this difficulty remains it has been stated rab and levi one maintains coins can affect the barter the other rules that they cannot set are papa what is his reason who maintains that a coin cannot affect the barter because his the recipient's mind is set on the legend thereof and the legend is Liable to cancellation, we learn gold acquires silver. Does that not mean even in virtue of barter, thus proving that a coin may affect a barter no only in virtue of payment? If so, instead of stating gold acquires silver, he should have said gold sets up a liability for silver. Learn gold sets up a liability for etc. Reason supports this too, since the second clause states silver does not acquire gold. Now, should you agree that it means in virtue of payment? It is well, thus we say gold ranks as produce silver as money, and money cannot affect a title in respect of produce. But should you maintain that the reference is to barter, let each acquire the other. Moreover, it has been taught silver does not acquire gold. E.g., if one sells 25 silver denarii for a gold dinar, even if the other party takes possession of the silver, he does not acquire it until he the first takes possession of the gold. Now, should you agree that the reference is to payment? It is well, therefore, he gains no title. There too, but if you maintain that the streets of barter let him acquire it, what then is payment? If so, consider the first clause gold acquire silver, e.g., if one sold a gold dinar for 25 silver denarii, immediately the other party takes possession of the gold, the ownership of the silver vest in the first wherever it be. Now, should you agree that the reference is to barter it is well, hence it is taught the ownership of the silver vest in the first wherever it be, but should you maintain that it treats of payment instead of saying thus he the tana should have taught the man the recipient of the gold becomes liable for the silver set or ashi after all it refers to payment and what is meant by wherever it be is just as it is as he stipulated thus if he had stated I will give you coins out of a new purse, he cannot give him coins out of an old purse, even if they are superior. Why? Because he can say I need them to store away our papa said even on the view that a coin. Cannot affect the barter though indeed it cannot affect the barter it can nevertheless be acquired through barter for this may be compared to produce according to our Arnaman's view thus though in Arnaman's view produce cannot affect the barter yet it can surely be acquired through barter so coin two is not in any way different an objection is raised if one is standing in a granary and has no money with him he may say to his friend behold this produce is given to you as a gift Talmud, Mas Baba, Metziah then he may say let it see the produce be redeemed for the money I have at home hence it is because he has no money with him but if he had money in his hand he should rather give possession thereof to his friend through Meshika who would then redeem the tithe which is a preferable procedure since he would then be a real stranger but if you say that coin may be acquired through barter let him the tithe owner give possession of the money he has at home to his friend by means of a scarf and then let the latter redeem it the latter has no scarf then let him give possession thereof through soil he has no soil but it is stated if one is standing in a granary it means in a granary not belonging to him and does the tanna take the trouble of teaching us about a naked man who possesses not hence it must surely be that coin cannot be acquired by barter this proves it and our papa himself retracted as we find that our papa had 13,000 denarii at which he transferred to our samuel biaha along with the threshold of his house when he our samuel biaha came with the money he our papa went forth to meet him up to talk to revert to the original discussion and Ola said likewise coin cannot affect the barter and rc said likewise coin cannot affect the barter and rabbi barhana said likewise in our yohanan's name coin cannot affect the barter our abba raised an objection against Ola if his carters or laborers demanded their wages from a man in the marketplace and he said to a money changer give me copper coins for a dinar and I will pay them whilst I will return you a dinar's worth and addresses out of the coins which I have at home then if he has money at home it is permitted otherwise it is forbidden now should you think that coin cannot affect a barter it is alone and hence forbidden thereupon he was silent said he to him perhaps both refer to unco and metal which bear no imprint so that they rank as produce and therefore may be acquired by barter even so he replied this too follows from the fact that he the tana states a dinar's worth and addresses but does not state a current dinar and addresses this proves it or as he said after all the return may be in the character of repayment though the reference indeed is to unco and metal since he has them at home it is as though he said lend me until my son comes or until I find the key come and here whatever can be used as payment for another object as soon as one Party takes possession thereof, the other assumes liability for what is given in exchange, whatever can be used as payment for another object. What is that coins which proves that coins can affect the barter? Said Rab Judah, it means this Talmud, Mas Baba Matiabi, whatever is assessed as the value of another object. As soon as one party takes possession thereof, the other assumes liability for what is given in exchange. Reason two supports this for the second clause teaches how so if one bartered an ox for a cow or an ass for an ox, this proves it now on the original hypothesis that coin is referred to what is meant by how so it means this and produce two can affect the barter. How so if one bartered an ox for a cow or an ass for an ox, now that is well on the view of Arshis who maintained that produce can be employed for barter, but according to our who said only a utensil but not produce can affect the barter, what is meant by how so it means this money sometimes ranks as an object. A barter house, so if one bartered the money of an ox for a cow or the money of an ass for an ox, what is Arnaman's reason? He agrees with our Yohanan who said biblically speaking the delivery of money affects a title. Why then was it said that only Meshika gives possession as a precautionary measure lest he say to him your weed was burnt in the lock? Now the rabbis enacted a preventive measure only for a usual occurrence but not for an unusual occurrence. Now according to Resh Lakish, who maintains that Meshika is explicitly required by biblical law as well if he agrees with Arshi's hate then he can explain it as Arshi's hate but if he holds with Arnaman that produce cannot affect a barter whilst money does not affect a title at all how can he explain it? You are forced to assume that he explains it as Arshi's hate. We learned all more less acquire each other whereon Resh Lakish said even a purse full of money when bartered for a purse full of money Araha interpreted it as Referring to the Bithynian and Ansirene denarii, one of which was cancelled by the state and one by local authorities, and both are necessary for if we were taught this of state cancellation, that is because such coins have no official currency at all. But in the case of local repeal, since these coins circulate in another province, I might regard them as money which cannot be acquired through barter, whilst if it were stated in connection with local repeal, that is because they have neither a secret nor an open circulation within that province. But when cancelled by the state, since they circulate clandestinely, I might still regard them as coin which cannot be acquired through barter. Thus, both are necessary. Rabbis said in Arhuna's name, if they said to be sell at me for these coins, he acquires title thereto Talmud, Mas Babamitia, but the vendor nevertheless has a claim of fraud against him, he acquires a title thereto, even though he did not take possession thereof. See of the article. Since he the other party was not particular as to the exact amount of money he the former acquires if for it partakes of the nature of barter nevertheless he has a claim of fraud against him because he had said to him sell it me for these coins are have said in Arhuna's name if they said to be sell it me for these coins he acquires a title thereto and he the vendor has no claim of fraud against him now it is certain if money or an article is delivered as payment but he the recipient is not particular that the value shall correspond and we have just said that he the giver acquires title for it partakes of the nature of barter but what if it is delivered as barter and he the recipient is particular said our Adabi I have become and here if one was standing with his cow in the market and his neighbor came and asked him why have you brought your cow hither I need an ass he replied I have an ass which I can give you in return for your cow what is the value of your Cow so much what is the value of your ass so much if the ass owner drew the cow into his possession but before the cow owner had time to draw the ass into his possession if the ass died he the ass owner acquires no title thereto the cow this proves that in the case of barter where each is particular no title is g
said with the utensil of the receiver for the receiver which is the bestower to take possession so that he the latter in his turn may determine to give him possession whilst Levi said with the utensil of the bestower as will be explained in Anarhuna of this card is said to Robin now according to Levi who maintained that it is with the utensil of the bestower one will be able to acquire land in virtue of a garment which is tantamount to secured property being acquired along with unsecured whereas we Learned the reverse unsecured chattels may be acquired along with secured chattels said he to him were Levi here he would have smitten you with fiery lashes do you really think that the garment gives him possession surely not but in consideration of the pleasure he the bestower experiences and that the receiver accepts it from him he wholeheartedly transfers it to him as is disputed by Tanaim now this was a matter in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and concerning changing. For to confirm all things a man drew off his shoe and gave it to his neighbor redeeming means selling and thus it is written it shall not be redeemed changing refers to barter and thus it is written he shall not alter it nor change it for to confirm all things a man drew off his shoe and gave it to his neighbor who gave whom Boaz gave to the kinsman or Judah said the kinsman gave to Boaz it has been taught acquisition may be made by means of a utensil even if it is worth less than a paratot. Said Arnaman this applies only to a utensil but not to produce Arshis hate said it may be done even with produce what is Arnaman's reason scripture saith his shoe implying only his shoe i.e. a utensil but nothing else what is Arshesh it is reason scripture saith for to confirm all things but according to Arnaman too is it not written to confirm all things that means to confirm all things the title to which is to be affected by means of a shoe and Arshis hate too is it not written his shoe are. Shes hate can answer you that is to teach just as his shoe is a clearly defined object so must everything used in this connection be a clearly defined object thus invalidating half a pomegranate or half a nut which may not be employed Arshis hate the son of Arad he said in accordance with whom do we write nowadays with a utensil that is fit for acquiring possession therewith with a utensil that rejects the view of Arshis hate who maintains a title may be affected by means of produce that is. Valid this excludes Samuel's dictum his possession can be obtained Talmud, Mas Baba Matiabi by means of Maroka for gaining possession this rejects Levi's view that the utensils of the bestower are required therefore it teaches us to obtain possession but not to confer possession therewith our Papa said it is to exclude coins RZ but other state are Ashi said it is to exclude objects the benefit of which is forbidden other state therewith excludes coins that is fit RZ but other state are Ashi said that excludes objects whose use is forbidden but as for Maroka it is unnecessary to exclude that uncoined metal Asiman acquires coined what is Asiman said rab coins that are presented as tokens at the Babs an objection is raised the second tithe may not be redeemed by Asiman nor by coins that are presented as tokens at the Babs proving that Asiman is not coins that are presented as tokens at the Babs and should you answer that it is a definition surely the tanda does not Teach thus for we learned the second tithe may be redeemed by Asiman this is our dosis view the sages maintain it may not yet both agree that it may not be redeemed with coins that are presented as tokens at the baths but said our Yohanan what is Asiman a disc now our Yohanan follows his views expressed elsewhere for our Yohanan said our dosa and our Ishmael both taught the same thing our dosa the statement just quoted and what is our Ishmael's dictum that which has been taught and thou shalt bind up the money in thine hand this is to include everything that can be bound up in one's hand that is our Ishmael's view our Akiva said it is to include everything which bears a figure e.g. if a drew into his possession bs produce without paying him the money he cannot retract etc our Yohanan said by biblical law the delivery of money affects possession why then was it said Meshika affects possession lest he the vendor say to him the vendor we was burnt in the loft but after all whoever Causes the fire must make compensation but for fear lest the fire accidentally break out now if the ownership is still vested in him the vendor he will wholeheartedly take pains to save it if not he will not do so Resh Lakish said Meshika is explicitly provided for by biblical law what is Resh Lakish reason scripture said and if thou sell aught unto thy neighbor or acquire aught of thy neighbor's hand i.e. a thing acquired by passing it from hand to hand but our Yohan and maintains off. Thy neighbor's hand is to exclude real estate from the law of fraud and Resh Lakish if so scripture should have written and if thou sell aught unto thy neighbor's hand ye shall not defraud why state or acquire aught this proves that its purpose is to teach the need of Meshika and our Yohan and how does he utilize or by he employs it even as was taught and if thou sell aught ye shall not defraud from this I know the law only if the purchaser was defrauded once do I know it if the vendor was cheated from the phrase or acquire ought ye shall not defraud and rush like he learns both therefrom we learned our Simeon said he who has the money in his hand has the advantage this means only the vendor can retract but not the purchaser now should you say that by biblical law the delivery of money affects possession it is well therefore the vendor can retract but not the vendee but if you say that the delivery of money does not affect a title even by biblical law then the purchaser too should be able to retract rush like can answer you I certainly did not state my view on the basis of our Simeon's opinion but according to the rabbis now as for rush like it is well for precisely therein do our Simeon and the rabbis differ but according to our Yohan and wherein do our Simeon and the rabbis differ in respect to our histos dictum is just as they see the rabbis enacted the law of Meshika in respect of the vendor so did they institute it in respect to the vendee. Thus our Simeon rejects the dictum of Arhista whilst the rabbis agree therewith we learned but the SC the sages said he who punished the generation of the flood and the generation of the dispersion he will take vengeance of him who does not stand by his word now if you say that the delivery of money affects a title it is well hence he is subject to the but etc if however you maintain that money does not affect a title why is he subject to but on account of his words but is one subject to but on account of mere words has it not been taught Talmud Mas Baba Matiyah our Simeon said though the SC the sages rule the delivery of the garment acquires the gold dinar but not vice versa that however is only the halacha but they also said he who punished the generations of the flood and of the dispersion the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah and the Egyptians at the Red Sea he will exact vengeance of him who does not stand by his word and he who enters into a verbal transaction affects no title yet he who retracts therefrom the spirit of the sages is displeased with him whereon Rabbah observed we have no other condemnation than that the spirit of the sages is displeased with him for words accompanied by the passage of money one is subject to but for words unaccompanied thereby one is not subject to but Rabbah said both scripture and the very to support Resh Lakish scripture for it is written if a soul sin and lie unto his neighbor in that which vast delivered him to keep or in the putting forth of the hand or in the thing taken away by violence or hath oppressed his neighbor the putting forth of the hand said are his dog if he the debtor assigned a utensil to him for the payment of his debt or hath oppressed said are his dog if he assigned him a utensil for that in respect of which he oppressed him yet when scripture repeated it, it is written and it shall be because he hath sinned and is guilty that he shall restore that which he took away or the Thing that he withheld by oppression or that which was delivered him to keep but the putting forth of the hand is not repeated why so surely because it lacked Meshika said our Papa to Rabbah but perhaps that follows from oppression which scripture did repeat the circumstances here are e.g. that he the employee took it the utensil from him and then entrusted it to his keeping but this is identical with bailment there are two kinds of bailments if so the putting forth of the hand i.e. loan should also be repeated and it could likewise be applied to the case where e.g. the creditor had taken it the utensil assigned for repayment from him the debtor and then redeposited it with him had scripture repeated it, it would have been neither a refutation nor a support since however scripture did not repeat it it supports him rush yet did not scripture repeat the putting forth of the hand but it was taught our Simeon said once do we know that what was stated above is to be applied to what is stated below because it is written or all that about which he hath sworn falsely and Arnaman said in the name of Rabbi Abba in Rab's name that is to extend the law of restoration to the putting forth of the hand even so scripture did not explicitly repeat it where have we a barrier for it has been taught if he gave it to a bath attendant he is liable to a trespass offering and Rabbi said thereon this holds good only of a bath attendant since no Meshika is lacking. But if he gave it for any other object which requires Meshika he is not liable to a trespass offering until he does draw it into his possession
He acts as is fitting for that people. Rabbi said once do I know it for it once happened that money was given to our high Joseph in advance payment for salt subsequently salt rose in price on his appearing before our Yohanan he ordered him go and deliver it to him the purchaser and if not you must submit to the curse he who punished now if you say that one is merely informed did our high Joseph require to be told what then he is anathematized did our high Joseph come to submit to it. Curse of the rabbis, but what happened was that only a deposit had been paid to our high Joseph. He thought that he, the purchaser, was morally entitled only to the value thereof. Whereupon our Yohanan told him that he was entitled to the whole of the purchase. It has been stated a deposit. Rab said it affects a title only to the extent of the value thereof. Our Yohanan ruled it affects a title to the whole purchase. An objection is raised if one gives a pledge to his neighbor and says to him, If I retract my pledge before it to you and the other stipulates, if I retract, I will double your pledge. The conditions are binding. This is our Jose's view. Our Jose following in this is general ruling that as Mac acquires title, our Judah, however, maintained it is sufficient that it affects a title to the value thereof. Said our Simeon B. Gamaliel when is that if he, the depositor, said to him, Let my pledge affect the purchase, but if one sold a house or field for a thousand sous of which he the Paid him 500 he acquires title to the whole and must repay the balance even after many years now surely the same ruling applies to movables as if a deposit is given without specifying its purpose possession is gained of the whole no as for movables an unspecified deposit does not affect possession of the whole and wherein do they differ real estate which is actually acquired by the delivery of money is entirely acquired movables which are acquired by the delivery of money. Only in respect of submission to the curse he who punished are not acquired entirely shall we say that this is disputed by Tanaim for it has been taught if one makes a loan to his neighbor against the pledge and the year of release arrived even if the pledge is worth only half the loan at the year of release does not cancel the loan this is the ruling of our Simeon B. Gamaliel Arjuta Hanis I said if the pledge corresponds to the value of the loan it does not cancel it otherwise. It does what is meant by our Gamaliel's statement, it does not cancel the loan, shall we say to the value thereof, hence it follows that in the opinion of our Judah Hanisai, even that half two is cancelled Talmud, Mas Babamitzia, for what purpose then does he hold the pledge? Surely then this proves that by it does not cancel it, our Simeon B. Gamaliel means that it does not cancel it at all, whilst by it does cancel it, our Judah refers to the half against which he holds no pledge, and they differ in this. Our Simeon B. Gamaliel holds that if the pledge affects a title to the whole of the loan, whilst our Judah Hanisai holds that it affects a title only to the value thereof, no, by it does not cancel the loan, our Simeon B. Gamaliel means that half against which he holds a pledge, then it follows that in our Judah's opinion, even the half against which he holds a pledge is also cancelled, but if so, what is the purpose of the pledge as a mere record of fact, our Kahana was given money in advance payment. For Flax subsequently Flax appreciated so he came before Rab delivered the goods to the value of the money you received said he to him but as for the rest it is a mere verbal transaction and a verbal transaction does not involve a breach of faith for it has been stated a verbal transaction Rab said it involves no breach of faith our Yohanan ruled it does involve a breach of faith an objection is raised our Jose son of Arjuna said what is taught by the verse just in shall you have surely in is included in Eva but it is to teach you that your yes hand should be just and your no should be just Abbe said that means that one must not speak one thing with the mouth and another with the heart an objection is raised our Simeon said though the SC the sages rule the delivery of a garment acquires the gold dinar but not vice versa that however is only the holocha but they also said he who punished the generations of the flood and of dispersion the inhabitants of Sodom and Gemara hand the Egyptians at the Red Sea he will exact vengeance of him who does not stand by his word and he who makes a verbal transaction affects no title yet he who retracts therefrom the spirit of the sages is displeased with him it is a dispute of the Tanaim for we learned it once happened that our Yohanan B. Matthew said to his son go out and engage laborers he went and agreed to supply them with food but on his returning to his father the latter said my son should you even prepare for the banquet like Solomon's when in his glory you cannot fulfill your undertaking for they are children of Abraham Isaac and Jacob but before they commence work go out and tell them I engage you on condition that you have no claim upon me other than bread and beans now if you should think that words involve a breach of faith how could he say to him go and withdraw there it is different for the laborers themselves did not rely upon him why because they knew full well that he himself was Dependent upon his father if so even if they had already commenced work it is also thus once they have commenced work they certainly rely upon him for the reason he must have reported to his father who agreed thereto now did our Yohanan say thus but Rabbi Barhanna said in our Yohanan's name if one says to his neighbor I will make you a gift he can retract therefrom he can retract but that is obvious hence he must have meant he is permitted to withdraw our papa replied our Yohanan. Admits in the case of a small gift because he the recipient relies thereon that is logical too for our Rabbi said in our Yohanan's name if an Israelite says to a Levite you have a core of tithe in my possession he the Levite may declare it the terima of the tithe for other produce now if you agree that he the Israelite cannot morally withdraw it as well therefore he the Levite is permitted to declare this as the terima of the tithe but if you say that he the Israelite can retract. Why is he the Levite permitted to declare etc. seeing that it may thereby transpire that he eats people the reference here is to a case where e.g. he the Levite had already received it and then re-entrusted it to him the Israelite if so consider the second clause if he gave it to another Levite he the Levite has nothing but resentment against him but if you should think that it means e.g. that he took it from him and then re-entrusted it to him why has he nothing but resentment against him since he took possession thereof he has a monetary claim upon him hence it must certainly mean that he did not first take it from him which proves that a certain man gave money for poppy seed subsequently poppy seed advanced in price so he the vendor retracted and said I have no poppy seed take back your money but he would not take his money and it was stolen when they came before Rabbi he said he him since he said to you take back your money and you would not not only is he not accounted a paid billy but he is not even a gratuitous billy thereupon the rabbis protested before Rabba but he the vendor would have had to submit to the curse he who punished he replied that is even so our poppy said Rabba told me one of the rabbis named Artabuth other state our Samuel Bezitra who if he were given all the underground treasures of the world would not break his word told me that incident happened with me that day was Sabbath even I was sitting when a certain man came stood at the threshold and asked me have you poppy seed for sale Talmud, Mas Baba Metziabi no I answered then let me entrust this money to you he replied as it is growing dark the house lies before you I replied so he deposited it in the house and it was stolen when he came before Rabba he ruled in every case of the house lies before you not only is one not a paid billy he is not even a gratuitous trustee thereupon I observed to him but the rabbis protested to Rabba he would have to submit to the curse he who punished and he answered that is a pure fiction our Simeon said he who has the money in his hand has the advantage it has been taught our Simeon said when is that if the vendor has both the money and the produce but if the money is in the vendor's hand and the goods in the vendee's he the vendee cannot retract since the money is in his hand you say in his hand but it is in the vendor's say then because his money's worth is in his hand but that is obvious said Robert the circumstances here are e.g. where the vendee's loft was rented to the vendor now why did the rabbis institute meshika for fear lest he say to him your wheat was burnt in the loft but here it is already in the vendee's ownership should fire accidentally break out he will take the trouble to save it a certain man gave money in advance payment for one subsequently he learned that one of the men of the field marshal parzak intended to seize it thereupon he said to him return me my money I do not want the one so he went before Arista who said to him just as Meshika was instituted in favor of the vendor so was it instituted in favor of the vendee to Mishnah fraud is constituted by an overcharge of four silver my is in 24 which is a sale hence a sixth of the purchase until what time is one permitted to revoke the sale until he can shoot the article to a merchant or a relative of Artarfan ruled in Lida that fraud is constituted by eight silver my AHS in 20. Four which is a sale hence a third of the purchase whereat the Lidden merchants rejoiced but said he to them one may retract the whole day then let Artarfan leave US in status quo they requested and so they
Revoke the sale until he can shoot the article to a merchant or a relative. Now Arnaman observed thereon this was taught only of the purchaser. The vendor, however, can always withdraw, but it means that one sold something worth 24 my AHS for 28. We learned our Tarfan rule in Lita that fraud is constituted by 8 silver my AHS in 24, which is a seller hands a third of the purchase. Surely that means that one sold something worth 16 my AHS for 24. Which proves that a third of the money paid was also taught. No, it means that what was worth 24 was sold for 16 then who was overreached the vendor. But consider the next clause, but said he to them one may retract the whole day whereon our nomin observed this was taught only of the purchaser. The vendor, however, can always withdraw, but it means that one sold the value of 24 my AHS for 32. It has been taught in accordance with Samuel, he who was deceived has the upper. And e.g. if one sold an article worth 5 my AHS for 6 who was defrauded the venti therefore the venti has the upper hand and he can demand of him the vendor either return me my money or return me the overcharge if he sold him Talmud, Mas Bagamitia has 6 my AHS worth for 5 who was overreached the vendor therefore the vendor has the upper hand he can either say return me the purchase or return me the sum underpaid the scholars propounded on the view of the rabbis doesn't. Overcharge of less than a sixth immediately constitute renunciation or only when he has had time to shoot the purchase to a merchant or relative and should you object if it is only when he has had time to shoot the purchase to a merchant or a relative wherein do a sixth and less than a sixth differ yet there is a difference for in the case of a sixth he has the upper hand and can either withdraw or retain the ownership but have the overcharge returned whereas in the case of less than a Sixth, he must retain ownership and have the overcharge refunded. What then is our ruling come in here? And so they reverted to the ruling of the sages. Now it was thought that less than a third on Artarfan's view is identical in law with less than a sixth on the view of the rabbis. Now should you say that an overcharge of less than a sixth in the view of the rabbis constitutes renunciation only when he has had time to shoot the purchase to a merchant or a relative? Whereas according to our Tarfan, the whole day must pass before he loses the rights of redress. It is well on that account they the merchants reverted to the ruling of the sages. But if you say that less than a sixth in the view of the rabbis immediately constitutes renunciation, Talmud, Mas Bagamitia be whilst in Artarfan's view too less than a third immediately constitutes renunciation. Why did they revert, etc.? Artarfan's ruling was surely more advantageous to them for what the rabbis declared overreaching our Tarfan regarded as renunciation. Do you really think that less than a third according to our Tarfan is identical with less than a sixth on the view of the rabbis? That is not so from a sixth to a third according to our Tarfan is as a sixth itself on the view of the rabbis. If so, whereat did they rejoice in the first place? Hence, you may deduce that in the view of the rabbis, in the case of annulment of the sale, one can always withdraw. They thus rejoice when our Tarfan told them that an overcharge up to a third constitutes overreaching, whilst they reverted to the ruling of the rabbis when he told them that the time for withdrawing is all day. For if you should think that in the view of the rabbis, the annulment of the sale is only within the time that he can shoot it to a merchant or to a relative, whereat did they rejoice? They rejoiced in respect of a sixth itself. The scholars propounded in the case of annulment of sale on the view of the rabbis can one always retract or perhaps only. Within the time necessary to shoot the purchase to a dealer or a relative, and should you answer if only within the time necessary to shoot it to a dealer or a relative, wherein do a sixth and more than a sixth differ, there is a difference. For in the case of a sixth, only the defrauded party can retract, whereas in the case of more than a sixth, both can retract. What is the ruling come and here? They reverted to the ruling of the sages. Now, if you say that annulment of the sale on the view of it, rabbis is only within the time necessary to shoot the purchase to a dealer or a relative, whereas on our Tarfan's view it is all day, it is well on that account they reverted, etc. But if you say that in the case of annulment of sale on the view of the rabbis, one can always retract. Why did they revert, etc.? Surely our Tarfan's ruling was more advantageous to them since he declared overreaching returnable the whole day, but no more annulment of sale is rare. Rabbis said the law is in the case of less. Then a sixth the sale is valid more than a sixth that is null exactly a sixth that is valid but the overcharge is returnable and in both cases it is within the time necessary to shoot the purchase to a merchant or a relative it has been taught in support of Rabba in the case of overreaching of less than a sixth the sale is valid more than a sixth the sale is null exactly a sixth he the defrauded party retains ownership whilst the overcharge must be refunded this is our Nathan's view our Judah Nasi said the vendor has the upper hand if he wishes he can say return me the purchase or pay up the sum wherein you defrauded me and in both cases it is within the time necessary to shoot the purchase to a merchant or a relative until what time is one permitted to revoke the sale etc our nomin said this was taught only of the purchaser but the vendor can always retract shall we say that he is supported by the mission they reverted to the ruling of the sages now if you agree that the vendor can always retract it as well Talmud, Mas Bagamitia therefore they reverted but if you say that the vendor is as the vendi what difference did it make to them just as the rabbis ameliorated the position of the vendi so did they likewise that of the vendor the merchants of Lita very seldom heard Rami Bihamis host sold some wine and heard finding him depressed he Rami asked him why are you sad I sold wine he replied and heard then go and retract he counseled but I have tarried more time than is necessary to shoot it to a dealer or a relative said he thereupon he sent him to Arnaman who said to him this was taught only of the vendi but the vendor can always retract why the vendi has the purchase in his hand wherever he goes he shoots it and is told whether he heard or not but the vendor who has not the purchase in his hand must wait until he comes across an article like his and only then can he know whether he heard or not a man had silk skeins for sale he demanded Six sous whilst they were worth five, yet if five and a half were offered, he would have accepted. Then a man came and said to himself, If I pay him five and a half, it is immediate renunciation, therefore I will pay him six and then sue him at law. When he went before Rabbah, he said to him, This was taught only of one who buys from a merchant, but when one buys from a private person, he has no claim of fraud upon him. A man had jewelry for sale, he demanded sixty sous whilst it was worth fifty, yet had he been offered fifty five, he would have accepted. Then a man came and argued, If I give him fifty five, it will constitute renunciation, therefore I will give him sixty and then sue him at law. When he came before Arhista, he said to him, This was taught only of one who buys from a merchant, but when one buys from a private individual, he has no claim of fraud against him, said Ardini to him, Well spoken, and our Eliezer said, Likewise, well spoken, but did we not learn just as a law of overreaching? Holds good in the case of a layman, so it holds good in the case of a merchant now who is meant by a layman. Surely a private individual said Arhista that applies to rough cloth garments, but garments of personal use which are dear to him he would not sell, but at an enhanced price mission both the vendee and the vendor can claim for overreaching just as the law of overreaching holds good in the case of a layman, so it holds good in the case of a merchant. Arjuna said there is no overreaching for a merchant he who was deceived has the upper hand if he wishes he can either say give me back my money or return what you overcharged me. Gamar whence do we know this for our rabbis taught and if thou sell aught unto thy neighbor ye shall not deceive from this I know it only if the purchaser was defrauded how do I know it if the vendor was overreached because scripture states acquirers ye shall not deceive now both vendee and vendor must be written for had the divine law stated the law. Only of the vendor that is because he knows his purchase but as for the purchaser who is not experienced in the purchase I might think that the divine law did not apply the injunction of ye shall not defraud to him and had scripture mentioned the vendee only that might be because he acquires an article for it is proverbial when you buy you gain but as for the vendor who indeed loses thereby as it is said he who sells loses I might think that the divine law did not exhort him ye shall not defraud hence both are necessary our Judah said there is no overreaching for a merchant because he is a merchant has he no claim for overreaching said Arnaman in Rab's name this was taught of a speculator why because he well knows the value of what he sells but foregoes part thereof to him the vendee the reason that he sells thus cheaply being that he has chanced upon another purchase nevertheless now he wishes to retract our ash he said what is meant by there is no overreaching for a Merchant, he is not subject to the law of overreaching, i.e., he can withdraw even for less than the recoverable standard of overreaching
Woman, behold, thou art betrothed unto me on condition that thou hast no claims upon me of sustenance, rhyme, and conjugal rights. She is betrothed, but the condition is null. This is Arma view, but Arjuna said in respect of civil matters, his condition is binding. Rab can answer you, my ruling agrees even with Arjuna. Arjuna states his view there only in that case because she knew of her rights and renounced them. Talmud, Mas Babamitsiabi, but here did he know that he was defrauded that he should make renunciation, whilst Samuel can say, my ruling agrees even with Arma only there does Arma state that view insofar as he certainly rejects a biblical law, but here who can say that he disregards anything at all? Arain and said, I was told on Samuel's authority, if one says to his neighbor, I agree to the sale on condition that you have no claim of overreaching against me, then he can prefer no claim of overreaching against him, but if he stipulates on condition that there is no Overreaching therein, then in case of deceit, a charge of imposition can be preferred. An objection is raised if one trades on trust, or if one says to his neighbor, The sale is on condition that you have no claim of overreaching against me, then he has no claim of overreaching against him. Now, according to Rab, who maintained my ruling agrees even with Arjuda, who is the authority for the set of A, it is clear, therefore, that Rab's ruling agrees with Armahir only and Samuel's with Arjuda. Rabba said, There is no difficulty. One refers to a general condition, the other to a particular stipulation, as it has been taught. One is the set of a general condition, but if one explicitly states that he is overcharging, e.g., if the vendor said to the vendee, I know that this article which I sell you for 200 zoos is only worth 100, but I sell it to you on condition that you have no claim of overreaching against me, then he has no claim of overreaching, and likewise, if it Purchaser said to the seller, I know that this article which I buy from you for 100 zoos is worth 200, yet I do so on condition that you have no claim of overreaching against me, then he has no claim of overreaching against him. Our rabbis taught if one buys and sells on trust, he must not compute the inferior goods on trust and the superior at PAR, but either both on trust or both at PAR, and he must pay him the cost of porterage, transport, and storing, but he does not receive payment for his own trouble since he has already been paid in full. Once was his payment in full given him, said our papa. This refers to cloth manufacturers who give a discount of 4% mission by how much may the seller be deficient and yet involve no overreaching. Our said four isers, which is an isop per dinar. Our said four puntines, which is a puntine per dinar. Our Simeon said Talmud, Mas Baba Mitzia, eight puntines, which is two puntines per dinar until what time is he the Defrauded party permitted to retract in towns until he can shoot the coins to a money changer in villages until the following Sabbath Eve if he recognized it he must accept it back from him even after a 12 month and he has nothing but resentment against him and one may redeem the second tithe therewith and have no fear because it is mere churlish neskimar and now the following is opposed to the mission to what extent is the seller to be deficient to involve overreaching said our papa there is no difficulty our tana reckons in an ascending fashion whilst the tana of the very the reckons in a descending fashion wherein do a seller and a garment differ that there is a dispute on the former but not the latter said Rabba which tana is the authority for one sixth in the case of a garment our simian abe said in the case of a garment one forgives overreaching up to a sixth because people say overpay for your back but give only the exact word for your stomach but as for a seller since it does not readily circulate, one does not forgive a deficiency to turn to the main text. To what extent is the seller to be deficient to involve overreaching? Our mayor said four isars, which is one iser per dinar. Our Judah said four puntines, which is one puntine per dinar. Our Simeon said eight puntines, which is two puntines per dinar. Above that, it may be sold at its intrinsic worth by how much may it depreciate that it shall still be permissible to keep it in the case of a seller. It can depreciate as far as a shekel in the case of a dinar, as far as a quarter. If it is an iser, less it is forbidden. One may not sell it to a merchant, highwayman, or murderer because they cheat others with it, but should pierce and suspend it around the neck of his son or daughter. The master said in the case of a seller, as far as a shekel in the case of a dinar, as far as a quarter, wherein does a seller differ from a dinar that the permitted deficiency of a seller is only as far as a shekel, i.e. half its. Value whereas that of a dinar is as far as a quarter said Abe what is meant by a quarter a quarter shekel said Rabba this may be proved too since Ethatana teaches as far as a quarter and not a fourth part this proves it but why should the dinar be correlated to the shekel Ethatana thereby incidentally informs us that there is a kind of dinar which is derived from a shekel this supports RMI for RMI said a dinar which is derived from a shekel may be kept from a seller it may not be kept if it is an isar less it is forbidden what does this mean Abe said it means this if the seller depreciated by an isar more than the standard for overreaching it may not be expended Rabba demurred if so even if the depreciation exceeds it but slightly it is likewise so but said Rabba if the seller depreciated an isar to the dinar it is forbidden to offer it as a seller this anonymous ruling agreeing with Armaier we learned elsewhere if a seller became unfit and it was prepared for Use as a weight it is liable to become unclean how much may it depreciate that it shall still be permissible to keep it in the case of a seller up to two denarii when it is worth less than this it must be cut up what if it is worth more than this Arhuna said if worth less it must be cut up and if worth more than this it must also be cut up RMI said if worth less it must be cut up but if worth more than this it may be kept as it is an objection is raised Talmud, Mas Baba Mitzibi. Above the type may be sold at its intrinsic worth surely that means that it depreciated by more than a limit for overreaching no above that means it is worth more not yet having depreciated to an extent involving overreaching then it may be sold at its intrinsic value an objection is raised by how much may it depreciate that it shall still be permissible to keep it in the case of a seller it can depreciate as far as a shekel surely that means that it depreciated little by little no it means that it fell into a fire and so lost in value all at once the master said he should pierce and suspend it around the neck of his son or daughter but the following contradicts it one must not employ it as a weight cast it amongst his scrap metal nor pierce and suspend it around the neck of his son or daughter but must either pound it to dust melt it down mutilate or cast it into the salt sea said our Eliezer others state Arhunah in our Eliezer's name there is no difficulty the former refers to the middle of the coins the latter to its edge until what time is he the defrauded party permitted to retract in towns until he can shoot the coins to a money changer in villages until the following Sabbath why is a distinction between towns and villages made in respect to a seller but not to a garment have they answered our mission to when it treats of a garment refers to towns Rabba said as for a garment everyone has expert knowledge therein whereas in regard to a seller since not Every man can value it save a money changer alone it follows that in towns where a money changer is available he can retract only until he shoes it to a money changer whereas in villages where none is available the period is until Sabbath Eve when the villagers go up to market if he recognized it he must accept it back from him even after a 12 month etc where is this if in towns but you have said until he can shoot the coins to a money changer again if in villages but you have said until the following Sabbath Eve said Arhista here a measure of piety was taught if so consider the second clause and he has nothing but resentment against him to whom does this refer if to the pious man let him neither accept it nor bear resentment against him but if to the one from whom he accepted it then after having had it accepted from him should he bear resentment it means thus but as for another person even if he does not reaccept it from him he to whom it was given as a full Coin has nothing but resentment against him, and one may redeem the second tithe therewith and have no fear because it is mere churlishness. Our Papa said this proves that he who is exacting in respect to coins is dubbed a churl, providing, however, that they still circulate this. The mission supports Hezekiah for Hezekiah said when he comes to exchange it, he must exchange it as its intrinsic value. If he comes to redeem therewith, he estimates it at a proper coin. What does he mean? He means this. Though when he comes to exchange it, he exchanges it at its present value, yet when he redeems second tithe therewith, he may estimate it as a good coin. Shall we say that Hezekiah holds that the second tithe may be treated disparagingly, but did not Hezekiah say with respect to second tithe produce worth less than a paratile one may declare it together with its fifth is redeemed with the first money of redemption because it is impossible for a person to calculate his money exactly what is. Meant by a proper coin on the basis of the proper value of the coin because if the second tithe may not be lightly treated in
not its leniencies but he teaches there accounted the priest's property you cannot think so because it was distinctly taught the second tithe is neutralized by a greater quantity than itself and of which second tithe was the set of a tithe which is not worth a peritot or which has once entered Jerusalem and gone forth again but if Hezekiah's ruling is correct let Hezekiah's remedy be employed by redeeming it with the earlier money it means that he has not yet redeemed any other. Then let him bring the other tithe produce which he has and combine them that which is tithe by biblical law and that which is so only by rabbinic law cannot be combined and let him bring demay we fear lest either by bring certain tithe then let him bring two perutas redeeming the tithe that he brings with a peritot and a half and this the intermixed tithe with the rest do you think that one and a half peritot's worth of tithe consecrates two perutas that is not so one. Peritot s worth consecrates one peritot whilst the half peritot s worth does not consecrate anything so again there is tithe by biblical law and tithe by rabbinic law and these two cannot be combined and let an isar be brought that is forbidden lest he bring perutas for that purpose or which has once entered Jerusalem and gone forth again but why so let it be taken back again it refers to defiled tithe and let it be redeemed for our Eliezer said once do we know if second. Tithe produce became defiled that it is to be redeemed Talmud, Mas Baba Metziah be even in Jerusalem from the verse when thou art not able Esetho to bear it now Seth can only refer to eating as it is written and he took and sent Mazoth messes unto them from before him but this refers to commodities purchased with the redemption money of the second tithe but let that also which is bought with the redemption money of the second tithe be redeemed for we learned if what was redeemed. With the redemption dash money of the second tithe became defiled it is itself to be redeemed this agrees with our Judah who ruled it must be buried if so why particularly if it has gone forth again the same applies even if it has not gone forth but after all this refers to undefiled tithe and what is meant by gone forth that the walls of Jerusalem had fallen but did not rob say the law of the walls of Jerusalem and that it the second tithe must be eaten within them is biblical but that they have retaining power is merely rabbinical and consequently when would the rabbis enact thus only as long as the walls were standing but not when they no longer existed having fallen the rabbis drew no distinction whether the barriers were standing or not Arhunabi Judah said in our Sheshit's name a single clause is taught the second tithe produce worth less than a peritah which has entered Jerusalem and gone forth again but why so let it be taken back and eaten it means that the walls had fallen then let it be redeemed for Rabbi said the law of the walls of Jerusalem and that it the second tithe must be eaten within them is biblical but that they have retaining power is merely rabbinical and consequently ought we not to say when would the rabbis enact thus only as long as the walls were standing but not when they no longer existed having fallen the rabbis drew no distinction if so why particularly if worth less than a peritah even if worth a peritah it is. The same he implicitly proceeds to a climax thus if it contains a paratise worth it is unnecessary to state that the walls retain it but where it does not contain a paratise worth I might think that the walls do not retain it therefore we are taught otherwise our rabbis taught and if a man will at all redeem out of his tithes he shall add thereto the fifth part thereof of his tithes but not all his tithes thus excluding second tithe produce worth less than a. Paratot it has been stated RMI said this means that the tithe itself is not worth a paratot RC maintained its fifth is less than a paratot or Yohanan said that the tithe itself is not etc R Simeon Belakish said its fifth is less etc an objection is raised for second tithe worth less than a paratot it is sufficient to declare that itself and its fifth are redeemed with the first money now on the view that it does not require redemption even if its fifth is worth less than. A paratai is correct hence he the tana states it is sufficient though that itself contains the value of a paratai yet since its fifth does not it is well but on the view that the tithe itself is worth less what is the appropriateness of it is sufficient this is indeed a difficulty the scholars propounded is the fifth calculated on the inner sum sc the principal or on the outer sc the principal plus the addition said rubbin a come and here if the owners value it at twenty. Sell as the owners have priority since they add a fifth if a stranger declared I accept it for twenty one Talmud, Mas Baba Metzia, the owners must give twenty six for twenty two the owners must give twenty seven for twenty three the owners must pay twenty eight for twenty four the owners must pay twenty nine for twenty five the owners must pay thirty because a fifth is not added on this man's higher valuation this proves that the fifth is calculated on the outer sum this proves it this is. Disputed by Tanaim, then he shall add a fifth part of it thereto, i.e. SC the principal plus its fifth shall amount to five. This is the view of our Josiah. Our Jonathan said a fifth part of it means a fifth of the principal. The scholars propounded does a fifth restrain or not thus do for Zeus redeem for Zeus worth of second tithes whilst a fifth is independently added so that the fifth is no bar to the validity of the redemption or perhaps for Zeus worth must be redeemed by five. The fifth being thus a bar said Rubinicum and here Dime is not subject to the law of a fifth or to the law of removal. This implies but the law of the principal does apply to it. Why so surely because the principal which is indispensable for tithe by biblical law is required in the case of tithe by rabbinic law whereas the fifth which is not a bar in tithe by biblical law is not required in the case of rabbinic tithe shall we say that this is disputed by Tanaim it has been. Taught if one gave the principle but not the fifth our Eliza ruled that the redeemed tithe may be eaten outside Jerusalem our Joshua said it may not be eaten said Rabbi I approve of our Eliza's view for the Sabbath and our Joshua's view for weekdays now since he said I approve of our Eliza's view for the Sabbath it follows that their dispute applies even to weekdays and since he said I approve of our Joshua's view for weekdays it follows that their dispute applies even to the Sabbath surely. Then they differ in this reasoning because our Eliza holds that the fifth is no bar whilst our Joshua holds that it is said our Papa that is not so all agree that the fifth is no bar but here they differ as to whether we fear culpable omission one master holds that we fear culpable omission whilst the other master maintains that we do not fear this our Yohanan said all agree in the case of Hippish that it is redeemed since the treasure is demanded in the marketplace now do they really not differ in? Respect to it is surely it has been taught if one gave the principle but did not give him SC the treasurer the fifth our Eliza said he has redeemed it whilst the sages say he has not redeemed it said Rabbi I approve of our Eliza's view in respect to it and that of the sages in respect to tithes now since he said I approve of our Eliza's view in respect to it it follows that he himself our Eliza differs even in reference to the tithe and since he said I approve of the view of it. Sages in respect to tithes it follows that they differ even on it but if it or Yohanan's dictum was stated it was stated thus our Yohanan said all agree in respect to the Sabbath and Hippish that it is redeemed firstly because it is written and thou shalt call the Sabbath a delight and furthermore since the treasurer is demanded in the marketplace Rami Bihama said now it has been said that Hippish cannot be redeemed by land for the divine law ordered then he shall give the money and it. Shall be assured to him, but can its fifth be redeemed by I you rendered in land again? Terima can be repaid only by Holland for the divine law set, then he shall give unto the priest the holy thing, implying that which is eligible to be holy can its fifth be rendered out of what is not Holland. Further, the second tithe cannot be redeemed by Asiman because the divine law set, and thou shalt bind up the money in thy hand, thus including everything which has a figure can its additional fifth be exchanged for unco and metal. Now it eventually transpired that at these questions reached Rabba thereupon he said to them, Scripture set, then he shall add the fifth part of the money of thine estimation unto it, which is to include its fifth as equal to itself. See the principal Rabbana said, We have learned likewise if one stole Terima but did not eat it, he must repay double the value of the Terima. If he ate it, he must repay two principles and a fifth, one principle and a fifth out of. Holland and the other principle as the value of Terima Talmud, Mas Baba Metziah be this proves that the fifth is as the principle Rabbah said with respect to robbery it is written he shall even restore it in the principle and shall add the fifth part more thereto and we learned if he restored the principle and then swore falsely concerning the fifth he must then add a fifth upon the fifth and so on until the principle is less than a paratai's worth with respect to Terima it is written and if a man eat of the holy thing unwittingly then he shall add the fifth part thereof unto it and we learned if one eats Terima unwittingly he
Original Hitpish in redemption, but not to second Hitpish set. Our Papa Jerobin of us did Rabba say the fifth ranks as original Hitpish. What is our decision in the matter? Our Tabiomi said in Abbe's name scripture set, then he shall add the fifth part of the money of thy estimation unto it. Thus its fifth is assimilated to its assessed value, just as a fifth is added to the assessed value, so is a fifth added to the fifth of its value. The above text states our Joshua B. Levi said a fifth is added to first, i.e., original Hitpish in redemption, but not to second Hitpish said Rabba. What is our Joshua B. Levi's reason scripture says, and if he that sanctified it will redeem his house, then he shall add the fifth part, implying only he who sanctified, but not he who transferred its sanctity, and resided before our Eliezer, and if it be of the unclean beast, then he shall redeem it according to thine estimation, and shall add a fifth part of it thereto, just as an unclean beast is. Distinguished in that it is the original dedication belongs entirely to heaven and it involves trespass, so everything which is original hippish and belongs entirely to heaven involves one in trespass. Thereupon our Eliezer observed to the ten as for the stipulation that it must belong entirely to heaven, it is well that excludes sacrifices of secondary sanctity since its owners enjoy part thereof, they involve no trespass offering. But what is original dedication intended to exclude, do you mean? That only original hippish involves a trespass offering, but not final hippish. Perhaps you said it in reference to the fifth and in agreement with our Joshua B. Levi, even so he replied, That is what I meant. Our Ashi said to Robin is an unclean animal capable only of original hippish Talmud, Mas Babamitzia, but not of intermediary hippish. He replied, Because it is incapable of final hippish, but our Ahav Dipti objected to Robin, yet it is capable of intermediary hippish, then let a fifth be added. Two, he replied, it is as final hippish, just as a fifth is not added for final hippish, so for intermediary hippish, no fifth is added. Our Zitra son of Armari said to Robin, on what grounds do you liken it to final hippish, liken it rather to original hippish? He replied, it is logical to liken it to final hippish, since thereby transferred sanctity is deduced from transferred sanctity. On the contrary, it should rather be compared with original hippish, deducing that which may be followed by sanctity from that which may be followed by sanctity. It is as Rabba said, viz, and the fire upon the altar shall be burning in it, it shall not be put out, and the priest shall burn wood on it every morning and lay the burnt offering in order upon it, and he shall burn thereon the fat of the peace offering implies the first burnt offering, so here too, and if it be of the unclean beast, denotes the first uncleanliness to which it may be subject, it has been taught in accordance with our Joshua. Believe I, if one declared this cow is a substitute for this cow of Hippish, this garment be instead of this other garment of Hippish's consecrated object is redeemed whilst Hippish has the upper hand, even if he declares this cow which is worth five cellars be a substitute for this other cow of Hippish, or this garment worth five cellars be instead of this other garment of Hippish's consecrated object is redeemed for the first Hippish, he must add a fifth, but not for the second Misha. Overreaching is constituted by four silver my AHS, the minimum claim is two silver my AHS, and admission is at least the value of a parata. A parata was specified in five instances, I admission must be at least the equivalent of a parata to a woman is betrothed by the value of a parata. Three, he who benefits from Hippish to the value of a parata is liable to a trespass offering, four, he who finds an article worth a parata is bound to proclaim it, and he who robs his neighbor. Of the value of a parata and swears falsely to him concerning it must follow him to return it even as far as media gemara but we have already learned that once fraud is constituted by an overcharge of four silver my AHS in 24 which is a sellahance of six of the purchase he the tana desires to state the minimum claim is two silver my AHS and admission is at least the value of a parata but that too we have already learned the judicial oath is imposed for a claim of two silver my AHS and admission of a parata the last clause is necessary because a parata is specified in five instances a parata is specified in five instances etc but let him the tana teach also the minimum overreaching is a parata set arcahana this proves that the law of overreaching does not apply to parutas but Levi maintain the law of overreaching does apply to parutas and thus did Levi read in his very the collection a parata was specified in five instances I Minimum overreaching is a parata to admission is a parata three the kitchen of a woman is with a parata for robbery imposes its obligations on account of a parata and v the court session is on account of a parata now why does our tana not include the court session he includes it under robbery yet does he not teach both robbery and loss those are both necessary robbery to teach that he who robs his neighbor of the value of a parata and swears falsely to him concerning it must follow him to return it even as far as media loss thus he who finds an article worth a parata is bound to proclaim it even if it depreciated after being found now why does Levi not teach that a loss in the sense of the mission is at least a parata he teaches robbery but does he not teach both robbery and the court session he needs to teach that in order to reject the view of our tana who said the court sits even for less than a parata is worth now why does Levi omit Hippish he deals with Holland, not sacred objects, and since our tana does treat of sacred objects, let him teach the minimum of second tithe to be eligible for redemption is a parata. The omission is in accordance with the view that if its fifth is less than a parata, it cannot be redeemed, then let him state the added fifth of the second tithe must be not less than a parata. He treats of principles, not fifths. The above text states our catna said the court sits even for less. Then a parata is worth Rob objected, and he shall make amends for the harm that he hath done in the holy thing Talmud. Mas Babamitia be this and extends the law of restoration even to less than a parata's worth, thus it applies to Hippish, but not to Holland. But if stated it was stated, thus our catna said if the court met for a claim of the equivalent of a parata, they conclude the hearing even for less because at the beginning of the trial a parata must be involved, but at the end day. Claim of a parata is unnecessary mission of addition of a fifth to the principal is prescribed in five cases I want to eat terima the terima of the tithe the terima of the tithe of Dimehala and the first fruits must add a fifth two he who redeems the fourth year planting and his own second tithe adds a fifth three he who redeems his sacred objects adds a fifth four he who benefits from it is to the value of a parata adds a fifth and he who robs his neighbor of a parata is worth and swears falsely to him concerning it must add a fifth Gemara Rabba said the terima of the tithe of Dimeh presented a difficulty to our Eliezer did then the sages set up protective measures for their enactments as for those of the Torah said Arnaman in Samuel's name the author of this mission is Armadir who maintained the sages did set up protective measures for their enactments as for those of the Torah for it has been taught if one brought a divorce from countries. Overseas and delivered it to her the wife without declaring it was written in my presence and signed in my presence he her next husband must divorce her too and their offspring is a bastard this is our view but the sages say their offspring is not a bastard what then shall he the messenger do he must take it the divorce back from her give it to her again in the presence of two witnesses and declare it was written in my presence and signed in presence but according to our merely because he did not declare to her it was written in my presence and signed in my presence he must divorce her and the child is a bastard even so our is consistent with his view for our hamana said Anul's authority our used to say whenever one departs from the fixed procedure ordained by the sages in case of divorce he her next husband must give a divorce whilst the offspring is a bastard Arshis hate objected at SC the second tithe he may is redeemed by exchanging silver for Silver copper for copper, silver for copper, and copper for produce, then he may redeem the produce. This is our mayor's opinion, but the sages say he must carry the produce to Jerusalem and eat it there. Now is it permissible to redeem silver with copper? Surely we learned if a seller of the second tithe was intermixed with one of Holland, he brings a seller's worth of copper coins and declares wherever the seller of the second tithe may be, it is redeemed with these coins, then he selects the best of them and redeems them the copper coins there with Talmud, Mas Babamitia, because it was said at SC the second tithe may be redeemed by substituting copper for silver in case of emergency, not however that it should remain so, but that it should itself be redeemed in turn with silver. Thus it is nevertheless stated that its silver may be exchanged in case of emergency, proving that only in an emergency is it done, but not otherwise. Our Joseph replied, though our mayor is more lenient in regard to its. Redemption he is stricter in regard to the eating thereof for it has been taught only the wholesaler
Sheshit's refutation was not well grounded for E. Samuel referred to a law involving death whilst Arshis hate raised an objection from what is merely a negative injunction for it is written thou mayest not eat within thy gates the tithe of thy corn etc. Yet the objection Arshis hate does raise is well answered by our Joseph but as for Robin instead of raising an objection from a baker let him support him from the case of a wholesale bread merchant for we learned if one buys bread from a bread seller he must give tithes on the loaves of each mold separately this is our mayor's view what then must you answer a bread seller buys from two or three hands in the case of a baker two you must say that he buys from one man only Robin said Samuel answered well the designation of death exists mission of the following are not subject to the law of overreaching the purchase of slaves bills real estate and sacred objects there is neither double repayment nor fourfold and fivefold. Repayment in their case a gratuitous billy does not swear on their account nor does a paid billy make it good. Our Simeon said Talmud, Mas Babamitzi of these sacrifices for which one the owner bears responsibility are subject to the law of overreaching those for which one bears no responsibility are not subject thereto. Our Judah said also when one sells a scroll of the Torah an animal or a pearl there is no law of overreaching thereupon the SC the sages said to him that the law of overreaching was enacted only in reference to these Gemara. How do we know this for our rabbis taught and if thou sell a sale unto thy neighbor or acquire a spot of thy neighbor's hand this applies to that which is acquired by being passed from hand to hand thus excluding land which is not movable slaves which are assimilated to landed estates and bills for it is written and if thou sell a sale implying that which is intrinsically sold and intrinsically bought excluding bills which are not Intrinsically sold or bought and exist only as evidence, hence it was said if one sells his bills to a perfume dealer, they are subject to the law of overreaching, but surely that is obvious it is to reject our Kahana's view that overreaching does not apply to a purchase involving only Purutas, therefore we are taught that overreaching does apply to Purutas. Sacred object scripture saith one man shall not defraud his brother, his brother, but not hit Ishrab be mammal objected wherever his hand is written. Is it then literal if so when it is stated and he took all his land out of his hand, does that too mean that he held all his land in his hand, but it must mean out of his possession? So here too it means out of his possession, then wherever his hand is written, is it not literal, but it has been taught if the theft be certainly found in his hand, he shall restore double from this. I know the law only if it is found in his hand, whence do I know it of his roof courtyard or enclosure? From the phrase if it certainly be found implying in all circumstances hence this is only because the divine lord if it certainly be found but otherwise I would have said that wherever his hand is written hand is meant literally again it has been taught and let him write her a bill of divorcement and he shall give it in her hand thus I know only that he can place it in her hand whence do I know it of her record or enclosure because it is written and he shall give it implying in any manner hence this is only because scripture wrote and he shall give it but otherwise I would have said that wherever scripture writes hand it is meant literally but in truth his hand is always meant literally there however it is different because it cannot possibly be translated thus but must mean his possession are zero propounded does the law of overreaching apply to hiring or not the divine law said and if thou sell a sale implying but not hire or perhaps there is no difference. Said Abbe is it then written a permanent sale and undefined sale is stated and this too for its day is a sale robber propounded what of wheat which was sown in the soil does the law of overreaching apply thereto or not is it just as though he had placed it in a pitcher hand subject to the law of overreaching or perhaps he has assimilated it to the soil but what are the circumstances shall we say that he declared I cast six measures therein and then witnesses came and testified that he sowed five only but robber said on account of any fraud in measure weight or number even if less than the standard of overreaching one can withdraw but the question arises where he declared I cast as much into it as was necessary whilst it was subsequently revealed that he had not sown with it as much as was required is it subject to the law of overreaching or not is it as though he had placed it in a pitcher and hand subject to overreaching or perhaps he assimilated it to the soil further is an oath taken concerning it or not is it as though he had placed it the seed in a pitcher and therefore an oath must be taken or perhaps he assimilated it to the soil and so no oath is taken again does the omer permit it for food or not but how is this meant if it took root then we have learned it and if not we have also learned it for we learned if they, the seeds took root before the bringing of the omer the omer permits them if not they are forbidden until the bringing of the next omer this arises only if he reaped and resowed it before the omer then the omer came and went whilst it did not take root before the bringing of the omer talmud mas babamitia talmud mas babamitia now may one remove and eat it is it as though lying in a pitcher and therefore made permissible by the omer or perhaps he assimilated it to the soil the question stands rabba said in arhas's name are am i propounded now these are not subject to the law of overreaching but are they subject to cancellation of sale or not said Arnam and Arhas has subsequently said that Rmi solved it thus they are not subject to the law overreaching but are subject to cancellation of sale now Arjona said the following in respect to sacred objects whilst Jeremiah said it in respect to real estate both in Aryohanan's name is the law of overreaching does not apply thereto but cancellation of sale does he who said this in reference to sacred objects would certainly say it in reference to real estate too but he who referred this to land would not admit sacred objects too in accordance with Samuel for Samuel said if it is worth a was redeemed with the equivalent of a paratot it is redeemed we learned elsewhere if the consecrated animal was blemished it becomes holland but its value must be assessed Aryohanan said it becomes holland by biblical law but its value must be assessed by rabbinic law but Reshlakish maintained that its value must be assessed is also biblical what are the circumstances shall we say that it is within the limit of overreaching in such a case could Reshlakish maintain that its value is assessed by biblical law did we not learn the following are not subject to the law of overreaching the purchase of slaves bills real estate and sacred objects but if it refers to a difference involving cancellation of sale could Aryohanan in that case say that its value must be made up by rabbinical law only did not Arjona say in respect to sacred objects and Arjeremiah say in reference to real estate yet both in Aryohanan's name the law of overreaching does not apply thereto but cancellation of sale does in truth it refers to a difference involving cancellation of sale but reverse it ascribing Aryohanan's views to Reshlakish and Reshlakish to Aryohanan wherein do they differ in respect to Samuel's dictum is if it is worth a was redeemed with the equivalent of a paratot it is redeemed one master except Samuel's Ruling the other rejects it alternatively all agree with Samuel but here they differ in this one master maintains only if it was redeemed but not in the first place whilst the other holds that it is permissible even at the very outset an alternative answer is this in truth it refers to a difference within the limit of overreaching and you must not reverse it but they differ on our dictum who said what is meant by they are not subject to the law of overreaching is that they are not subject to the provisions of overreaching Talmud, Mas Babamitzi Aviv is that even less than the standard of overreaching a sixth is returnable an objection is raised the prohibitions of usury and overreaching apply to a layman but not to Hippish is this then stronger than our mission which we interpreted as referring to the provisions of overreaching so here too the prohibition of usury and the provisions of overreaching apply to a layman but not Hippish if so how can the second clause State in this respect the case of a layman is more stringent than that of Hippish that refers to usury than it should also teach in this respect the case of Hippish is more stringent than that of a layman is overreaching how compare as for saying in this respect the case of a layman is more stringent than that of Hippish it is well for there are no other instances but with respect to Hippish is this the only stringency and are there not others how is usury by Hippish possible shall we say that the treasurer of Hippish lent 100 zoos for 120 but he thereby committed a trespass and that being so the money passes out into Holland and is a layman said Arhashai what is meant here is e.g. if one a layman contracted to supply flour at 4 seahs per cell whilst it subsequently stood at 3 seahs per cell as we learned if one contracts to supply flour at 4 seahs per cell and it subsequently stood at 3 he must supply it at 4 at 3 and it subsequently stood at four he must apply it at four because Hippish always has the upper hand our papa said this refers to bricks for building entrusted to the treasurer in accordance with Samuel's dictum for Samuel said we build with unconsecrated material and then consecrate it neither there is double repayment etc once do we know this for our rabbis taught for all
Proposition money or stuff that is a specialization and it be stolen out of a man's house is again a general statement now in a general proposition followed by a specialization and again by a general proposition you must be guided by the peculiarities of the specialization just as the specialization is clearly defined as something movable and of value in itself so everything movable and intrinsically valuable is included thus real estate is excluded not being movable slaves are excluded. Being assimilated to real estate bills too are excluded for though movables they are not intrinsically valuable as for sacred objects scripture rights and if a man shall deliver unto his neighbor but not hitish nor does a paid bailey make it good etc. How do we know this for our rabbis taught if a man deliver unto his neighbor that is a general proposition an ass or an ox or a sheep that is a specialization or any beast to keep that is again a general proposition now in a general proposition followed by a specialization followed again by a general proposition you must be guided solely by the specialization just as the specialization is clearly defined as a movable article which is intrinsically valuable so everything movable which is intrinsically valuable is included thus real estate is excluded not being movable slaves are excluded being assimilated to real estate bills too are excluded for though movables they are not intrinsically valuable as for sacred objects. Scripture saith if a man deliver unto his neighbor his neighbor but not hit furthermore a gratuitous belly does not swear etc. But the following contradicts this if townspeople sent their shekels and they were stolen or lost if this happened after the separation of the funds Talmud, Mas Baba Metziah they the messengers swear to the treasurers but if not they must swear to the townspeople who substitute other shekels in their stead if they the shekels were subsequently found or returned by the thieves both are sacred shekels yet they are not credited to them for the following year said Samuel this refers to paid billies and they swear in order to receive their fees if so they swear to the treasurer surely they should swear to the townspeople said Rabbi it means this they swear to the townspeople in the presence of the treasurer so that they should not be suspected or stigmatized as culpable negligence but it is taught and they were stolen or lost whereas a Paid Billy is responsible for loss or theft and here too granted that they do not make it good yet they must surely lose their wages Rabbi replied stolen means by armed robbers lost that their ship foundered at sea are Yohanan said who is the author of this are Simeon who maintains sacred objects for which one the owner bears responsibility are subject to overreaching and oaths are taken on their account now that is well before the dividing of the funds but after that they the lost shekels are sacred objects for which no responsibility is borne by their owners for it has been taught the division is made in respect of what is lost collected and yet to be collected but said our Eliezer this oath was in pursuance of a rabbinical enactment that people might not treat sacred objects lightly nor does a paid Billy make it good our Joseph B. have appointed out a contradiction to Rabbi we learned nor does a paid Billy make it good but the following contradicts it if one see the temple Treasurer engages a day worker to look after the heifer or a child or to wash over the crops. He is not paid for the Sabbath, therefore he is not responsible for the Sabbath. But if he was engaged by the week year or sub he is paid for the Sabbath. Consequently, he bears the risks of the Sabbath. Surely that means in respect to payment. No, it means that he loses his wage. If so, when the first clause states he is not responsible for the Sabbath, does that to refer to loss of wages? Is he then paid for the Sabbath? But it is stated he is not paid for the Sabbath. Thereupon he was silent. Said he to him, Have you heard aught in this matter? He replied, Thus did our say we deal with the case where he, the treasurer, acquired it from his hand, and thus did our Yohanan say too. It means that he acquired it from his hand. Our Simeon said, Sacrifices for which one the owner bears responsibility are subject to overreaching. Those for which he bears no responsibility are not subject. There too a tanner recited before our Isaac B. Abba for sacrifices for which he the owner bears responsibility he is liable because I can apply to them the verse if a soul sin and commit a trespass against the Lord and lie but for those sacrifices for which no responsibility is born he is not liable because I read in respect to them if a soul sin against his neighbor and lie said he to him whether do you turn Talmud, Mas Baba Metziah be the logic is the reverse then. Shall I delete it he asked no he replied it means this for sacrifices for which he the owner bears responsibility he is liable for these are included in if a soul sin against the Lord and lie but for those for which he the owner bears no responsibility he is not liable because they are excluded by against his neighbor and lie Arjuda said also when one sells a scroll of the Torah an animal or a pearl there is no law of overreaching it has been taught Arjuda. Said the sale of a scroll of the law too is not subject to overreaching because its value is inaccessible an animal or a pearl is not subject to overreaching because one desires to match them said they the sages to him but one wishes to match up everything and Arjuda these are particularly important to him the purchaser others are not and to what extent said Amimar up to their value it has been taught Arjuda be but there is said the sale of a horse sword and buckler on the field of battle are not subject to overreaching because one's very life is dependent upon the mission just as there is overreaching in buying and selling so is there wrong done by words thus one must not ask another what is the price of this article if he has no intention of buying if a man was a repentant sinner one must not say to him remember your former deeds if he was a son of proselytes one must not taunt him remember the deeds of your ancestors because it is written thou shalt neither wrong a Stranger nor oppress him, Gemara or rabbis taught, ye shall not therefore wrong one another. Scripture refers to verbal wrongs, you say verbal wrongs, but perhaps that is not so. Monetary wrongs being meant when it is said, and if thou sell aught unto thy neighbor or acquire a spot of thy neighbor, ye shall not wrong one another. Monetary wrongs are already dealt with, then to what can I refer? Ye shall not therefore wrong each other to verbal wrongs, e.g., if a man is a penitent, one must not say to him, Remember your former deeds, if he is a son of proselytes, he must not be taunted with, Remember the deeds of your ancestors, if he is a proselyte and comes to study the Torah, one must not say to him, Shall the mouth that ate unclean and forbidden food, abominable and creeping things, come to study the Torah which was uttered by the mouth of omnipotence, if he is visited by suffering, afflicted with disease, or has buried his children, one must not speak to him as his companions spoke to Job, is not thy. Fear of God, thy confidence, and I hope the integrity of thy ways. Remember, I pray thee, whoever perished being innocent, if ass driver sought grain from a person, he must not say to them, Go to so and so who sells grain, whilst knowing that he has never sold any. Our Judah said, One may also not feign interest in the purchase when he has no money, since this is known to the heart only, and of everything known only to the heart it is written, and thou shalt fear thy God. Our Yohanan said, On the authority of our Simeon, be your behavior wrong is more heinous than monetary wrong, because of the first it is written, and thou shalt fear thy God, but not of the second. Our Eliezer said, The one affects is the victim's person, the other only his money. Our Samuel be Naman, he said, For the former restoration is possible, but not for the latter. A tanner recited before our Naman, be Isaac, he who publicly shames his neighbor is as though he shed blood, whereupon he remarked to him, You say well, because I have seen it, S.C. such. Shaming the ruddiness, departing and paleness, supervening of A. Ask Ardimi, what do people most carefully avoid in the West S.C. Palestine? He replied, putting others to shame for our Hannah. said, All descend into Gehenna, excepting three. All can you really think so? But say thus, all who descend into Gehenna subsequently reascend, excepting three who descend, but do not reascend. Viz. he who commits adultery with a married woman publicly shames his neighbor or fastens an evil epithet nickname. Upon his neighbor fastens an epithet, but that is putting to shame. It means even when he is accustomed to the name Rabbi Bar Hannah said in our Yohanan's name Talmud, Mas Baba Metziah, better it is for man to cohabit with a doubtful married woman rather than that he should publicly shame his neighbor. Whence do we know this from what Rabbi expounded? Viz. what is meant by the verse, but in my adversity they rejoiced and gathered themselves together. They did tear me and cease not David. Exclaimed before the Holy One, Blessed be He, Sovereign of the Universe, Thou knowest full well that had they torn my flesh, my blood would not have poured forth to the earth. Moreover, when they are engaged in studying leprosies and tents, they jeer at me, saying, David, what is the death penalty of him who seduces a married woman? I reply to them, He is executed by strangulation, yet has he a portion in the world to come, but he who publicly puts his neighbor to shame has no portion in the world to come. Marzitra be Tobia said in Rab's name, Others state, Our Hannah be business said in
Locked accepting the gates through which pass the cries of wrong on off for it is written behold the Lord stood by a wall of wrongs and in his hand were the wrongs are Eliezer said all evil is punished through an agent accepting wrong for it is written and in his hand were the wrongs are of said there are three evils before which the curtain is not closed overreaching robbery and idolatry overreaching for it is written and in his hand was the overreaching robbery because it is written. Robbery and spoil are heard in her there before me continually idolatry for it is written the people that provoke me to anger continually before my face that sacrifice FSC to idols in gardens and burneth incense upon altars of brick Rab Judah said one should always take heed that there be corn in his house for strife is prevalent in a house only on account of corn food for it is written he make peace in thy borders he filleth thee with the finest of the wheat said our papa hence it. Proverb when the barley is quite gone from the pitcher strike comes knocking at the door our high and papa said one should always take heed that there be corn in his house because Israel were called poor only on account of the lack of corn for it is said and so it was when Israel had sown etc and it is further written and the SC the Midianites and the Amalekites encamped against them and destroyed the increase of the earth whilst this is followed by and Israel was greatly impoverished. Because of the Midianites our Helbo said one must always observe the honor due to his wife because blessings rest on a man's home only on account of his wife for it is written and he treated Abram well for her sake and thus did Rabba say to the townspeople of Mahus honor your wives that ye may be enriched we learned elsewhere if he cut it into separate tiles placing sand between each tile our Eliezer declared it clean and the sages declared it unclean Talmud, Mas Baba Metziah B and this was it. Abin Abakne why the Abin Abakne said Rab Judah in Samuel's name it means that they encompassed it with arguments as a snake and proved it unclean it has been taught on that day our Eliezer brought forward every imaginable argument but they did not accept them said he to them if the Halajah agrees with me let this carob tree prove it there upon the carob tree was torn a hundred cubits out of its place others affirm four hundred cubits no proof can be brought from a carob tree they Retorted again he said to them if the Halacha agrees with me let the stream of water prove it whereupon the stream of water flowed backwards no proof can be brought from a stream of water they rejoined again he urged if the Halacha agrees with me let the walls of the schoolhouse prove it whereupon the walls inclined to fall but our Joshua rebuked them saying when scholars are engaged in a Halashik dispute what have you to interfere hence they did not fall in honor of our Joshua nor did they resume the upright in honor of our Eliezer and they are still standing thus inclined again he said to them if the Halacha agrees with me let it be proved from heaven whereupon the heavenly voice cried out why do you dispute with our Eliezer seeing that in all matters the Halacha agrees with him but our Joshua rose and exclaimed it is not in heaven what did he mean by the said our Jeremiah that the Torah had already been given at Mount Sinai we pay no attention to a heavenly voice because thou hast Long since written in the Torah at Mount Sinai after the majority must one incline our Nathan met Elijah and ask him what did the Holy One bless be he do in that hour he laughed with joy he replied saying my sons have defeated me my sons have defeated me it was said on that day all objects which our Elijah had declared clean were brought and burnt in fire then they took a vote and excommunicated him said they who shall go and inform him I will go answered our Akiba less than unsuitable person. Go and inform him and thus destroy the whole world what did our Akiba do he donned black garments and wrapped himself in black and sat at a distance of four cubits from him Akiba said our Elijah to him what has particularly happened today master he replied it appears to me that thy companions hold aloof from me thereupon he too rent his garments put off his shoes removed his seat and sat on the earth whilst tears streamed from his eyes the world was then smitten the third of the olive crop. Third of the wheat and a third of the barley crop. Some say the dough in women's hands swelled up a tan and talk great was the calamity that befell that day for everything at which our Eliezer cast his eyes was burned up. Our Gamaliel too was traveling in a ship when a huge wave arose to drown him. It appears to me he reflected that this is on account of none other but our Eliezer be hearkened thereupon he arose and exclaimed sovereign of the universe thou knowest full well that I have not acted for my honor nor for the honor of my paternal house but for thine so that strife may not multiply in Israel at that the raging sea subsided. I am a shalom was our Eliezer's wife and sister to our Gamaliel from the time of this incident onwards she did not permit him to fall upon his face now a certain day happened to be new moon but she mistook a full month for a defective one other say a poor man came and stood at the door and she took out some bread to him on her return she found him fallen on his face. Arise, she cried out to him, Thou hast slain my brother. In the meanwhile, an announcement was made from the house of Rabbi Gamaliel that he had died. Whence dost thou know it? He questioned her, I have this tradition from my father's house. All gates are locked, excepting the gates of wounded feelings. Our rabbis taught he who wounds the feelings of a proselyte transgresses three negative injunctions, and he who oppresses him infringes two, wherein does wronging differ, because three negative injunctions are stated, Viz, thou shalt not wrong a stranger, i.e., a proselyte, and if a stranger sojourn with thee in your land, ye shall not wrong him, and ye shall not therefore wrong each his fellow man. A proselyte being included in fellow man, but for oppression, also three are written, Viz, and thou shalt not oppress him, also thou shalt not oppress a stranger, and if thou lend money to any of my people that is poor by thee, thou shalt not be to him as a usurer, which includes a proselyte, but say both are. Forbidden by three injunctions it has been taught our Eliezer the Great said why did the Torah warn against the wronging of a proselyte in 36 or as others say in 46 places because he has a strong inclination to evil what is the meaning of the verse thou shalt neither wrong a stranger nor oppress him for ye were strangers in the land of Egypt it has been taught our Nathan said do not taunt your neighbor with the blemish you yourself have and thus the proverb runs if there is a case of hanging in a man's family record say not to him hang this fish up for me mission produce may not be mixed with other produce even new with new Talmud Mas Baba Metziah, how much more so new with old yet in truth it was said that strong wine may be mixed with mild because it improves it a man must not mix the lees of wine with wine but he the vendor may give him the vendee its lees if his wine was diluted with water he must not sell it in his shop in small quantities unless he Informs him the customer nor to a merchant even if he informs him because the latter buys it only in order to cheat therewith where it is a practice to adulterate wine with water it is permissible a merchant may purchase grain from five granaries and put it into one storeroom or wine from five presses and put it into the same cask providing that it is not his intention to mix them tomorrow our rabbis taught it goes without saying when new produce stands at four as eahs per seller. Whilst old is priced at three that they may not be intermixed but even when new is at three and old at four they may still not be mixed because the higher price of the new corn is due to the fact that one wishes to store them until old yet in truth it was said that strong wine may be mixed with mild because it improves it our Eliezer said from this it may be concluded that wherever it is stated in truth it was said that is the halacha said our nom and this was taught only when they the wines. Are in the presses, but nowadays wines are mixed even after they have left the presses. Said our Papa, it is known and forgiven. Our Aha, son of our Ika, said that is in accordance with our Aha, for it has been taught our Aha permits mixing in a commodity that is first tasted. A man must not mix the lees of wine with wine, but he the vendor may give him the vendee its lees. But you have ruled in the first clause that they may not be mixed at all. And should you reply that what is meant by but he may give him its lees is that he informs him thereof. Since the subsequent clause states he must not sell it in his shop unless he informs him the customer nor to a merchant, even if he informs him, it follows that this clause means even if he does not inform him, said Rab Judah, it means this a man must not mix the lees of yesterday's wine with that of today's nor vice versa. But he the vendor may give him the vendee its own lees. It has been taught likewise. Our Judah said when a man pours out wine. For his neighbor selling it to him he must not mix the lees of yesterday's wine with that of today's nor vice versa but may mix yesterday's with yesterday's and today's with today's if his wine was diluted with water he must not sell it in his shop in small quantities unless he informs him etc. Rabba once brought wine from a shop after diluting it he tasted it and on finding that it was not good he returned it to the shop thereupon a vapor tested but we learned nor to a merchant even if he informs him he replied by mixing is well known and should you object he may add wine thereto
may not be inflated nor may meat be soaked in water. What is meant by one may not give an appearance of stiffness here in Babylon? It is explained as referring to brand broth. Zeiri said in Arkahana's name, brushing up an animal's hair. Samuel permitted fringes to be put on a cloak. Rab Judah permitted a gloss to be put on fine cloths. Rabbi permitted hem cloths to be beaten. Rabbi permitted arrows to be painted. Our Papa B. Samuel allowed baskets to be painted, but did we not learn men cattle and utensils may not be painted? There is no difficulty. One refers to new the other to old. What is the purpose of painting men? As in the case of a certain aged slave who went and had his head and beard dyed and came before Rabbi saying to him, "By me, let the poor be the children of thy house." He replied, "So he went to our Papa B. Samuel, who bought him one day. He said to him, 'Give me some water to drink.' Thereupon he went, washed his head and beard white again, and said to him, 'See, I am older than your father.'" At that he applied to himself the verse the righteous is delivered out of trouble and another cometh in his stead C H A P T E R V Mishnah what is Neshek and what is Tarbith what is Neshek one who lends a seller for denarii for five denarii or two S E A H S of wheat for three that is forbidden because he thereby bites the debtor and what is Tarbith the taking of interest on produce e.g. if a man purchased wheat at a gold denarii twenty five silver denarii per core which was the current price and subsequently wheat appreciated to thirty denarii per core then the purchaser said to him give me my wheat as I wish to sell it and buy wine with the proceeds to which the vendor replied let the wheat be charged to me as a debt of thirty denarii per core and you have a claim of wine upon me for its value but he actually has no wine at the time Gemara now since he the disregards the biblical meaning of interest and defines its rabbinical connotation it follows that biblically. Speaking Neshek and Tarbith are synonymous whereas in fact there are scriptural expressions Neshek of money and Ribbeth of food. Do you think then that there can be Neshek lost to the debtor without Tarbith profits to the creditor or Tarbith without Neshek? How might there be Neshek without Tarbith if he lent him a hundred brutas for one hundred and twenty brutas at first when the loan is made a dunk of being valued at a hundred brutas and subsequently when the loan was repaid? At a hundred and twenty there is Neshek for he bites him the debtor by taking from him something which he the creditor did not give yet there is no Tarbith to the creditor for there is no profit since he lent him a dunk and received back a dunk but after all if the original rate is the determining factor there is both Neshek and Tarbith if the subsequent rate there is neither Neshek nor Tarbith furthermore how is Tarbith profit to the creditor conceivable without Neshek lost to it? Debtor if he lent him a hundred brutas for a hundred the hundred being worth a dunk at first and now if, if if you regard the first rate there is neither Neshek nor Tarbith if the final rate there is both Neshek and Tarbith but said Rabbi you can find neither Neshek without Tarbith nor Tarbith without Neshek and the only purpose of scripture in stating them separately is to teach that one transgresses two prohibitions by taking interest for rabbis taught thou shalt not give him thy money upon Neshek usury nor lend him thy vittles for marbeth interest from this I only know that the prohibition of Neshek applies to money and that of ribbeth to provisions whence do we know that the prohibition Neshek applies to provisions too from the verse thou shalt not lend upon usury to thy brother Neshek of money Neshek of vittles whence do we know that the prohibition of ribbeth applies to money from the verse Neshek of money Talmud Mas Baba Metzia, now since this is Redundant in respect of money, Neshek, as it is already written, thou shalt not lend upon usury to thy brother. Utilize the subject to teach that the prohibition of Ribbeth applies to money from this. I know it only of the borrower. Whence do we know it of the lender? Neshek is stated in reference to the borrower, also in reference to the lender, just as with respect of the Neshek written in reference to the borrower. No distinction is drawn between money and provisions. Neshek and Ribbeth, so also. In respect to Neshek written in reference to the lender, you must draw no distinction between money and provisions. Neshek and Ribbeth, whence do we know to extend the law to everything from the verse Neshek of anything that is lent upon usury? Rabbin has said there is no need of any verse to teach either that the prohibition Neshek in respect of vittles or of Ribbeth in respect of money applies to the lender, for were it written thy money, thou shalt not give him upon Neshek and thy food upon. Marbeth it would be even as you say since however it is written thy money thou shalt not give him upon Neshek and upon Marbeth thou shalt not lend thy vittles read it thus thy money thou shalt not give him upon Neshek and upon Marbeth and upon Neshek and upon Marbeth thou shalt not give thy vittles but does not the Tana state it is said it is said he means this if the verse were not written in such a way I should have adduced the Gezerishawa now however that the verse is couched thus. The Gezerishawa is unnecessary then for what purpose do I need the Gezerishawa in respect of Neshek of anything for which usury may be given which is not written in connection with the lender Rabbah said why did the divine law write an injunction against Ribbeth an injunction against robbery and an injunction against overreaching they are necessary for had the divine law stated an injunction against Ribbeth only no other prohibition could be deduced therefrom because it is anomalous. The prohibition lying even upon the debtor again had the divine law written an interdict against robbery I might argue that that is because it is against his victims which but as for overreaching I might maintain that it is not forbidden and were there a prohibition in the divine law against overreaching only I might reason that is because he the defrauded does not know of his loss to be able to pardon now one could not be deduced from another but cannot one be derived from. The other two which could be thus deduced should the divine law omit the prohibition of usury that it might follow from these robbery and fraud but I would argue the reason why these are forbidden is because they lack the victim's consent will you say the same of usury which is taken with his the debtor's consent and if the divine law omitted the injunction against overreaching that it might be deduced from the others I would argue the reason why the others are forbidden is. Because commerce is not carried on thus, but the divine law should not have stated the prohibition of robbery and it would have followed from the others for what objections will you raise as for interest that it is an anomaly then let overreaching prove it should you argue as for fraud the reason of the prohibition is that he the victim is in ignorance thereof and cannot pardon then let interest prove it and thus the argument revolves the distinguishing feature of one is not the distinguishing feature of the other and vice versa the characteristic common to both is that he robs him so also may I this actual robbery as prohibited I will tell you that indeed is so then what is the need of an injunction against robbery in respect of withholding the payment of a hired worker but the prohibition against the withholding of such payment is explicitly stated thou shalt not oppress an hired servant that is poor and needy at his day thou shalt give him his hire to Teach that he who withholds payment transgresses two negative precepts, then let it be referred to interest or fraud that in their case two negative commands are transgressed. It is a matter deduced from its context. Talmud, Mas Baba Mitzvah, and at the injunction against robbery is written in connection with the hired worker. What is the need of the injunction? Ye shall not steal, which the divine law wrote for that which was taught. Ye shall not steal, even in order to grieve. Ye shall not steal, even in order to repay. Double Rmr said to Rashi, for what purpose did the divine law state separately the prohibition against false weights? He replied to forbid the steeping of weights in salt, but that is pure robbery to teach that one transgresses at the very moment that this is done. Our rabbis taught, Ye shall do no unrighteousness in judgment in meat yard and in weight or in measure meat yard means land measurement and it forbids measuring for one in summer and four. Another in winter in weight prohibits the steeping of weights in salt and in measure teaches that one must not cause the liquid to foam. Now surely you can reason a minority if the Torah objected to a false messer which is but a thirty-sixth of a log. How much more so a hin half a hin a third of a hin and a quarter of a hin a log half a log or quarter log. Rabbi said why did the divine law mention the exodus from Egypt in connection with interest fringes and weights the holy one blessed be he. Declared it is I who distinguished in Egypt between the firstborn and one who was not a firstborn even so it is I who will exact vengeance from him who ascribes his money to a Gentile and lends it to an Israelite on interest or who steeps his weights in salt or who attaches to his garment threads dyed with vegetable blue and maintains that it is real blue. Rabbi happened to be in Surah on the Euphrates said Arhanan of Surah on the Euphrates why did scripture mention the exodus from Egypt? In connection with forbidden reptiles, he replied, The Holy One, blessed be he said, I who distinguish between the firstborn and one who was not a firstborn, even I will mete out
From your onward it is indirect interest. Our Eliezer said direct interest can be reclaimed in court but not indirect interest. Our Yohanan ruled even direct interest cannot be reclaimed in court. Our Isaac said what is our Yohanan's reason? The writ said he hath given forth upon usury and hath taken increase. Shall he then live? He shall not live. He hath done all these abominations for it. This transgression death is prescribed but not return of the money. Our Adabi Agabus said scripture saith take thou no. Usury of him or increase but fear thy God fear is prescribed but not return Rabbah said it follows from the essential meaning of the verse he shall surely die his blood shall be upon him thus those who lend upon usury are compared to shedders of blood just as those who shed blood can make no restitution so those who lend upon interest can make no restitution Arnaman B. Isaac said what is our Eliezer's reason scripture saith Talmud, Mas Baba Mitzia, take thou no usury of him or increase but fear thy God that thy brother may live with thee implying return it to him that he may be able to live with thee now how does our Yohanan interpret that thy brother may live with thee he utilizes it for that which was taught if two are traveling on a journey far from civilization and one has a pitcher of water if both drink they will both die but if one only drinks he can reach civilization the son of Patrick taught it is better that both should drink and die rather than that one should. Behold his companion's death until our Akiva came and taught that thy brother may live with thee thy life takes precedence over his life an objection was raised if their father left them usury money though they know it to be usury they are not bound to return it this implies but their father is bound to return it in truth their father too is not bound to return it but because the second clause desires to state if their father left them a cow or a garment or any distinguishable object received as interest they must return it for the sake of their father's honor the first clause too is taught with reference to them but are they then bound to make restitution for the sake of their father's honor why not apply here thou shalt not curse a ruler of that people which means only if he acts as is fitting for that people it is as our has in another connection said in Rob's name if he repented so here too we deal with the case where he repented but if he repented how came it Money to be still in his possession he died before he had time to return it an objection was raised robbers and those who lend on usury even when they have exacted it must make restitution now how can even when they have exacted it apply to robbers if it is robbed it is robbed and if not can you call them robbers but say thus robbers and those meant thereby are those who lend upon usury even when they have exacted it must make restitution it is a dispute of tanaim for it was taught our Nehemiah and our Eliezer be Jacob exempt the lender and the surety from punishment because they have a positive duty now what is meant by a positive duty surely that we bid them arise and return the usury from which it follows that the first tana maintains that they are not bound to make a return no by positive duty is meant that they are bid to tear up the bond of indebtedness but what is his opinion if he maintains a bond which is destined to be exacted is as though it were already Exacted they have already committed their transgression whilst if it is not as already collected they have committed no wrong in truth in his view a bond destined to be exacted is not as though already exacted and what he teaches us is that the mere putting on of usury is a transgression this also stands to reason for we learned the following transgress the negative injunction the lender the borrower the surety and the witnesses now with respect to all it is well since they committed action but what have the witnesses done hence it surely must be that the mere putting on of usury is a substantial act and in this case a transgression this proves it our Safra said wherever by their law a non-Jewish law exaction is made from the debtor for the creditor restoration is made by our law from the creditor to the debtor wherever by their law there is no exaction from the debtor to the creditor there is no restoration by our law from the creditor to the debtor said of to R. Joseph now is this a general rule behold there is a case of SEL and for SEL which by their law the debtor is forced to repay the creditor yet by ours it is not returnable from the creditor to the debtor he replied they regard it as having come into his possession merely as a trust Robin is said to our Ashi but mortgages without deduction which by their law is exacted from the debtor for the creditor Talmud, Mas Baba Metziah be it by our law is not restored from the creditor to the debtor he replied they regard it as having come into his hand by the law of purchase then when our Safra said wherever by their law etc what did he mean to tell us this wherever by their law exaction is made from the debtor for the creditor restoration is made by our law from the creditor to the debtor this refers to direct interest and in accordance with our LA's or wherever by their law there is no exaction from the debtor to the creditor there is by our law no restoration from the creditor. To the debtor this refers to prepaid and postpaid interest e.g. if one purchased we had a gold in our procor which was the current price etc. But what does it matter if he has no wine did we not learn one must not fix a price for produce until the market price is known once the market price is established a fixed price may be agreed upon for even if this vendor has no stock another has rather replied our mission refers to the creating of a debt for the value thereof and as it has been. Taught if one was his neighbor's creditor for a main and he went and stood at his the debtor's granary and demanded give me my money as I wish to purchase wheat therewith to which he answered I have wheat with which to supply you go and calculate the amount at the current price and I will furnish you with it spreading it over the whole year that is forbidden because it is not as though the had come to his hand they said to him if the reason in the mission is that it is not as Though the Esau had come to his hand, why particularly state the case where he has no one, even if he has it is also forbidden, but said of our mission is as our Safra learned in the collection of Berithas on interest of the College of Arhai, for our Safra learned in the collection of Berithas on interest of the College of Arhai, some things are essentially permitted yet forbidden as constituting an evasion of usury, how so if they requested be lend me a mana to which he replied, I have no mana but wheat to the value thereof which I will give you, and thereupon he gave him a mana's worth of wheat calculated on the current price and repurchased it for twenty four sellers. Now this is essentially permitted yet may not be done on account of evasion of usury, so here in the mission to EGA said to be lend me thirty denarii to which he replied, I have not thirty denarii but wheat for the same which I can give you, he then gave him thirty denarii's worth of wheat calculated at the Current price and repurchased it for a gold dinar. Now, if the debtor has wine which he gives him against the thirty denarii, the creditor merely receives provisions from him, and there is no objection. But if not, since he has no wine to receive money, certainly smacks of usury. Rabba said to him, If so, instead of give me my wheat, the tana should state, Give me the money for my wheat. Read the money for my wheat instead of as I wish to sell it. He should state which I sold. You read which I sold. You the wheat shall be accounted as a debt to me of thirty denarii. But from the very beginning, had it not been fixed thus against him, he said thus to him, For the value of your wheat which you have accounted against me at thirty denarii, you have a claim of wine upon me. Whereas he the debtor has no wine, but it is stated if a man purchased wheat at a gold dinar per core, which was the market price. But said Rabba, When I die, Arashai will come to meet me. Talmud, Mas Baba Metzia, for I interpret. The Mishnah Yoth in accordance with his views for our Ashai taught if a man was his neighbor's creditor for a mana and he went and stood at his granary and said repay me my money as I wish to purchase wheat therewith and he the debtor replied I have wheat which I will supply you go and charge me therewith against my debt at the current price the time came for selling and he said to him give me the wheat which I wish to sell and purchase wine with the proceeds to which he replied I have wine go and assess it for me at the current price then the time came for selling wine and he said to him give me my wine for I wish to sell it and purchase oil for it to which he replied I have oil to supply you go and assess it for me at the current price in all these cases if he possesses these commodities it is permitted if not it is forbidden so in the Mishnah and what is meant by if a man purchased he purchased against his debt Rabbah said three deductions follow from our Ashai I the debt may be offset against provisions and we do not say it is not as if the Esau had come to his hand too but only if he the debtor possesses these commodities and three Arjane's view is correct is what is the difference between them themselves see the provisions and the value thereof for it was stated Rab said one may buy on trust against future delivery of crops but not against repayment of money at future prices but Arjane said what is the difference between them themselves see the crops and the value thereof an objection was raised in all these cases if he possesses these commodities it is permitted Arhuna answered in Rab's name this means that he threw the produce into his possession if he drew it into his possession need it be taught but e.g. he assigned a corner of the granary to him Samuel said this is taught in accordance with Arjuna who ruled one-sided usury is permitted for it has been taught if
who not the son of Arjashu objected to Rabba's statement in all these cases if he possesses these commodities it is permitted if not it is forbidden he answered them there the reference is to a loan here to assail Rabba and Arjuza both said why did the Rabbi's rule a man may contract to supply provisions at the current market price even if he has none because he the purchaser can say to him the vendor take your favors and throw them in the bush how do you benefit me had I money I could have bought cheaply in Hainai and Shilia Bay said to Arjuza if so should it not be permitted to lend SEA for SEA since he the borrower could say take your favors and throw them in the bush where he could argue would my we have gone to ruin in my granary he replied there is a loan here a purchaser at a B Abba said to Rabba but he would have to pay money to a broker he replied he the purchaser must give that to, to him or as she said people's money is their broker Rabba. And Arjosa both said he who advances money at the early market price must personally appear at the granary for what purpose if to acquire it but he does not thereby acquire it if that he the vendor may have to submit to the curse he who punished etc even without his appearing there he must submit thereto in truth it is that he may submit to the curse but he who advances money on an early market generally gives it to two or three people hence if he appears before him he shoes that. He relies upon him for supplies but if not he the vendor complete I thought that you found better produce than mine and bought it intending that I should return your money or as he said now that you say it is because of his relying upon him and even if he met him in the market and said to him I rely upon you he relies upon him Arnam and said the general principle of usury is all payment for waiting for one's money is forbidden Arnam and also said if one gives money to a wax merchant. When it is priced at four standard measures pursues and he the vendor proposes I will supply you five pursues if he possesses it it is permitted if not it is forbidden but this is obvious it is necessary to teach this only when he has wax credits in town I might think that in such a case it is as though he had said lend me until my son comes or until I find the key therefore he teaches since it must yet be collected it is as non-existent Arnam and also said if one borrows money from his neighbor and found a surplus therein if it is an amount about which there could be an error he must return it otherwise it is simply a gift when is it an amount about which there could be an error Araba the son of Arjoseph said Talmud, Mas Bagumitia in denominations of tens or fives Araha the son of Rabba asked Arashi but what if he the lender is a hard man who never gives presents he replied he may have robbed him on a previous occasion and now included it in the total sum. For it has been taught if one robbed his neighbor and then included it in the account he is quit of his obligation but what if he the lender had come from elsewhere and had never had business dealings with him he replied he the borrower might have been robbed by some other person and might say to him the lender when so and so borrows money from you include this in the sum Arkahana said I was sitting at the end of Rab sessions and heard him repeatedly mention gourds but did not know. What he meant after Rab arose and departed I asked him see the students to what did Rab refer in his repeated mention of gourds they answered me thus did Rab say if a man gives money to a gardener for gourds ten gourds of a span's length being priced at a zoo's and says to him I will give you gourds a cubit in length for the money if he actually has them it is permitted but if not it is forbidden is this not obvious I might think since they naturally grow large without requiring. Labor it is in order he therefore taught otherwise with whom does this agree with the following tenet for it has been taught if one is going to milk his goats shear his sheep or remove the honey from the combs and meeting his neighbor says to him the milk which my goats will yield is sold to you the wool sheared from my sheep is sold to you the honey to be removed from my combs is sold to you it is permitted but if he said to him so much of my goats milk yield is sold to you so much of my sheep's shearings is sold to you or so much of the honey which will be removed from the honey combs is sold to you it is forbidden now though such yield comes naturally yet since it is not existent just then when the transaction is made it is forbidden others say robber ruled in reference to the gourd since they grow naturally it is permitted but it has been taught that so much and so much is forbidden there the increase is not in the product itself for the present yield is taken and other Comes in its stead here, however, that itself the produce he has in his garden increases in size for it that is taken away, others do not grow in its place. Abbe said, A man may say to his neighbor, Here are four zoos for a barrel of wine. If it turns sour, it is in your ownership, but if it appreciates or depreciates in value, it is in mindset. Arsh Arabia to Abbe Talmud, Mas Baba Matiabi, but that is near to profit. If it appreciates and remote from loss, he replied, Since he accepts the risk of depreciation, it is near to both profit and loss. Mission, if a man lends money to his neighbor, he must not live rent free in his court nor at a low rent because that constitutes usury. Gamara Ar Joseph Beman, said in Arnaman's name, though it has been ruled if one dwells in his neighbor's court without his knowledge, he need not pay him rent. Yet if he lent him money and then dwelt in his court, he must pay him rent. What does he teach us? We have already learned if a man lends money to. His neighbor he must not live rent free in his court nor at a low rent because that constitutes usury if from the mission I might have thought that that holds good only of a court which exists for letting and a man as see the creditor who generally rents but if it is a court which is not for letting and a person who does not generally rent I would say it is not so therefore he teaches us otherwise others say our Joseph Beman I said in Arnaman's name though it has been ruled if a man dwells in his neighbor's court without his knowledge he is not bound to pay him rent yet if he proposes to him lend me money and live in my court he the creditor must pay rent now he who rules even if he had already lent him he must pay rent will certainly hold the same if he proposed lend me etc but he who rules if he says lend me he must pay him rent will in the case where he has already lent him hold that it is unnecessary why so since he did not originally lend the money for this Purpose there is no objection to it. Our Joseph Behama seized the slaves of people who owed him money and put them to service. Said his son Rabba to him, Why does the master do thus? He replied, I agree with Arnaman for Arnaman said a slave's labor is not worth the bread he eats. Said he to him, Perhaps Arnaman said this only of such as his servant there who went about dancing in taverns. But did he say this of other servants? He replied, I am of the same opinion as our Daniel son of Arkatna who said, In Rab's name, if one seizes his neighbor's slave and puts him to service, he is free from payment. Talmud, Mas Babamitia, because he the owner is pleased that his slave does not become demoralized through idleness. But he urged that is only if one has no monetary claim upon him. Since you, sir, have a monetary claim upon them, it looks like usury for our Joseph Beman. I said in Arnaman's name, though it has been ruled if one dwells in his neighbor's court without his knowledge, he is not. Bound to pay him rent yet if he lent him money and then dwelt in his court he must be replied then I repent thereof Abbe said if a man had a claim of usury upon his neighbor and the market price of weed was four grivas azus whilst he the debtor gave him five when we reclaim it from him we only reclaim four but as for the other he merely favored him with a cheap rate Rabbi said we reclaim five because from the very outset he acquired it all as interest Abbe also said if a man had a claim of four zoos and interest upon his neighbor and he gave him a garment for it when we compel repayment we make him repay four zoos but not the garment Rabbi said we compel him to return the garment why so that people may not say the garment he wears is a garment of usury Rabbi said he who has a usury claim of twelve zoos upon his neighbor and he the debtor rented him his courtyard such as is generally let at ten zoos for twelve when we make him disgorge we force him to repay twelve araha of Tifti said to Rabbin, but cannot he protest when I rented it thus at such a high rent it was because I profited thereby now however that I do not profit just at the same rate as all rented so will I because he the debtor can say to him you understood its value and accepted it at 12 zoos mission rent may be increased but not the purchase price e.g. if a man rents his court and says to him the tenant if you pay me now for the year you can have it for 10 sellers per annum if monthly at a seller per month that is permitted if he sells his field and says to him the purchaser if you pay me now it is yours for 8000 zuz but if at harvest time for 12 minutes that is forbidden tomorrow what is the difference between the first clause and the second rabbi and our joseph both said rent is payable at the end of the year hence since it is not yet time to claim it is not payment for waiting but this a seller per month is its actual value and as for his proposition if you pay me now for the year you can have it for 10 seller per annum he is favoring him with a cheaper rent than normal but in the second clause the reference is to purchase where the money is immediately due therefore the higher price is payment for waiting which is forbidden
and the law is as our Eliezer, and the law is as our Jenna, who said what is the difference between them themselves as see the provisions and the value thereof mission if a man sold a field and he the buyer having paid part of the purchase price the vendor proposed whenever you desire bring me the balance and take your own as see the field that is forbidden if he lent money on a field and said to him the debtor if you do not repay me within three years at the field I as mine it becomes his and thus. Did Boethus Bezan in do acting with the approval of the sages Gemara who enjoys the usufruct Arhuna said the vendor Arain and said it is entrusted to a third party but there is no dispute the former is the case if he stipulated when you bring it the balance then acquire it the latter if he stipulated when you bring it acquire it from now our Safra learned in the collection of Barithas on usury of the school of Arhai sometimes both the vendor and the purchaser are permitted to enjoy it. Usufruct sometimes both are forbidden sometimes the vendor is permitted and the purchaser forbidden and sometimes the purchaser is permitted and the vendor forbidden thereupon Rabbah explained sometimes both are permitted viz if he stipulates acquire forth within proportion to your deposit sometimes both are forbidden if he stipulates when you bring it the balance let it be yours from now sometimes the vendor is permitted but the purchaser forbidden if he stipulates when you bring it then. Acquire it and sometimes the purchaser is permitted and the vendor forbidden if he states let it be yours from now and the balance be alone from Eju which Tana holds that both are forbidden Arhuna the son of Arjashua said it does not agree with Arjuna for were it in accordance with Arjuna surely he maintained that one-sided interest is permitted if a man mortgages a house or a field and he the creditor says to him should you wish to sell it you must let me have it at this price. Less than its value that is forbidden at its real value that is permitted which Tana maintains that if he stipulates at this price it is forbidden Arhuna the son of Arjashua said it does not agree with Arjuna for were it in accordance with him surely he holds that one-sided interest is permitted if he sells a house or a field and says to the purchaser when I have money resell it to me that is forbidden if the buyer says when you have money I will resell it to you that is permitted. With which Tana does disagree Arhuna the son of Arjashua said not with Arjuna for if it agreed with him surely he ruled that one-sided interest is permitted what is the difference between the first clause and the second Rabbah answered in the second clause he the buyer stipulated that if the resale should be voluntary a man once sold an estate to his neighbor without surety seeing that he the purchaser was disquieted he said to him why are you disquieted should it be ceased from you for a debt of mine I will repay you out of the best of my estate even for your improvements and the crops said Amimar Talmud, Mas Baba Matiyah, they are merely words of good cheer Arashi said to him why so is it because the buyer should have stipulated whilst here the vendor did so and therefore you maintain that they were merely words of good cheer but what of the very were and it is taught if the purchaser says when you have money I will resell it to you that is permitted. Now surely there too though the vendor should have made this stipulation the vendor did not stipulate but the buyer and yet when we asked what is the difference between the first clause and the second Rob answered in the second clause he the purchaser stipulates that if the resale should be voluntary thus implying that if he does not stipulate that it should be voluntary the transaction would be forbidden and we do not assume that his offer was merely words of good cheer he replied. What was said was that it is accounted as though he had stipulated that if the resale should be voluntary a certain sick man wrote to get for his wife he then groaned and sighed whereupon she his wife said to him why do you sigh should you recover I am your said RZ but these were mere words of consolation Araha if he asked Robin and what if they were not mere words of consolation does it lie within her power to insert a condition in the get surely it rests only with him to give it. Get on a condition I might think he himself meant to give the get in accordance with her desires hence he teaches otherwise if he lent money on a field Arhuna said if he stipulated thus when lending the money it becomes completely as if after he acquires of the field only in proportion to the money owing Arnam and said even if the stipulation was made after lending the money it becomes completely as now Arnam and gave a practical decision at the Reshalif's court in accordance with his ruling Rab Judah however tore up the document embodying his decision said the Reshalif to him Rab Judah has torn up your document he replied did then a child tear it up it was a great man who tore it up he must have seen some reason therein to invalidate it and hence tore it up others say here Arnam and replied a child has torn it up for in civil law everyone is a child compared to me subsequently Arnam and ruled even if the stipulation was made when the money was being handed. Over he the creditor acquires no rights therein at all Rob objected to Arnaman if you do not repay me within three years at the field I as mine it becomes his he replied I used to rule that an Ismakta is binding but Minyamai ruled that it is not but then according to Minyamai is not our mission difficult if you wish I can answer that the mission agrees with our Jose who ruled that an Ismakta is legally valid Talmud, Mas Baba Matiyah be alternatively it means that he said to him let it be. Years from now Marianaka and Markashi saw the sons of Arhista said to Arashi thus did the Nihardian say in Arnaman's name an Ismakta in its time is binding out of its time it is not binding said he to them every agreement not merely an Ismakta is binding only when it matures but not otherwise perhaps you mean thus if he the debtor meets him the creditor within the period of repayment and says to him take possession he acquires it if after the time fixed for repayment and he says to him take possession he does not acquire it why he spoke thus merely through shame yet that is incorrect even if within the period he obtains no legal right and as for his saying take possession he intends thereby that when the time comes he shall not trouble him or papa said in his makta is sometimes legally binding and sometimes not if he the creditor found him the debtor drinking beer at the expiration of the period it is binding if he was endeavoring to procure money it is not binding Araha of Divti said to Robin perhaps he was drinking to drown his anxiety or else someone had assured him of the money but said Robin if he insists on its full value it is offered to the creditor to take the field is certainly valid said Araha of Divti to Robin perhaps that is due to fear lest his land lose its worth but said our papa if he is particular about his land it is offered to the creditor is certainly binding our papa also said although the rabbis ruled that in his makta gives no legal title yet it creates a mortgage from which payment may be exacted said Arhuna the son of Nathan to our Papa did he then say to him let it be yours for the exaction of your debt Marzitra the son of Armari objected before Robina but even if he had said let it be yours for the exaction of your debt has he a legal title after all it is an Ismakta and an Ismakta is not binding but when did our Papa rule that it creates a mortgage if he stipulated you shall receive payment only out of this a man once sold land to his neighbor with security said he the purchaser to him should this be seized from me will you repay me out of your very best he replied I will not repay you out of the very best as I want them for myself but out of other best which I possess subsequently it was seized from him and there came an inundation and swamped the very best land our Papa thought to rule he promised him of the best which is intact said Araha of Divti to him but he the vendor complete. When I promised to repay you from the best, the very best was existent, but now the best has replaced the very best. Rabbi Shabba owed money to our Kahana. If I do not repay you by a certain date, said he to him, You may exact your debt out of this wine. Now our Papa thought to argue, Where do we rule that an Ismakta is not binding only in respect of land which is not for sale, but as for wine, since its purpose is to be sold, it is just the same as money. But Arhuna, the son of Arjashua, said to our Papa, Thus is it stated in Rabbi's name, No, if is binding Arnam and said, Now that the Rabbis have ruled an Ismakta gives no claim, both the land and its produce are returnable. Shall we say that Arnam holds that renunciation in error is invalid? Surely it has been stated, If one sells his neighbor the fruit of a palm tree, Arhuna said, As long as it is not existent, the fruit not having grown yet, he can retract, but when it is already come into existence, he cannot Arnam and said, Even when it has come. Into existence he can retract yet Arnaman said I admit that if he the purchaser snatched and consumed it he the vendor has no claim upon him there it is a sale here it is alone Rabba said Talmud, Mas Baba Matiyah I was sitting before Arnaman and wished to refute him from the law of overreaching but observing my intentions he drew my attention to the case of a barren woman Rabba proceeds to explain now overreaching being as it is the result of renunciation in error we find that it is not illegal renunciation but observing my intention he drew my attention to a barren woman for a barren woman makes renunciation in error and yet it is valid for we learned an objecting woman a consanguineous relation in the
In the previous case that he made no stipulation and here too there was no stipulation or perhaps there it is a sale but here alone you replied the reason there is that no stipulation was made so here too there was no stipulation our poppy said Rabbi gave a practical decision calculated the value of the crops and ordered it to be returned us disagreeing with Rabbi son of Arhun Amar the son of Ar Joseph said in Rabbi's name with reference to a mortgage where it is customary to make the creditor quit whenever the loan is repaid if he took the usufruct to the amount of the loan he must quit it but if in excess thereof the surplus is not returnable nor is one loan balanced against another but when it the mortgage estate belongs to orphans if he the creditor enjoyed its usufruct to the amount of the loan he must quit it if the usufruct exceeded it the surplus is returnable and one loan is balanced against another Ar said now that you rule if the usufruct Exceeded the loan, the balance is not returnable, and even if it merely equaled it, he must not be dismissed without payment. Why? Because to dismiss him without payment is tantamount to making him return what he has already had, whereas it is only indirect interest which is not reclaimable. At law, Arashi gave a practical decision in reference to orphans, minors, Talmud, Mas Babamitzia B Talmud, Mas Babamitzia B, just as though they were adults, Rabba the son of Ar Joseph said in Rabba's name. With reference to a mortgage where it is the usage to make the creditor quit whenever the loan is repaid, one must not enjoy the usufruct without making a fixed annual deduction, but a scholar must not enjoy the usufruct even at a fixed allowance. How else shall he take them by a stipulated time limit? Now, this is well on the view that a stipulated time limit is permitted, but on the view that it is forbidden, what can you say for it has been stated as for a stipulated time limit? Araha and Rabbana differ therein one maintain that it is permitted the other that it is forbidden what is meant by a stipulated time limit if he the creditor said for the first five years the usufruct is mine without deduction thereafter I will make you a full allowance for the crops others maintain any arrangement involving no deduction is forbidden what then is meant by a stipulated time limit if he the creditor said to him for the first five years the usufruct is mine at a fixed deduction thereafter I will make you a full allowance for the crops now he who forbids the first arrangement will permit the second but he who forbids even the second on what condition may he a scholar have the usufruct when it is as the mortgage bonds arranged in surah in which it was written on the expiry of a certain number of years this estate reverts to the debtor without any payment our papa and our the sons of our Joshua said as for a mortgage where it is a practice to make the creditor Quit whenever the loan is repaid, the creditor's creditor cannot exact his debt from it. The firstborn receives no double portion therein, and the seventh year cancels it. The privilege of usufruct, but where the creditor is not obliged to give up possession, whenever the loan is repaid, his creditor can exact his debt from it. The firstborn receives a double portion, and the seventh year does not cancel it. Marzitra also said in our papa's name with reference to mortgage property where it is. The usage to make the creditor quit, he must give up possession absolutely even of the dates on the mattings, but if he has already picked them up and placed them in baskets, they are his. But on the view that the purchaser's utensils affect ownership for him, even in the domain of the vendor, even if they have not been gathered into baskets, they are his. Now it is obvious where the usage is that the creditor must quit, but he stipulated when making the loan, I will not quit it before a certain. Time and surely he has so stipulated and it is binding but what if he promised to quit immediately on repayment where the usage does not compel him to go is it necessary to submit him to a binding act or not our papa said it is unnecessary our she's hate the son of our ed ruled it is necessary and the law is that he must perform a binding act now if he the debtor states I am about to bring you the money he the creditor may not take the usufruct in the meanwhile where he however states I will go make earnest effort to obtain it and bring the money Rabbana ruled he may take the usufruct Marzitra the son of our Mari said he may not and the law is that he may not take the usufruct our Kahana our papa and our Ashi did not take usufruct with deduction Rabbana did Marzitra said what is the reason of him who takes it with deduction because it is analogous to a field of possession with respect to this did not the divine law order even though there may be greater usufruct there from Talmud. Mas Babamitia that it should be redeemed at Forzu so here too it is in no way different but he who holds it forbidden argues thus a field of possession is a matter of sanctification which the divine law based upon a fixed redemption here however it is alone and so it looks like interest Arashi said the elders of the town Mahajah told me that an unconditional mortgage is for a year what is the practical outcome of this fact that if he the creditor has enjoyed the usufruct for a year he can be forced to quit but not otherwise Arashi also said the elders of the town of Mahajah told me what is the meaning of Mashkantag pledge that it abides with him the mortgagee in respect to what has this a practical bearing in respect to the right of preemption Rabbah said the law permits neither the credit interests of our papa nor the bonds of the Mahusans nor the Narshian tenancies the credit interests of our papa means the credit sales arranged by our papa the bonds of it. Mahusans they add the estimated profit to the principal and record it the whole in the bond for who knows that there will be profit Mar the son of Amimar said to Arashi my father does so but when his agents come before him and declare that they have earned no profit he believes them he replied that is well whilst he is alive but what if he dies and the notes are transferred to his ears the supposition was an unwitting order which proceedeth from the ruler and Amimar died. Narshian tenancies for they wrote thus a mortgage his field to be and then he the debtor rented it from him but when did he the creditor acquire it to transfer it to the debtor nowadays however that the note is drawn up thus he the creditor hath acquired it from him hath been in possession such and such a time and then re rented it to him so as not to shut the door in the borrower's faces it is well but still this is no justification Mishnah a man may not commission a tradesman on a half. Profit basis nor advance money for provisions to be sold on half profits unless he pays him a wage as a worker fowls may not be set to brood on half profits nor may calves or foals be assessed thus unless he pays him for his labor and foodstuffs but calves and foals may be accepted without assessing their value at all on half profits and they are bred until if they're grown whilst an ass is bred until it can bear burdens Gemara it has been taught unless he is paid as an unemployed worker. What is meant by as an unemployed worker Talmud, Mas Baba Metzia Biyabe said as a laborer unemployed in his craft now they the first two clauses of the mission are both necessary for if the case of a tradesman were taught I would think that only a storekeeper is it sufficient to pay as an unemployed worker seeing that his efforts are not great but when one is advanced money for buying provisions his toil being great I would think it insufficient to pay him merely as an unemployed. Artisan whilst if the case of advancing money to buy provisions were taught I would think that only there must he be paid as an unemployed worker since much work is involved but for a shopkeeper who makes very little effort I would think a mere trifle sufficient e.g. even if he just dipped his bread into his vinegar or ate a dry fig of his it is enough therefore both are necessary mnemonic how much are goats and fowls assessed our rabbis taught how much must he be paid whether much or little it matters not this is our mayor's view our Judah said even if he merely dipped his bread into his vinegar or joined him in a dry fig that is his pay our Simeon he said he must remunerate him in full our rabbis taught neither goats sheep nor anything which does not toil for its food may be assessed on half profits our Jose son of our Judah said goats may be assessed because they yield milk and sheep because they yield wool by being shorn by passing through water and by being plucked and Fowls because they lay eggs for their food but what of the first tana are the shearings and milk insufficient to pay for his labor and food as for the shearings and milk all agree that they are adequate the conflict refers to way and will refuse the first tana is of our Simeon Biyohi's opinion who maintained that he must remunerate him in full whilst our Jose son of Arjuda agrees with his father who ruled that even if he merely dipped his bread into his vinegar or joined him in a dry fig that is adequate payment our rabbis taught a woman may hire a fowl to her neighbor in return for two fledglings if a woman proposes to her neighbor I have a fowl and you have eggs let us equally share the fledglings Arjuda permits whilst our Simeon forbids it but what of Arjuda does he not require payment to be made for labor and food there are the adult eggs our rabbis taught where it is the usage to make a payment for shouldering beasts such payment may be made in general. Custom must not be abrogated. Our Simeon B. Gamaliel said a calf may be assessed with its mother and a foal with its mother, and even where it is customary to make a monetary payment for shouldering, but our Simeon B. Gamaliel does he
For his labor now is it Rab's opinion that a dinar need not be fixed, but Rab said the calf's head is the breeder. Surely that means that he said to him, Receive the excess above a third as your payment. No, it means that he said to him, Either the excess above a third or the calf's head for the breeder. Alternatively, when did Rab rule that a stipulation, Receive the excess above a third as your payment is permitted when he, the breeder, has a cow of his own, for people say it is the same weather. One mixes fodder for an ox or for oxen. Our Eliezer of Hadrani bought a cow and gave it to his heiress. The latter fattened it and received the head in payment. And also, half the prophet said his heiress's wife to him, Had you been in partnership with him, he would have given you the tail too as your share. So he went and bought a cow in partnership with him. But he, our Eliezer, divided the tail and then said, Come, let us divide the head too. What shall I not receive even as much as before? Exclaimed he. Until now, he, our Eliezer, replied, The money was altogether mine. Had I not given you a little more than half, it would have looked like usury. Now, however, we are partners. What will you plead? I have worked rather more. But people say the average heiress binds himself to the landowner to find him. Pastor, our rabbis taught if one entrusts his neighbor with cattle on evaluation, how long is he bound to attend there? Two Simica said, In the case of asses, 18 months, small cattle, 24 months. Should he wish to divide the profits within this period, his partner can prevent it, but the attention of the first year cannot be compared with that of the second. Why say, but therefore say thus, because the attention necessary in the first year cannot be compared with that of the second. Another very the taught if one entrusts his neighbor with cattle on valuation, how long is he bound to attend to the young? In the case of small cattle, 30 days, large cattle, 50 days, are Jose said in the case of small cattle, 3 months, because they need much attention. How do they need much attention? Because their teeth are very small. Thereafter, he the breeder receives his own half of the young and a half of his neighbors. Half Armina Shia began to took his own half and half of his partner's half. Then he came before Abbe said he to him who divided for you. Moreover, the local usage here is to breed until fully grown, and we learned where it is the usage to breed that the young must be. Fully bred two Kutians entered on a share partnership and one went and divided the money without his partner's knowledge so they came before our Papa said he to him the plaintiff what difference does it make thus did our nominal monies are held to be already divided the following year they bought wine in partnership thereupon the other arose and divided it without his partner's knowledge again they came before our Papa said he to him who divided it for you I see he replied that you are biased in my partner's favor said our Papa Talmud, Mas Baba Metziah B in such a case it is certainly necessary to inform him of the grounds of my verdicts as for coins would he take good coins and leave short weight ones for you but in the case of wine everybody knows that some wine is sweet and some is not the above text states our nominal said monies are held to be already divided but that is only if they are all good or a full weight but not if some are good and others a full weight are. Hamma used to hire out a Zeus for a peshita per day as a result his money evaporated now he argued wherein does it differ from a spade but the analogy is false the self same spade is returned and its depreciation is accessible whereas the self same coins are not returned nor can their depreciation be estimated Rabbah said one may say to his neighbor take these four Zeus and lend money to so and so because the Torah forbade only usury which comes from the borrower to the lender Rabbah also said one may say to his neighbor here are four Zeus and persuade so and so to lend me money why so he merely receives a fee for his talking just as Abamar the son of our Papa used to take balls of wax from wax dealers and then persuade his father to lend them money but the rabbis protested to our Papa your son enjoys usury he replied such interest we may enjoy the Torah forbade only interest that comes from the borrower direct to the lender but here he receives a fee for his talking which is Permitted mission one may assess cows, asses, and all animals which toil for their food on half profit and loss where it is the usage to divide the young immediately on birth they must divide where it is customary to breed them they must be bred. Our Simeon B. Gamaliel said a calf may be assessed with its mother and a foal with its mother and one may offer an increased land rental without fear of usury. Gamara our rabbis taught one may offer an increased land rental without fear of usury e.g. if one rents a field from his neighbor for 10 core annually and proposes give me 200 zoos to expend their on SE in improving the land and I will pay you 12 core annually it is permitted but an increased rental may not be offered for a shop or a ship our nomin said in the name of Rabbi Abu sometimes an increased rental may be offered for a shop e.g. in consideration of a loan for decorations or for a ship to build a sail yard therein for a shop in return for decorations that it may be. Attractive for customers and thus earn more profit and for a ship to build a sail yard therein for the more beautiful its sail yard the greater is the higher as for a ship Rab said both higher and loss is permitted said our Kahana and RC to Rab if higher no loss if loss no higher thereupon Rab was silent being unable to answer our she's hate observed why was Rab silent had he never heard what was taught though it was ruled that one must not accept from an Israelite iron flock investment with absolute immunity for the investor yet such may be accepted from heathens it was nevertheless ruled that if one assesses a cow for his neighbor and says to him your cow is charged to me a 30 denarii and I will pay you a seller per month it is permitted because he did not assess it as money but did he not our she's hate said he did not assess it as money whilst alive but only in case of death our Papa said the law is for a ship both higher and loss is allowed Talmud, Mas Baba Metziah and the practice of ship owners is to receive the hire at the time of Meshika and the payment for loss when it is shipwrecked, but does such a thing depend upon custom that usage arose as a result of the burial which was taught our aim and said in Samuel's name orphans money may be lent out at interest our nomin objected because they are orphans we are to feed them with forbidden food orphans who eat what is not rightfully theirs may follow their testator now tell me said he what actually transpired he replied a cauldron belonging to the children of Marakba who were orphans was in Samuel's care and he waited before hiring it out and waited when receiving it back charging for its hire and for its loss of weight but if a fee for hiring there should be no charge for depreciation and if a charge for depreciation there should be no fee for hiring he replied such a transaction is permitted even to bearded men since he the owner stands the loss of wear and tear for the more the copper is burnt, the greater is its depreciation. Rabbi Shila said in our dog's name, other state Rabbi Joseph Bihama said in our Sheshit's name, money belonging to orphans may be lent on terms that are near to profit and far from loss. Our rabbis taught one who invests money on terms near to profit, but far from loss is a wicked man near to loss, but far from profit is a pious man near to both, or far from both. That is the arrangement of the man in the street. Rabbi asked our Joseph, What is done with orphans' money? He replied, It is entrusted to court and paid out to them in installments, but surely the principal will disappear. He urged, What then would you do? He asked, He replied, We seek out a man who possesses broken pieces of gold, take the gold from him and entrust to him the orphans' money on terms that are near to profit and far from loss, but an object which bears an identification mark cannot be taken as a security lest it was merely entrusted to him and its owner. May come state the mark which proves his ownership and take it away. Our Ashi demurred that as well. If you find a man who possesses broken gold, but if you do not, is the orphan's money to be frittered away? But said our Ashi, we seek out a man whose property is secure, who is trustworthy, obedient to the law of the Bible, and will not suffer a band of the rabbis. And the money is given to him in the presence of a Beth in Talmud, Mas Baba Metziah B. Mishnah. One may not accept from an Israelite an iron flock investment with complete immunity for the investor, because that is usury. But such may be accepted from heathens, and one may borrow from and lend to them on interest. The same applies to a resident alien. An Israelite may lend to Gentiles money on interest with the knowledge of the Gentile, but not of the Israelite. Gemara shall we say that it stands under the ownership of the contractor? But the following is opposed thereto. If one undertakes to breed sheep on iron flock terms for a even the young are exempt from the law of firstlings. Abbe answered, There is no difficulty in the one case, he the owner accepted the risk of unpreventable accident and depreciation, in the other, he did not send Robert to him. If the owner accepts the risk of depreciation and unpreventable accidents, do you designate it iron flock moreover instead of the second clause teaching? But such may be accepted from Gentiles, let a distinction be drawn and taught in that SC the first clause itself. Thus, when does this hold good that iron flock may not be accepted from a Jew only if he the investor does not b
Positive and negative injunction are violated. He further raised an objection one may borrow from and lend money to them on interest, and the same applies to a resident alien. Arhai, the son of Arhuna, said this permission is granted only up to Talmud. Mas Bagumatia, the minimum requirements of a livelihood Rabbin is set here in the mission of the reference is to scholars. For why did the rabbis enact this precautionary measure lest he learn of his ways, but being a scholar he will certainly not learn of his ways? Others referred to statement of Arhuna to the teaching which our Joseph learned. If thou lend money to any of my people that is poor by thee, this teaches if the choice lies between my people and a heathen, my people has preference. The poor or the rich, the poor takes precedence. The poor as see thy relatives and the general poor of thy town, the poor come first, the poor of thy city and the poor of another town, the poor of thy own town have prior rights to Master said if the choice lies between my people and a heathen my people has preference but is it not obvious our nom and answered who not told me it means that even if money is lent to the heathen on interest and to the Israelite without the latter should take precedence it has been taught our Jose said come and see the blindness of usurers if a man calls his neighbor wicked he cherishes a deep-seated animosity against him whilst they bring witnesses a notary pen and ink and record and attest so and so has denied the God of Israel it has been taught our Simeon B. Eliezer said he who has money and lends it without interest of him scripture writes he that putteth not out his money to usury nor taketh reward against the innocent he that doth these things shall never be moved thus you learn that he who does lend on interest his wealth dissolves but do we not see people who do not lend on interest yet their wealth dissolves our Eliezer said the latter sink into poverty but re Ascend whereas the former sink but do not reascend wherefore lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously and holdest thy tongue when the wicked devoureth the man that is more righteous than he or who not said the man that is merely more righteous than he devoureth but the man that is completely righteous he cannot devour it has been taught rabbi said the righteous proselyte who is mentioned in connection with the sale of oneself for a slave and the resident alien who is mentioned with reference to usury I know not their purpose the righteous proselyte who is mentioned in connection with the sale as it is written and if thy brother that dwelleth with thee be waxen poor and be sold unto thee and not only unto thee a Hebrew but even to a proselyte as it is written and sell himself unto a proselyte and not alone to a righteous proselyte but even to a resident alien as it is written to a proselyte and a settler or to a family of the proselyte i.e. to a heathen hence when it is said or to the stock etc. It must refer to one who sells himself to the service of the idol itself. Now the master said, and not only unto thee, but even unto a proselyte, as it is written, and sell himself unto a proselyte. Are we to say that a proselyte may acquire a Hebrew slave? But the following contradicts it: a proselyte cannot be acquired as a Hebrew slave, nor may a woman or a proselyte acquire a Hebrew slave. A proselyte cannot be acquired as a Hebrew slave for the verse, and he shall return unto his own family must be applicable, which it is not in the case of a proselyte, nor may a woman or a proselyte acquire a Hebrew slave. A woman, because it is not seemly a proselyte, because it is a tradition that he who can be acquired can himself acquire, but he who cannot be acquired cannot himself acquire. Our nomin B. Isaac said he cannot acquire him under the provisions of an Israelite owner, but may acquire him as a non-Israelite master, for it has been taught he has see a Hebrew slave. Whose ear is bored and he who is sold to a heathen serve neither the son nor the daughter the master said nor may a woman or a proselyte acquire a Hebrew slave must we assume that this disagrees with our Simeon B. Gamaliel for it has been taught a woman may acquire female but not male slaves our Simeon B. Gamaliel rule she may acquire even male slaves it may agree even with our Simeon B. Gamaliel yet there is no difficulty the former applies to a Hebrew slave the latter to a Canaanite slave a Hebrew slave she deems to be self-respecting whereas a Canaanite slave she deems unreservedly dissolute but what of that which our Joseph learned the widow may not breed dogs nor permit a scholar to live with her as a border now the prohibition of a scholar is intelligible since she deems himself respecting but as for a dog since it will follow her if she commits bestiality she will surely be afraid I will tell you since it follows her even if she merely throws it a piece of meat that will be Assume the cause of its attachment the resident alien who is mentioned with reference to usury what is it for it is written and if thy brother be waxen poor and fallen in decay with thee then thou shalt relieve him yet though he be a proselyte or a settler that he may live with thee take thou no usury of him nor increase but fear thy god that thy brother may live with thee but the following opposes it one may borrow from and lend to them on interest the same applies to a resident alien are Naman B. Isaac replied is it then written take thou no usury of them of him is written meaning of an Israelite or rabbis taught take thou no usury of him or increase but thou mayest become a surety for him Talmud Mas Babamitia be a surety to whom shall we say to an Israelite but we learn the following violate the negative precept the lender the borrower the surety and the witnesses again if it means to a heathen since however it is a law of the heathen to claim direct from the surety it is he the surety who borrows from him. Arshi's hate answered it means that he engaged himself to bring his actions in accordance with Jewish law, but if he engaged to abide by Jewish law, he should not take usury either. Arshi's hate replied he pledged himself for the one but not for the other. An Israelite may lend a heathen's money on interest with the knowledge of the heathen, but not of the Israelite. Our rabbis taught an Israelite may lend a heathen's money on interest with the knowledge of the heathen, but not of the Israelite. E.g., if an Israelite borrowed money from a heathen on interest and was about to repay it when another Israelite met him and proposed, Give it to me and I will pay you as you pay him, that is forbidden. But if he presented him to the heathen, it is permitted. Similarly, if a heathen borrowed money from an Israelite on interest and was about to repay it when another Israelite met him and proposed, Give it to me and I will pay you as you pay him, it is permitted. But if he presented him to the Israelite, it is forbidden. Now the second clause is well for there. The ruling is in the direction of greater stringency. But as for the first clause, since the law of agency does not apply to a heathen, it is he the Israelite who takes interest from him. His fellow Israelite are who not be said in the name of Araha, the son of Araka. Here it is meant that he the heathen said to him, the Israelite put it the money on the ground and you may go if so why stated. But said our Papa, it means e.g. that he the heathen took it from the first creditor and personally gave it to the second. Yet even so why stated, I might think that the heathen himself in acting so transfers the money pursuant to the wish of the Israelite. Therefore it is taught otherwise. Arashi said, when do we maintain that agency cannot be vested in a heathen only in reference to Terima, but in all other biblical matters the principle of agency holds good in the case of a heathen this. Distinction, however, of Arashi must be rejected for why does Terima differ that agency is not allowed to a heathen because it is written thus ye also shall offer an heave offering, etc. Teaching just as ye are members of the covenant, so also must your deputies be members of the covenant, but is not the principle of agency as applied to all biblical matters derived from Terima. Hence Arashi's distinction is to be rejected. Others state Arashi said, in what sense do we maintain that? Agency cannot be vested in a heathen only that they cannot be agents for us, but we can be agents for them. But this distinction of Arashi is to be rejected for why the difference that they cannot be agents for us because it is written, yea, also which teaches the inclusion of your agents just as ye are members of the covenant, so must your agents be members of the covenant, but with reference to ourselves being agents to them does not the same exegesis apply by just as ye who appoint agents. Members of covenant are meant, hence Arashi's distinction is not acceptable. Rabbin is said, though a heathen has no power of agency, yet by rabbinical law one can obtain possession on his behalf, for this is similar to a minor, surely a minor, though excluded from the principle of agency Talmud, Mas Babamitia Talmud, Mas Babamitia is nevertheless by rabbinical law eligible to vicarious possession, so here too there is no difference, but the analogy is false and Israelite minor comes. Eventually within the principle of agency, but a heathen never does our rabbis taught if an Israelite borrowed money on interest from a heathen and then recorded them is the principle and the interest against him as alone and he the creditor became a proselyte if the settlement preceded his conversion he may exact both the principle and the interest if it followed his conversion he may collect the principle but not the interest similarly if a heathen borrowed money on interest from an Israelite and then recorded them the principle and the interest against him as alone and became a proselyte if the settlement
Agrees with Armaier Aryohan and said it may agree even with the rabbis, but it is a precautionary measure lest he exact his debt from sold property as from the earlier date. A man once pledged an orchard to his neighbor for ten years after he, the creditor, had taken its usufruct for three years. He proposed to him the debtor, if you sell it to me, it is well. If not, I will hide the mortgage deed and claim that I have bought it thereupon. He, the debtor, went arose, transferred it to his young son, a minor, and then sold it to him. Now the sale is certainly no sale, but is the purchase dash money accounted as a written debt and collectible from sold mortgage property, or perhaps it is only as a verbal debt which cannot be collected from mortgage property. Said Abbe, is this not covered by RSC's dictum vis Talmud? Mas Babu Mitzi if he, the debtor, admits the genuineness of a bond, he, the creditor, need not confirm it and can collect his debt from mortgage property sold after the. Debt was contracted thereupon Rabbah said to him how compare there it is permissible to write it but here it is not permissible to write it at all now Mirmar sat and recited this discussion whereupon Rabbah said to Mirmar if so when are you had and said it is a precautionary measure lest he exact his debt as from the earlier date let us say that it was not permissible to write it at all said he is there the least analogy there granted that it was not permissible to write it from the earlier date it was permissible to write it from the later date but here it was not permissible to write it at all but surely with respect to that which has been taught as to claims for land improvement e.g. if one took away unlawfully a field from his neighbor and sold it to another who effected improvements therein and then it was seized from him by the first owner when he the buyer exacts his due from the robber he may collect the principal even from mortgage property that has since been sold but the improvements only from the free, i.e., unsold property. Let us say that if the deed of sale was not permissible to be written at all, how now there, whether on the view that he the vendor is anxious not to be called a robber, or on the view that he is desirous of retaining his the purchaser's trust, he seeks to pacify the first owner so as to validate the deed here. However, it was his purpose to save it from his clutches. Shall he then validate the deed? Mission: A man must not fix a price for produce until the market price is known. Once the market is established, a fixed price may be agreed upon. For even if one has no stock, another has. If he was of the first harvesters, he the buyer may enter into a contract for the crops in the stack, the basket of grapes, the vat of olives, potters, lumps of clay, and for lime when it has already been placed in the kiln, one may also make a fixed contract for manure for the whole year. Our Jose maintained no contract for manure may be entered into. Unless he the vendor has the manure in dung pits but the sages permit it and one may also bargain for the lowest price. Our Judah said even if he did not stipulate for the lowest price he may demand supply me at this price or return my money. Gamar RC said in Aryohanan's name one may not fix a contract at market prices. Our Zara questioned RC did Aryohanan rule thus even of a great fair he replied Aryohanan referred only to town markets where values fluctuate now on the original hypothesis. That Aryohanan referred even to a great fair how is our mission conceivable which teaches a man must not fix a price for produce until the market price is known once the market price is established a fixed price may be agreed upon our mission relates to wheat and granaries and ships whose fixed price extends over a long period our rabbis taught one may not contract for commodities until the market price is out once the market price is established a contract may be entered into for even if one. The vendor has no stock and other has if the new supplies were at 4 SEAHS per cell and the old at 3 a contract may not be made until the price has been equalized for the new and old if the gleaned grains were priced at 4 SEAHS and upward per cell whilst ordinary stock at 3 a contract must not be entered into at a fixed maximum price until the same market price has been established for the gleaner and the merchant Arnaman said one may contract for gleanings at the price. A gleaning said Robert to Arnaman why does the gleaner differ because if he lacks stock he will borrow from his fellow gleaner then even a merchant can borrow from a gleaner he replied a merchant deems it undignified to borrow from a gleaner alternatively he who pays money to a merchant expects to receive best quality produce Arshis hate said in Arhuna's name one may not borrow upon the market price thereupon our Joseph Bihama said to Arshis hate others say our Jose B. Abba said to Arshis hate did R. Who not actually ruled us but a problem was propounded of Arhuna the students who borrow in Tishri and repay in Tibet is it permitted or forbidden he replied we may be procured in Hainai and Shili if they wish they can buy in Tishri and repay at first Arhuna held that one must not borrow but on hearing that our Samuel Bihai said in our Eliezer's name that one may he too ruled likewise our rabbis taught if a man was transporting a load from place to place when his neighbor met him and proposed let me have it and I will pay you for it the price you would obtain their Talmud, Mas Baba Mitzia, if the vendor retains the title thereto it is permitted if the vendia is forbidden if he was transporting provisions from place to place when his neighbor met him and proposed let me have them and I will supply you later with provisions that I have there if he actually possesses provisions there it is permitted if not it is forbidden but carrier supply in the dearer place at the Prices of the cheaper without fear of incurring the guilt of usury why our papa said they are satisfied by being informed of the market price our aha the son of RIK said they are satisfied with the extra discount they receive wherein do they differ in respect of a new trader in Surah 4 SEAHS went to the zoos in Kafri 6 so Rab gave money to the carrier accepted himself the risks of carriage and received 5 SEAHS per zoos but why not take 6 for a man of great repute it is. Different RC propounded of Aryohan and may this be done with small where he replied our Ishmael son of Arhose wished to do so with linen garments but was not allowed by Rabbi others say Rabbi wished to do so with small where but our Ishmael son of Arhose did not allow him an orchard Rab forbade it Samuel permitted it Rab forbade it since it is worth more later on it looks like payment for waiting Samuel permitted it since there may be cause for regret it does not look like payment for waiting R. Shimei Bihai said but Rab agrees where the plowing is done with the aid of oxen since great losses caused Samuel said to those who advance seed grain to be returned in new grain busy yourselves in the field that you may have a title to the soil itself for if not it will be accounted as a loan to you and forbidden Rabbi advised those who keep watch over the cornfields go out and find some occupation in the barn that your wages may not be payable until then since wages are not payable until the end of one's task and it is only then that they make you the gift the Rabbis protested to Rabbi you enjoy usury for everyone who leases a farm accepts four core as annual rent and dismisses the tenant in Nissan whilst you wait until year and receive six he retorted it is you who act contrary to the law the land is in bond to the tenant if you make him quit in Nissan before the crops are ripened you cause him much loss whereas I wait until year thus greatly enhancing his profits Talmud. Mas Baba Mitzia B. A certain even gave a house in pledge to Armari B. Rachel and then sold it to Rabba thereupon he Armari waited a full year took the rent and offered it to Rabba said he to him the reason that I have not offered you rent before this is that an unspecified pledge is a year had the even wished to make me quit within a year he would have been unable but now you must take rent for the house he replied had I known that it was pledged to you I should not have bought it now I will treat you according to their laws for until they redeem the pledge they receive no rent so I will take no rent from you until you are paid out Rabba Barnish said to Arashi see sir the rabbis enjoy usury for the advance money for wine in Tishri and receive choice quality in Tibet he replied they too pay their money for wine not vinegar and from the very beginning wine is wine and vinegar vinegar it is then when they pay that they select choice wine Rabba gave money for wine to the Residents of Akrat Zenwitha and they supplied a liberal addition so he went to Arashi and asked him is it permitted yes he replied they but forego their rights in your favor but said he the land is not theirs the land is pledged for the land tax he replied and the king has decreed he who pays the land tax is entitled to the usufruct our papa said to Rabbi see there are some scholars who advance money for people's poll tax and then put them to much service he replied I might have died. Without telling you this thing thus said Arshis hate the surety of these people lies in the king's archives and the king has decreed that he who does not pay his poll tax is made the servant of him who pays it on his behalf Rse or Rabbi's brother used to seize people of disrepute and make them draw Rabbi's letter said Rabbi to him you have done well for it has been taught if you see a man who does not behave in a seemly fashion once do we know that you may make him your servant from it. Verse the S.C.
Rabbah's name, the mark on the one barrels, gives possession in respect of what does it affect the title. Our Habibah said in respect of actual possession, the Rabbah said for the acceptance of the curse and the law is that it gives possession only in respect of submission to the curse. But where it is the usage that this gives actual possession, it does so with full legal recognition. If he was of the first harvesters, Rabbah said, if only two processes are wanting before the crops are ready for delivery, a contract may be made. If three, no contract may be made. Samuel said, if they are to be done by man, even if a hundred are lacking, an agreement may be effected. If by heaven, even when one is lacking, no contract may be made. We learned he may enter into a contract for the crops in the stack, but it still wants spreading out in the sun to dry threshing and winnowing. It means that it had already been spread out and dried in the sun. But on Samuel's view, that it depended on heaven. Even when one process is lacking, no contract may be made. Does it not need winnowing, which is in the power of heaven? It can be done with a fan and for the basket of grapes, but they yet need heating, placing in the press, treading, and being drawn into the pit. As our high learned, a contract may be made in respect of the heated mass of olives. So here too it is for the heated mass of grapes, but three processes are still wanting. It refers to a place where the buyer draws the wine into the pit, and for the bad of olives, but it must yet be heated, placed between the boards of the olive press, pressed, and conducted into the oil pit. As our high taught, the contract may be made in respect of the heated mass of olives. So here too, but three processes are still wanting. It refers to a place where the buyer draws the oil into the pit, and for potters' lumps of clay, but why surely it requires molding, drying, placing in the oven, burning, and taking out. It means when they have been. Molded and dried, but there are still three processes wanting. It refers to a place where the buyer removes the earthenware from the oven and for lime when it has already been placed in the kiln, but it requires to be burnt, removed from the kiln, and crushed. It refers to a place where the purchaser crushes it. But on the view of Samuel, who maintained that if they are to be done by man, even when a hundred processes are wanting, a contract may be made. Why must it have been placed in the kiln? Say thus, when it is ready for placing in the kiln and for potters' lumps of clay, our rabbis taught contracts may not be entered into for potters' lumps of clay until they are kneaded into lumps. This is our mayor's view. Our Jose said this refers only to white earth, but for black earth such as that of Kafar Hanania and its environs, Kafar Sion and its environs, an agreement may be concluded. For even if one merchant has none, another has a mimar paid money for earthenware when he the manufacturer. Had stocked himself with the earth in accordance with whom did he do this if in accordance with our mayor surely our mayor ruled that no contract may be made until they are needed into clay if with our Jose surely he said even if one has none another has in truth it was in accordance with our Jose but in Amimar's locality earth for this purpose was rare hence if he is stocked there with each place's full reliance if not they place no reliance one may also make a fixed contract for manure for the whole year but are not the sages identical with the first Tanarabah said Talmud, Mas Babamitsiabi they differ with respect to winter and one may also bargain for the lowest price a man once paid money in advance for his father in law's dowry i.e. the trousseau comprised therein subsequently the dowry fell in price so they came before our Papa said he to him the purchaser if you have contracted for the lowest price you can take at present prices if not you must accept at the original price. But the rabbis protested to our papa yet if he did not stipulate thus must he accept at previous prices surely it is only money that has passed between them and money gives no title he replied I too spoke only with reference to submission to the curse if he stipulated for the lowest price and the vendor wishes to retract the vendor must submit to the curse if no stipulation has been made and the purchaser wishes to retract the purchaser must submit to the curse Rabbanah said to our papa whence do you know that at our mission under discussion accords even with the rabbis who disagree with our simian and maintain that money does not affect possession and yet even so only if he stipulated for the lowest price does he receive at the present value but if not he must accept it at the previous price perhaps it accords only with our simian who maintain that money affects possession so that if he stipulated for the lowest price he receives it at current values but if not he must accept it at previous prices because his money has affected possession for him whereas in the opinion of the rabbis whether he stipulated or not he can take it at present prices for a man's intention is for the lowest price he replied you must assume that our simian ruled that the purchaser is morally in possession after paying money only if the price remained uniform but did he rule thus when there were two prices for should you not admit this does our simian maintain that the provision of the curse never applies to the purchaser and should you rejoin that indeed is so surely it has been taught at all events such as merely the halachah but the sages said he who punished etc what is meant by at all events surely that it matters not whether the vendor or the purchaser retracts he must submit to the curse hence our simian gave his ruling that the vendee cannot legally cancel the sale only if the price remained uniform but if not there were two prices Araha, the son of Rabbah, said to Rabbah. But does it not follow that there is no curse in the case under discussion since in the first place he the father-in-law had only appointed him the son-in-law as his agent he replied this refers to a merchant who buys and sells mission a man may lend his tenants grain for an equal quantity of grain to be returned for sowing purposes but not for food for Rabban Gamaliel used to lend his farmer tenants grain for grain for sowing and if it was dear and became cheap or cheap and became dear he would accept a return only at the lower price not because the halacha is so but because Rabban Gamaliel desired to submit himself to greater stringency Gemara our rabbis taught a man may lend his tenants grain for grain for sowing that is only if he the tenant has not entered therein but if he has entered therein it is forbidden why does our tenant draw no distinction whether he has entered therein or not whereas the tenant of the very the does Rabba replied already explained the matter. To me in the locality of our tenant the heir has provided the seed and whether he has yet entered therein or not as long as he has not provided the seed he the landlord can make him quit hence when he enters therein and the owner provided the seed it is straightway for a lower return but in the locality of the tenant of the berry the landowner provided the seed hence if he the heiress has not yet entered therein so that he the landlord can make him quit when he does enter it is for a lower return but if he has already entered so that he cannot force him to quit it is forbidden our rabbis taught a man may propose to his neighbor Talmud, Mas Babamitia lend me a core of wheat and stipulate a monetary return if it depreciates he returns wheat if it advances he repays its value as at the time of borrowing but did he not stipulate our she's hate answered it is thus meant if no stipulation is made and it depreciates he takes wheat if it advances he repays its original value. Mishnah a man may not say to his neighbor lend me a core of wheat and I will repay you at harvest time but he may say lend me until my son comes or until I find the key Hillel however forbade even this and thus Hillel used to say a woman must not lend a loaf to her neighbor without first valuing it lest wheat advances and thus they the lender and borrower come to transgress the prohibition of usury Gemara Aruna said if he possesses Sea he may borrow Sea to Seahs he may borrow to Seahs our Isaac said even if he has only Sea he may borrow many cores against it our high taught the following which is in support of our Isaac one may not borrow wine or oil for the same quantity to be returned because he has not a drop of wine or oil surely then if he has he may borrow a large quantity against it Hillel however forbade even this our and said in Samuel's name the Halacha agrees with Hillel's ruling the law is nevertheless not in accordance with him and thus Hillel Used to say a woman must not lend, etc. Rab Judah said in Samuel's name, This is Hillel's view, but the sages maintain one may borrow and repay unconditionally. Rab Judah also said in Samuel's name, The members of a company who are particular with each other transgress the prohibition of measure weight number borrowing and repaying on the festival, and according to Hillel usury too. Rab Judah also said in Samuel's name, Scholars may borrow from each other on interest while fully knowing that usury is forbidden. They merely present gifts to each other. Samuel said to Abu Abi I lend me a hundred peppercorns for a hundred and twenty, and this is well. Rab Judah said in Rab's name, One may lend to his sons and household on interest in order to give them experience thereof. This nevertheless is incorrect because he will come to clean their tuition. A man may say to his neighbor, Help me to weed, and I will help you assist me to hoe, and I will assist you, but he may not suggest to you weed with me. And I will hoe with you, do you hoe with me, and I will weed with you, Talmud. Mas Babamitia be all the days of the dry season are equal, and likewise of the rainy
The usury teaching that even speech is forbidden the following transgress have they said the lender infringes all the borrower thou shalt not cause thy brother to take usury but unto thy brother thou shalt offer no usury and thou shalt not put a stumbling block before the blind the surety and the witness only neither shall ye lay upon him usury it has been taught our Simeon said those who lend on interest lose more than they gain moreover they impute wisdom to Moses our teacher and to his Torah and Say had Moses our teacher known that there is profit in this thing, as see usury he would not have prohibited it when our Dimi came, he said, Whence do we know that if one is his neighbor's creditor for a man and knows that he has not for repayment, he may not even pass in front of him from the verse, Thou shalt not be to him as an usurer, RMI and RC say it is as though he subjected him to a twofold trial, for it is written, Thou hast caused man to ride over our heads, we went through fire. And through water, Rab Judah said in Rab's name, He who has money and lends it without witnesses infringes, and thou shalt not put a stumbling block before the blind, Rush Lakish said, He brings a curse upon himself, as it is written, Let the lying lips be put to silence, which speak grievous things proudly and contemptuously against the righteous. The rabbis observed to our Ashi Rabbin, fulfills all the rabbinical requirements, he or Ashi sent word to him, Rabbin, on the eve of the Sabbath, please let me. Have a loan of ten zoos as I just have the opportunity of buying a small parcel of land. He replied, Bring witnesses and we will draw up a bond even for me too. He sent back you in particular. He retorted, Being immersed in your studies, you may forget and so bring a curse upon me. Our rabbis taught three cry out and are not answered. This he who has money and lends it without witnesses. He who acquires a master for himself and a henpecked husband. He who acquires a master for himself. What does this mean? Some say he who attributes his wealth to a Gentile. Others he who transfers his property to his children in his lifetime. Others he who is badly off in one town and does not go to seek his fortune elsewhere. C-H-A-P-T-E-R-V-I mission. If a man engages artisans and they deceive each other, they can only cherish resentment against each other. If he hires an ass driver or a wagoner to bring litter carriers and pipers for a bride or for the dead or laborers to remove his flax from the water of Steeping or anything which would be irretrievably lost and they the workers break their engagement if it is a place where no others are available at the same wage he may hire workers against them or deceive them if he engages artisans and they retract after doing some work they are at a disadvantage Talmud, Mas Baba Mitzia, if the employer retracts he is at a disadvantage he who alters the contract is at a disadvantage and he who retracts is at a disadvantage Gemara it is not stated. One or the other retracts but they deceive each other implying the artisans deceive each other as the employer instructed him see his employee go and hire me workers whereupon he went and deceived them how so if the employer's instructions were at four zoos per day and he went and engaged them for three what cause have they for resentment they understood and agreed whilst if the employer's instructions were for three and he went and engaged them at four what then were the conditions if he who engaged them said to them I am responsible for your wages he must pay them out of his pocket for it has been taught if one engages an artisan to labor on his work but directs him to his neighbors he must pay him in full and receive from the owner of the work actually done the value whereby he benefited him it is necessary to teach this only if he said to them the employer is responsible for your pay but let us see at what rate workers are engaged it is necessary to teach this. Only when some workmen engage themselves for four zoos and others for three hence they can say to him had you not told us that it is for four zoos we would have taken the trouble to find employment at four alternatively this may refer to a householder hence he can say to him had you not promised me four it would have been beneath my dignity to accept employment or again it may refer after all to normal employees yet they can say to him the foreman since you told us it was for four we took. The trouble of doing the work particularly well but then let us examine the work this refers to a dike but even in a dike its superior workmanship may be distinguished it means that it is filled with water and so not noticeable another possibility is this in truth it means that the employer gave instructions for four and he went and engaged them for three but as to your objection they understood and accepted they can remonstrate with him do you not believe in withhold not good from them. To whom it is due it is obvious if the employer instructed him to engage laborers for three zoos per day and he went and promised them four but they stipulated according to the employer's instructions that their reliance was upon him who engaged them but what if the employer instructed him to engage them at four and he went and promised them three and they said be it as the employer instructed did they rely on his agents were saying to him we believe you that the employer has Instructed you thus, or perhaps they relied upon the words of the employer. Come and hear if a woman said to a man, Bring me my divorce. And he went and stated to her husband, Your wife authorized me to accept the divorce on her behalf, to which he replied, Take it in accordance with her instructions. Our and said in the name of Rabbi Abu in Rab's name, Even when the divorce reaches her hand, she is not divorced. This proves that he, the husband, relies upon his agent's statement. For should you maintain that he relies upon hers, then at least when the divorce reaches her hand, let her be divorced. Said Arashi Talmud, Mas Baba Mitzia, Bihal, now that were well had the reverse been taught us. If a woman said to a man, Accept the divorce on my behalf, and he went and stated to her husband, Your wife instructed me, Bring me my divorce, to which he replied, Take it in accordance with her instructions, and had Arnaman ruled thereon in the name of Rabbi Abu in Rab's name that. Immediately the divorce comes into his agent's hands, she is divorced that would have proved that he the husband relied upon her word again had he ruled that only when the divorce reaches her hand is she divorced that would shew that he relied upon the agent's statement but there where Arnaman did state his ruling it is because the agent himself entirely cancelled his appointment by declaring I am willing to be an agent for acceptance but not for delivery reverting to the Misha. If you prefer I can say this Tana designates retracting to deceiving for it has been taught if one hires laborers and they deceive the employer or the employer deceives them they have nothing but resentment against each other but no legal redress now this holds good only if they have not gone to the scene of their labor but if ass drivers are engaged to convey a load of grain from a certain place and go there and find no grain or laborers hired to plow a field go and find it. Feel the swamp unfit for plowing he must pay them in full yet traveling with a load is not the same as traveling empty handed nor is working the same as sitting idle moreover this holds good only if they have not commenced work but if they have commenced work the portion done is assessed for them e.g. if they contract to harvest a field of standing corn for two sellers and they harvest half and leave half or to weave a garment for two sellers and they weave half and leave half the portion. Done is assessed if it is worth six denarii he must pay them a seller for denarii or they can complete the work and receive two sellers if it is worth a seller he must pay them a seller Ardosa said that which still remains to be done is assessed thus if it is worth six denarii he pays them a shekel two denarii or they can complete their work and receive two sellers if a seller he must pay them a seller now this holds good only if there is no irretrievable loss if the work is postponed until fresh. Laborers are found, but if there is, he can engage workers at their cost or deceive them. How does he deceive them? He says to them, I have promised you a seller come and receive two. To what extent may he engage workers against them, even to forty or fifty zoos? But when is this said? Only if no artisans are available for hiring. But if there are any, the first worker says to him, Go out and engage one of these. He has nothing but resentment against him. A tanner recited before Rab, he must pay them. In full, whereupon he Rab observed, My uncle Arhai said, Were it I, I would have paid them only as unemployed laborers. Yet you say he must pay them in full, but surely it is taught thereon. But traveling with a load is not the same as traveling empty handed, nor is working the same as idling. Now, if the barrier had not been completed before him, Rab others say it had been completed before him, and he Rab observed, Thus my uncle said, Were it I, I would not have paid him at all. Yet you say. He must pay him as an unemployed laborer, but this very opposes it. There is no difficulty. The latter ruling is if he viewed the field the previous evening, the former if he did not, just as Rabba said, if one engaged laborers to cut dikes and rain fell and rendered it the land waterlogged, making work impossible if he inspected it the previous evening, Talmud, Mas Baba Mitzia, the loss is the workers, if not the loss is the employers, and he must pay them as unemployed workers, Rabba also. Said if one engaged laborers for irrigation and there fell rain rendering it unnecessary, the loss is theirs, but if the river overflowed, the loss is the employers, and he must pay them as unemployed laborers, Rabba also said if one
That he the employer can answer them and was on the understanding that I should take particular pains over your food and drink if it is worth a sella he must pay them a sella is this not obvious this is necessary only if labor was cheap originally when he hired them whilst he engaged them for Azuz above the usual cost but subsequently labor appreciated and stood at more than Azuz I might think that they can plead you promised us Azuz above the usual price give us Azuz more than was stipulated since that is now the usual wage we are therefore told that he the employer may answer them when did I promise you an extra Azuz only when you did not agree but now you have agreed Ardosa said that which still remains to be done is assessed thus if it be worth six denarii he pays them a shekel in his opinion the laborer is at a disadvantage or they can complete their work and receive two sellers is this not obvious this is necessary only when labor costs diminished and it Employer retracted whereupon the laborers went and persuaded him I might think he can say to them I re-engaged you on the understanding that you allow a rebate on your wages therefore we are taught that they can answer him it was on the understanding that we perform our work particularly well if a seller he must pay them a seller is this not obvious are who not the son of our Nathan said it is necessary only in a case where the laborers contracted for Azuz below the usual wage in the first place and subsequently labor costs fell I might think that the employer can plead you agreed with me for Azuz less than usual hence I will give you Azuz less so we are taught that they can reply we agreed upon Azuz less only when you would not agree to pay the full price but now you have agreed Rab said the Halajah is as Ardosa but did Rab really rule thus did not Rab say a worker can retract even in the middle of the day and should you answer Ardosa draws a distinction between time. Work and peace work I can rejoin did he really admit a distinction has it not been taught if one engages a laborer and in the middle of the day he the laborer learns that he has suffered a bereavement or is smitten with fever then if he is a time worker Talmud, Mas Baba Metziabi he must pay him his wages if a contract worker he must pay him his contract price now with whom does this agree if with the rabbis why particularly if he learns that he has suffered a bereavement or is smitten with fever and so unfortunately compelled to break the agreement even if he is not compelled surely the rabbis maintain that the laborer has the advantage hence it must agree with Ardosa thus proving that he allows no distinction between time work and contract work said Arnaman B. Isaac here the reference is to a thing of irretrievable loss and therefore it agrees with all we learned he who alters his contract is at a disadvantage and he who retracts is at a disadvantage now it is well too. State he who alters his contract is at a disadvantage as thereby Arjuna's opinion is given as a general view but what is added by he who retracts is at a disadvantage surely its purpose is to extend the law to a time worker and in accordance with Ardosa but Ardosa refers to both cases alike whereas Rab agrees with him in one and disagrees in the other alternatively he who retracts is at a disadvantage is stated for this purpose visit has been taught he who retracts how is that if a sold a field to be for a thousand zoos and be paid a deposit of two hundred zoos if the vendor retracts the purchaser has the advantage if he desires he can demand either return me my money or give me land to the value thereof and from what part of the estate must he satisfy his claim from the best but if the purchaser retracts the vendor has the advantage if he desires he can say to him here is your money alternatively he can say here is land for your money and what part of the field may he Offer him the worst our Simeon B. Gamaliel said they are instructed so to act as to make it impossible for either to withdraw how so he the vendor must draw up a deed stating I so and so have sold such and such a field to so and so for a thousand zoos upon which he has paid me two hundred zoos and now I am his creditor for eight hundred zoos thus he the vendee acquires the title thereto and must repay him the rest even after many years the master said and from what part of the estate must he satisfy his claim from the best now this was assumed to mean from the best part of his estate but let him the buyer be even as an ordinary creditor and we learned the creditor is entitled to medium quality moreover here is the land for which he paid money Arnaman B. Isaac said it means from the best there in S.C. the field bought and the worst there in Araha the son of R.I.K.A. said it may even mean the best part of his estate yet the average person when buying a field for a thousand zoos must Sell off his other property cheaply and hence he is as one who has sustained damage and we learn for damages we assess and collect the best of the offender's estate. Our Simeon B. Gamaliel said they are instructed so to act as to make it impossible for either to withdraw how so he the vendor must draw up a deed stating I so and so have sold such and such a field to so and so for a thousand zoos etc. Hence it is only because he writes thus but if not he the purchaser does not acquire it. But has it not been taught if a man gives a deposit to his neighbor and stipulates if I retract this deposit be forfeited to you and the other stipulates if I retract I will double you your deposit the conditions are effective this is our Jose's view our Jose ruling here in accordance with his general opinion that an Ismacta is valid Arjuna said it is sufficient that he the purchaser shall gain possession of the object sold in proportion to his deposit said our Simeon B. Gamaliel this holds. Good only if he stipulates let my deposit affect possession but if he sells him a field for a thousand zoos of which he pays him five hundred he acquires it all and must repay him the balance even after many years there is no difficulty the former refers to a case where he the vendor repeatedly done the buyer for his money the latter where he did not repeatedly demand his money for Rabba said if one sold an article to his neighbor and repeatedly demanded payment it does not become his the purchasers but if not he the buyer acquires it Rabba also said if one lent a hundred zoos to his neighbor who repaid him a zoos at a time it is valid repayment but he may bear resentment against him for he can complain you have destroyed it for me a man one sold and asked to his neighbor and one zoos of the purchase price being left unpaid he the vendor made repeated calls for it now Arashi sat and cogitated thereon what is the law in such a case does he the purchaser acquire it or not said our Mordecai to Arashi thus did Abami of Hagronia say in Rab's name one zoos is as many zoos and he does not acquire it or Aha the son of our Joseph protested to Arashi but we have stated in Rab's name that he does acquire it he replied you must interpret your teaching as referring to one who sells his field Talmud, Mas Baba Metio, because of its poor quality now if a man wished to sell a small field for a hundred zoos but finding no purchaser for so small a field in spite of much seeking he sold a larger one for two hundred zoos and made repeated calls for his money it is obvious that he the purchaser does not acquire it but what if he wished to sell for a hundred did not find the purchaser though had he taken pains he could have found one but he took no trouble and sold a field for two hundred and now he makes repeated calls for his money is he as one who sells a field because of its poor quality or not this problem remains unsolved if he hires an ass. Driver or a wagoner he may hire laborers against them or deceive them how far may he hire laborers against them Arnaman said up to their wages robber raised an objection to Arnaman even to 40 or 50 zoos he replied that was taught only if the bundle of the workers tools etc had come into his possession mission if one hires an ass to drive it on the mountaintop but drives it on the plane or to drive it on the plane but drives it on the mountain even if both are 10 bills and it perishes he is liable for damages if he hires an ass to drive it on the mountaintop but drives it on the plane if it slips and sustains injuries he is exempt but if it is injuriously affected by the heat he is liable if he hires it to drive on the plane but drives it on the mountain if it slips he is liable if affected by the heat he is not yet if it is on account of the descent he is liable if one hires an ass and it is struck by lightning or seized as a royal levy he the owner can say to him behold here is your hired property before you but if it perishes or is injured he the owner must supply him with a substitute tomorrow why is no distinction drawn in the first clause between the causes of death whilst it is in the second the school of our Jane said in the first clause it means that it died on account of the air and so we say the mountain air killed it or the air of the plane killed it our Jose B. Hanan said it means e.g. that it died through fatigue rabbi said it means that it was bitten by a serpent our high B. Abba said in our Yohanan's name this the first clause agrees with our mayor who ruled whoever disregards the owner's stipulation Talmud Mas Baba Metzia B. Talmud Mas Baba Metzia B. is treated as a robber which ruling of our mayor shoes this opinion shall we say our mayor's view in respect to a dire for we learned if one gives wool to a dire to be dyed red but he dyed it black or to dye it black and he dyed it red our mayor said he must pay him for his will Arjuna said if its increased value
that poor man and has not bought it or so and so promised to buy a cloak for that poor man and has not bought it if so it should state because he may be suspected why state because he disregards the donor's desire this proves that it is essentially because he makes a change and he who disregards the owner's desire is called a robber if one hires an ass and it is struck by lightning we have what is meant by we have here in babylon it is translated new writer said paralysis of the feet a man once said i saw vermin in the royal garments said they to him in which in linen or in wool garments some say he replied in linen garments whereupon he was executed others maintained he replied in wool garments so he was set free or seized as a royal levy he can say to him behold here is your property before you rap said this was taught only in respect of a levy that is returned but if it is a non-returnable levy he the owner must provide him with another ass in its stead Samuel said whether it is a returnable levy or not if it is taken on the root of its journey he the owner can say to him behold here is yours before you but if it is not taken on its root he is bound to supply him with another ass in its stead an objection is raised if one hires an ass and it is struck by lightning or turns rapid he the owner can say to him there is yours before you if it perished or was seized as a levy he must supply him with another ass now on Rab's view it is well. And there is no difficulty there in the mission the reference is to a levy that is returned here in the buried to one that is not but on Samuel's view is there not a difficulty and should you answer on Samuel's view too there is no difficulty there in the mission it means that it was seized on the root of its journey whilst here in the buried that it was not yet surely since the second clause states are Simeon B. Eliezer said if it was taken on the root of its journey he the owner can say to him behold here is yours before you but if not he must supply him with another ass does it not follow that according to the first tanda there is no difference Samuel can answer you is there not our Simeon B. Eliezer who agrees with me then my ruling is based on his alternatively the whole buried is based on our Simeon B. Eliezer but its text is defective and was thus taught if one hires an ass and it is struck by lightning or becomes rabbit he the owner can say unto him behold here is yours before you if it perished or was seized as a levy he must supply him with another ass this holds good only if it was not seized on the root of its journey but if it was he can say to him behold here is yours before you Talmud, Mas Baba Metziah this is the view of our Simeon B. Eliezer for he used to maintain if it was taken on the root of its journey he can say to him here is yours before you if not he is bound to replace it but can you possibly assign it all to our Simeon B. Eliezer surely the first clause states if one hires an ass and it is struck by lightning or turns rapid he the owner can say to him here is yours before you whereas our Simeon B. Eliezer ruled if one hires an ass to ride upon it and it is struck by lightning or turns rapid he the owner must furnish him with another said rabbis son of Arhuna if for riding the case is different our papa said and to carry glassware is the same as for riding rabbis son of Arhuna said in rab's name if one hires and as for riding and it perishes midway he must pay him his hire for half the journey and can only bear resentment against him how so if another can be obtained for hire what causes therefore resentment if not is he then bound to render him his hire in truth it means that another is not obtainable here for hiring yet he is bound to pay for half the journey because he the owner can say to him had you desired to go as far as this where it died would you not have had to pay its hire now what are the circumstances if he simply promised him an ass without specifying which then surely he is bound to replace it whilst if he promised him this ass if its value sc of the carcass is sufficient to buy another let him buy one this ruling holds good only when its value is insufficient to purchase another yet if its value is sufficient for hiring let him hire another rap follows his view expressed elsewhere for rap said the principle must not be destroyed for it has been Stated if a man hires an ass and it perishes midway rap said if its value sc of the carcass is sufficient to buy another he must buy one if only to hire he who engaged it may not hire but Samuel said even if only to hire he may do so wherein do they differ rap maintain the principle may not be destroyed Samuel maintain the principle may be destroyed an objection is raised if the tree withered or was broken down both are forbidden to use it what then shall be done land must be bought therewith and he takes the use of now here immediately on the advent of the jubilee year the land reverts to its first owner and thus the principle is destroyed here the reference is to a sixty years purchase for our Hista said in our Katniss name once do we learn that if one sells his field for sixty years it does not return to the first owner in the year of jubilee from the verse the land shall not be sold in perpetuity showing that it refers to a sale which in the absence of the law of Jubilee would be forever, hence when the law of Jubilee supervenes it is not in perpetuity, thus excluding the sale is for sixty years, which even in the absence of the law of Jubilee is not forever, but after all on the expiration of the sixty years the land returns to its first owner, and thus the debtor's principle is destroyed. But here the reference is to the time when the law of Jubilee is not in force. Reason two supports this, for should you assume that it refers to the time when the law of Jubilee is in force and that we destroy the principle, let him the creditor cut up the wood and take it as for that it is no difficulty the period of mortgage might expire before the Jubilee, or he the debtor might obtain money and redeem it four or five years before the Jubilee. Our rabbis taught if one hires a ship and it sinks in mid-journey, our Nathan said if he has paid the hire he cannot take it back, but if not he need not pay it now, how so shall we say that? The agreement was for this particular ship and an unspecified cargo of wine as freight and even if he has already paid why cannot he claim it back let him say provide me with that ship and I will bring the wine but if it refers to an unspecified ship and a particular cargo of wine even if he has not yet paid why must he not pay now Talmud, Mas Baba Metziah be let him the ship owner say bring me that wine and I will provide a ship said our papa it is possible only in the case of this ship and this wine but in the case of an unspecified ship and unspecified wine they must divide our rabbis taught if one hires a ship and unloads it in midroot he must pay him for half the journey and he the owner has nothing but resentment against him what are the circumstances shall we say that he can find someone to whom to hire it why bear resentment whilst if he can find no one to whom to hire it he must surely pay him the whole hiring fee in truth it means that he can find someone to whom to hire it and the reason that he has cause for resentment is because of the trampling of the ship if so it is a just complaint and he is entitled to financial compensation but what is meant by he unloaded it is that he unloaded more of his cargo within it than what ground has he for complaint because his intentions were thwarted or on account of the additional cordage necessary our rabbis taught if one hires an ass for riding the hire may put upon it his clothing water bottle and provisions for that journey beyond that the ass driver can prevent him the ass owner can place upon it the fodder straw and provisions for one day but beyond that the hire can prevent him how is it meant if food can be purchased let the ass driver to prevent him whilst if provisions are not obtainable on the road the hire of two should not be able to prevent him our papa answered this arises when it is indeed possible to procure it after some trouble from stage to stage now for the ass Driver, it is a normal matter to take trouble and purchase his stores at various places, but not for the hire. Our rabbis taught if one hires an ass for a man to ride upon it, it may not be ridden by a woman. If for a woman, it may be ridden by a man, and a woman includes both large and small. And even if pregnant or one giving suck, seeing that you permit a woman giving suck, is it necessary to state a pregnant woman? Our papa said it means even a pregnant woman who is at the same time feeding. Another infant abbe said this proves that the weight of a fish depends on the size of its belly. What does this matter in respect of buying and selling Talmud? Mas Baba Metzia Mishnah. If a man hires a cow for plowing on the mountain and plows therewith on the plain, if the colder broke, he is not liable for plowing on the plain, but plows on the mountain. If the colder broke, he is liable if he hires it to thresh poles, but thre she's grain, he is not liable, but if to thresh poles and he thre she's grain he is liable because pulse is slippery tomorrow but if he did not change the conditions of the contract who must pay our papa said he who handles the share our shisha the son of our ed said he who handles the colder and the law is that he who handles the colder must pay but if the place was known to abound in stony clods both are responsible our yohan and said if one sold a cow to his neighbor and informed him this cow is a butter a biter a habitual kicker and prone to break down under a load and it possessed one of these defects which he inserted amongst the other blemishes of which it was free it is a sale in error but if the vendor said it has this defect which it actually had and another two not specifying which it is not a sale in error it has been taught likewise
Strain as weight Rabba said we learned is strain when added to weight thus Abe said we learned is as great as strain as weight bulk is equal to weight therefore if he added three caps the bulk being equal he is liable Rabba said we learned is strain when added to weight i.e. the weight being equal the greater bulk is an additional strain we learned to bring a leaf each of wheat and he brings a leaf each of barley he is exempt but if he increases the weight he is liable surely that means by three caps no it means by SEO but thereon it is stated by how much must he increase it in order to be liable Simica said on our Mayor's authority ASEO in the case of a camel and three KABS in the case of an acid is thus meant but if he did not alter the terms of hiring i.e. he engaged to bring wheat and brought wheat barley and brought barley by how much must he increase it SC the wheat in order to be liable Simica said on our Mayor's authority by ASEO in the case of a camel and 3 KABS in the case of an ass come and here it has been taught if he hired an ass to bring a leaf each of wheat and he brought Talmud, Mas Baba Mitzia B16 SEAHS of barley he is liable this implies if he merely added 3 caps he is exempt Abbe interpreted it as referring to leveled measures of corn our rabbis taught a cab is a culpable overload for a porter and arba before a canoe a core for a ship and 3 cores for a large liver and the master said a cab is a culpable overload for a porter but if it is too heavy for him is he not an intelligent being let him throw it down said Abbe it means that if the weight struck him down immediately Rabbi said you may even say that it did not strike him down immediately but this is taught only with regard to extra pay or as he said he might have thought that he had been seized with weakness a core for a ship and 3 cores for a large liver and our papa said from this it follows that the average ship takes a load of 3. Of course, what practical difference does it make in respect of buying and selling mission? All artisans are regarded as paid billies, but if they declare take your property and then bring U.S. money, they rank as unpaid billies. If a man said to another, keep this article for me and I will keep another for you, he ranks as a paid billy. If he requested, keep this for me and he replied, put it down before me, he is an unpaid billy. If a man lends another on a pledge, he ranks as a paid trustee. Our Judah said if he lends him money on a pledge, he is an unpaid trustee. If provisions, he is a paid billy. Abbasal said one may hire out a pledge taken from a poor man, fixing a hiring fee and progressively diminishing the debt because it is like returning a lost article. Tomorrow must we say that our mission does not accord with our mayor for it has been taught one who hires e.g. an animal. How does he pay if it comes to harm? Our mayor said as an unpaid trustee, our Judah said as a paid trustee, you may assume. It to agree even with our mayor in return for that benefit that he the employer forsakes everyone else and engages him he becomes a paid billy in respect thereof if so the same applies to a hire in return for that benefit and that he forsakes everyone else and hires it to him he becomes a paid trustee in respect thereof but say thus you may assume it to agree even with our mayor in return for that benefit that he pays him somewhat more than his due he becomes a paid billy in respect thereof if so the same applies to a hire may one not be referring to a case where he gives him slightly better value but say thus you may assume it to agree even with our mayor in return for that benefit that he holds it against his remuneration and is not forced to go seeking for money he ranks as a paid billy in respect thereof alternatively it is as Rabbi Abba reversed the barrier and learned how does a hire pay our mayor said as a paid billy our Judah said as an unpaid billy but if they declare take your property and then bring U.S. money they rank as unpaid billies we learned elsewhere if the borrower instructed him S.C. the lender to send the animal and he sent it and it died on the road before reaching him he is liable for it the same holds good when he returns it Raf Ram B. Papa said in Arhista's name this was stated only if he returned it within the period for which he borrowed it but if after he is not liable Arnam and B. Papa raised an objection but if they declare take your property and then bring U.S. money they rank as unpaid billies Talmud, Mas Baba Mitzia surely this implies if they inform him I have completed it they rank as paid billies no deduce us but if they say bring money and then take your property they are paid billies but what if they declare I have completed it do they rank as unpaid billies if so instead of teaching but if they declare take your property and then bring U.S. money they rank as unpaid billies let it teach the case. Of I have completed it from which take your property follows a fortiori it is particularly necessary to state the case of take your property for I might think that he is not even an unpaid billy hence we are told that he is other say Arnam and B. Papa said we too have learned likewise but if they declare take your property and then bring us money they rank as unpaid billy surely the same holds good if he says I have completed it no the case of take your property is different to Namar the son of Miramar sitting before Rubina opposed two Mishnahs to each other and reconciled them we learned but if they declare take your property and then bring us money they rank as unpaid billies and presumably the same holds good if he informs him I have finished it but the following contradicts it if the borrower instructs him as see the lender to send the animal and he does so and it dies on the road before reaching him he is responsible for it the same holds good when he returns it and he reconciled them by the dictum of Raf Ram B. Papa in Arhista's name. This was stated only if he returned it within the period of the loan. But if after he is not liable, the scholars propounded, does it mean he is not liable as a borrower yet liable as a paid billy? Or perhaps he is not even a paid billy? Said Amimar logically, it means that he is exempt from the liabilities of the borrower but is responsible as a paid billy. For since he has benefited, he must give benefit in return. It has been taught in accordance with Amimar. If one takes goods from a tradesman on approval to send them as a gift to his father in law and stipulates, if they are accepted, I will pay you their value. But if not, I will pay you its goodwill benefit. If they are accidentally damaged on the outward journey, he is liable but exempt if on the return journey because he is regarded as a paid billy. A man once sold and asked to his neighbor, said the latter, I will take it to that place if it is sold, it is well if. Not I will return it to you. He went, but it was not sold, and on his way back it was accidentally injured on his going before Arnaman. He held him liable thereupon. Robber raised an objection to Arnaman. If they are damaged on the outward journey, he is liable, but exempt if on the return journey because he is regarded as a paid billy. He answered, The return journey of this person is an outward journey. Why so it is common sense for if he found a purchaser on his return, would he not sell it? Keep this article for me, and I will keep another for you. He ranks as a paid billy, but why so is it not a trusteeship wherein the owner is pledged to the service of the billy? Our papa said it means that he proposed to him, keep this article for me today, and I will keep another for you tomorrow. Our rabbis taught if he proposes to be keep this article for me, and I will keep an article for you, lend me, and I will lend you keep this article for me, and I will lend you another lend me and I will keep an article for you in all these cases they rank as paid trustees but why so is it not a trusteeship wherein the owner is pledged to the service of the billy said our papa it means that he proposed to him keep this article for me today and I will keep an article for you tomorrow there was a company of perfume sellers of whom each day a different one baked for all one day they said to one of them go and bake for us then guard my robe he rejoined before his return it was stolen through their negligence so they went before our papa who held them responsible said the rabbis to our papa but why is it not a trusteeship wherein the owner is pledged to the service of the billy thereupon he was ashamed subsequently it was discovered that just then he the owner had been drinking beer now on the view that he has see the billy is not liable for negligence when the owner is pledged to the service of the billy it is well on that account he was ashamed but on the view that he is why was he ashamed but it happened thus that day was not his for baking yet they requested him go bake for us to which he rejoined in return for my baking for you guard my robe Talmud, Mas Baba Mitzia B before he returned it was stolen and they went before our papa who held them responsible the rabbis protested to our papa why so is it not a trusteeship wherein the owners are pledged to the service of the billy so he was ashamed but subsequently it was discovered that just then he had been drinking beer two men were traveling together on a road one of whom was tall and the other short the tall one was riding an ass and had a linen sheet whilst the short one was wearing a woolen cloak and walked on foot on coming to a river he took his cloak placed it upon the ass and took the other man's linen and covered himself there with then the water swept the sheet away so they came before Rabba who ruled him the short man liable but the rabbis protested to Rabba why so is it not a case of borrowing wherein the owner is pledged to service so he was ashamed subsequently it was learned that he had taken it
He brought them in with the owner's permission. The courtyard owner is liable. Rabbi said in all these cases he is not liable unless he explicitly undertook to guard. But how does this follow? Perhaps the rabbi's rule that he becomes a billy only there in the case of a courtyard which is a guarded place so that when he the owner said to him bring it in he meant bring it in and I will take care of it for you. But here in a marketplace which is unguarded he may have meant put it down take a seat and guard it. Contrary wise perhaps rabbi rules that he does not become a billy only there in the case of a private courtyard to enter where permission is necessary so that when he gave him permission to enter he meant come and sit down and guard it. But here he must have meant put it down and I will guard it for should you think he meant put it down take a seat and guard it. Does he require his permission to put it down if a man lends another on a pledge he ranks as a paid trustee? Shall we say that our mission does not agree with our Eliezer for it has been taught if one lends his neighbor money against the pledge and the pledge is lost he must swear that it was not due to his negligence and then be repaid this is our Eliezer's opinion our Akiva ruled he the debtor can say to him did you lend me against aught but the pledge the pledge being lost your money too is lost but if he lends him a thousand sous against a note and the pledge is deposited for it all agree that if the pledge is lost the money is lost you may say that it agrees even with our Eliezer yet there is no difficulty in the latter case he took the pledge when the loan was made in the former he did not take the pledge at the time of the loan but in both cases Talmud, Mas Baba Metzia, if a man lends another on the pledge is taught but say thus there is no difficulty in the latter case he lent him money in the former SC our mission of provisions but since the following clause states our Judah said if he lends him money on a pledge. He is an unpaid trustee. If provisions, he is a paid billy that proves that the first ten admits no distinction. The whole mission is according to our Judah, but it is defective and should read thus: If a man lends another on a pledge, he ranks as a paid trustee. This holds good only if he lends him provisions. But if money, he is an unpaid trustee. For our Judah said, if he lends him money on a pledge, he is an unpaid trustee. If provisions, he is a paid billy. But if so, does not the mission disagree with our Akiva? Hence, it is perfectly clear that our mission does not agree with our Eliezer. Shall we say that the dispute arises when the pledge is not worth the money lent, and that they differ in regard to Samuel's dictum? For Samuel said, if a man lends his neighbor a thousand sous and the latter deposits the handle of a saw against it, if the saw handle is lost, the thousand sous is lost. No, when the pledge is worth less than the loan, all reject Samuel's ruling. But here the dispute arises only if it is worth the loan and they differ with respect to our Isaac's dictum for our Isaac said once do we know that the creditor acquires a title to the pledge from the verse in any case thou shalt deliver him the pledge again when the sun goeth down and it shall be righteousness unto thee if he has no title thereto once is his righteousness hence it follows that the creditor acquires a title to the pledge but is this reasonable verily our Isaac's dictum refers to a pledge not taken when the loan was made but did he say it with reference to a pledge taken at the time of the loan hence where the pledge was not taken when the loan was made all agree with our Isaac but here the reference is to a pledge taken at the time of the loan and they differ as to the guardian of lost property for it has been stated he who is in charge of lost property Rabbi said he ranks as an unpaid billy our Joseph maintained as a paid billy shall we say that our Joseph's view is Disputed by Tanaim, no with respect to one who guards lost property, all agree with our Joseph, but here Talmud, Mas Baba Metzia B, they differ where the creditor needs a pledge. One master SCR Akiva maintaining that he fulfills a religious precept in making a loan and therefore ranks as a paid billy, whereas the other master SCR Eliezer holds that he fulfills no religious precept thereby since he desires his own benefit, therefore he is an unpaid billy. Abbasal said one may hire out the pledge of a poor man fixing a price and progressively diminishing the debt. Arhanan BM I said in Samuel's name the Halachah is as Abbasal, but even Abbasal ruled thus only in respect of a home attic and act since their hiring fee is large whilst their depreciation is small. Mishnah if a man of billy moved the barrel from one place to another and broke it, whether he is a paid or an unpaid billy, he must swear. Our Eliezer said, I too have learned that both must swear, yet I am astonished that. Both can swear tomorrow our rabbis taught if a man moved the barrel for his neighbor from one place to another and in doing so broke it whether a paid or an unpaid billy he must swear this is our mayor's view our Judah ruled an unpaid billy must swear whereas a paid trustee is responsible our Eliezer said I too have learned that both must swear yet I am astonished that both can swear shall we say that in our mayor's opinion one who stumbles and thereby does damage is not regarded as culpably negligent but it has been taught if his pitcher was broken and he did not remove it or if his camel fell down and he did not raise it up our mayor holds him liable for any damage they may cause whilst the sages rule he is exempt by laws of man but liable by the laws of heaven and it is an established fact that they differ on the question whether stumbling amounts to negligence said our Eliezer separate than the two buried are not both by the same teacher and our Judah comes to teach that an Unpaid Billy must swear whilst the paid Billy must make it. SC the damage good each in accordance with his own peculiar law whereupon our Eliezer observes verily I have a tradition in accordance with our mayor nevertheless I am astonished that both should swear as for an unpaid Billy it is well he swears that he was guilty of no negligence but why should a paid Billy swear even if not negligent he is still bound to pay and even with respect to an unpaid Billy the ruling is correct only if the accident happened on sloping ground but if not on sloping ground can he possibly swear that he was not negligent Talmud, Mas Baba Metzia, and even on sloping ground it is reasonable that the Billy swears where no evidence is possible but where evidence is possible let him deduce evidence and only then be free from liability for it has been taught as he be Judah said if a man deliver unto his neighbor and ask to keep and it die or be hurt or driven away no man seeing it then. Shall an oath of the Lord be between them both hence it follows if there be a spectator he must bring evidence and then be free but our high B Abba said in our Yohanan's name this oath is a rabbinical institution for should you not rule thus no man would move a barrel for his neighbor from one place to another what does he swear Rabbi said I swear that I broke it unintentionally and our Judah comes to teach that an unpaid billy must swear whilst a paid billy must make it good each in accordance with his own peculiar law whereupon our Eliezer observes verily I have a tradition in accordance with our mayor nevertheless I am astonished that both should swear as for an unpaid billy it is well he swears that he was guilty of no negligence but why should a paid billy swear even if not negligent he is still bound to pay and even with respect to an unpaid billy at SC the ruling is correct if the accident happened on sloping ground but if not on sloping ground can he possibly swear that he was not negligent and even on sloping ground it is reasonable that the billy swears where no evidence is possible but where it is let him deduce evidence and only then be free from liability for it has been taught as he be Judah said if a man deliver unto his neighbor and ask to keep and it die or be hurt or driven away no man seeing it then shall an oath of the Lord be between them both hence it follows if there be a spectator he must bring evidence and then be free a man was once moving a barrel of wine in the manner of Mahusa and broke it on a projection of Mahusa so he came before Rabbi said he to him the manner of Mahusa is a frequented place go and bring evidence then you are free from liability thereupon our Joseph his son said to him in accordance with whom is your verdict with his he yes said he in accordance with his he and we agree with him a man instructed his neighbor go and buy me four hundred barrels of wine so he went and bought them for him subsequently However he came before him and said I bought you the four hundred barrels of wine but they turned sour so he came before Rabba when four hundred barrels of wine turned sour said he to him the facts should be widely known go and bring proof that originally when bought the wine was sound and will you be free from liability our Joseph his son observed to him in accordance with whom is your verdict with his he yes said he in accordance with his he and we agree with him our high B Joseph instituted a measure in Sakharov is those who carry burdens on a yoke and they break must pay half why because if the burden is too much for one yet too little for two therefore it lies midway between accident and negligence those who carry on a pole must pay all some porters negligently broke a barrel of wine belonging to Rabba son of Arhuna thereupon he seized their garments so they went and complained to Rabba returned them their garments he ordered is that the law he inquired even so he rejoined that Thou mayest walk in the way of good men their
Higher remuneration is only for better work but not longer hours. Resh Lakish said Talmud, Mas Baba Metzi a laborer's entry to town is in his own time and his going forth to the fields is in his employers as it is written the sun or as if they see the animals gather themselves together and lay them down in their dens. Man goeth forth unto his work and to his labor until the evening but let us see what is the usage this refers to a new town and let us see whence they come it. Refers to a conglomeration alternatively it means that he said to them you are engaged to me as laborers whose conditions of work are set forth in the Bible are zero lectured others say our Joseph learned what is meant by thou makest darkness and it is night wherein all the beasts of the forest do creep forth thou makest darkness and it is night this refers to this world which is comparable to night wherein all the beasts of the forest do creep forth to the wicked therein who are like the beasts of the forest the sun is for the righteous the wicked are gathered in for Gehenna and lay them down in their habitations not a single righteous man lacks a habitation as befits his honor man goeth forth unto his work i.e. the righteous go forth to receive their reward and to his labor until the evening as one who has worked fully until the very evening our Eliezer son of our Simeon once met an officer of the Roman government who had been sent to arrest thieves how can you detect? Them he said, Are they not compared to wild beasts of whom it is written therein in the darkness? All the beasts of the forest creep forth. Others say he referred to him to the verse he and wait secretly as a lion in his den. Maybe he continued, You take the innocent and allow the guilty to escape. The officer answered, What shall I do? It is the king's command, said the rabbi, Let me tell you what to do. Go into a tavern at the fourth hour of the day. If you see a man dozing with a cup of wine in his hand, ask what he is. If he is a learned man, you may assume that he has risen early to pursue his studies. If he is a day laborer, he must have been up early to do his work. If his work is of the kind that is done at night, he might have been rolling thin metal. If he is none of these, he is a thief. Arrest him. The report of this conversation was brought to the court, and the order was given. Let the reader of the letter become the messenger. Our Eliezer, son of our Simeon, was accordingly sent for end. He proceeded to arrest the thieves thereupon our Joshua son of Karha sent word to him vinegar son of wine how long will you deliver up the people of our God for slaughter back came the reply I weed out thorns from the vineyard whereupon our Joshua retorted let the owner of the vineyard himself God come and weed out the thorns one day a fuller met him and dubbed him vinegar son of wine said the rabbi to himself since he is so insolent he is certainly a culprit so he gave the order to his attendant arrest him arrest him when his anger cooled he went after him in order to secure his release but did not succeed thereupon he applied to him the fuller the verse who so keepeth his mouth and his tongue keepeth his soul from troubles and they hanged him and he our Eliezer son of Arsimian stood under the gallows and what said they his disciples to him master do not grieve for he and his son seduced the betrothed maiden on the day of atonement on hearing this he laid his hand upon his heart and exclaimed, Rejoice my heart, if matters on which thou hast see the heart art doubtful are thus how much more so those on which thou art certain I am well assured that neither worms nor decay will have power over thee. Yet in spite of this his conscience disquieted him thereupon he was given a sleeping draft taken into a marble chamber and had his abdomen opened and baskets full of fat removed from him and placed in the sun during Tammuz and of and yet it did not putrefy but no fat. Putrefies true no fat putrefies nevertheless if it contains red streaks it does but here though it contained red streaks it did not thereupon he applied to himself the verse my flesh too shall dwell in safety a similar thing befell our Ishmael son of our Jose Talmud. Mas Baba Metzia, one day Elijah met him and remonstrated with him how long will you deliver the people of our God to execution what can I do he replied it is the royal decree your father fled to Asia he retorted do you flee to? Laodicea when our Ishmael son of our Jose and our Eliezer son of our Simeon met one could pass through with a yoke of oxen under them and not touch them said a certain Roman matron to them your children are not yours they replied theirs se our wives is greater than ours but this proves my allegation all the more she observed some say they answered thus for as a man is so is his strength others say they answered her thus love suppresses the flesh but why should they have answered her at all is it not written answer not a fool according to his folly to permit no stigma upon their children our Yohanan said the waste of our Ishmael son of our Jose was as a bottle of nine calves capacity our Papa said our Yohanan's waste was as a bottle containing five calves others say three calves that of our Papa himself was as large as the wicker work baskets of Harpania our Yohanan said I am the only one remaining of Jerusalem's men of outstanding beauty he who desires to see our Yohanan's beauty let him take a silver Goblet as it emerges from the crucible, fill it with the seeds of red pomegranate, encircle its brim with a chaplet of red roses, and set it between the sun and the shade. Its lustrous glow is akin to our Yohanan's beauty, but that is not so. For did not a master say, Our Kahana's beauty is a reflection of our Abbas, our Abbas is a reflection of our father Jacob's, our father Jacob's was a reflection of Adam's, whereas our Yohanan is omitted, our Yohanan is different because he lacked the beard our Yohanan used to. Go and sit at the gates of the Mikwe when the daughters of Israel ascend from the bath, said he, Let them look upon me that they may bear sons as beautiful and as learned as I said the rabbis to him, Do you not fear an evil eye? I am of the seed of Joseph, he replied, Against whom an evil eye is powerless, for it is written, Joseph is a fruitful bow, even a fruitful bow by well, whereon our Abba observed, render not by well, but above the power of the eye, our Jose, son of our Hanan, deduced it from. The following and let them multiply abundantly like fish in the midst of the earth, just as fish in the seas are covered by water, and the eye has no power over them, so also are the seed of Joseph. The eye has no power over them. One day our Yohanan was bathing in the Jordan when Reshlakish saw him and left into the Jordan after him, said he, Our Yohanan to him, Your strength should be for the Torah, your beauty, he replied, should be for women. If you will repent, said he, I will give you my sister in. Marriage who was more beautiful than I, he undertook to repent, and he wished to return and collect his weapons, but could not subsequently our Yohanan taught him Bible and mission and made him into a great man. Now one day there was a dispute in the schoolhouse with respect to the following visit, sword, knife, dagger, spear, hand, saw, and aside at what stage of their manufacture can they become unclean when their manufacture is finished, and when is their manufacture finished, our Yohanan ruled. When they are tempered in a furnace, Resh Lakish maintained when they have been furbished in water, said he to him, A robber understands his trade, said he to him, And wherewith have you benefited me there as a robber? I was called master, and here I am called master by bringing you under the wings of the Shechinah. He retorted, Our Yohanan therefore felt himself deeply hurt as a result of which Resh Lakish fell ill. His sister, S.C. Our Yohanan's the wife of Resh Lakish came and wept before him, Forgive him for the sake of my son, she pleaded. He replied, Leave thy fatherless children, I will preserve them alive for the sake of my widowhood, and, and let thy widows trust in me. He assured her, Resh Lakish died, and Our Yohanan was plunged into deep grief, said the rabbis, Who shall go to ease his mind? Let our Eliezer be Pedafko, whose dispositions are very subtle. So he went and sat before him, and on every dictum uttered by Our Yohanan, he observed, There is a which supports you, or you as the son of. Lakisha he complained when I stated the law the son of Lakisha used to raise 24 objections to which I gave 24 answers which consequently led to a fuller comprehension of the law whilst you say a very has been taught which supports you do I not know myself that my dicta are right thus he went on rending his garments and weeping where are you O son of Lakisha where are you O son of Lakisha and he cried thus until his mind was turned there upon the rabbis prayed for him and he died Talmud, Mas Baba Metzia be reverting to the story of our Eliezer son of Arsimian yet even so our Eliezer son of Arsimian's fears were not allayed and so he undertook a penance every evening they spread 60 sheets for him and every morning 60 basins of blood and discharge were removed from under him in the mornings his wife prepared him 60 kinds of pap which he ate and then recovered yet his wife did not permit him to go to the schoolhouse lest the rabbis discomfort him every evening. He would exhort them come my brethren and familiars whilst every morning he exclaimed depart because he had disturbed my studies one day his wife hearing him cried out you yourself bring them upon you you have already squandered the money of my father's house so she left him and returned to her paternal home and there came sixty seamen who presented him with sixty slaves bearing
insulted and did not protest as I should have done whenever two people came before him in a lawsuit they stood near the door each stated his case and then a voice issued from that upper chamber proclaiming so and so you are liable so and so you are free now one day his wife was quarreling with a neighbor when the latter reviled her saying let her be like her husband who was not worthy of burial said the rabbis when things have gone thus far it is certainly not me others say are Simeon B. Yohei appeared to them in a dream and complained I have a pigeon amongst you which you refused to bring to me then the rabbis went to attend to him for burial but the townspeople of Akabaria did not let them because during all the years our Eliezer son of our Simeon slept in his upper chamber no evil beast came to their town but one day it was the eve of the day of atonement when they were busily occupied the rabbis sent word to the townspeople of Berry and they brought up his beer and carried it to his father's vault which they found encircled by a serpent said they do it O snake O snake open thy mouth and let the son enter to his father thereupon it opened its mouth for them then rabbi sent messengers to propose marriage to his wife she sent back shallow utensil in which holy food has been used be used for profane purposes there sc in palestine the proverb runs where the master hung up his weapons there the shepherd hung up his wallet he sent back word granted that he outstripped me in learning was he also my superior in good deeds she returned yet at least he outstripped you in learning though i did not know it but i do know that he exceeded you in virtuous practice since he submitted himself to mortification in learning to what is the reference when rabbi simeon be gamaliel and our joshua be sat on benches our Eliezer son of our simeon and rabbi sat in front of them on the ground raising objections and answering them said they we drink their water i.e. benefit from their learning yet they sit upon the ground let seats be placed for them thus were they promoted but our Simeon Gamaliel protested i have a pigeon amongst you and ye wish to destroy it so rabbi was put down there upon our joshua b karha said shall he who has a father live whilst he who has no father die so our Eliezer son of our Simeon too was put down whereat he felt hurt saying ye have made him equal to me now until that day whenever rabbi made a statement our Eliezer son of our Simeon supported him but from then onward when rabbi said i have an objection our Eliezer son of our Simeon retorted if you have such and such an objection this is your answer now have you encompassed us with loads of answers in which there is no substance rabbi being thus humiliated went and complained to his father let it not grieve you he answered for he is a lion and the son of a lion whereas you are a lion the son of a fox to this rabbi alluded when he said three were humbled is my father Talmud. Mas Bagumatia the Baini Bithira and Jonathan the son of Saul are Simeon be Gamaliel as has been said the Baini Bithira as a master said they placed him at the head and appointed him Nasi over them Jonathan the son of Saul for he said to David and thou shalt be king over Israel and I shall be next unto thee but how does this prove it perhaps Jonathan the son of Saul spoke thus because he saw that the people were flocking to David the Baini Bithira too because they saw that Hillel was there superior in learning but our Simeon be Gamaliel was certainly very modest rabbi observed suffering is precious thereupon he undertook to suffer likewise for thirteen years six through stones in the kidneys and seven through scurvy others reverse it rabbi's house steward was wealthier than kingship or when he placed fodder for the beasts their cries could be heard for three miles and he aimed at casting it before them just then when rabbi entered his privy closet yet even so his voice lifted in pain was louder than theirs and was heard even by seafarers. Nevertheless, the sufferings of our Eliezer son of our Simeon were superior in virtue to those of Rabbi. For whereas those of our Eliezer son of our Simeon came to him through love and departed in love, those of Rabbi came to him through a certain incident and departed likewise. They came to him through a certain incident. What is it? A calf was being taken to the slaughter when it broke away, hid his head under Rabbi's skirts and load in. Terror go said he for this wast thou created thereupon. They said in heaven, since he has no pity, let us bring suffering upon him and departed likewise. How so? One day Rabbi's maid servant was sweeping the house, seeing some young weasels lying there. She made to sweep them away. Let them be said he to her. It is written and his tender mercies are over all his work. Said they in heaven, since he is compassionate, let us be compassionate to him during all the years that our Eliezer suffered no man. Died prematurely during all those of Rabbi the world needed no rain for Rabbi son of Arshila said the day of rain is as hard to bear as the day of judgment and Amimar said but that it is necessary to the world the rabbis would have prayed that it might cease to be nevertheless when a radish was pulled out of its bed there remained a cavity full of water Rabbi chanced to visit the town of our Eliezer son of our Simeon did that righteous man leave a son he inquired yes they replied and every harlot whose hires two zoos hires him for eight so he had him brought before him ordained him a rabbi and entrusted him to our Simeon B as he be like any of his mother's brother to be educated every day he would say I am going to my town to which he is instructor replied they have made you a safe spread over you a gold trimmed cloak at the ceremony of ordination and designated you rabbi and yet you say I am going back to my town said he I swear that this my desire has been abandoned. When he became a great scholar he went and sat in Rabbi's academy on hearing his voice he Rabbi observed this voice is similar to that of our Eliezer son of our Simeon he is his son they his disciples told him thereupon he applied to him the verse the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life and he that winneth souls is wise thus the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life this refers to our Jose the son of our Eliezer the son of our Simeon and he that winneth souls is wise to our Simeon be easy. Be like when he died he was carried to his father's burial vault which was encompassed by a snake o snake o snake they drew it open thy mouth and let the son enter to his father but it would not uncoil for them now the people thought that one was greater than the other but there issued a heavenly voice proclaiming it is not because one is greater than the other but because one underwent the suffering of the cave and the other did not Rabbi chance to visit the town of Artarfon said he too. Them has that righteous man who used to swear by the life of his children left a son they replied he has left no son but a daughter's son remains and every harlot who is hired for two zoos hires him for eight so he had him brought before him and said to him should you repent I will give you my daughter he repented some say he married her rabbi's daughter and divorced her others that he did not marry her at all lest it be said that his repentance was under account and why did he rabbi take such extreme measures because as Rab Judah said in Rab's name others say our high be Abba said in our Yohanan's name others say our Samuel be Naman he said in our Jonathan's name he who teaches Torah to his neighbor's son will be privileged to sit in the heavenly academy for it is written if thou see Jeremiah will cause Israel to repent then will I bring thee again and thou shalt stand before me and he who teaches Torah to the son of an Amhire as even if the holy one blessed be he makes a Decree he annuls it for his sake as it is written and if thou shalt take forth the precious from the vial thou shalt be as my mouth are barnak said in our Yohanan's name he who is himself a scholar and his son is a scholar and his son's son to the Torah will never more cease from his seat as it is written as for me this is my covenant with them saith the Lord my spirit is upon thee and my words which I have put in thy mouth shall not depart out of thy mouth nor out of the mouth of thy seed nor out of the mouth of thy seed seed saith the Lord from henceforth and forever what is meant by saith the Lord the Holy One blessed be he said I am surety for thee in this matter what is the meaning of from henceforth and forever our Jeremiah said from henceforth i.e. after three generations the Torah seeks its home our Joseph fasted forty fasts when he was made to read in his dream they shall not depart out of thy mouth he fasted another forty and was made to read they shall not depart out of Thy mouth nor out of the mouth of thy seed he fasted another forty and was made to read they shall not depart out of thy mouth nor out of the mouth of thy seed nor out of the mouth of thy seed seed henceforth said he I have no need to fast the Torah seeks its home when our Zerah emigrated to Palestine he fasted a hundred fasts to forget the Babylonian Gemara that it should not trouble him he also fasted a hundred times that our Eliezer might not die in his lifetime so that the communal cares should not fall upon him and yet another hundred that the fire of Gehenna might be powerless against him every thirty days he used to examine himself to see if he were fireproof he would heat the oven ascent and sit therein but the fire had no power against him one day however the rabbis cast an envious eye upon him and his legs were cinched whereafter he was called short and legs cinched Rab Judah said in Rab's name what is meant by who is a wise man that may understand this and who is he to whom the mouth of the Lord hath
of the universe he exclaimed did I not debate on the Torah as he did thereupon a heavenly voice cried out in reply you did indeed debate on the Torah as he did but did not spread the Torah as he did whenever Arhana and Arhai were in a dispute Arhana said to Arhai would you dispute with me if heaven forfend the Torah were forgotten in Israel I would restore it by my argumentative powers to which Arhai rejoined would you dispute with me who achieved that the Torah should not be forgotten in Israel what did I do I went and sowed flax made nets from the flax cords trapped ears whose flesh I gave to orphans and prepared scrolls from their skins upon which I wrote the five books of Moses then I went to a town which contained no teachers and taught the five books to five children and the six orders of the Talmud to six children and I bade them until I returned teach each other the Pentateuch and the Mishnah and thus I preserved the Torah from being forgotten in Israel this is what Rabbi meant when he said how great are the works of Hyasset are Ishmael son of our Jose to him are they even greater than yours yes he replied and even then my father's heaven forfend he rejoined let not such a thing be heard in Israel Arzara said last night our Jose son of Arhana appeared to me in a dream and I asked him near whom art thou seated in the heavenly academy near Arjohanan and Arjohanan near whom Arjane and Arjane near Arhana and Arhana Near Arhai said I to him and is not Arjohanan worthy of a seat near Arhai he replied in the region of fiery sparks and flaming tongues who will let the smith son enter Arhabba said Arhabba be sir make he told me I saw one of the rabbis whom Elijah used to frequent whose eyes were clear in the morning but in the evening they looked as though burnt in fire I questioned him what is the meaning of this and he answered me thus I requested Elijah to show me the departed rabbis as they Ascend to the heavenly academy, he replied, Thou canst look upon all excepting the carriage of our high upon it, thou shalt not look what is their sign. All are accompanied by angels when they ascend and descend, excepting our highest carriage who ascends and descends of his own accord, but unable to control my desire, I gazed upon it, whereat two fiery streams issued forth smoke and blinded me in one eye. The following day I went and prostrated myself upon his grave, crying out, It is thy burial. Then I study and I was healed. Elijah used to frequent Rabbi's academy one day, it was new moon, he was waiting for him, but he failed to come, said he to him the next day, Why didst thou delay? He replied, I had to wait until I awoke. Abraham washed his hands and he prayed, and I put him to rest again, likewise to Isaac and Jacob, but why not awake them together? I feared that they would wax strong in prayer and bring the Messiah before his time, and is there like to be found in this world? He asked. There is Arhai and his sons, he replied thereupon Rabbi proclaimed a fast and Arhai and his sons were bidden to descend to the reading desk as he Arhai exclaimed he causeth the wind to blow a wind blew he proceeded he causeth the rain to descend whereat the rain descended when he was about to say he quickeneth the dead the universe trembled and in heaven it was asked who hath revealed our secret to the world Elijah they replied Elijah was therefore brought and smitten with sixty flaming lashes so he went disguised himself as a fiery bear entered amongst and scattered them Samuel Yarnah was Rabbi's physician now Rabbi having contracted an eye disease Samuel offered to bathe it with a lotion but he said I cannot bear it then I will apply anointment to it he said this too I cannot bear he objected so he placed a file of chemicals under his pillow and he was healed Rabbi was most anxious to ordain him but the opportunity was lacking let it not grieve thee he said I have seen the book of Adam in which is written Samuel Yarnah Talmud, Mas Baba Mitzia shall be called sage but not rabbi and rabbi's healing shall come through him rabbi and our Nathan conclude the mission Arashi and Rabbana conclude authentic teaching and assign thereof is the verse until I went to the sanctuary of God then understood either and Arkahana said Arhamma the son of the daughter of Hassa related to me that Rabbi Bin Amani died through persecution information having been laid against him to the state said that the informers there is an Israelite who keeps back 12,000 Israelites from the payment of the royal poll tax one month in summer and one in winter thereupon a royal officer was sent for him but did not find him he rather than fled from Pumadai the two Acre from Acre to Agama from Agama to Sahin from Sahin to Zarafah from Zarafah to Ian Adam and thence back to Pumadai in Pumadai that he found him for the royal officer chance to visit the same. In where Rabbi was hiding now they placed a tray before him the royal officer gave him two glasses of liquor and then removed the tray whereupon his face was turned backward by demons what shall we do with him said they the in attendance to him Rabbi he is a royal officer offer him the tray again he replied and let him drink another goblet then remove the tray and he will recover they did so and he recovered I know said he that the man whom I require is here he searched for and found him he then said I will depart from here if I am slain I will not disclose his whereabouts but if tortured I will he was then brought before him and he led him into a chamber and locked the door upon him to keep him there as a prisoner but he Rabbi prayed whereupon the wall fell down and he fled to Agamah there he sat upon the trunk of a fallen palm and studied now they were disputing in the heavenly academy thus if the bright spot preceded the white hair he is unclean if it Reverse he is clean if the order is in doubt the Holy One blessed be he ruled he is clean whilst the entire heavenly academy maintained he is unclean who shall decide it said the Rabbi Binamani for he said I am preeminent in the laws of leprosy and tense a messenger was sent for him but the angel of death could not approach him because he did not interrupt his studies even for a moment in the meantime a wind blew and caused a rustling in the bushes when he imagined it to be a troop of soldiers let me die he exclaimed rather than be delivered into the hands of the state as he was dying he exclaimed clean clean when a heavenly voice cried out happy art thou Rabbi Binamani whose body is pure and whose soul had departed in purity a missive fell from heaven in Pumadai upon which was written Rabbi Binamani has been summoned by the heavenly academy so Abay and Rabbi and all the scholars went forth to attend on him at his burial but they did not know his whereabouts. They went to Agam and saw birds stationed there and overshadowing it to give protection. They said they proves that he is there. They bewailed him for three days and three nights, but there fell a missive from heaven. He who will now hold aloof from the lamentations shall be under a ban. So they bewailed him for seven days and then there fell a missive from heaven. Return in peace to your homes on the day that he died. A hurricane lifted an Arab who was riding a camel and transported him from one bank of the river Papa to the other. What does this portent? He exclaimed, Rabbi Binamani has died. He was told sovereign of the universe. He cried out, The whole world is thine, and Rabbi Binamani too is thine. Thou art the friend of Rabbi and Rabbi is thine. Why dost thou destroy the world on his account? Thereupon the storm subsided. Our Simeon Behalapta was a fat man. One day feeling hot, he climbed up, sat on a mountain boulder, and said to his daughter, Daughter, fan me with a fan, and I will. Give you bundles of spikenard just then however a breeze arose whereat he observed how many bundles of spikenard do I owe to the master of the breeze everything depends on local custom what does everything add the case where it is customary to break bread and drink a small measure of liquor if he the employer demanded of them come early that I may bring it to you they can answer you have no power to demand this it once happened that our Yohanan B. Matthias said to his son go out and engage etc a story is quoted contradicting the stated law the text is defective and should read thus but if he stipulates to provide them with food Talmud Mas Baba Matthias B. He thereby increases his obligations to them and it once happened likewise that our Yohanan B. Matthias said to his son go out and engage laborers he went and agreed to supply them with food but when he returned to his father he said to him my son should you even prepare a banquet for them like Solomon's went in his Glory you cannot fulfill your duty for they are the children of Abraham Isaac and Jacob shall we say that the meals of Abraham the patriarch were superior to those of Solomon but is it not written and Solomon's provisions for one day were thirty measures of fine flour and threescore measures of meal ten fat oxen and twenty oxen out of the pastures and an hundred sheep besides hearts and roebucks and fell deer and fat fowl were on Gorian Beastron said in Rab's name these were for the cooks. Do and our Isaac said these animals were but for the mince meat puddings moreover said our Isaac Solomon had a thousand wives and each prepared this quantity in her own house why each reason he may dine in my house today whereas of Abraham it is said and Abraham ran unto the herd and fetched the calf tender and good whereon Rab observed the calf means one tender two and good three there the three calves were for three men whereas here the provisions en
Ministering angels descended below and ate bread and ate can you really think so but say appeared to eat and drink Rab Judah said in Rab's name everything which Abraham personally did for the ministering angels the Holy One blessed be he did in person for his sons and whatever Abraham did through a messenger the Holy One blessed be he did for his sons through a messenger thus and Abraham ran unto the herd and there went forth a wind from the Lord and he took butter and milk behold I will rain bread from heaven for you and he stood by them under the tree behold I will stand before thee there upon the rock etc and Abraham went with them to bring them on the way and the Lord went before them by day let a little water I pray you be fetched and thou shalt smite the rock and there shall come water out of it that the people may drink but he is thus in conflict with Arham son of Arhanan for Arham son of Arhanan said and the school of Ishmael taught likewise as a reward for three Things done by Abraham they his descendants obtained three things thus as a reward for and he took butter and milk they received the manna as a reward for and he stood by them they received the pillar of cloud as a reward for let a little water I pray you be fetched they were granted Miriam's well let a little water I pray you be fetched and wash your feet Arjani son of Ar Ishmael said they the travelers protested to him Abraham dost thou suspect us of being Arabs who worship thee dust on their feet Ishmael has already issued from thee and the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre and he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day what is meant by in the heat of the day Arham son of Arhanan said it was the third day from Abraham's circumcision and the Holy One blessed be he came to inquire after Abraham's health moreover he drew the sun out of its sheath so that the righteous man S.C. Abraham should not be troubled with wayfarers he sent Eliza out to seek Travelers, but he found none said he I do not believe thee hence they say their SC in Palestine slaves are not to be believed so he himself went out and saw the Holy One blessed be he standing at the door thus it is written pass not away I pray thee from thy servant but on seeing him tying and undying the bandages of his circumcision he said it is not well that I stand here hence it is written and he lifted up his eyes and looked and lo three men stood by him and when he saw them he ran to meet them at first they came and stood over him but when they saw him in pain they said it is not seemly to stand here who were the three men Michael Gabriel and Raphael Michael came to bring the tidings to Sarah of Isaac's birth Raphael to heal Abraham and Gabriel to overturn Sodom but is it not written and there came the two angels to Sodom and even Michael accompanied him to rescue Lot the red supports this too for it is written and he overthrew those cities not and they overthrew this Proves it why is it written in the case of Abraham and they said so do as thou hast said whereas of Lot it is written Talmud, Mas Baba Mitzia, and he pressed upon them greatly our Eliezer said this teaches that one may shew unwillingness to an inferior person but not to a great man it is written and I will fetch a morsel of bread but it is also written and Abraham ran unto the herd said our Eliezer this teaches that righteous men promise little and perform much whereas the wicked promise much. And do not perform even little once do we know the latter half from Ephron at first it is written the land is worth four hundred shekels of silver but subsequently and Abraham here can unto Ephron and Abraham way to Ephron the silver which he had named in the audience of the sons of hate four hundred shekels of silver current money with the merchant indicating that he refused to accept anything but centenary for there is a place where shekels are called centenary scripture rights. Ordinary meal and it is then written fine meal said our Isaac this shoes that a woman looks with a more grudging eye upon guests than a man it is written knead it and make cakes upon the hearth but it is also written and he took butter and milk and the calf yet he brought no bread before them Ephraim Machai a disciple of our Meir said in his teacher's name our patriarch Abraham ate Helen only went undefiled and that day our mother Sarah had her menstrual period and they said unto him where is Sarah thy wife and he said behold she is in the tent this is to inform us that she was modest Rab Judah said in Rab's name the ministering angels knew that our mother Sarah was in the tent but why bring out the fact that she was in her tent in order to make her beloved to her husband our Jose son of Arhanan said in order to send her the one cup of benediction it has been taught on the authority of our Jose why are the letters Edu and Elijah dotted the Torah thereby taught etiquette that a man must inquire of his hostess about his host, but did not Samuel say one must not inquire at all after a woman's well being when inquired is made through her husband? It is different and permitted after I have waxed old, I have had youth. Our Hista said, After the flesh is worn and the wrinkles have multiplied, the flesh was rejuvenated, the wrinkles were smoothed out, and beauty returned to its place. It is written, and my Lord is old, but it is also written, and the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore? Did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I of a surety bear a child, seeing that I am old? The Holy One blessed be he, not putting the question in her words. The school of Ishmael taught peace is a precious thing, for even the Holy One blessed be he made a variation for its sake, as it is written. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also, whereas it is further written, and the Lord said unto Abraham, etc., seeing that I am old, and she said, Who? Would have said unto Abraham that Sarah should have given children suck how many children then did Sarah suckle our Levi said on the day that Abraham weaned his son Isaac he made a great banquet and all the peoples of the world derided him saying have you seen that old man and woman who brought a foundling from the street and now claim him as their son and what is more they make a great banquet to establish their claim what did our father Abraham do he went and invited all the great men of it. Age and our mother Sarah invited their wives each one brought her child with her but not the wet nurse and a miracle happened unto our mother Sarah her breasts opened like two fountains and she suckled them all yet they still scoffed saying granted that Sarah could give birth at the age of ninety could Abraham beget child at the age of a hundred immediately the lineaments of Isaac's visage changed and became like Abraham's whereupon they all cried out Abraham begot Isaac until Abraham there. Was no old age whoever wished to speak to Abraham would speak to Isaac and the reverse thereupon he prayed and old age came into existence as it is written and Abraham was old and well stricken in age until Jacob there was no illness then Jacob came and prayed and illness came into being as it is written and one told Joseph behold thy father is sick until Elisha no sick man ever recovered but Elijah came and prayed and he recovered for it is written now Elisha was fallen sick of his sickness. Whereof he died thus proving that he had been sick on previous occasions too but had recovered our rabbis taught on three occasions did Elisha fall sick once when he repulsed Gehazi with both hands a second time when he incited bears against children and a third with the sickness whereof he died as it is written now Elisha was fallen sick of his sickness whereof he died but before they begin work go out and tell them I engage you on condition that you have no other claim upon me but bread. And Pulse etc. Araha the son of our Joseph said to Arhista did we learn bread made of Pulse or bread and Pulse he replied in very truth above and is necessary as large as a rudder on the Labrath our Simeon B. Gamaliel said it was unnecessary to stipulate thus everything depends on local custom what does everything add it adds that which has been taught if one engages a laborer and stipulates I will pay you as one or two towns people are paid he must remunerate him with the lowest wage. Paid this is our Joshua's view but the sages say an average must be struck mission and now the following laborers may eat of that upon which they are employed according to scriptural law he who is engaged upon that which is attached to the soil when its labor is finished and upon that which is detached from the soil before its labor is completed providing that it is something that grows from the earth but the following may not eat he who is engaged upon that which is attached to the soil. Talmud, Mas Baba Mitzia B. Talmud, Mas Baba Mitzia B. Before its labor is completed upon that which is detached from the soil after its labor is completed and upon that which does not grow from the soil tomorrow whence do we know these things it is written when thou comest into thy neighbor's vineyard then thou mayest eat we have found this law to be true of a vineyard whence do we know it of all other things we infer them from the vineyard just as the vineyard is peculiar in that it S. C. its products grow from the earth and at the completion of its labor the laborer may eat thereof so everything which grows from the soil the laborer may eat thereof at the completion of its work but might it not be argued as for a vineyard the worker's privilege may be due to the fact that it is liable to the law of gleanings which other cereals are not we deduce it from the standing corn but how do we know it of standing corn itself because it is written when thou comest into the comma standing corn of thy neighbor then thou mayest pluck the ears with thine hand but may you not argue as for standing corn that
themselves are designated karam as it is written and he burnt up both the shocks and the standing corn and also the olive karam our papa said it is designated olive karam but not simply karam but still the difficulty remains samuel answered scripture set and a sickle thou shalt not move on to thy neighbor's standing corn which i.e. the end extends a law to everything which requires a sickle but this word sickle is needed to intimate that when the sickle is used you may eat but not Otherwise that follows from but thou shalt not put any in thy vessel now this deduction is satisfactory in respect of that which requires the sickle but what of that which does not but set our Isaac the writ says comma to extend the law to everything which stands upright from the soil but have you not employed the analogy of comma written twice to shoot that it means only such standing crops as are liable to hell that was only before the word sickle was adduced now however that sickle has been quoted everything which needs a sickle is embraced even if not liable to hell hence what is the purpose of comma to include everything which stands upright but now that we infer these laws from sickle and comma what is the need of when thou comest into thy neighbor's vineyard to teach its detailed laws replied Rabbah as it has been taught when thou comest coming is mentioned here and elsewhere too it is said thou shalt not oppress a hired servant at this day thou shalt give him is higher neither shall the sun come down upon it just as their scripture refers to an employee so here too into thy neighbor's vineyard but not into a heathen's vineyard now on the view that the robbery of a heathen is forbidden it is well but if it be held permitted does an employee need a verse to grant him permission he interprets into thy neighbor's vineyard as excluding a vineyard of itish then thou mayest eat but not suck out the juice grapes but not grapes and something else as thine own person as the person of the employer so the person of the employee just as thou thyself mayest eat thereof and art exempt from tithe so the employee too may eat and is exempt to thy satisfaction but not gluttonously but thou shalt not put any in thy vessel only when thou canst put it into thine employer's baskets thou mayest eat but not otherwise our said Tebal is not liable to tithes Talmud, Mas Babamitia until it sees the front of the house for it is written I have brought away the hallowed things out of mine house our Yohanan said even a courtyard establishes liability to tithes for it is written that they may eat at the gates and be filled but according to our Yohanan is it not written out of mine house he can answer you it teaches that the courtyard must be similar to the house in order to impose liability just as a house is guarded so also must the courtyard be guarded but our Janae is it not written in the gates that is required to Shoot that it must be brought into the house through the gates but not over the roof or through back enclosures when no liability is established our Hannah of Behozi raised an objection as thine own person as the person of the employer so the person of the employee just as thou thyself mayest eat thereof and art exempt from tithes so also the employee may eat and is exempt this thus implies that a purchaser is liable and does it not mean even in the field our Papa said this refers to a Fig tree growing in a garden but with its branches inclining to the courtyard or to the house on the view that it must see the front of the house if so even the first owner should be liable the owner's eyes are upon the whole fig tree whereas the buyer has eyes only for his purchase but is a purchaser at all liable by biblical law has it not been taught why were the bazaars of Bethany destroyed because they based their actions upon scripture they used to say Talmud, Mas Baba Metzibi. Thou shalt truly tithe and thou shalt eat implies but not if thou sellest it the increase of thy seed but not if it is purchased but the liability of a purchaser is only by rabbinic law and the verse is a mere support then what is the purpose of as thine own person as has been taught as thine own person just as if thou must list thine own mouth thou art guiltless so also if thou must list the mouth of thy labor thou art free from transgression bars it raised an objection what is there harvesting time for liability to tithes in the case of cucumbers and gourds when they are blossomed and R.C. interpreted this as soon as their blossoms are shed now does that not mean as soon as their blossoms are shed even in the field no only in the house if so instead of saying as soon as etc. he the tana should state they are not liable until their blossoms are shed had he stated until etc. I would think that it means until the shedding of their blossom is complete. Therefore we are taught by stating as soon as etc. that it means as soon as the shedding commences Mars the son of Arnaman raised an objection it's harvesting time in respect of tithes and that the prohibition of people is transgressed is when its work is finished and what is the finishing of its work when it is brought in now surely when it is brought in means even in the field no when it is brought into the house that is the completion of its work alternatively our Janae's dictum refers only to olives and grapes which are not gathered into a threshing floor but in the case of wheat and barley the threshing floor is distinctly stated we now know that man may eat when employed upon what is attached to the soil and an ox of what is detached whence do we know that man may eat of what is detached it follows a minority from an ox if an ox which does not eat of what is attached may nevertheless eat of what is detached then a man who may eat of what is attached may surely eat of what is detached as for an ox it may be argued that sc the privilege mentioned is because you are forbidden to muzzle him can you assume the same of man whom you are not forbidden to muzzle but then let the muzzling of man be interdicted a fortiori from an ox if you must not muzzle an ox whose life you are not bidden to preserve then man whose life you are bidden to preserve you must surely not muzzle him scripture tiak as thine own person so is the person of the laborer just as thine own Person, if you muzzle yourself, you are free from penalty. So also, if you muzzle the laborer, you are free. Then the question remains: Whence do we know that man may eat when engaged upon what is attached? Scripture saith, When thou comest into the standing corn, but thou shalt not move a sickle unto thy neighbor's standing corn. Twice, since its purpose is not to teach that man may eat of what is attached, apply it to man in respect of what is detached. R. M. I. said that man may eat of what is detached. No redundant verse is necessary for it is written: When thou contest into thy neighbor's vineyard, does this not hold good even if he was hired for porterage? And yet the Torah states that he may eat of the grapes. Whence do we know that an ox may eat of what is attached? It follows a minority from man. If man who does not eat of what is detached may eat of what is attached, then an ox which may eat of what is detached may surely eat of what is attached. As for man, may it not. Be argued that SC the privilege mentioned is because you are bidden to preserve his life will you say the same of an ox whose life you are not bidden to preserve but then infer a duty to preserve the life of an ox of minority of man though you are not forbidden to muzzle him you are commanded to preserve his life then an ox which you may not muzzle you are surely commanded to keep it alive scripture saith that thy brother may live with thee thy brother but not an ox then the question remains. Whence do we know that an ox may eat of what is attached scripture saith when thou contest into thy neighbor's vineyard when thou comest into the standing corn of thy neighbor twice since it is unnecessary for man in respect of what is attached apply it to an ox in respect of what is attached Robin has said neither for a man in respect of what is detached nor for an ox in respect of what is attached are the above verses necessary because it is written thou shalt not muzzle the ox. When he treadeth out the corn Talmud, Mas Babamitia, now consider everything is included in this prohibition of muzzling because we employ the analogy of ox written here and in the case of the Sabbath then scripture should have written thou shalt not thresh with muzzled animals why write ox to assimilate the muzzled sc man to the muzzled sc ox and animals in general and vice versa just as the muzzled man may eat of what is attached so the muzzled may eat of what is attached and just as the muzzled may eat of what is detached so the muzzled may eat of what is detached our rabbis taught threshing just as threshing is peculiar in that it applies to what is grown in the earth and the laborer may eat whilst employed thereon so also of everything which is grown in the earth the laborer may eat hence milking pressing thick milk and cheese making are excluded since they are not earth grown the laborer may not partake thereof but why is this needed does it not follow from when? Thou comest into thy neighbor's vineyard, it is necessary, I might think, since comma is written to include everything that stands upright, it also embraces what is not earth grown, therefore we are taught otherwise. Another berry that teaches threshing, just as threshing is peculiar in that it is an employment at the completion of its labor, and the worker may eat whilst engaged thereon. So during everything which is done at the completion of its labor, the worker may eat, hence weeding amongst garlic and onions is excluded, as it is not the completion of the work, the laborer may not eat, but why is this necessary? Does it not follow from, but thou shalt not put any in thy vessel, it is necessary to intimate that he may not eat even when removing small onions from amongst large ones. Another berry that
Palestine yet there is no difficulty for the references to the seven years of conquest and seven years of division for a master said in the seven years of conquest and the seven of division there was a liability to hell but not to tithes but is it the tithing that is responsible it is the finishing of the work that is responsible but said Rabbanah combined the two berithas and read thus threshing just as threshing is peculiar in that its work is not complete in respect of tithes and Hala and the worker may eat whilst engaged thereon so during everything the work of which is not complete in respect of tithes and Hala the laborer may eat the scholars propounded is a laborer permitted to parch the ears of corn at a fire and eat them is it the equivalent of eating grapes together with something else or not come and here an employer may give his employees wine to drink that they should not eat many grapes on the other hand the laborers may dip their bread in Brine that they should eat many grapes Talmud, Mas Baba Mitzia B.S. for making a man fit to eat more of that there is no question our problem is only whether the food may be rendered more appetizing what is the ruling come and here laborers may eat the topmost grapes of the vine dash rose but must not parch them at the fire there at the prohibition is on account of loss of time but our problem arises when he has his wife or children with him what then come and here he the laborer may not parch the crops at the fire and eat nor warm them in the earth nor crush them on a rock but he may crush them between his hands and eat them there too it is on account of loss of time that too is logical for should you think it is because either by makes the fruit tasteful what tastefulness is there acquired by crushing them on a rock no the reasoning is incorrect because it is impossible for it not to become slightly more tasteful come and here workers engaged in picking Fix harvesting dates, vintaging grape or gathering olives may eat and are exempt from tithes because the Torah privileged them, but they must not eat these with their bread unless they obtain permission from the owner nor dip them in salt and eat salt is certainly the same as grapes and something else it has just been stated nor dip them in salt and eat but the following contradicts it if one engages a laborer to hoe and to cover up the roots of olive trees he may not eat but if he engages him to vintage grapes pluck olives or gather fruit he may eat and is exempt from tithes because the Torah privileged him if he the laborer stipulates that he is to eat he may eat and singly but not two at a time and he may dip them in salt and eat now to what does this refer shall we say to the last clause but having stipulated he can obviously eat just as he wishes surely then it must refer to the first clause have they answered there is no difficulty here at the second Beritha refers to Palestine there the first to the diaspora in Palestine dipping in salt establishes a liability to tithes in the diaspora it does not rob a demur is there out for which dipping establishes a liability in Palestine but not in the diaspora so that it is permitted from the very outset but said rob both in Palestine and without for one fix salting does not establish liability but for two it does but if he has see the laborer stipulates that he is to eat whether he salts or not he may eat them one by one but not in twos hence if he neither stipulates nor salts them he may eat them two by two if he salts them he may eat them one by one but not two by two even if he obtain the employer's permission because they become people in respect of tithes of salting establishing that liability and whence do we know that salting establishes liability only for two set our matina scripture set for he hath gathered them as the sheep to the threshing Flora rabbis taught when cows stamp pollen grain talmud, mas baba mitzia or thresh terima and tithes there is no prohibition of thou shalt not muzzle the ox when he treadeth out i.e. threshes his corn but for the sake of appearances he must bring a handful of that species and hang it on the nose bag at its mouth are simian bio he said he must bring vetches and hang them up for it because these are better for it than anything else now the following contradicts it when cows are stamping. On grain there is no prohibition of thou shalt not muzzle but when they thresh terima or tithes there is when a heathen threshes with an Israelite's cow that prohibition is not transgressed but if an Israelite threshes with a heathen's beast he does thus the rulings on terima are contradictory and likewise those on tithes now as for the rulings on terima it is well and there is no difficulty the one refers to terima itself the other to the produce of terima but as for the rulings on Tithes these are certainly difficult and should you answer there is no contradiction in the rulings on tithes either one referring to tithes and the other to the produce of tithes as for the produce of terima the answer is fitting since it is terima but the produce of tithes is hullin for we learned the produce of tibal and the produce of the second tithe are hullin but there is no difficulty the one refers to the first tithe the other to the second alternatively both refer to the second tithe yet there is no difficulty the one sc the first beritha agrees with our mayor the other with our judah thus the one agrees with our mayor who maintained that the second tithe is sacred property the other with our judah who held it secular property and how is it conceivable g if he the owner anticipated the tithing whilst it was yet in here but even on our judah's view does it not require the wall of jerusalem he threshed it within the walls of beth page another alternative is this there is no difficulty one refers to a certain tithe the other to a doubtful tithe now that you have arrived at the solution there is no contradiction between the two rulings on terima to the one refers to certain terima the other to doubtful terima now that is well with respect to a doubtful tithe which exists but is there a doubtful terima has it not been taught he also abolished the wadu and enacted the law of dime because he sent messengers throughout the territory of israel and saw that only the great terima was rendered but there is no difficulty the one refers to terima of a certain tithe the other to terima of the doubtful tithe the scholars put a problem to our she's hate what if it ate and excreted is it sc the prohibition of muzzling because if the crops benefits her whereas here it does not or because it sees and is distressed through inability to eat and here too it is distressed if muzzled our she's hate replied we have learned it our simian bio he said he must bring vetches and hang them up for her because these are better for her than anything else. This proves that the reason is that it benefits her. This proves that the scholars propounded may one say to a heathen muzzle my cow and thresh therewith. Do we say the principle that an instruction to a heathen is a shabbat applies only to the Sabbath work being forbidden on pain of stoning but not to muzzling which is prohibited merely by a negative precept or perhaps there is no difference come. And here if a heathen threshes with the cow of an Israelite he the Israelite does not infringe the precept thou shalt not muzzle this implies he merely does not infringe it yet it is forbidden actually it is not even forbidden but because the second clause states that if an Israelite threshes with a heathen's cow he does infringe the first clause two teaches that he does not infringe come and here for they the scholars sent to Samuel's father one of those oxen Talmud, Mas Baba Mitzibi. Which error means steal at the instance of the owners and castrate he replied since an evasion was committed with them turn the evasion upon them their owners and let them be sold our papa replied the Palestinian scholars hold with our hiccup is that the Noahites are themselves forbidden to practice castration and hence he the Israelite in instructing the heathen to do it violates ye shall not put a stumbling block before the blind now Rabbi thought to interpret they must be sold for slaughter. Thereupon Abbe said to him it is sufficient that you have penalized them to sell now it is obvious that an adult son is as a stranger but what of a minor son are he forbade it whilst our Ashi permitted it Miramar and Marzitra other states certain two has it interchanged with each other Rami Bihama propounded what if one put a thorn in its see the animal's mouth you ask what if one put a thorn in its mouth surely that is real muzzling but the problem is what if a thorn stuck in its Mouth similarly what if one caused a lion to lie down outside the field in which the ox was threshing what if one caused a lion to lie down surely that is actual muzzling but the problem is what if a lion lay down outside of its own accord what if one placed its sc the animals young outside the field what if it thirsted for water and so could not eat what if he spread a leather cover over the grain to be threshed solve one of these problems from the following berry the it has been taught the owner of the cow may let it go hungry that it should eat much of the grain it threshes whilst on the other hand the landowner may untie a bundle of trodden sheaves before the cow that it should not eat much of the threshing there it is different because it does eat nevertheless alternatively it means the field owner may untie a bundle of trodden sheaves in front of the cow before the commencement of the threshing so that it should not eat much of the corn that is Thresh our Jonathan asked Arsimai what if he muzzled it outside does scripture mean thou shalt not muzzle an ox when I eat at the time that it thre sheth whilst this is not done when it thre sheth or perhaps scripture meant thou shalt not thresh with a muzzled ox he replied you may learn from your father's house do not drink wine or strong drink thou nor thy sons with thee when you enter into the tabernacle
Action, but can you make this agree with Arjuna? Does not the first clause state all have power to exchange both men and women? Now we pondered thereon what is all intended to add, and we answered an heir, and this does not agree with Arjuna, for if it did, surely he maintained that an heir can neither exchange nor lay hands. This tana agrees with Arjuna in one ruling and disagrees in another. Our rabbis taught if one muzzles a beast and threshes therewith, he is flagellated and pays to the owner. Of the cow, four calves in the case of a cow and three calves for an ass, but is it not a principle? One is not flagellated and executed, nor is one flagellated and made to pay. Abbe replied, This is in accordance with our mayor who maintained one is flagellated and also made to pay. Rabbi said the Torah forbade the hire of a harlot, even if one had relations with his mother. Our papa said he becomes liable for its food from the moment of Meshiko, whereas flagellation is not incurred until muzzling our papa. Said the following problems were propounded to me by the disciples of our Papa B. Abba, and I gave stringent rulings one in accordance with the law, the other not in accordance with the law. They asked of me, may dough be needed with milk, and I ruled that it was forbidden, this being in accordance with the law, for it has been taught dough may not be needed with milk, and if it is a whole loaf is forbidden because it may lead to transgression, likewise an oven may not be greased with tail fat, and if it is a whole loaf baked therein is forbidden until the oven is heated through the other problem they propounded of me was made two heterogeneous animals of opposite sexes be led into a stable, and I answered them that it is forbidden this not being in accordance with the law, for Samuel said in the case of adulterers, they see the witnesses must have seen them in the posture of adulterers, but in respect to diverse species they must have seen him assisting the copulation even as one. Places the painting stick in the tube are boy BM I raised an objection had scripture stated thou shalt not cause thy cattle to gender I might have thought it to mean one must not hold a beast when the male even of its own kind copulates with it therefore it is said with a diverse kind surely then this proves that in the case of different species one may not even hold the female by holding assisting is meant and why is it designated holding as a more delicate term Rab Judah said in animals of the same species one may assist at copulation even as one places the painting stick in the tube and it is not even forbidden on account of obscenity why because he is engaged in his work Arahad boy BM I raised an objection Talmud Mas Baba Mitzia B had scripture stated thou shalt not cause thy cattle to gender I should have thought it to mean one must not hold a beast for the male to copulate with it therefore it is said with a diverse kind hence only in regard to different Species is it forbidden but in the same species it is permitted yet even there only holding is permitted but not assisting what is meant by holding assisting and why is it called holding as a delicate term Arashi said this question was put to me by the scholars of Rabbanan Yamai the Reshalitha may an animal be led into a stable together with one of its own species and another heterogeneous to it do we argue having its own kind it will be attracted thereto or perhaps even so it is not permitted and I answered them that it is forbidden not because the law is so but on account of the licentiousness of slaves Mishnah if he the laborer works with his hands but not with his feet or with his feet but not with his hands and even if he works with his shoulders only he may eat our Jose son of Arjuda said he may not eat unless he works with his hands and feet tomorrow what is the reason of the first tano when thou comest into the neighbor's vineyard implies for whatever Work he may do our Jose son of Arjuda said he may not eat unless he works with his hands and feet what is the reason of our Jose son of Arjuda he the laborer is likened to the ox just as the ox does not eat unless it works with its hands and feet so the laborer too must work with his hands and feet Rabbi son of Arjuna propounded according to our Jose son of Arjuda what if one threshes with geese and fowls is it necessary that the work shall be done with all its see the creature that threshes strength which provision is complied with or perhaps it must work with its forefeet and hind feet which is here absent the problem remains unsolved our said in Rabbi Abba's name laborers before they walk both lengthwise and crosswise in the one press may eat grapes but drink no wine having walked lengthwise and crosswise in the one press they may eat grapes and drink wine Mishnah when he the laborer is working among figs he must not eat of grapes among grapes he must not eat a fix yet he may restrain himself until he comes to the choice quality fruit and then eat now with respect to all of them see the laborers permission was given only when they are actually at work but in order to save the employer's time they rule laborers may eat as they walk from row to row and when returning from the one press and as for an assay may eat whilst being unladen gamara the scholars propounded whilst working on one by may he the laborer eat of another is it merely necessary that thou shalt eat only of the kind which thou puttest into the employer's baskets which requirement is fulfilled or is it stipulated that thou shalt eat only that i.e. the tree from which thou puttest into the employer's baskets which is here lacking but should you say when working on one vine he may not eat of another how can an ox eat of what is attached to the soil our shisha the son of Aridi replied it is possible in the case of a straggling branch come and hear if he the laborer is working among figs he must not eat of grapes this implies that he may eat of figs when working on figs on the same conditions that he may not eat of figs when working on grapes but should you say if he works on one vine he may not eat of another how is this possible Arshisha the son of Aridi said it is possible in the case of an overhanging branch come and here but he may restrain himself until he comes to the choice quality fruit and then eat but should you say whilst employed on one vine he may eat of another let him go bring the choice fruit and eat it and why restrain himself there it is forbidden because of loss of time in that case there is no question our problem arises only if he has his wife and children with him what then come and here now with respect to all of them see the laborer's permission was given only when they are actually at work but in order to save the employer's time they rule laborers may eat as they walk from row to row and when returning from the one press now it was assumed that walking from vine to vine is regarded as actual work it being necessary there to yet he may eat only in order to save the employer's time but not by scriptural law thus proving that whilst engaged on one vine he may not eat of another no in truth I may assert that whilst engaged on one vine he may eat of another but walking is not regarded as actual work others say it was assumed that walking is not regarded as actual work and only on that account may he not eat by scriptural law because he is not doing work but if he were doing actual work he might eat even by biblical law thus proving that whilst engaged on one vine he may eat of another no in truth I may assert that whilst engaged on one vine he may not eat of another Talmud Mas Baba Mitzia, and walking is regarded as actual work and as for an ass may eat whilst being unladen but when it is unladen once can it eat say until it is unladen we have thus learned here what our rabbis taught an ass and a camel can eat of the load on their backs providing that he the driver does not personally take thereof and feed the mission a laborer may eat cucumbers even to the value of a dinar or dates even to the value of a dinar our Eliezer his said a laborer must not eat more than his wage but the sages permitted yet one is advised not to be greedy and thus shut the door in his face Gamara are not the sages identical with the first tana. They differ as to whether the laborer is advised not to be greedy the first tana holds that he is not advised whilst the rabbis maintain that he is alternatively they differ in respect of RC's dictum for RC said even if engaged merely to gather a single cluster he may eat it RC also said even if he has yet vintage only one cluster having been engaged for the day he may eat it now both dicta are necessary for if the first only were stated I would think that that is so. Since there is nothing else to put into the employer's vessels but when there is something to put into the employer's vessels I would think that he must first put some there and then he whilst if the second statement only were made I would think that the reason is that it can be eventually fulfilled but where it cannot be eventually fulfilled I might think that he may not eat hence both are necessary reverting to the mission alternatively I can say they differ in respect of Rabs. Dictum for Rab said I found a secret scroll of the school of Arhai wherein it was written Isi B. Judah said when thou comest into thy neighbor's vineyard scripture refers to the coming in of any man whereon Rab commented Isi makes life impossible for anyone Arashi said I repeated the above teaching before our Kahana thereupon he observed perhaps Isi B. Judah referred to those who labor for their food working and eating and Rab even then a man prefers to engage laborers to vintage. His vineyard rather than that anyone should enter the scholars propounded does the laborer eat his own SC when partaking of the fruit upon which he is engaged or does he eat of heaven's gift what practical difference does this make if he said give it the fruit that I might have eaten to my wife and children now should you say that
interprets as thyself just as if thou muslest thyself thou art exempt from punishment so the laborer if thou muslest him thou art exempt come and hear if a nazir said give the grapes I might have eaten to my wife and children he is not eaten now should you say he eats his own why is he disregarded there it is because go go thou nazi right say we take the most devious route but approach not the vineyard come and hear if a laborer said give the grapes to my wife and children we do not eat him now should you say he eats his own why not what is meant by a laborer a nazir but the case of a nazir has been taught and also that of a laborer were they then taught together come and hear whence do we know that if a laborer said give the fruit to my wife and children he is not eaten from the verse but thou shalt not put any in thy vessel and should you reply this to refers to a nazir if so is it on account of but thou shalt not put any in thy vessel surely it is because go Go thou not to write we say etc. That is indeed so but since he is referred to as a laborer the verse relating to a laborer is cited come and here if one engages a laborer to dry fixed Talmud, Mas Baba Mitzia the laborer may eat and is exempt from tithes but if he stipulates I accept the work on condition that I and my son eat or that my son eat for my wage he may eat and is exempt and his son may eat but is liable now should you say he eats his own why is his son liable said Rabbana. Because it looks like purchase come and here if one engages laborers to work upon his fourth year plantings they may not eat but if he the employer did not inform them that they were of the fourth year he must redeem the fruit and let them eat it now should you say he eats of heaven's gift why must he redeem the fruit and let them eat it surely the all merciful conferred no privilege upon them in respect of that which is forbidden there it is because it looks like an erroneous. Bargain if so consider the second clause if his fixed cakes were broken or if his barrels of wine burst open they may not eat but if he did not inform them he must tie the fruit and wine and let them partake thereof now should you say he eats of heaven's gift why must he tie and let them eat surely the all merciful conferred no privilege upon him in respect of what is forbidden and should you reply here too it is because otherwise it looks like an erroneous bargain I can rejoin. Now as for the breaking of his fig cakes it is well since it does look like an erroneous bargain but if his barrels burst where is the erroneous bargain surely he the laborer knew that they were people in respect of tithes Arshis he replied it means that his barrels burst open into the tank but has it not been taught wine is subject to tithes when it descends into the tank this agrees with our Akiba who ruled it is not liable until the scum is removed so that they, the laborers can say. To him we did not know thereof but can he not retort the possibility of its having been schemed should have occurred to you it refers to a locality where the same person who draws the wine from the tank into barrels first schemes it and now that our Zibid learned out of the Beritha of our Ashai wine is subject to tithes when it is run into the tank and schemed our Akiba said when it is schemed in barrels you may even say that the barrels did not burst open into the tank yet they can say we did. Not know that it had been schemed, but can he not say to them the possibility of its having been schemed should have occurred to you? It refers to a place where the same person who closes it also schemes it. Come and here a man may stipulate to receive payment instead of eating for himself his son or daughter that are of age, his manservant and maidservant that are of age, and his wife because they have understanding, but he may not stipulate thus for his son or daughter that are minors, his manservant or maidservant that are minors, nor in respect of his beasts because they have no understanding. Now it is being assumed that he provides them with food. Should you then say that he the laborer eats of heaven's gift, it is well. Consequently, one may not stipulate to deprive them of their rights, but if you maintain that he eats of his own, let him stipulate thus even for minors. In this case, it means that he does not provide them with food. If so, for adults too, he cannot. Stipulate thus adults know their rights and forego them but our Hashai taught a man may stipulate as above for himself and his wife but not in respect of his beast for his son and daughter if adults but not if minors for his Canaanite manservant and maidservant whether adults or minors now presumably both mean that he provides them with food and they differ in the following one master sc that of the Beritha maintains that he the laborer eats of his own whereas the other holds that he eats of heavens no all hold that he eats his own yet there is no difficulty here in the Mishnah he does not provide them with food whereas in the Beritha he does how do you explain it that he provides them with food if so let him stipulate for his son and daughter if minors too the all merciful did not privilege him to cause distress to his son and daughter now how do you explain the Mishnah that he does not provide them with food Talmud, Mas Baba Mitzia, that agrees with the view. That the master cannot say to his slave work for me yet I will not feed you but on the view that he can say so what can you answer both teachings therefore deal with the case where he does not provide them with food but they differ on this very matter one master maintains that he can demand their work and refuse their food and the other holds that he cannot then what of our Yohanan who ruled that the master can say this does he forsake the mission and follow the Beritha but all agree that he eats of heaven's gift and he certainly cannot stipulate in what sense then did our Hashai teach that he can stipulate in regard to food and by analogy in respect of an animal a similar arrangement is that the higher should feed it with straw then let him stipulate hence they must differ there in one master SC of the Beritha maintains that he eats his own whereas the other holds that he eats of heaven's gift mission a man may stipulate to receive payment instead of eating for himself his son or daughter that are of age, his manservant and maidservant that are of age, and his wife because they have understanding, but he may not stipulate thus for his son or daughter that are minors, his manservant or maidservant that are minors, nor in respect of his beasts because they have no understanding. If one engages laborers to work upon his fourth year plantings, they may not eat, but if he did not inform them that they were of the fourth year, he must redeem the fruit and let them eat. If his fig cakes were broken or his barrels of wine burst open, they may not eat, but if he did not inform them, he must tie the fruit or wine and let them partake thereof. Those who guard fruits may eat thereof in accordance with general custom, but not by scriptural law. Gemara, those who guard fruits, etc. Rab said this was stated only of those who look after gardens and orchards, but those who guard wine vats and grain stocks may eat even by biblical law in his Rab's opinion. Guarding is counted as labor but Samuel said this was stated only of those who guard wine vats and grain stocks but those who look after gardens and orchards may eat neither by biblical law nor by general custom in his view guarding is not considered labor Araha son of Arhuma raised an objection he who guards the red heifer defile his garments now should you maintain guarding is not considered labor why does he defile his garments Rabbi said as a precautionary measure lest he move a limb thereof Arkahana raised an objection he who guards four or five cucumber beds must not eat his fill of one of them but proportionately of each now if guarding is not considered labor why eat at all Arshai my Ashi replied this refers to those which are removed from the plant but then this work is finished for tithes their blossom had not yet been cut off Arashi said reason support Samuel for we learned now the following laborers may eat by scriptural law he was engaged Upon what is attached to the soil when the labor thereof is completed and upon what is detached etc. This implies that some eat not by scriptural law but in accordance with general custom and consider the second clause but the following do not eat what is meant by do not eat shall we say they do not eat by scriptural law yet eat in accordance with general custom and is it not identical with the first clause hence it must surely mean that they eat neither by scriptural nor by unwritten law. And who are they who is engaged upon that which is attached to the soil before its labor is completed how much more so than they who look after gardens and orchards mission there are four billies a gratuitous billy a borrower a paid billy and a hire a gratuitous billy must swear for everything a borrower must pay for everything a paid billy or a hire must swear concerning an animal that was injured captured in a raid or that perished but must pay for loss or theft tomorrow which tana. Maintains that there are four billies Arnaman said in Rabbi Abba's name it is Armeir said Rabbi to Arnaman does any Tana dispute that there are four billies he replied I mean this which Tana holds that a higher ranks as a paid billy Armeir but we know Armeir to hold the reverse for it has been taught how does a higher pay Armeir said as an unpaid billy our Judah ruled as a paid one Rabbi Abba learned it reverse if so are therefore surely there are only three Arnaman B Isaac replied there are indeed four billies but they fall into three classes a shepherd was once pasturing his beast by the banks of the river Papa when one slipped and fell into the water and was drowned he then came before Rabbi who exempted him from liability with the remark what could he have done Talmud Mas Baba Mitzia B he guarded them as people guard Abba protested if so
with the assistance of other shepherds and staves if so what particularly a paid billy the same applies even to an unpaid one for you yourself master did say if an unpaid billy could have met the destroyer e.g. align with other shepherds and staves but did not he is responsible an unpaid billy must obtain their help only when he can procure them gratuitously whereas a paid billy must even engage them for payment and to what extent up to their value but where do we find that a paid trustee is responsible for accidents subsequently he collects the money from the owner said our papa to obey if so how does he benefit him it makes a difference on account of the attachment of the animals or the additional trouble are his and rabbi son of our who not disagree with rabbi's dictum for they maintain the owner can say i paid you wages precisely in order that you should guard with greater care bar out of the carrier was leading beast across the bridge of Naresh when one beast pushed Another and threw it into the water on his appearing before our papa the latter held him responsible but what was I to do he protested you should have led them across one by one he replied do you know of your sister's son that he could have led them across one by one he asked your predecessors before you have already complained but none pay heed to them he replied Abu and trusted flax to Rania then Shabu came and stole it from him but subsequently the thief's identity became known and he did. Trustee came before our Naman who ruled him liable shall we say that he disagrees with Arunabi Abin for Arunabi Abin sent word if the bailment was stolen through an accident and then the thief's identity became known if he was a gratuitous billy he can either swear that he had not been negligent or settle with him if a paid trustee he must settle with him and cannot swear said Rabba their officers were about and had Irania cried out they would have come and protected him Misha. If one wolf attacks IT is not an unavoidable accident, if two attack IT is an unavoidable accident, Arjuna said when there is a general visitation of wolves, even the attack of one is an unavoidable accident, the attack of two dogs is not an unavoidable accident. Jadwa the Babylonian said on Armagir's authority, if they attack from the same side, it is not an unavoidable accident. From two different directions, it is a robber's attack. IS an unavoidable accident, damage done by a lion bear. Leopard, panther, and snake ranks as an unavoidable accident. When is this if they came and attacked of their own accord? But if he the shepherd LED them to a place infested by wild beasts and robbers, it is no unavoidable accident. If it died a natural death, it is an unavoidable accident. But if he maltreated it and it died, it is no unavoidable accident. If it ascended to the top of steep rocks and then fell down, it is an unavoidable accident. But if he took it up to the top of steep rocks and it Fell and died, it is no unavoidable accident, Gamara, but has it not been taught the attack of one wolf is an accident? Arnaman B. Isaac replied, That is when there is a visitation of wolves and is Arjuna's view that attack of a robber is an unavoidable accident, but why so let man stand against man? Said Rab, this refers to an armed robber. The scholars propounded what of an armed robber and an armed shepherd do we say man must stand against man, or perhaps the former is prepared to risk his life. But this cannot be expected of the latter reason teaches that the one risks his life, but not the other. Abbe asked Rabba what if the shepherd met him as see the robber and said to him, Thou vile thief, we are stationed in such and such a place, Talmud, Mas Baba Metia, we have this number of men, this number of dogs, so many sharpshooters are assigned to us, and he came and robbed him of them. He replied, Then he has led them to the place of wild beasts and robbers, mission a gratuitous billy may. Stipulate to be free from an oath a borrower from payment a paid billy and a hirer from an oath or payment a stipulation contrary to a scriptural enactment is null also every stipulation which is preceded by the action is null and whatever can be fulfilled eventually and it is stipulated at the outset the stipulation is valid Gemara but why so is it not a stipulation contrary to scriptural law which is null this agrees with Arjuna who maintained in civil matters the stipulation is valid for it has been taught if one says to a woman behold thou art betrothed unto me on condition that thou hast upon me no claims of sustenance rhyme and conjugal rights she is betrothed but the condition is null this is our mayor's view Arjuna said in respect of money matters his condition is valid but can you assign it to Arjuna then consider the second clause a stipulation contrary to a scriptural enactment is null does not disagree with our mayor that is no difficulty in truth it is Arjuna's view. But this second clause does not refer to civil matters, then consider the latter clause. Every stipulation which is preceded by an action is null. Now, whom do you know to hold this view? Armadier, for it has been taught Abba Halaft of Farhan and I said on Armadier's authority, if the condition is stated before the act, it is valid. If the reverse, it is not, but it is all in accordance with Armadier. Yet here it is different because at the very outset he accepted no liability, it has been taught and paid. Billy may stipulate to be liable as a borrower, how with mere words said Samuel, if he acquires it from his hand, Aryohan and said, you may even say that he does not acquire it from his hand, yet in return for the benefit he receives and that he achieves thereby reputation for being trustworthy, he renders himself fully responsible and whatever can be fulfilled eventually, etc. Our tabla said in Rab's name, this is the view of Arjuna B. Tima, but the sages say even if it is impossible to fulfill it. Eventually and one stipulates it at the beginning the stipulation is valid for it has been taught if one says here is thy divorce on condition that thou ascendest to heaven or descendest to the deep on condition that thou swallowest a hundred cubic cane or crossest the great sea on foot if the condition is fulfilled the divorce is valid but not otherwise Arjuna Bhitima said in such a case it is a valid divorce Arjuna Bhitima stated a general rule that which can never be fulfilled and he the husband stipulates it at the beginning it is only to repel her and is valid Arnaman said in Rab's name the Halachag says Arjuna Bhitima Arnaman B. Isaac said Armishna 2 proves it for it states whatever can be fulfilled eventually and it is stipulated at the outset the stipulation is valid hence if it is impossible of fulfillment the stipulation is null this proves it C-H-A-P-T-E-R-V-I-I Mishnah if a man borrows a cow and borrows or hires its owner with it or if he first hires it Owner and then borrows the cow and it dies, he is not responsible for it is written, but if the owner thereof be with it, he shall not make it good Talmud, Mas Baba Metzia be, but if he first borrows the cow and only subsequently borrows or hires its owner and it dies, he is liable as it is written, the owner thereof not being with it, he shall surely make it good Gemara since the second clause states and then borrows the cow, it follows that when the first clause reads with IT, it is literally meant. But is it possible that it shall be literally with IT, the cow is acquired only by Meshika, whereas its owner is acquired by his promise, I can answer either that the cow was standing in the borrower's courtyard so that Meshika is not wanting, or alternatively that he the borrower said to him, You yourself are not lent to me until I perform Meshika on your cow. We have learned elsewhere there are four billies, a gratuitous billy, a borrower, a paid billy, and a hire a gratuitous billy swears. For everything a borrower pays for everything a paid billy or a hire swears concerning an animal that was injured, captured, or that perished, but pays for loss or theft. Whence do we know these things for our rabbis taught the first section refers to a gratuitous billy, the second to a paid one, and the third to a borrower. Now as for the third referring to a borrower, it is well for it is explicit, and if a man borrow out of his neighbor and it be hurt or die, the owner thereof being not with it. He shall surely make it good, but as for the first treating of an unpaid billy and the second of a paid one, perhaps it is the reverse, it is reasonable to assume that the second refers to a paid billy since he is responsible for theft and loss. On the contrary, is it not more logical that the first refers to a paid billy since he is liable to restitution of twice the principal in a false plea of theft, even so to pay the principal without the option of an oath is a heavier liability. Then to pay double after a false oath the proof being that the borrower though all the benefit is his yet pays only the principal but is it so that in the case of the borrower all the benefit is his but does it see the animal borrowed not require food it is all his when it the animal is standing on a common but it needs special guarding where there is a town watch alternatively do not say all the benefit is his but most of the benefit is his or again refer it to the borrowing of utensils a paid billy or a hire swears concerning an animal that was injured captured or perished but pays for loss or theft now as for theft it is well for it is written and if it indeed be stolen from him he shall make restitution unto the owner thereof but whence do we know it of loss for it has been taught and if it indeed be stolen from this I know only theft whence do I know loss from the expression and if it indeed be stolen implying no matter how it disappears now that agrees with the view that we do
His neighbor and it be hurt or die or extends the logic captured but is not this or needed as a disjunctive for I might think that he is responsible only if it is injured and also dies therefore scripture states otherwise now on our Jonathan's view it is well but on our Joshua's what can you say for it has been taught for any man that curseth his father and his mother shall surely be put to death from this I know only that he is punished for cursing his father and his mother once do I know the same if he cursed his father without his mother or his mother without his father from the passage his father and his mother he hath cursed his blood shall be upon him implying a man that cursed his father a man that cursed his mother this is our Joshua's opinion our Jonathan said the beginning of the verse implies either the two together or each separately Talmud Mas Babamitia unless the verse had explicitly stated together you may say so even according to our Joshua it sc or is Unnecessary here for the purpose of separation why it is a matter of logic what is the difference whether it is wholly killed or only partly once do we know that a borrower is responsible for theft and loss and should you say it follows from injury and death I would rejoin as for these he is responsible because it is impossible to take the trouble of finding it again will you then say the same in the case of theft and loss seeing that with trouble it may be found but it may be derived. Even as it has been taught and if a man borrow out of his neighbor and it be hurt or die from this I know the law only for injury and death once do I know it for theft and loss you can reason a minority of a paid billy who is not responsible for injury and death is nevertheless liable for theft and loss and a borrower who is liable for the former is surely liable for the latter too and this is a minority argument which cannot be refuted why state that it cannot be refuted for. Should you object it may be refuted thus as for a paid billy he is responsible for theft and loss because he must make restitution of twice the principal if discovered in a false plea of loss through an armed robber I would reply yet notwithstanding the fact that the borrower is responsible for the principal is a greater severity alternatively he maintains that an armed robber is a gaslin we have thus learned responsibility once do we know freedom from liability and should you say it is deduced from injury and death it might be argued as for these he is free because they are unavoidable accidents but it follows from a paid billy and once do we know it of a paid billy himself the liability of a paid billy is equated to that of a borrower just as there when the owner is lent for personal service he has see the borrower is free thereof so here too in the case of a paid billy when the owner is lent for personal service he is free thereof how is this deduced if by Analogy that may be refuted as in fact we have refuted it since the SC injury etc are accidents but scripture says and if a man borrow the bob copulative and indicates conjunction with the preceding subject and the upper section is determined by the lower but even so the law of the borrower cannot be deduced from that of a paid billy since it the similarity may be refuted as for a paid billy that SC is non-liability for theft when the owner is in his services because he is exempt in the case of injury and death will you say the same of a borrower who is liable for these but reason this once do we know that a borrower is liable for theft and loss at all is it not because we deduce it from a paid billy then it is sufficient that the conclusion of an minority proposition shall be as its premise just as theft and loss in the case of a paid billy when the owner is in his service impose no liability so also with respect to theft and loss in the case of a Borrower when the owner is in his service there is no responsibility now that is well on the view that we accept this limitation but on the view that rejects it what can you say but answer the scripture says and if a man borrow the bob indicates conjunction with the preceding subject and so the lower section illuminates the upper and is itself illumined thereby it has been stated when there is culpable negligence on the part of an unpaid billy and the owner is in his service are aha and rub in a dispute there and one maintains that he is liable the other that he is exempt he rules that he is liable maintains that a scriptural verse may be interpreted as applying to the immediately preceding subject but not to the one anterior thereto consequently but if the owner thereof be with it etc does not refer to a gratuitous billy on the other hand negligence as a cause of liability is not stated in connection with a paid billy and a borrower therefore liability for negligence. In the case of the paid billy and borrower two follows a minority from a gratuitous billy but that there should be no liability for it when the owner is in their service that cannot be maintained even in respect of a paid billy and a borrower why so because when scripture states in respect of a borrower and a paid billy but if the owner thereof be with it he shall not make it good it refers only to those cases of liability which are explicitly stated whilst he who maintains that he is not responsible is of the opinion that the verse may be interpreted as bearing upon the preceding subject and the one anterior thereto hence when it is stated but if the owner thereof etc it refers to a gratuitous billy too we learned if a man borrows a cow and borrows its owner with it or borrows a cow and hires the owner with it or if he first borrows or hires the owner and then borrows the cow and it dies he is not responsible but a gratuitous billy is not mentioned but even on your Reasoning is that a paid billy mentioned hence it must be said the tana states only what Talmud, Mas Babamitia B is explicitly written and not what is exegetically derived come in here if he borrows it sc the animal and borrows its owner along with it if he hires it and hires the owner with it if he borrows it and hires the owner along with it or if he hires it and borrows its owner with it even if the owner is working elsewhere and it dies he is not liable now it was assumed that this tana agrees with our Judah that a higher ranks as a paid billy thus we see that this tana includes what is derived exegetically yet omits an unpaid trustee this agrees with our Meir who maintains that a higher ranks as a gratuitous trustee and so he states the law of an unpaid billy and the same applies to a paid billy if you wish I can say it is as Rabbi Biabo reversed the dispute and taught how does a higher pay our Meir said as a paid billy our Judah said as an unpaid billy are. Hamnana said he is always responsible unless at the bailment be a cow and he its owner plows there within the bailey service or an ass and he drives it along and unless the owner is in the bailey service from the time the loan is made until it is injured or dies thus we see that in his view but if the owner thereof be with it refers to the whole transaction robber raised an objection if he borrows it sc the animal and borrows its owner along with it if he hires it and hires it owner with it if he hires it and borrows its owner with it or if he borrows it and hires the owner along with it even if the owner is working elsewhere and it dies he is not liable surely that means on different work no it means on the same work as the animal was doing then how can it be elsewhere it means that he went along breaking up the ground ahead of it but since the second clause refers to working near it it follows that the first clause means actually a different work for the second clause states if he first borrows it, sc the animal and then borrows its owner if he hires it and then hires its owner with it even if the owner is plowing at its side and it perishes he the borrower or hire is responsible I will tell you both the first clause and the last refer to the same work and the first clause teaches something of noteworthy interest and the second likewise the first clause teaches something of noteworthy interest though he the owner is actually by its side but yet engaged on the same work since the owner was in his service from the time the loan was made he the billy is not responsible and the second likewise teaches us something of noteworthy interest though he the owner is by its side yet since the owner was not in his service from the time of the loan he is responsible how so now if you concede that the first clause refers to different work and the second to the same it is well that very fact is remarkable but if you suggest that both the first clause and the second refer to the same work what is there remarkable both are on the same work and moreover it has been taught from the verse but if the owner thereof be with it he shall not make it good do and not know by implication that if the owner thereof is not with it that he must make it good why then is it explicitly stated and the owner thereof not being with it he shall surely make it good to teach you if he is in his service when the loan is made he need not be so at the time of injury or death but though in his service at the time of injury or death he must also have been so with him at the time of loan and another bury the further taught from the verse the owner thereof being not with it he shall surely make it good do and not know by implication that if the owner thereof is in his service that he is free from liability why then is it stated but if the owner thereof be with it etc to teach you once that the animal has left the lender's possession it's Owner being simultaneously in his service even for a single hour and it dies he the borrower is free from liability the complete refutation of our Hamana is indeed unanswerable Abbe holding with our Joshua explains the verses in accordance with him Rob agreeing with our Jonathan interprets them on the basis of his views thus Abbe holding with our Joshua explains the verses in accordance with him the owner thereof being not with it he shall surely make it good hence it is only because he was not with him on both occasions but if he were with him on one occasion but not
shall not make it good. This too implies whether he is not with him on both occasions or only on one he is liable. Hence this contradiction is to teach you if he was with him at the time of the loan he need not have been with him at the time of the injury or death but though he were with him at the time of the injury or death he must also have been with him when the loan was made but may I not reverse it. It is logical that the time of the loan is stronger in remitting liability and that it brings that the animal into his possession on the contrary are not injury and death more likely to cancel responsibility since he then becomes actually liable for accidents were there no loan what would injury and death effect but if not for injury and death what liability is imposed by borrowing even so the responsibility imposed by borrowing is greater since he thereby becomes responsible for his food or as she said scripture said and if a man borrow out of his neighbor implying out of his neighbor but not his neighbor with it, see the animal then he shall surely make it good hence if his neighbor is with him when he borrows he is free from liability if so what is the need of the owner thereof being not with but if the owner thereof be with it but for these I should have thought that this sc out of his neighbor is the ordinary scriptural idiom Rami Bihama propounded what is the law if he borrows it in order to commit bestiality therewith must be loan bs people generally borrow whereas people do not borrow for such a purpose or perhaps the reason is because of the pleasure he derives from the loan in which case here too he has pleasure what again is the law if he borrows it for appearance's sake is it necessary that something of monetary value shall be lent which condition is fulfilled here or perhaps something of monetary value by which he the borrower directly benefits is required which is not the case here what if he Borrows it for work worth less than a parata must there be monetary value and there is some or perhaps less than a parata is of no account what if he borrows two cows for a parata's value of work do we say consider the borrower and lender and there is monetary value or perhaps the criterion is the work of the cows and in that of each there is none what if he borrows from partners one of whom lends himself to him must all its owners be in the belly service which condition is absent. Here or perhaps he after all bears no liability for his half what if partners borrow and he the animal's owner lends himself to one of them must there be a pledge of service to all the borrowers which however is absent here or perhaps for that half of the partnership to which he is pledged there is no responsibility what if he borrows from a woman and her husband pledges his service or what if a woman borrows and he the owner lends himself to her husband is a title to use a to say title in the principle itself or is it not Robin asked Arashi what if one says to his agent go and loan yourself for service on my account together with my cow must there actually be its SC the bailment's owner which is absent here or perhaps a man's agent is as himself hence the condition is fulfilled said Araha the son of Arawiya to Arashi as for the husband that is disputed by Aryohanan and Reshlakish with reference to an agent that is disputed by Arjonathan and Arjashi as for the husband that is disputed by Aryohanan and Reshlakish for it has been stated if one sells his field to his neighbor for its usufruct Aryohanan said he must bring the first fruits and recite the confession Reshlakish maintained he brings the first fruits but does not recite the confession Aryohanan said he must bring the first fruits and recite the confession because he holds that a title to usufruct is equal to a title to the principle itself Reshlakish maintained he brings the First fruits but does not recite a title to use a fruct is not as a title to the principle itself with reference to an agent that is disputed by Arjonathan and Arjashia for it has been taught if one says to his epitrophus all vows which my wife may vow from now until I return from such a place and all for her and he does so I might think that they are annulled therefore scripture writes her husband may establish it or her husband may make it void this is Arjashia's view Arjonathan said we find in the whole Torah that a man's agent is legally as himself or Eilish asked Rabba what is the law if one says to his slave go and loan yourself together with my cow the problem arises whether it be maintained that a man's agent is as himself or not thus the problem arises on the view that a man's agent is as himself for that may apply only to an agent who is subject to scriptural commands but not to a slave who is not subject thereto or on the other hand even on the view that a man's agent is not as himself that may hold good of an independent agent but as for a slave the hand of a slave is as the hand of his master he replied it is logical that the hand of a slave is as the hand of his master Rami Bihama propounded does the husband rank as a borrower in his wife's property Talmud, Mas Baba Mitzia B or as a hirer said Rabba his very subtlety has led him into error what will you if he ranks as a borrower it is alone when the owner is in his service if a hirer it is a hiring in similar circumstances but when does Rami Bihama's problem arise if he hired a cow from her and then married her what is the law then does he rank as a borrower or as a hirer does he rank as a borrower and so the present loan when the owner is in his service abrogates hiring effected when the owner was not in his service or perhaps he ranks as a hirer and the status of a hirer remains unchanged but wherefore this differentiation if it is maintained that should he rank as borrower the Borrowing affected when the owner is in his service cancels the hiring affected without the owner being engaged in his service why not apply the same principle even if he is considered a hire and say that the new hiring affected with the owner in his service abrogates the old hiring affected without the owner's being in his service but when does Rami Bihama's problem arise e.g. if she hired a cow from a stranger and then was married not to the owner now on the view of the rabbis who maintain that the borrower must pay the hire there is no problem for it is certainly a case of a loan plus the owner's service where the problem arises is on the view of our Jose who ruled the cow must be returned to its first owner hence the question what is the law then does he rank as a borrower or as a hire said Robert the husband ranks neither as a borrower nor as a hire but as a purchaser this follows from the dictum of our Jose son of our Hannah for our Jose son of our Hannah said in Ishaya. Was enacted if a woman sells of her property of plucking in her husband's lifetime and then dies her husband as her heir can claim it from the purchaser Rami Bihama propounded when the husband obtains the privilege of usufruct in his wife's property which belonged to Ishu is liable to a trespass offering Rabba thereupon observed who then should be liable to a trespass offering the husband he is willing to acquire a right in what is permitted but not in what is forbidden the wife. But she herself does not particularly wish him the husband to acquire even what is permitted the Beth Din when did the rabbis enact that the husband ranks as a purchaser only in respect of what is permitted not in respect of what is forbidden but said Rabba the husband is liable to a trespass offering when he actually expends it just as in general when one withdraws money of Ish and converts it into Holland the scholars propounded what if the borrowed animal became emaciated. Through its work said one of the rabbis are healthier the son of Arawi by name then it follows that if it died through the work he is certainly responsible but let him say to him the lender I did not borrow for exhibition in a showcase but said Rabbi not only is it unnecessary to state that if it became emaciated through work he is not responsible but even if it died through work he is still not liable because he can say I did not borrow it that it should stand in a showcase a man once borrowed an axe from his neighbor and it broke when he came before Rabbi he said to him go and bring witnesses that you did not put it to foreign use and you are free from liability but what if there are no witnesses come and here for a man once borrowed an axe from his neighbor and it broke when he came before Rabbi he said to him go and return him a good axe said Arkahana and Arasi to Rab Talmud Mas Baba Mitzia is that the law thereupon Rab was silent and indeed the law agrees with Arkahana and R.C. that he returns him the broken axe and makes up its full value a man borrowed a bucket from his neighbor and it broke when he came before our papa he said to him go and bring witnesses that you did not put it to foreign use and you will be free from liability a man borrowed a cat from his neighbor the mice then formed the united party and killed it now R.C. sat and pondered thereon how is it in such a case is it as though it had died through its work or not thereupon our Mordecai said to our Ashi thus did Abami of Patronia say in Rabba's name a man whom woman killed for him there is no judgment nor judge others say it ate many mice whereby it sickened and died now R.C. sat and cogitated thereon how is it in this case said our Mordecai to R.C. thus did Abami of Patronia say a man whom woman killed for him there is no judgment nor judge Rabba said if a man wishes to borrow something from his neighbor and yet be free from responsibility he should say to him give me a drink of Water so that it constitutes a loan together with the owner's service, but if he the lender is wise, he should answer him first, borrow it by threshing with it, and then I will give you a drink. Rabba said a teacher of children, a gardener, a butcher, a cupper, and a town barber, all if
Thereupon the rabbis protested to Rabba, but it was theft whilst the owner was in their service. But subsequently it was ascertained that he had gone out to supervise its loading mission. If one borrows a cow, borrowing it for half a day and hiring it for half a day, or if he borrows it for one day and hires it for the next, or if he hires one and borrows another and one cow dies, the lender asserting that the borrowed one died or it died on the day when it was borrowed. Talmud, Mas Baba Mitzia B. Or during the hour for which it was borrowed, and the other replies, I do not know. He must pay if the hire asserts the hired one died or it died on the day when it was hired or it died during the hour for which it was hired. And the other replies, I do not know. He is not liable. But if one asserts that it was the borrowed one and the other that it was the hired one, the hire must swear that the hired one died, which frees him from liability. If the one says I do not know and the other says I do not. No, they must divide Gemara. Hence, it follows that if A says to be you only a and B pleads, I do not know. He is bound to pay. Shall we say that this refutes Arnaman? For it has been taught if A says to be you only a and B pleads, I do not know. Arunah and Rav Judah rule that he must pay Arnaman and Aryohan and say he is not liable. It is as Arnaman answered elsewhere. E.g., there is a dispute between them involving an oath. So here too, it means that there is a dispute between them involving an oath. What is meant by a dispute involving an oath is Rabbis dictum Talmud. Mas Baba Metia for Rabbis said if A says to be you only a to which he replies, I certainly owe you fifty zuz. And as for the rest, I do not know since he cannot swear he must pay all on these lines. The first clause of our mission is conceivable when two and the second when three cows are involved. Thus the first clause when two are involved, A said to be I gave you two cows loan for. Half a day and hired for half, or he says they were loaned for one day and hired for another, and both died during the time they were borrowed. To which be replied, one indeed did die then, but as for the other, I do not know whether it was during the time it was borrowed or the period of hire, since he cannot swear he must pay. And the second clause, where three cows are involved, thus a said to be, I gave you three cows, two loaned and one hired, and the two loaned ones died. To which the borrower replied, "Tis true that one borrowed animal died, but as for the other, I do not know whether the borrowed one died and the one alive is the hired one, or the hired one died and the one alive is the borrowed, since he cannot swear he must pay." And according to Rami Bihama, who maintained that the four billies must partially deny and partially admit liability, the first clause is possible only when three and the second when four animals are involved. The first clause when three are involved, a said. To be I gave you three cows half a day on loan and half on hire or he says I gave you them one day on loan and one on hire and the three died all in the period when they were borrowed to which the borrower replied as for one the claim is entirely unfounded I never received it the second did die in the period when it was borrowed of the third I do not know whether it died during the time it was borrowed or the period when it was hired since he cannot swear he must pay in the second clause. Where four animals are involved a said to be I gave you four cows three loaned and one hired and the three loaned ones died to which the borrower replied Talmud, Mas Baba Metzia B as for one the claim is entirely unfounded with respect to the second it is true that the borrowed one died and as to the others I do not know whether it was the hired one that died and the one alive is the borrowed one or whether it was the borrowed one that died and the one alive is the hired one and since he cannot. Swear he must pay, but if one asserts that it was the loaned one and the other that it was the hired one, the hirer must swear that the hired one died. But why so? What he claims from him, he does not admit, and what he admits, he does not claim. Said Ula, he swears through the superimposition of an oath, for he, the lender, can demand you must at least swear that it died of natural causes. And since you must swear, thus swear also that the hired one died. If both say, I do not know, they must divide. Who is the author of the Simicus who ruled when money lies in doubt? It is divided. Our Abu Bimamel propounded what is the ruling if the borrowing was made together with the owner's service, but subsequently if the bailment was hired without the owner, do we say the borrowing stands alone and the hiring stands alone, or perhaps the hiring is a continuation of the loan since he is responsible for theft and loss? And should you rule that hiring is a continuation of the loan? What if he hired? It together with the owner's service and then borrowed it without the owner shall we say that borrowing is certainly not included in hiring or perhaps being partly related thereto it is wholly related thereto and should you rule that we do maintain that partial relationship is regarded as complete relationship what if one borrowed it with the owner's service hired it without the owner's and borrowed it again without the owner does the borrowing revert to its former status or perhaps the hiring breaks the connection likewise if it was hired with the owner's service then borrowed and then hired again the last two without do we say the hiring reverts to its former status or perhaps the intermediate borrowing breaks the connection these problems remain unsolved mission if a man borrows a cow and he the lender sends it to him by his son servant or agent or by the son servant or agent of the borrower and it dies on the road he is not liable but if the borrower said to him Send it to me by my son servant or agent or by your son servant or agent or if the lender said to him I am sending it to you by my son servant or agent or by your son servant or agent and the borrower replied send it and he sent it and it died on the road he is responsible and the same holds good when he returns it Talmud Mas Baba Metzia Gemara if he sends it by his SC the lender servant why does the mission state that he is liable is not the hand of the servant as the hand of his master said Samuel this refers to a Hebrew servant whose body does not belong to him his master Rab said it may refer even to a heathen servant yet it is considered as though he the borrower said to him strike it with a stick and it will come to me an objection is raised if one borrows a cow and sends it to him the borrower by his son or agent he is liable for accidents on the road by his servant he is not now on Samuel's view it is well our mission refers to a Hebrew servant. Bury the to a heathen servant, but according to Rab, is there not a difficulty? Rab can answer you, do not answer above. It is considered as though he said to him, etc. It means that he had actually said to him, strike it with a stick and it will come, for it has been stated if a said to be lend me your cow, and he asked him, by whose hand shall I send it to which he replied, strike it with a stick and it will come, said Arnaman in the name of Rabbi Biabu in Rab's name once it leaves the lender's possession and it dies, he the borrower is responsible. Shall we say that the following bury the supports him if a said to be lend me your cow, and he asked him, by whose hand shall I send it to which he replied, hit it with a stick and it will come once it leaves the lender's possessions and it dies, he the borrower is responsible. Arashi said, no, for we deal here with a case where the borrower's court was within the lender, so that when he sends it, it will certainly go there if so I stated it is necessary to state it only when there are narrow passages in various directions in the courtyard. I might think that he the borrower does not place full reliance on its coming to him, for perhaps it may stand there as see in a bot path and not come to him. Therefore we are taught that he places full reliance that it will come. Arhuna said if a man borrows an axe from his neighbor and he cleaves with there with he acquires it. If he does not cleave with there with he does not acquire it in what respect shall we say in respect of unavoidable accidents, but wherein does it differ from a cow for which he is responsible from the time of the loan, hence in respect of returning it once he cleaves with there with the lender cannot retract, if not the lender can retract now he Arhuna is in conflict with RMI for RMI said if a man lends an axe belonging to the sanctuary he is liable for trespass in respect of its goodwill value and his neighbor may use it. Forthwith now if he the borrower does not acquire it until he actually uses it why is he the lender liable for trespass and why may his neighbor use it forthwith let him return it gain no title thereto and so not be liable for trespass he or who not is also in conflict with our Eliezer for our Eliezer said just as they, the rabbis instituted Meshika for purchasers so did they institute Meshika for Belize it has been taught likewise just as they instituted Meshika for purchasers so did they institute Meshika for Belize and just as Talmud Mas Baba Metzia B real estate is acquired by means of money a deed or hazaka so is hiring affected by the same means but what has hiring to do with these are his da said it refers to the renting of real estate Samuel said if a man robbed his neighbor of a cake of pressed dates containing fifty dates which sold together bring fifty brutas less one whilst sold separately realize fifty brutas in the case of secular property he must. Repay 49 perutas in the case of Hittish, he must pay 50 plus the fifth thereof. This, however, is not so in the case of one who injures property belonging to Hittish, for such a one does not add a fifth for a
Dictum for Rabba Sedhif without its owner's knowledge is a secular property with its owner's knowledge. Rabba Sedhif carriers broke a shopkeeper's barrel of wine which on the market day is sold for five zoos but on other days for four if they make a return on the market day they return a barrel of wine but if on other days they must return five zoos that however holds good only if he had no other wine for sale but if he had some left after the market then he should have sold that. And they deduct the payment for his trouble and the value of the tapping Talmud, Mas Baba Mitzia Mishnah if a man exchanged a cow for an ass and a calf and likewise if he sold his maidservant and she bore a child the one maintaining it was before I sold her whilst the other said it was after I bought her they must divide if he the vendor had two servants one an adult and the other a child or likewise two fields one large and one small the purchaser maintaining I bought the large one. Whilst the other says I do not know he acquires the large one if the vendor says I sold the small one and the other says I do not know he receives only the small one if one of the vendee claims that it was the large one and the other that it was the small one the vendor must swear that he had sold the small one if this one says I do not know and the other says I do not know they must divide tomorrow why should they divide let us see in whose possession it is see the calf or child is and then apply. To the other the principal he who claims from his neighbor has the onus of bringing proof our high be and said in Samuel's name it means that if the calf was standing in the meadow the maidservant too was in the market stand and let us presume the ownership of the first master and apply to the other the principal he who claims from his neighbor bears the onus of proof this agrees with Simicus who ruled when the ownership of property is in doubt it is divided among the claimants without. An oath now when did Simicus rule thus where each claimant pleads perhaps it is mine but did he maintain it likewise when each states I am certain said Rabbi son of Arhu not even so Simicus ruled thus even when each states I am certain Rabbi said in truth Simicus ruled thus only when each pleads perhaps but not when each states I am certain but read in the mission of the vendor maintains perhaps it was before I sold her and the vendee perhaps it was after I bought her we learned if this one says I do not know and the other says I do not know they must divide now on Rabbi's view it is well since the last clause refers to when both state perhaps the first may likewise refer to a case where both plead perhaps but according to Rabbi son of Arhu not who maintained indeed Simicus ruled thus even when both plead certain if they divide even on certain claims is it necessary to teach it when their claims are uncertain as for that it is no argument the last clause is. Stated in order to throw light on the first viz that you should not say that the first clause refers only to a doubtful plea on both sides but where both contend with certainty it is not so therefore the last clause teaches the case of perhaps on the part of both from which it follows that the first refers to a plea of certainty by both and even then they must divide we learned if one of Vendee claims that it was a large one and the other the vendor that it was a small one it vendor must swear that he had sold the small one now on Rabba's view that Simicus gave his ruling only where each claimant is uncertain but not when they are both positive it is well hence he must swear but according to Rabba's son of Arhuna who maintained that the ruling of Simicus does indeed hold good even when both are positive why should the vendor swear let them divide Simicus admits that one must swear where an oath is necessary by biblical law as we interpret this below if he had two servants, one an adult and the other a child, etc. Why should he swear what he claims he does not admit and what he admits he does not claim? Moreover, it is a case of here it is moreover an oath is not taken with respect to slaves. Rab said it means that he demands money. The vendee claims the price of an adult slave, whilst the vendor offers the value of a child slave. Similarly, the value of a large field and that of a small one are involved. Samuel said it means that he the purchaser claims rhyme for an adult slave, and the vendor offers rhyme for a child slave. Or the dispute concerns the sheep of a large field and those of a small one. Talmud, Mas Baba Mitzia, but you say rhyme, but surely what he claims he does not admit and what he admits he does not claim. Even as our Papa said below, when it is on the roll, so here too when it is on the roll. Now this presented a difficulty to our Hashai. Does then the mission state rhyme? It states a slave, but said our Hashai. Means e.g. that he claimed a slave together with his rhyme or a field with its sheep, but still the difficulty remains with respect to rhyme what he claims he does not admit and what he admits he does not claim. Said our papa, it refers to cloth on the roll. This presented a difficulty to our she's hate. Does he the tano wish to teach us that movable property binds immovable? But we have already learned it. Unsecured chattels bind secured property in respect of an oath. But said our she's hate. The tana of the mission is our mayor who maintained that a slave ranks as movable chattels, but the difficulty still remains what he claims he does not admit what he admits he does not claim. He the tana is of our Gamaliel's opinion, for we learned if he the plaintiff claims we, whilst the other the defendant admits owing barley, he is free from an oath. Our Gamaliel held him liable, yet even so it is still a case of here it is said Rabba in the case of the slave which he admitted he did. Seller had cut off his hand, and in the case of the field, he had dug in its pits, ditches, and cavities. But are we not informed that our mayor holds the reverse? For we learned if a man took by violence a cow and it aged or slaves and they aged, he must pay their value at the time of the robbery. Our mayor said, in the case of slaves, he can say to him, the owner, behold, here is yours before you. That is no difficulty. It is as Rabbi Abba reversed the mission and read. Our mayor said he must pay their value at the time of the robbery. But the sages ruled, in the case of slaves, he can say to him, the owner, behold, here is yours before you. But there is this difficulty. How do we know that our mayor holds that real estate is equated to slaves, just as an oath is taken for slaves? So also is an oath taken for real estate. Perhaps in his opinion, there is an oath only in respect of slaves, but not for immovable property. You cannot think so, for it has been taught if a cow is exchanged for an ass and it. Cab likewise if one sells his maidservant and she bore a child one says it happened in my possession and the other is silent the former acquires it if each says I do not know they divide if each pleads it happened in my ownership the vendor must swear that she bore whilst in his possession because all who take an oath in accordance with scriptural law swear to be free from liability this is our mayor's view but the sages rule no oath is taken in respect of slaves or lands surely then it follows that in our mayor's opinion an oath is taken even on lands but how is this to be inferred perhaps they argue by analogy just as you admit to us in the matter of lands that there is no oath so should you admit in respect to slaves the proof is this we learned our mayor said some things are similar to real estate yet do not rank as such but the sages disputed e.g. if it claims from B I delivered you ten laden vines and B replies there were only five our mayor makes him liable but the sages Say that which is attached to the soil is as the soil whereon our Jose son of our Hannah said they differ with respect to grapes which are ready for vintaging. One master S.C. our mayor regards them as already vintage whilst the other maintains that they are not as already vintage but after all it must be explained as our Hashaya and as to your difficulty does the Tana wish to teach that movable property binds immovable it is necessary for I might think that a slave's garment is as the slave. Himself likewise the sheaves of a field are as the field itself therefore we are taught otherwise if each says I do not know they must divide with whom does this agree with Simicus who ruled when the ownership of property is in doubt it is divided then consider the latter clause if each pleads it happened in my ownership the vendor must swear that she bore whilst in his possession now according to Rabbi son of Arhuna who maintained indeed Simicus gave his ruling even where both make. Positive statements why should he swear surely they ought to divide Simicus admits that one must swear when an oath is required by biblical law the circumstances being that he the owner had cut off her se the slave's hand and in accordance with Rabba's explanation mission if one sells his olive trees for their wood and they yield less than a quarter log of oil per se of olives it is the purchasers but if they produce olives yielding a quarter log of oil per se one the purchaser claiming my olive trees produced them and the other the vendor maintaining it was my land which caused the yield they must divide if the river swept away a man's olive trees and deposited them in his neighbor's field and there they produced olives and one maintains my olive trees produced them whereas the other claims my land caused the yield they divide tomorrow how is it meant if he stipulated cut them down immediately then even if the oil yield is less than a quarter Log per SEI it should belong to the landowner whilst if he stipulated cut them down whenever you desire even when it is a quarter log it ought to be the purchasers it is necessary to state this only when he made no stipulation in which case when there is
Planted they would have been small and I could have sown beets and vegetables under them and taught if he said I wish to take my olive trees he is not heated why are you Hanan said that Palestine may be well cultivated said our Jeremiah for such an answer a master is necessary we learned elsewhere our Judah said if one leases a field of his fathers from a heathen he must tithe all the crops and then give him a heathen his share now the scholars understood it thus what is meant by a field of his fathers is Palestine and the reason it is called the field of his fathers is because it is a field of Abraham Isaac and Jacob and here Judah holds a heathen cannot acquire a title in Palestine to free the crops from tithes also one who leases on a percentage is as a renter at a fixed rent just as a renter must tithe crops and pay him whether the field produces or not because it is as repaying a debt so also he who leases a field is as though he were settling a debt and therefore must first tie the crops and then pay him. Our Kahana said to our poppy other state to our Zebit, but what of the Beritha that was taught? Our Judah said, if one leases a field of his fathers from a heathen oppressor, he must tie the crops and pay him his percentage. Why, particularly from an oppressor, does not the same hold good even if he is not an oppressor? But in truth, a heathen can acquire a title in Palestine to free crops from tithes, whilst the lessee is not as a renter and a field of his fathers is meant quite literally. But him, the son, the rabbis penalized because since it is more precious to him than to others, he will go and lease it on such disadvantageous terms, whereas others would not accept it on such terms. But why did the rabbis penalize him? Our Yohanan said, in order that it might come absolutely into his possession, said our Jeremiah, for such an answer, a master is needed. It has been stated, if one enters his neighbor's field and plants it without permission, Rab said. An assessment is made and he is at a disadvantage. Samuel said we estimate what one would pay to have such a field planted said our papa there is no conflict. The latter Samuel refers to a field suitable for planting the former Rab to a field unsuitable for planting. Now this ruling of Rab was not explicitly stated but inferred from a general ruling for a man came before Rab go and assess it for him said he demurred but I do not desire it said he to him go and assess it for him and he shall be at a disadvantage but I do not desire it he reiterated subsequently he saw that he had fenced and was guarding it whereupon he said to him you have revealed your mind that you desire it go and assess it for him and he the planter shall be at an advantage it has been stated if one enters his neighbor's ruins and rebuilds them without permission and then says to him I want my timber and stones back our said his request is granted our hate said his request is not granted an objection. Is raised our Simeon B. Gamaliel said Beth Shammai maintain his request is granted Beth Hillel hold it is not granted shall we then say that our Naman ruled in accordance with Beth Shammai he agrees with the following tenet for it has been taught his request is acceded to this is the opinion of our Simeon B. Eliezer our Simeon B. Gamaliel said Beth Shammai maintain his request is granted Beth Hillel it is not what is our decision on the matter our Jacob said in our Yohanan's name Talmud, Mas Baba Metziabi. In the case of a house his demands are ignored in the case of a field they are granted why so in the case of a field for the sake of the cultivation of Palestine others say because of the impoverishment of the soil wherein do they differ in respect to the diaspora mission if one rents a house to his neighbor in winter he cannot evict him from the festival until Passover in summer he cannot evict him for 30 days in large cities whether in summer or in winter the period is 12. Months, but with respect to shops, whether in towns or in large cities, he need not quit for twelve months. Our Simeon B. Gamaliel said a baker's shop and a dyer's shop are for three years. Gamara, why is it different in winter? Because when one rents a house in winter, it is for the whole of the winter, and does not the same apply to summer. For when one rents a house, it is for the whole summer. But as for winter, this is the reason because houses are not available for renting. Then consider the second clause. But in large cities, whether in summer or in winter, the period is twelve months. Hence, if this period expires in winter, he can evict him. But why, seeing that no house is available for renting, said Rab Judah, this refers to the notice that must be given, and this is what the Mishnah teaches: if one rents his house to his neighbor for an unspecified period, he cannot evict him in winter if the year expires. Then between the festival and Passover, unless he gave him notice in the summer. Thirty days before it has been taught likewise when the sages said thirty days or twelve months it was only in respect of notice and just as the landlord must inform him that he will not renew the lease so must the tenant give notice that he will not re-rent it for otherwise he can say to him had you notified me I would have taken the trouble to find a good tenant for it or as he said if it the lease entered one day into winter he cannot evict him from the festival until Passover but we learn thirty days he means thus if one of these thirty days fell in winter he cannot evict him from the festival until Passover Arhuna said yet if he wishes to increase the rent he can do so Arnam and Demur this is like holding him by the secrets to force him to give up his cloak but this that he can raise the rent holds good only if house rents advanced in general now it is obvious that if his own SC the landlord's house fell in and no notice to quit had been given he can say to him you are no better than I if he sold rented or gifted it to another he the tenant can say to him the new owner you are no better than the man once you derive your rights if he appointed it a home for his son after marriage we consider the matter if it were possible for him the landlord to have informed him that it would be needed for his son then he should have informed him but if not he can say to him you are no better than I a man once bought a boatload of wine having nowhere to store it he asked a certain woman have you a place for renting she replied no so he went and married her whereupon she gave him a place for storage he then went home wrote a divorce and sent it to her so she went hired carriers against that itself and had it put out in the road said Arhuna son of Arjashu as he did so shall be done unto him his requital shall recoil upon his head not only if it is not a courtyard that stands to be rented but even if it is a courtyard that is for Renting, she can say to him, to anybody else, I am willing to rent it, but not to you, because you appear to me like a lion in ambush. Our Simon B. Gamaliel said, a baker's shop and a dyer's shop are for three years. It has been taught because they give very much credit. Mission: If one rents a house to his neighbor, the landlord must provide the door, door bolt, lock, and everything which requires a skilled worker. But what does not require a skilled worker must be done by the tenant. The dung belongs to the landlord, and the tenant is entitled only to that which issues from the oven or the pot range. Our rabbis taught: If a man rents a house to his neighbor, the landlord must erect doors, make the windows, strengthen the ceiling, and support the joists. The tenant must provide the ladder for ascending to the loft, parapet, fix a gutter spout, and plaster his roof. Our she's was asked who must provide the mezuzah. Is then the mezuzah a problem? Did not our measure she say the obligation of the mezuzah? Lies upon the inhabitant, but the question is who must provide the place for the mezuzah said Arshis hate to them we have learned it, but what does not require a skilled worker must be done by the tenant, and this too requires no skill for it can be placed Talmud, Mas Baba Metzia in a wooden tube. Our rabbis taught if one rents a house to his neighbor, the tenant must provide a mezuzah, but when he quits it, he must not take it with him, excepting if it be leased from a gentile, in which case he must remove it when he quits, and it once happened that a man took it away with him and he lost his wife and two children. A story is quoted in contradiction said Arshis hate it refers to the first clause the dung belongs to the landlord, and the tenant is entitled only to that which issues from the oven or the pot range to what does this refer? Shall we say to a courtyard which was rented to the tenant and to oxen belonging to the tenant, then why is it the dung the landlord's but if a courtyard? Which was not leased to the tenant and the landlord's oxen are meant. Is it not obvious? It is necessary to teach this only in respect of a courtyard belonging to the landlord and oxen that had strayed thither from elsewhere. Now this supports our Jose son of Arhana, who said a man's courtyard affects a title on his behalf even without his knowledge. And objection is raised if a man declared any lost property that may enter therein today. Let my courtyard affect possession thereof on my behalf. His declaration is valueless. Now if our Jose son of Arhana is ruling that a man's courtyard affects a title on his behalf even without his knowledge is correct. Why is his declaration valueless? The reference here is to an unguarded courtyard. If so, consider the second clause. If a rumor was spread in town that he had found something, his declaration holds good. Now if it is an unguarded courtyard, what if such a rumor did spread? Since a rumor was spread, people keep aloof from it in recognition of. His ownership and so it becomes as a guarded courtyard an objection is raised the
Now if our Jose son of our Hananist dictum that a man's courtyard affects a title on his behalf without his knowledge is correct then apply here the verse if a bird's nest chance to be before the excluding that which is always at thy disposal Rabbah explained as for the egg when the greater part of it has issued from the body of the fowl it is subject to the law of sending away whilst he the owner of the court does not acquire it until it falls into the courtyard and when it is stated they are subject to the law of sending away it means before it falls into the court if so why are they forbidden as robbery that refers to the dam alternatively it may refer to the eggs after all but when the greater part thereof has issued his intention is set thereon but now that Rab Judah said in Rab's name the eggs must not be taken as long as the dam is sitting upon them for it is written but thou shalt in any wise let the dam go first and only then take the young to the you may say that it holds good even if it the egg fell into his courtyard nevertheless it is subject to the law of sending away because wherever he himself might acquire it his courtyard acquires it for him but where he himself might not acquire it his courtyard cannot acquire it for him either if so are they forbidden as robbery only for the sake of peace if he the stranger sends the dam away it is real robbery whilst if not she is to be sent away this refers to a minor who is not obliged to send her away but is a minor subject to provisions enacted for the sake of peace it means thus the father of the minor must return them for the sake of peace mission if one rents a house to his fellow for a year and the year was intercalated the intercalation is in the tenant's favor if he let it to him by the month and the year was intercalated the intercalation is in the owner's favor it happened in separates that one rented a bathhouse from his neighbor for 12 gold denarii per annum at a gold Dinar per month Talmud, Mas Baba Mitziabi and the matter came before Rabban Simeon and Gamaliel and Arhose who ordered them to divide the intercalated month. Gamara's story is quoted in contradiction of the ruling given the text is defective and is thus meant but if he said to him I let it to you for 12 golden denarii per annum at a golden dinar per month they must share and it happened in Sephiroth that one rented a bathhouse from his neighbor for 12 golden denarii per annum at a gold dinar per month and the matter came before Rabban Simeon and Gamaliel and Arhose who ordered them to divide the intercalated month. Rab said were either I would have awarded the whole of it to the owner now what does this teach us that the last expression alone is regarded but Rab has already said it once for Arhuna said in the name of the college of Rab if the agreed prices in Isra 100 my HS then 100 my HS are due if 100 my HS in Isra are arranged in Isra. Is meant if from there I might have thought that the second term defines the first therefore we are informed otherwise Samuel said we refer to a case where he the landlord comes to claim rent in the middle of the month but if he comes at the beginning it is all the landlords at the end it is all the tenants now did Samuel reject the principle that the last term only is regarded but Rab and Samuel both said if A says to B I sell you a core for 30 sell I'm he can retract even at the last SEO but if he says I sell you a core for 30 a sell per SEO then SEO then he takes each he acquires it the reason there is that he has taken possession so here too has he not taken possession but our nominal ruled land remains in the presumptive possession of its owner now what does this teach us that the last term is decisive but that is Rab's teaching he informs us that it is thus even if the terms were reversed our Jane was asked if the tenant maintains I have paid. Rent and the landlord pleads I have not received it upon whom rests the onus of proof but when does the dispute take place if within the term we have learned it if after we have likewise learned it for we learned if the father died within the 30 days the presumption is that he the firstborn has not been redeemed unless proof is it is to the contrary after 30 days he is presumed to have been redeemed unless told that he was not the question is only when the dispute arises on the day that completes the term does one pay on the day which completes the term or not our Jane replied we have learned it Talmud Mas Baba Mitzi a hired laborer engaged for a period on the expiration of his term swears and his pathers it is only the employee whom the rabbi subjected to an oath because the employer is occupied with his laborers but here the tenant is believed on oath Rabbi said in Arnaman's name if one leased a house to his neighbor for 10 years and wrote a deed to that effect but without dating it and then alleged you have held it for five years he is believed said araha of dipti to rubin if so if a lent be 100 zoos against the bond and then be said i have repaid you half is he also believed he replied what comparison is there in that case the purpose of the bond is to ensure repayment had he really repaid him he should have written the fact on it or obtained a receipt but here he can say the reason i wrote you a deed was that you should not claim ownership through unbroken possession arnaman said one can borrow an article in its good state forever said armari the son of samuel's daughter providing however that he formally acquired it from him armari son of arashi observed he must return him the handle robber said if one asks his neighbor lend me a hoe for hoeing this garden he may hoe only that garden for hoeing a garden he may hoe any garden for hoeing gardens he may hoe all his gardens and return him the handle our papa said if one Says to his neighbor, lend me this well for irrigation, and it falls in, he cannot rebuild it, lend me a well, and it falls in, he can rebuild it, but if he says, lend me the place for a well, he can go on sinking shafts in his land until he chances upon a water supply, it is also necessary that he shall have formally acquired it from him, mission, if one rents a house to his neighbor, and it falls in within the period of lease, he must provide him with another, if it was a small one, he cannot furnish him with a large one, or vice versa, nor can he offer him two instead of one, or one instead of two, he may neither diminish nor increase the number of windows, excepting by common agreement, tomorrow, what are the circumstances, if he stipulated this house, then if it falls, he is quit of any further obligation, whilst if he said a house without specifying which, why cannot he provide two instead of one, or a large house instead of a small, said Reshlakish, it means that he had said to him that House which I let to you is of this length if so why teach it but when Rabin came he said in the name of Reshlakish it means that he said I let you a house like this one but still the difficulty remains why stated it is necessary to teach it only if it the house shown as a model stood on the river bank I might think what is meant by like this one situated on the river bank therefore we are taught otherwise Talmud, Mas Baba Mitzia B-C-H-A-P-T-E-R-I-X mission if one leases a field from his neighbor where it is the usage to cut the crops he must cut to uproot them he must uproot them to plow after it he must plow after it it is all determined by local custom and just as they divide the grain so they also share in the straw and stubble and just as they divide the wine so do they share Talmud, Mas Baba Mitzia B and the branches cut from the vine and the canes used for supporting the vines and both supply the canes Gemara it has been taught where it is the Usage to cut off the crops he must not uproot to uproot he must not cut and each can restrain the other from varying the usual procedure to cut he must not uproot the one the lesser can say I want my field manured with stubble and the other may say it is too much labor to uproot thus to uproot he must not cut the one the lesser can say I wish my field to be cleared of stubble and the other I need the stubble and each can restrain the other from varying the usual procedure why state this this gives the reason thus why may he not uproot when the usage is to cut and vice versa because each can restrain the other to plow after it he must plow after it is this not obvious it is necessary only for a place where weeding is not done whilst the corn is standing and he the less he went and weeded it I might think that he can plead I weeded it in order to be exempt from subsequent plowing therefore we are taught that he should have distinctly stated this Beforehand it is all determined by local custom what does all include it includes that which our rabbis taught where it is customary to lease the trees together with the field they are leased where it is not customary to do so they are not leased where it is customary to lease the trees together with the field they are leased but is this not obvious it must be taught only where fields are generally leased for a third share to be the owners and he went and leased it for a quarter share I might think that he complete I gave it to you at a lower rental on the understanding that you would receive no share of the trees therefore we are informed that he should have distinctly stated this beforehand where it is not customary to do so they are not leased but is it not obvious it must be taught only where it is generally rented for a quarter share and he the less he went and rented it for a third to be received by the lesser I might think that he complete I offered you a higher Rental on the understanding that I would receive a share of the trees we are therefore informed that he should have distinctly stated this just as they divide the grain so they also share in the straw and stubble our Joseph said in Babylon it is the practice not to give a share of the straw to the heiress what is the practical bearing of this that if there is
requires irrigation or this field which contains trees and the spring dries up or the trees are felt he may make a deduction from the rental Gemara how is it meant shall we say the main river dried up then why cannot he reduce the rent let him say it is a universal blow said our papa it means that the tributary dried up by which the water was brought to the field so that he the lesser can say to him Talmud, Mas Baba Metia, you should have brought up the water in buckets our papa said. These first two Mishnahs of this chapter hold good in the cases of both a fixed rental lease and a percentage lease, but in the subsequent Mishnahs, those which apply to a percentage lease do not apply to a fixed rental, and those that apply to a fixed rental do not apply to a percentage lease. But if he said, Lease me this field which requires irrigation, etc., but why so let him the lesser say to him, I merely defined it for you by name, has it not been taught if one says to his neighbor, I sell you a Beth of land, even if it contains only a leaf, each at the bargain is fulfilled because he sold him only a place by name, providing however that it is called Beth I sell you a vineyard, even if it contains no vines, it is a valid sale because he sold him only a name, providing however that it is called vineyard, I sell you an orchard, even if it contains no pomegranates, it becomes his because he sold him only a name, providing that it was called orchard, thus we see that he complete I merely defined it by name so here too let him plead I merely defined it for you by name Samuel replied there is no difficulty in the latter case the lesser stated this to the lessee in the former i.e. the mission of the lessee spoke thus to the lesser if the lesser stated it to the lessee it is mere name if the lessee says it to the lesser it particularizes Robin has said in both cases it means that the lesser stated this to the lessee nevertheless since he states this field it follows that we are Dealing with a case where he is standing there and then why tell him that it is dependent on irrigation hence he must have meant a field dependent on irrigation as now situated mission if one leases a field at a percentage from his neighbor and neglects it we assess it how much it ought to produce and he must pay him the agreed percentage for thus he writes him should I neglect and not till it I will pay of the best Gemara Mayor used to interpret common terms of speech or writing for it. Has been taught our Mayor said if I neglect and do not till it I will pay of the best our Judah used to interpret common terms for it has been taught our Judah said a husband must bring a sacrifice of the rich for his wife and likewise for every obligatory sacrifice of hers because he writes thus for her in the Ketub I undertake your liabilities incurred by you hitherto Hillel the elder used to interpret common speech for it has been taught the men of Alexandria used to betroth their wives and when they were about to take them for the Hapa ceremony, strangers would come and tear them away thereupon the sages wished to declare their children bastards said Hillel the elder to them bring me your mother's kathub as when they brought them he found written therein when thou art taken for the Hapa be thou my wife and on the strength of this they did not declare their children bastards our Joshua Bikarha interpreted common speech for it has been taught our Joshua Bikarha said if a man makes a loan to his neighbor he must not seize from him a pledge that is worth more than the debt because he writes thus unto him the repayment which is due to you from me shall be to the full value of this pledge now the reason that he may claim the value of the pledge is only because he wrote thus hence had he not written thus he would have no title thereto but did not our Yohan and say if he the creditor took a pledge from him returned it to him and then he the debtor died the former may D.I.S.T. reigned from his children Talmud, Mas Baba Metzia be the writing of that clause serves to countervail depreciation. Our Jose interpreted common terms for it has been taught. Our Jose said where it is the practice to treat the Kathuba as an ordinary debt, he the husband can collect it from her father likewise as a debt when it is a local usage to double the dowry, he the husband can collect from her father only half the written sum the Nihar Bileans used to collect the Thirmirmar. Used to empower the husband to collect even the addition said Rabbin Ajmirmar, but has it not been taught where it is the usage to double he can collect only half there is no difficulty in the one case possession was formally effected in the other it was not Rabbin was writing a large amount for the dowry of his daughter more than he was actually giving said to the other side to him let us effect a formal possession from you to which he replied if a formal possession then no. Doubling if doubling no formal possession a certain man once said give my daughter 400 zoos as her kathub our son of our we sent and inquired to our ashi does it mean 400 zoos as the actual dowry hence 800 to be written or 400 zoos as the sum to be recorded the equivalent of 200 zoos the real dowry our ashi replied we see if he said give her 400 zoos 800 are to be recorded but if he said write her 400 zoos he meant to 100 actual other state our ashi replied we see if he said for her kathub it is 400 actual and 800 written if he said in her kathub it means 400 written which is 200 actual yet that is incorrect whether he said for her kathub or in her kathub it means 400 written which is 200 actual unless he says give her without further qualifications a certain man once leased a field from his neighbor and stated if I do not cultivate it I will give you a thousand zoos now he left a third uncultivated said the Nihardians it is but just that he should pay him 333 one third zoos but Rabba said it is an Ismakta and an Ismakta affects no title but in Rabba's view wherein does it differ from what we learned should I neglect and not till it I will pay of the best in that case there was no exaggeration but here since he stated such a large sum it was a mere exaggeration not to be taken seriously a certain man once. Least a field for sesame he sowed wheat instead but the wheat appreciated to the value of sesame now our Kahana thought to rule he the tenant can make a deduction from the percentage due on account of the diminished impoverishment of the soil but our Ashi said to our Kahana people say let the soil become impoverished rather than its owner a certain man once least a field for sesame he sowed wheat however but the wheat subsequently exceeded the sesame in value now Rabba thought to rule that. He the lesser must give him the tenant the increased value said Araha of Dipti to Rubin was he the tenant the only cause of the higher value and the earth not at all the Nihardana said in Iska is a semi-loan and a semi-trust the rabbis having made an enactment which is satisfactory to both the debtor and the creditor now that we say that it is a semi-loan and a semi-trust if he the trader wishes to drink beer there with i.e. for the loan part he can do so Rabba said no it is therefore called Iska business because he can say to him I gave it to you for trading not for drinking beer R E D B Avin said and if he the trader dies it ranks as movable property in the hands of his children Rabba said it is therefore called Iska that if he dies it shall not rank as movable property in the hands of his heirs Rabba said if there is one Iska and two bonds it is to the investor's disadvantage Talmud Mas Baba Metzia, if two Iskas were arranged but only one bond drawn up it is to the Debtor's disadvantage Rabba also said if a man accepted an iska from his fellow and lost thereon but then made it good by an effort yet had not informed him the investor of the loss he cannot then say to him deduct the previous loss incurred because he can retort you took the trouble of making it good to avoid the odium of inefficiency Rabba also said if two men accept an iska and make a profit and one says to the other come let us divide now before the time for winding up then if the other object saying let us earn more profits he can legally restrain him from closing the transaction for if he claims give me half the profits he can reply the profit is mortgaged for the principal whilst if he proposes give me half the profits and half of the principal he can answer the parts of the iska are interdependent whilst if he proposes let us divide the profit and the principal and should you incur a loss I will bear it with you he can answer no the fortune of two is better than that of one mission if a man leases a field from his neighbor and refuses to weed it saying what does it matter to you seeing that I pay you your rental his plea is not heeded because he the lesser can reply tomorrow you may lease it and it will be overgrown with weeds tomorrow and should he the tenant say I will plow it afterwards he can reply I want good wheat and should he say I will buy for you wheat from the market he can answer I want wheat from my own soil should he reply then I will weed for you the area necessary for your portion he can retort you will bring my land unto disrepute but we learn because it will be overgrown with weeds but he is not heeded because he can answer him once a bung falls out it is fallen mission if a man leases a field to his neighbor and it does not yield a satisfactory crop if there is enough to make a stack he the tenant is bound to go on working there and said Arjuna what standard is a stack but the standard is if there is Enough for sowing tomorrow our rabbis taught if a man leases a field from his neighbor and it does not yield a satisfactory crop and there is enough to make a stack he the tenant is bound to go on working therein because he writes him thus I will stand plow so cut vine thresh window and
There is no dispute the former treats of a place when one core is put into the press at a time the latter where three cores are put into the press are rabbis taught Talmud, Mas Baba Metziah B. If they ascended a tree of feeble strength or a feeble branch he is unclean how is a tree of feeble strength to find the school of Arjan A said if its roots lack sufficient breadth for a quarter calf to be hollowed out of it what is the definition of a feeble branch Resh Lakish said that which is hidden. In the grip of the hand we learned elsewhere if a man travels through grave area over loose stones that can be moved if he travels upon a man or beast of feeble strength he is unclean what is meant by a man of feeble strength Resh Lakish said one whose knees knock together because of the rider upon him what is meant by a beast of feeble strength the school of Arjan A said if the rider causes it to excrete through the strain the school of Arjan A said in respect of prayer and phylacteries. The limit of the burden is four cabs. What is the reference in respect of prayer? As it has been taught, if a man bears a burden on his shoulder and the time for prayer arrives, if it is less than four cabs, she slings it over his back and prays. If four cabs, he must place it on the ground and then pray. What is the reference in respect of phylacteries? As it has been taught, if a man is carrying a load on his head and phylacteries are on his head at the same time, if the phylacteries are crushed under it, it is forbidden. Otherwise, it is permitted. Of what burden was the said? A burden of four cabs are high. Taught, if a man carries out manure on his head and has phylacteries on his head at the same time, he must not remove them to the side nor fasten them to his loins because such is a contemptuous treatment, but must bind them on his arm in the place of phylacteries on the authority of the school of Arshila. It was said, even their wrapper may not be placed on the head as a burden whilst it Phylacteries are being worn and how much said Abbe even a sixteenth of a pumadithi and weight said Arjuna what standard is a stack but the standard is if there is enough for rousseauing and how much is needed for rousseauing RMI said in Aryo Hanan's name for SEAHS per core RMI giving his own opinion said eight SEAHS per core an old man said to Armama son of Rabbi Abba I will explain it to you during Aryo Hanan's lifetime the land was fertile during that of RMI it was poor we learned. Elsewhere if the wind scattered the sheep we compute how much leanings at that field was likely to provide and so much must be given to the poor Arsimian Bigamaliel said the poor must be given the measure for rousseauing and how much is that when Ardimi came he said in the name of Arlaes or other state in the name of Aryo Hanan for caps per core Arjeremiah propounded does that mean for a core that is sown or for a core that is harvested further if it means for a core that is sown is it for Hand sowing or by oxen come and here for when Rabin came he said in the name of Arabau in the name of Arlaes or others say in the name of Aryo Hanan four cabs for a core of seed but the question still remains for hand sowing or by oxen the problem remains unsolved mission if a man leases a field from his neighbor and if the crop is eaten by grass hoppers or blasted by tempest if it was a widespread epidemic he can deduct from the rental if it was not a widespread epidemic he may not deduct from the rental Arjuna said if he leased it on a money rental then in both cases he may make no deductions from the rental Gemara how far must it extend to be called a widespread epidemic Rabjuda said e.g. if the greater part of the plain in which this field lay was blasted Ula said if four fields on the four sides thereof were blasted Ula said they propounded in the West SC the academies of Palestine what if one furrow over the entire length was blasted what if one furrow was Left unblasted over their entire length, what if pits lay between? What if they were separated by a field of fodder Talmud, Mas Baba Metziah? What if they were separated by a different cereal? Further, is wheat as different seed in relation to barley or not? What if others were smitten by blasting and is by mildew, or others were smitten by mildew and is by blasting? The problems remain unsolved. What if he, the lesser, said to him, the less he sowed it with wheat and he went and sowed it with barley, and then the greater part of the plain was blasted and his barley too was blasted? Do we say that he can argue had I sown wheat, it also would have been blasted, or perhaps he can answer him had you sown it with wheat? The scriptural promise thou shalt also decree a thing and it shall be established for thee would have been fulfilled unto me. It is reasonable that he can in fact answer him had you sown it with wheat. The promise thou shalt also decree a thing and it shall be established. For thee and the light shall shine upon thy ways would have been fulfilled unto me. What if all the lesser's fields were blasted and this one was blasted? Yet the greater part of the plain was unaffected. Do we say since the greater part of the plain was unaffected, he can make him no deduction? Or perhaps since all his lands were blasted, he can say to him, This transpired on account of your evil faith. The proof being that all your fields have been blasted, it is reasonable that he can answer him. Had it been on account of my bad luck, a little would have remained unaffected, as it is written. For we are left but few of many. What if all the lessee's fields were blasted and the greater part of the plain too? And this field also was blasted along with them. Do we say since the greater part of the plain was affected, he can deduct his? Or perhaps since all his fields were blasted, he the lesser can say to him, It is due to your misfortune. The proof being that all your fields have been smitten. It is. Logical that he can indeed say to him it is due to your misfortune why so here too let him answer had it been on account of my ill luck a little would have remained to me in fulfillment of the verse for we are left few of many because he can retort were you worthy that ought should remain to you something of your own would have escaped an objection is raised if it was a year of blasting or mildew or the seventh year or years like those of Elijah they are not included in the count now blasting and mildew are stated as analogous to years like those of Elijah just as during the years of Elijah there was no produce at all so in the former two but if there were some harvest elsewhere it is accounted to him and we do not term it an epidemic said Arnaman B. Isaac there it is different because scripture says according to the number of years of the harvest he shall sell into the meaning years in which the world enjoys harvest are ashi objected before Arkahana if so the seventh should be included in the count since there are harvests outside Palestine. The seventh year replied, He is excluded by royal decree. Marzitra, the son of Armari, said to Rabbin, If so, the seventh year should not rank for rebate. Why then did we learn he must pay a seller and a punty and per annum? He replied, There it is different because if the seventh year is fit for fruits to be spread out there. And Samuel said, This SC that a deduction may be made when there is a widespread epidemic was taught only if he, the less he sowed it, the field at the crop grew and was eaten by grass hoppers, but not if he failed to sow it altogether because he can say to him, Had you sown it, the promise they shall not be ashamed in the evil time added in the days of famine they shall be satisfied would have been fulfilled for me. Or she's hate raised an objection if a shepherd who was guarding his flock left it and entered the town and then a wolf came and killed a sheep or a lion came and tore it to pieces. We do not say. Had he been there, he could have saved them. But judge his strength if he could have saved them. He is responsible if not, he is exempt. But why so let him say to him, Had you been there, the verse thy servants live, both the lion and the bear would have been fulfilled for me. Because he can answer, Had you been worthy that a miracle should happen on your behalf, it would have happened as in the case of our Hannah Bidosa, whose goats brought in bears by their horns. But cannot he reply, Granted that I am not worthy of a great miracle, yet am I worthy of a minor one? Talmud, Mas Baba Metziah, be this indeed is a difficulty. One bury the teaches he, the tenant must sow at the field the first and second time, but not the third, but another bury the teaches he must re sow at a third time, but not a fourth. There is no difficulty. The former is according to Rabbi, the latter are Simeon Begamaliel. The former is according to Rabbi, who maintained that a presumption is established by an occurrence happening. Twice the latter are Simeon B. Gamaliel who held that a presumption is established only when it occurs three times. Resh Lakish said this was taught only if he sowed it it grew and was devoured by locusts but if he sowed it and it did not grow at all the lesser can say to him go on repeatedly sowing the field during the extra period of sowing and until when is that said our papa until the heiress comes from the field and Kamal is situated overhead an objection is raised our Simeon B. Gamaliel said on. The authority of our mayor and our Simeon B. Manasia said likewise the second half of Tishri Markishman and the first half of Kislev is seed time the second half of Kislev and half Shabbat are the winter months the second half of Shabbat Adar and the first half of Nisan cold months the second half of Nisan Iyar and the first half of Sivan is the period of harvest the second half of Sivan Tammuz and the first half of Bar summer the second half of Abelial and the first half of Tishri hot months are due to count these periods
Can pay him thereof or not? He replied, How compare in that case the soil had not performed the owner's behest, but here it had a certain man leased a vineyard from his fellow for ten barrels of wine, but that wine turned sour now our nom and thought to rule this is the same as our mission. If it was smitten, he can pay him thereof. But our ashi said to him, What analogy is there there? The soil had not performed its duty whilst here it had yet our ashi admits in the case of grapes that had become wormy or a field whose sheets were smitten mission. If one leases a field from his neighbor to sow barley, he must not sow wheat to sow wheat, he may sow barley, but our simian begamaliel forbids it. If rented for cereals, he may not sow pulse, but if for pulse he may sow cereals, our simian begamaliel forbids it. Gamara Arhista said, What is our simian begamaliel's reason? Because it is written the remnant of Israel shall not do iniquity nor speak lies, neither shall a deceitful tongue be found in their mouth. And Objection is raised the Purim collections must be utilized for Purim only and no scrutiny is made in the matter the poor may not even buy shoe straps there with unless this was stipulated in the presence of members of the community this is the ruling of our Jacob who stated it in the name of our Meir but our Simeon Begamaliel Talmud, Mas Baba Metzia is lenient in the matter said of our Simeon Begamaliel's reason is in accordance with you master for the master said if one wishes his land to become sterile let him sow it one year with wheat and the following with barley one year lengthwise and the following crosswise yet that is only if he does not plow it after the harvest and repeat before sowing but if he does no harm is done if rented for cereals he may not sow pulse etc. Rab Judah taught Rabin if rented for cereals he may sow pulse said he to him but did we not learn if rented for cereals he may not sow pulse he replied there is no difficulty this SC my ruling refers to ourselves the other to them the Palestinians Rab Judah said to Rabin son of Arnam and my brother Rabin the crest that grows among flax is not forbidden to strangers as robbery but that which grows on the borders of the field is so forbidden yet if it has become hardened for sowing even that which grows among the flax is forbidden as robbery why because the damage is already done Rab Judah said to Rabin son of Arnam and some of these fruits of mine are really yours and some of yours are really mine and the practice of abutting neighbors is to regard a tree as belonging to the field whether its roots tend for it has been stated if a tree stands by the boundary line between two fields Rab said whether each is inclined there it belongs Samuel said they share therein an objection is raised if a tree stands by the boundary that the owners of the adjacent fields share therein this refutes Rab's ruling Samuel interpreted this on Rab's views as meaning that it takes up it. Whole breadth of the boundary, if so, why stated it is necessary to teach it only when its weight overhangs in one direction, but even so, why stated I might think that he one field owner can say divide thus, therefore, we are informed that he can reply what reason is there for dividing in this manner divided. Otherwise, Rab Judah said to Rabin, son of Arnam, and my brother Rabin, do not buy a field that is near a town, for Arabab said in the name of Arhuna in Rab's name, one may not stand over his neighbor's field when its crop is full grown, but that is not so for when Arabab met Rab's disciples and asked them what comments did Rab make upon these verses, Blessed shalt thou be in the city, and blessed shalt thou be in the field, blessed shalt thou be when thou comest in, and blessed shalt thou be when thou goest out. They answered him, Thus did Rab say, Blessed shalt thou be in the city, that thy house shall be near a synagogue, and blessed shalt thou be in the field, that thy property. Shall be near the city, blessed shalt thou be when thou comest in that thou shalt not find thy wife in doubt of Nidah on returning home from thy travels, and blessed shalt thou be when thou goest out that thy offspring shall be as thee were upon he observed Aryohan and did not interpret thus, but blessed shalt thou be in the city that the privy closet shall be near to thy table, but not the synagogue Aryohan's interpretation is in accordance with his opinion, his one is rewarded for walking. To a synagogue, and blessed shalt thou be in the field that thy estate shall be divided in three equal portions of cereals, olives, and vines, blessed shalt thou be when thou comest in, and blessed shalt thou be when thou goest out that thine exit from the world shall be as thine entry therein, just as thou enterest it without sin, so mayest thou leave it without Talmud, Mas Babamitia be there is no difficulty, the latter dictum is meant when it the field is surrounded by a wall and a hedge. The former when it is not so surrounded and the Lord shall take away from thee all sickness and rab by this the evil eye is meant this is in accordance with his opinion expressed elsewhere for rab went up to a cemetery performed certain charms and then said 99 have died through an evil eye and one through natural causes Samuel said this refers to the wind Samuel follows his views for he said all illness is caused by the wind but according to Samuel what of those executed by the state those two but for the wind which enters and plays upon the wound anointment could be compounded for them which would cause the severed parts to grow together and they would recover our Hannah said this refers to the cold for our Hannah said everything is from heaven excepting cold drafts as it is written cold drafts are in the way of the forward he that doth keep his soul shall be far from them our Jose B. Hannah said this refers to the excretions for a master said the nasal end. Oral excretions are injurious when in great quantities but beneficial in small are Eliezer said this refers to diseases of the gall it has been taught likewise by Mahala sickness illness caused by the gall is meant and why is it called Mahala because it sickens the whole human frame alternatively because 83 illnesses are dependent upon the gall and all of them may be rendered nugatory by eating one's morning bread with salt and drinking a jugful of water our rabbis taught 13. Things were said of the morning bread it is an antidote against heat and cold winds and demons instills wisdom into the simple causes one to triumph in a lawsuit enables one to study and teach the Torah to have his words heated and retain scholarship he who partakes thereof does not perspire lives with his wife and does not lust after other women and it kills the worms in one's intestines some say it also expels jealousy and induces love rabbi ask rabbi bimari whence comes the proverbial Expression 60 runners speed along but cannot overtake him who breaks bread in the morning also the rabbinical dictum arise early and eat in summer on account of the heat in winter on account of the cold he replied because it is written they shall not hunger nor thirst neither shall the cold nor sun smite them thus the cold or sun shall not smite them because they shall not hunger nor thirst said he to him you deduce it from that verse but I from this and ye shall serve the Lord your God and he shall bless thy bread and thy water and ye shall serve the Lord your God this refers to the reading of the Shema and prayer and he shall bless thy bread and thy water to bread and salt and a jug of water thenceforth and I will take sickness away from the midst of the Rab Judah said to our Ada the surveyor do not treat surveying lightly because every bit of ground is fit for garden saffron Rab Judah also said to our Ada the surveyor the four cubits on the canal banks you may treat Lightly, but those on the river banks do not measure at all. Rab Judah is in harmony with his views. For Rab Judah said, Four cubits on the banks of a canal belong to the estate owners. It serves, but those on the banks of a river are common property. RMI announced, Cut down all vegetation in the shoulder breadth of barges on both sides of the river. Our Nathan Bihashia had sixteen cubits thus cut down there upon the people of Mishronia came and smote him. He thought that it is as a public thoroughfare. But that is incorrect only, therefore, a public road is so much necessary. But here at the clear space is required for hauling the ropes. Therefore, the full shoulder width of the barges is enough. Rabbi son of Arhuna possessed a forest by the river bank being requested to make a clearing by the waters. As he replied, Let the owners above and below me first clear their portion, and then I will cut down mine. But how might he act? So is it not written, Gather yourselves together, ye gather which. Reshlakish translated first adorn yourself and then adorn others in that instance the neighboring forests belong to Parzak the field marshal therefore he rabbi said if they cut down their forests I will do so likewise but if not why should I for if they can still haul their ropes they have room for walking Talmud, Mas Baba Metzia, if not they cannot walk there in any case rabbi son of Arnaman was traveling in a boat when he saw a forest on the river bank said he to whom does this belong to rabbi son of Arhuna he was informed he thereupon quoted yet the hand of the princes and rulers hath been chief in this trespass cut it down cut it down he ordered then rabbi son of Arhuna came and found it cut down whoever cut it down he exclaimed may his branches be cut down it was related that during the whole lifetime of rabbi son of Arhuna none of rabbi son of Arnaman's children remained alive rabbi Judah said all must
right of preemption he cannot be evicted the Nihardian said he is removed even on the score of the right of preemption for it is written and thou shalt do that which is right and good in the sight of the Lord what if one came to take counsel of him see the neighbor who enjoys the right of preemption and ask shall I go and buy it and he replied go and buy it is formal acquisition from him necessary or not Rubin ruled no formal acquisition is necessary the Nihardians maintained it is and the law is that a formal acquisition is needed now that you say that a formal acquisition is necessary if he did not acquire it of him and bought the field it advances or falls in his the abutting neighbor's ownership now if he bought it for a hundred zoos whereas it is worth two hundred we see if he the original vendor would have sold it to anyone at a reduced figure he the abutting neighbor pays him the vendee a hundred zoos and takes it but if not and it was a special favor to the vendee he must pay him two hundred and only then take it but if he bought it for two hundred its value being only one hundred it was at first thought that he the abutting neighbor can say to him I sent you for my benefit not for my hurt but Mark Ashisa the son of Arhista said to Arashi thus did the Nihardian say in our name there is no law of fraudulent purchase in respect to real estate if one sold a of land in the middle of his estate we see if it is of it. Choices or of the most inferior quality the sale is valid Talmud, Mas Babamitia B otherwise it is mere evasion a gift is not subject to the law of preemption said Amimar but if he the donor promised security of tenure it is subject thereto when one sells all his property to one person the law of preemption does not apply likewise if it is sold to its original owner it is not subject to the law of preemption if one purchases from or sells to a heathen there is no law of preemption if one purchases from a heathen because he the purchaser can say to him the abutting neighbor I have driven away a lion from your boundaries if he sells to a heathen because a heathen is certainly not subject to the exhortation and thou shalt do that which is right and good in the sight of the Lord nevertheless he the vendor is placed under a ban until he accepts responsibility for any injury that might ensue through him a heathen the mortgage is not subject to the law of preemption. For Arashi said the elders of Matha Mahaja told me what is the meaning of Mashkantag pledge mortgage that it abides with him the mortgagee what is its practical bearing in respect to preemption when one sells an estate that is far from the vendor's domicile in order to buy one that is near or an inferior property to repurchase a better the law of preemption does not apply when an estate is sold for poll tax alimony of a widow and her daughters and funeral expenses the law of preemption does not apply for the Nihardian said for poll tax alimony and funeral expenses an estate is sold without public announcement a sale to a woman orphans or a partner is not subject to the law of preemption of urban neighbors and rural neighbors the former have priority of a neighbor but not of the field to be sold and a scholar the latter takes precedence of a relative and a scholar the latter has priority the scholars propounded what of a neighbor and a relative come and hear. Better is a neighbor that is near that a brother that is far off if one offers well formed coins and the other full weight coins the law of preemption does not apply if these the coins of the abutting neighbor are bound up and those of the purchaser unsealed there is no preemption if he the neighbor says I will go take trouble and bring money we do not wait for him but if he says I will go and bring money we consider if he is a man of substance who can go and bring the money. Without delay we wait for him if not we do not wait for him if the land belongs to one and the buildings upon it to another the former can restrain the latter but the latter cannot restrain the former if the land belongs to one and the palm trees upon it to another the former can restrain the latter but the latter cannot restrain the former if a stranger wishes to purchase the land for building houses and the abutting neighbor wants the land for sowing habitation is more important and there is no law of preemption if a rocky ridge or a plantation of young palm trees lay between the fields we consider if he the abutting neighbor can enter therein even with a single furrow it is subject to the law of preemption but not otherwise if one of four neighbors on the four sides of a field forced all the others the sale is valid but if they all come together at the field is divided diagonally Talmud, Mas Babamitia Omisha if a man leases a field for but a few years. He must not sow it with flax nor has he a right to the sycamore beams but if he leased it for seven years he may in the first year sow it with flax and has a right to the sycamore beams Kamara Abe said he has no rights to the sycamore beams but is entitled to the improvement in the sycamores themselves Rabba said he is not even entitled to the improvement an objection is raised if one leases a field when his lease expires an assessment is made for him surely that means that the improvement in the sycamores are assessed for him know the vegetables and beets are assessed for him the vegetables and beets let him uproot and take them away it was before market day come and here if one leases a field and the seventh year i.e. the year of release intervenes an assessment is made for him does then the seventh year withdraw the land from the lessee but read thus if one leases a field and the jubilee arrives an assessment is made for him yet even so does then the jubilee cancel a lease hold. Scripture merely forbade a sale in perpetuity but read thus if one buys a field from his neighbor and the jubilee arrives an assessment is made for him and should you answer here too the vegetables and beets are assessed for him I would reply these are free to all in the jubilee hence it must surely refer to the improvement of the sycamores have they explained the cited buried on the basis of Rabba's views there it is different because the writ then the house that was sold shall go. Out in the year of Jubilee only that which was sold is returnable to the first owner but not the improvements then let us learn from it there it is a true sale and Jubilee is a royal revocation our Papa leased a field for growing fodder now some young trees sprouted up there and when he or Papa was about to quit he said to them the original owners give me the improvement said Arshisha the son of Aridi to our Papa if so had you leased palm trees and these grew thicker during the period of lease would you then master also demand the improvement he replied there I should not have taken possession for that purpose but here I leased it for that with whom does disagree with Abe who maintained that he is entitled to the improvement in the sycamores it may agree even with Rabba there he the lessee suffers no loss through the improvement of the sycamores here there is a loss but he the lessor said to him wherein did I cause you to suffer loss through the diminished area for fodder then take the value of the fodder that would have grown in their place and go he replied I would have sown it with garden saffron said he to Hanai you have thus shown that your intention was to remove what you did so and depart then take your saffron and go you are entitled only to the value of the wood rbbb of a leased a field and surrounded it with a ridge from which there sprung forth or bushes when he left the field on the expiration of the lease he said to them give me the improvements I effected said our poppy because you come from Mamla you speak words of no substance even our poppy claimed improvements only because he suffered loss but here what loss have you sustained our Joseph had a gardener now he died and left five sons in loss at our Joseph hitherto there was one and now there are five hitherto they did not rely on each other to do the work and so caused me no loss whilst now they will and cause me loss therefore he said to them if you accept the improvements due to you and quit it as well if nobody will evict you without giving you the improvements for Rabjud other state are who not other state are and said if a gardener dies his heirs may be evicted without receiving the improvements but nevertheless that is incorrect a certain gardener said to his employers should I cause loss I will quit he did then cause loss said Rabjud he must quit without receiving the improvements Arkahana said he must quit but receives the improvements he effected yet Arkahana admits that if he said I will quit without the improvements he is evicted without receiving improvements Rabba said even then it is an Ismakta which is not binding but according to Rabba wherein does it differ from what we learned should I neglect and not till it I will pay with the best crops there he merely pays for the loss he caused here it is sufficient that we make a deduction on account of what he spoiled whilst the rest must be given him. Rania was Rabbin's gardener having spoiled it he was dismissed thereupon he went before Rabbi complaining Caesar how he has treated me he has acted within his rights he informed him but he gave me no warning protested he no warning was necessary he retorted this is in accordance with Rabbi's views for Rabbi said elementary teachers a gardener's butcher a cover Talmud, Mas Baba Mitzia, B and the town scribe are all regarded as being permanently warned the general principle is this for every loss. That is irrecoverable the workers are regarded as being permanently warned a certain gardener said give me my improvements as I wish to emigrate to Palestine when he came before our Papa B Samuel he ordered give him the improvements but Rabbi protested has only he affected the increased value and not the soil he replied I meant half thereof but he protested hitherto the owner took half and the gardener half whereas now he must give a share to an heiress he replied I meant a
As produce robber ruled as principle therefore land must be bought therewith of which he the mortgagee enjoys the usufruct and objection is raised if the tree withered or was cut down both are forbidden to use and what then shall be done it must be sold for timber land bought with the proceeds and he the mortgagee takes the usufruct surely withered is similar to cut down just as the latter means in its due time so the former too and yet it is taught it must be sold for timber land bought with the proceeds and he the mortgagee takes the usufruct thus proving that it ranks as principle no cut down is similar to wither just as the latter implies before its time so the former two come and here of aged vines and olive trees fell to her as an inheritance talmud moss babamitia they are sold for timber and land bought with the proceeds whereof he the husband enjoys the usufruct read and aged alternatively have we not explained it that e.g. they fell to her in another field not belonging to her so that the entire principle is destroyed a certain note stated an unspecified number of years now the creditor maintained that it meant three whilst the debtor insisted upon two thereupon the creditor anticipated the findings of the court and enjoyed the usufruct now whom do we believe Rab Judah said the land stands in the presumptive possession of its owner Arkahana said the usufruct is in the presumptive possession of him who enjoyed it and indeed the law is in Accordance with Arkahana who maintained that the usufruct is in the presumptive possession of those who enjoyed it, but have we not an established principle that the law is in accordance with our nomin in civil law and he himself ruled that the land is in the presumptive possession of its owner there it is in a matter that is not destined to be cleared up here, however, it is a matter the truth of which may be finally revealed and the court is not to be troubled twice if the creditor maintains. That it the mortgage was for five years whilst the debtor says that it was for three, and when he challenges him, bring forth your note, he pleads the note is lost. Rab Judah ruled, we believe the creditor since he could have pleaded, I have bought it outright at our papa to our ashi our and our or disagree with Rab Judah's ruling why since this document is for the purpose of collection, he the creditor must have taken great care of it, and now he is actually suppressing the document. Thinking I will enjoy its usufruct for an additional two years, Rabbanah said to RC, if so, a mortgage after the fashion of Surah which was drawn up thus on the completion of this number of years, this estate shall go out of the mortgagee's possession without further payment. If he suppresses the mortgage deed and pleads, I have bought it, is he then believed would then the rabbis have enacted a measure which may lead to loss? He replied there, the rabbis enacted that the mortgager should pay the land tax and repair ditches, but what of an estate that has no ditches and is not subject to land tax, then he should have made a formal protest. He answered, but what if he did not protest, then he brought the loss upon himself. If the heiress claims I entered the field on half profits whilst the landlord maintains I engaged him on a third profits, who is believed, Rab Judah said the owner is believed, Arnaman ruled it all depends on local usage. Now it was assumed that there is no dispute the latter. Ruling refers to a place where an heiress receives half the former where he receives a third but Armari son of Samuel's daughter said to them the scholars thus did have a say even in places where the heiress receives a half there is still a dispute Rab Judah ruling that the landlord is believed since he could have pleaded he is my hired laborer or my gleaner if orphans maintain we have created the improvements whilst the creditor contends your father created them upon whom lies the onus of proof. Talmud, Mas Babamitia be now our hand in the thought to rule the land stands in the presumptive ownership of the orphans therefore the creditor must have disproved but a certain old man observed to him thus did our Yohan and rule it is for the orphans to disprove why since land stands to be seized for debt it is as though it were already seized hence the onus of proof lies upon the orphans have a said we have learned likewise if it is doubtful which came first he must cut it down without compensation. This proof since it stands to be cut down we say to him bring proof that the tree was here first and then receive compensation so here too since the note is for the purpose of collection it is as though already collected and therefore the orphans must prove their contention subsequently the orphans brought proof that they had effected the improvements now our hand of the thought to rule that when their claims are being satisfied it is done with land but that is incorrect their claims are satisfied with money this follows from our nomin's dictum for our nomin said in Samuel's name in three cases the improvements are assessed and payment made in money is in the settlement of the debt of the firstborn to the ordinary son of the creditor or of the widow who collected her cathu but to orphans and of the creditors to the vendees Robin objected before our ashi shall we say that in Samuel's opinion the creditor must return the improvement to the vendees has then the vendee any title to the improvement surely Samuel said a creditor collects the improvements and should you reply there is no difficulty the one refers to an improvement touching the carriers the other to an improvement not touching the carriers surely cases arose daily where Samuel ordered distraint even of the improvement touching the carriers there is no difficulty in one case the value of the land and its improvement is claimed in the other the value of the land and its improvement is not claimed but where the value of the land and its improvement is not claimed you say that he must pay the vendee money for his improvements and can dismiss him now that agrees well with the view that even if the vendee has money he cannot pay off the creditor but on the view that he can let him say to him had I money I would have paid you off from the whole estate now that I have no money give me a reward land in any field to the value of my improvements the circumstances here are that he the original debtor had created it the field in hypothetic declaring to him your payment shall come only out of this mission if one leases a field for us at 10a for 700 zuz the sabbatical year is included but if he leases it for 7 years for 700 zuz it is not included a worker engaged by the day can collect his wages the whole of the following night if engaged by the night he can collect it the whole of the following day if engaged by the hour he can collect it the whole day and night if engaged by the week month year or sub 10a if his time expires by day he can collect his wages the whole of that day if by night he can collect it all night and the following day tomorrow our rabbis taught whence do we know that a worker hired by day collects his wages all night from the verse the wages of him that is hired shall not abide with the all night until the morning and whence do we know that a worker hired by the night collects it the whole of the following day because it is written at his day shalt thou give him his hire but let us say the reverse wages are payable only at the end of the engagement our rabbis taught from the implication of the wages of him that his hire shall not abide with the all night do I not know that it means until the morning why then is it written until the morning to teach that he the employer violates the injunction only until the first morning but thereafter said rab he transgresses thou shalt not delay payment. Our Joseph said what verse choose the say not unto thy neighbor go and come again and tomorrow I will give when thou hast it by the our rabbis taught if one instructs his neighbor go out and engage for me workers neither transgresses the injunction thou shalt not keep the wages all night the former because he did not engage them Talmud, Mas Babamitia the latter because the wages i.e. the labor for which wages are due are not with him how so if he the agent assured them I am responsible for your wages then he is responsible for it has been taught if one engages a workman to labor on his work but directs him to that of his neighbor he must pay him in full and receive in turn from the owner of the work actually done the value whereby he benefited him it holds good only if he said to them the employer is responsible for your wages Judah B. Mirmar used to instruct his attendant go and engage laborers for me and say to them your employer is responsible for your wages Mirmar and Marzitra used to engage laborers on each other's behalf Rabbi son of Arhuna said the market traders of Surah do not transgress the injunction the wages of him that is hired shall not abide all night etc because it is well known that they rely upon the market day if engaged by the hour he can collect it all day and night Rab said a man engaged by the hour for day work can collect his wages all day for night work can collect it all night Samuel maintained a man Engaged by the hour for day work can collect it all day for night work all night and the following day we learned if engaged by the hour he can collect it all day and night this refutes rab rab can answer you it is meant disjunctively thus if engaged by the hour for day work he can collect his wages all day for night work he can collect it all night we learned if engaged by the week month year or sub if the time expires by day he can collect his wage the whole of that day if by night he can collect it all night and the following day rab can answer you it is a dispute of ten aim for it has been taught a man engaged by the hour for day work collects his wage all day for night work all night this is our Judah's opinion our Simeon said a man engaged by the hour for day work collects all day for night work all night and the following day hence it was said whoever withholds the wages of a hired laborer transgresses these five prohibitions of five denominations and one affirmative
Imposed a sacrifice that which is analogous to a bailment where one falsely repudiates a debt of money or its equivalent but said Abay I never engaged you that is oppression I paid you that is robbery now as for our she's hate how does oppression differ from robbery that he objected to the former but not the latter he can answer you robbery implies that he first robs him and then repudiates liability if so may not oppression to refer to subsequent repudiation what comparison is there? As for the other SC robbery it is well for it is written and lie unto his neighbor or in a thing taken away by violence which implies that he originally made admission to him but with respect to oppression is it then written or in a thing of oppression or hath oppressed his neighbor is stated implying that he had already oppressed him robber said oppression and robbery are identical why then did scripture divide them to teach that two negative precepts are infringed mission of whether it be the hire of man beast or utensils it is subject to the law at his day thou shalt give him his hire and the wages of him that is hired shall not abide with thee until the morning when is that only if he demanded it of him but otherwise there is no infringement if he gave him an order to a shopkeeper or a money changer he is not guilty of infringement a hired laborer within the set time swears and is paid but if his set time passed he cannot swear and receive payment yet if he has Witnesses that he demanded payment within the set time he can still swear and receive it one is subject to the law at his day thou shalt give him his hire in respect of a resident alien but not to that of the wages of him that is hired shall not abide with thee until the morning Gamara who is the authority for our mission for it is neither the first Tana who interpreted of thy brethren or our Jose son of our Judah to what is the reference it has been taught Talmud, Mas Bagumetia be Talmud. Mas Bagumetia be thou shalt not oppress an hired servant that is poor and needy whether he be of thy brethren this excludes idolaters or of thy strangers this means a righteous proselyte that are in thy gates i.e. an alien who eats unclean food from this I know the law only in respect of man's hire once do I know to extend it to animals and utensils from that are in thy land implying all that are in thy land and in respect of all these injunctions all are transgressed hence it was. Said the hire of man animal and utensils are identical in that they are subject to the laws at his day shalt thou give him his hire and the wages of him that is hired shall not abide with thee all night until the morning our Jose son of our Judah said in respect to a resident alien one is subject to the law at his day thou shalt give him his hire but not to that of thou shalt not keep all night the wages of him that is hired etc. in respect of the hire of animals and utensils only the injunction thou shalt not oppress etc. is applicable now who is the authority for our mission if the first tana who interpreted of thy brethren the resident alien presents a difficulty if our Jose the hire of animals and utensils presents a difficulty said Robert this tana of our mission is a tana of the school of our Ishmael who taught whether it be the hire of man beast or utensil it is subject to the laws at his day thou shalt give him his hire and the wages of him that is hired shall not abide with thee in respect of a resident alien one is subject to the law at his day thou shalt give him his hire but not to thou shalt not keep etc. What is the reason of the first tana who interprets the verse of thy brethren he deduces identity of law from the word hire written twice our Jose son of our Judah however does not accept this deduction but granted that he does not yet one should be liable to the law at his day thou shalt give him his hire in respect of animals and utensils to our Hanania learned scripture saith neither shall the sun go down upon it for he is poor hence it applies only to those who are subject to poverty or wealth and so excludes animals and utensils which are not subject to poverty and wealth and the first tana how does he interpret this verse for he is poor it is necessary to shoot that the poor receive precedence over the wealthy and our Jose son of our Judah that follows from thou shalt not oppress an hired servant that is poor and Needy and the first tana one teaches the priority of the poor man over the rich the other the priority of the poor over the needy and both are necessary for if we were merely informed of the poor man's priority over the needy I would think that it is because he the needy is not ashamed to demand it his wage from him but as for the wealthy who is ashamed to demand it from him I might say that it is not so is that the poor takes no precedence over him whilst if we learned this in respect to the wealthy I would think that it is because he is not in need thereof but as for the needy who needs it more I might argue that it is not so hence both are necessary now as to our tana in either case it is difficult if he accepts the deduction of hired written twice then even a resident alien should also be included if he rejects it once does he know the inclusion of animals and utensils in truth he does not accept this deduction yet there it is different because scripture Writes the wages of him that is hired shall not abide with thee all night until the morning implying whosoever's hire is with thee if so then even a resident alien too is meant to writ thou shalt not oppress thy neighbor thy neighbor is specified but not a resident alien if so then even animals and utensils too should be excluded but surely with thee is written what reason have you to include animals and utensils and exclude a resident alien it is logical that animals and utensils are to be included since they come within the category of the property of thy neighbor whereas the hire of a resident alien is not within this category now the first tana who interpreted of thy brethren what is his exegesis on thy neighbor he needs this even as it has been taught thou shalt not oppress thy neighbor but not an amalekite an amalekite but that follows from of thy brethren one gives permission in regard to his oppression the other in regard to the retention of his robbery and both are necessary for if we were informed that the retention of his robbery is permitted that may be because he the Amalekite has not worked for him but as for oppressing him by withholding his wages I would think that that is not permitted whilst if we were taught us about oppressing him that may be because it his wage has not yet reached as the Amalekite's hand but as to his robbery I would think the retention thereof is not allowed hence both are necessary and our Jose son of our Judah how does he interpret this verse the wages of him that is hired shall not abide with thee all night until the morning he needs it to teach the law stated by our receivers even if he the employer engaged him only to vintage a single cluster of grapes he is subject to it shall not abide all night etc and the other that follows from the verse and his solely life upon it implying anything for which he risks his life Talmud, Mas Bagumetia. Talmud, Mas Bagumetia, and the other that is needed even as it has been taught, and he said, his soul, I life upon it. Why did this man, the laborer, send the ladder, suspend himself from the tree, and risk death itself? Was it not that you should pay him his wages? Another interpretation, and he said, his soul upon it teaches he who withholds an employee's wages is as though he deprived him of his life. Arhuna and Arhista differ on this one says, the life of the robber is meant. It. Other, the life of the robbed, the view that the life of the robber is meant is based on the verse, rob not the poor, because he is poor, neither oppress the afflicted in the gate, which is followed by, for the Lord will plead their cause and spoil the soul of those that spoil them, whilst the opinion that it means the life of the robbed follows from, so are the ways of everyone that is greedy of gain, he taketh away the life of its rightful owner, and the other two is it not written, he taketh away. The life of its rightful owner it means of its present owner and the other two is it not written and spoil the soul of those that spoiled them that states a reason thus why shall he spoil those that spoiled them because they took their lives when is that only if he demanded it of him but otherwise there is no infringement our rabbis taught the wages of him that is hired shall not abide all night I might think this holds good even if he did not demand it therefore scripture writes with the meaning by thy desire I might think that even if he lacks it he is still guilty but scripture states with the meaning only when it the hire is with thee I might think that it the prohibition is in force even if he gave him an order to a trader or a money changer in his favor but scripture teaches with thee but not if he gave him an order to a trader or a money changer on his behalf if he gave him an order to a shopkeeper or a money changer on his behalf he is not guilty of Infringement the scholars propounded can he the employee return to the employer or not Arshis hate ruled he cannot return to him Rabbi held he can return Rabbi said once do I infer this since it is taught he is not guilty of infringement it is implied there is only no infringement yet he can return to him for payment but Arshis hate explained what is meant by he is not guilty of infringement he is no longer within the ambit of infringement Arshis hate was asked does the injunction the wages of him that is hired shall not abide all night hold good in respect of a contract or not does the artisan obtain a title in return for the improvement he effected in the article so that his wages rank is alone or does he not and hence it is considered wages Arshis hate replied one does transgress the law but has it not been taught there is no transgression in this case there it means that he gave him an order to a shopkeeper or a money
Taught here are these and traditional laws, they are surely merely rabbinical measures, but said Rab Judah in Samuel's name important enactments were taught here important does that imply the existence of unimportant ones, but said Arnaman in Samuel's name fixed measures were taught here thus the oath is the employer's privilege, but the rabbis took it away from the employer and imposed it upon the employee for the sake of his livelihood and on account of the employee's livelihood are we to cause loss to the employer, the employer himself is pleased that the employee should swear and be paid so that workers should engage themselves to him, on the contrary the employee himself is pleased that the employer should take an oath and be exempt so that he should engage him, the employer is bound to engage laborers, but the employee too is forced to seek employment, but the reason is that the employer is busily occupied with his laborers, if so let us award it the wages to him. Without an oath the oath is in order to appease the employer then let him pay him in the presence of witnesses it is too much trouble then let him pay him in advance both prefer credit if so even if the dispute concerns a stipulated amount it should be likewise so why then has it been taught if the laborer maintains you arranged with me for two zoos and the other sc the employer pleads I arranged only for one the plaintiff must furnish proof the stipulated wage is certainly well. Remembered again if so even if the set time passed he should also be believed why did we learn but if his set time passed he cannot swear and receive payment it is a presumption that the employer will not transgress the law the wages of him that is hired etc but have you not said that he is busy with his employees that is only before his obligation matures Talmud, Mas Baba Metzia, but when it matures he charges himself there with and remembers it but is the employee then likely to? Transgress the law thou shalt not rob there in the case of the employer we have two presumptions in his favor whilst here there is only one thus in respect to the employer there are two presumptions firstly that he will not transgress the law it shall not abide all night etc and secondly that the employee will not permit delay of his payment but in favor of the employee there is only the one presumption stated above yet if he has witnesses that he demanded payment he can still swear and receive it but he still demands it now said rc it means that he demanded payment within the set time but perhaps he paid him subsequently abay answered he demanded it all the set time and does this hold good forever said our habibi he is thus privileged only for the period following the day of his claim mission if a man lends money to his fellow he may take a pledge of him when the debt matures only through the court and he may not enter his house to take it Pledge for it is written thou shalt stand without if he possess two articles he must take one and leave one returning the pillow at night and the plow by day but if he the debtor dies he need not return the pledge to his heirs our Simeon B. Gamaliel said even to him himself the debtor he must return it only up to thirty days after that he may sell it on the instructions of the court Gamara Samuel said even the court officer may only forcibly seize it but not enter to take a pledge. But did we not learn if a man lends money to his fellow he may take a pledge of him only through the court which proves that a pledge may be taken by the court Samuel can answer you say he may forcibly seize outside the house only through the court that interpretation too is logical for the second clause states and he may not enter his house to take the pledge to whom does this refer shall we say to the creditor but that is known from the first clause hence it must surely refer to the court. Officer, as for that, it is not proof for this is its meaning. If a man lends money to his fellow, he may take a pledge of him only through the court, from which it follows that a pledge may be taken through the court, but the creditor himself may not even seize forcibly outside, so that he might not enter his house to take the pledge. Our Joseph raised an objection: No man shall take the nether or the upper millstone to pledge. Hence, other things may be taken to pledge. Thou shalt not take a widow's rhyment to pledge, implying if it belongs to others, it may be taken in pledge. By whom shall we say the creditor? But it is written: Thou shalt not go into the house to fetch his pledge. Hence, it must surely mean the court officer, our papa, the son of our nom, and explained it before our Joseph. Other state, our papa, the son of our Joseph, before our Joseph. In truth, the creditor is meant, and it is to intimate that he violates two prohibitions. Come and hear from the implication of the verse: Thou shalt stand. Without do I not know that the man of whom you claim shall bring it out then what is taught by in the man the inclusion of the court officer surely that means that he is like the debtor Talmud, Mas Baba Metzia be no it means that the court officer is like the creditor come and hear if thou at all take thy neighbor's rhyme to pledge this refers to the court officer you say it refers to the court officer but perhaps it is not so the reference being to the creditor when scripture writes thou shalt not go into his house to fetch his pledge it obviously speaks of the creditor hence to whom can I refer if thou at all take thy neighbor's rhyme to pledge surely to none but the court officer it is a controversy of Tanaim for it has been taught when the court officer comes to take a pledge of him he must not enter the house but stand without whilst he the debtor takes a pledge out to him for it is written thou shalt stand without and also the man whereas another very the taught. When the creditor comes to take a pledge of him, he must not enter the house but stand without whilst he the debtor enters and brings him out his pledge. But when the court officer comes to take a pledge of him, he may enter the house and take it and he must not take in pledge articles used in the preparation of food further a couch a couch and a mattress must be left in the case of a wealthy man and a couch a couch and a matting for a poor man only for himself the debtor must these be left but not for his wife's sons and daughters just as an assessment is made in favor of a debtor so also is it made in the case of valuations on the contrary the main law of assessment is written in reference to valuations but say just as an assessment is made in the case of valuation so also in favor of a debtor the master said further a couch a couch and a mattress must be left to a wealthy man and a couch a couch and a matting for a poor man for whom is the second couch shall we say for his wife. Sons and daughters, but you say, but not for his wife, sons and daughters, hence both are for himself. Then why two, one at which he eats, and the other on which he sleeps, even as Samuel said, this for all things I know the cure except the following three I eating bitter dates on an empty stomach, two girding one's loins with a damp flaxen cord, and three eating bread and not walking four cubits after it. A tanner recited before our nom, and just as assessment is made in the case of valuation, so is it also. Made for debtor said he to him, if we even sell his property, shall we make an assessment for him? But do we really sell his property? Did we not learn? And he must return the pillow at night and the plow by day. The tanner recited the view of our Simeon B. Gamaliel before him, whereupon he observed, seeing that according to our Simeon B. Gamaliel, we even sell his property, shall we make an assessment for him? For we learned our Simeon B. Gamaliel said even to him himself, the debtor he must return it. Only up to thirty days after that he may sell it on the instructions of the court. But how do you know that our Simeon B. Gamaliel means an outright sale? Perhaps he means this until thirty days he must return it as it is after that only what is fitting for him the debtor is returned, whilst what is not fitting for him is sold. Should you think that our Simeon B. Gamaliel accepts this view? There is nothing that is unfitting for him, for Abbe said our Simeon B. Gamaliel, our Simeon, our Ishmael, and our Akibal. Maintain that all Israelites are princes, our Simeon B. Gamaliel, for we learned neither love nor the mustard plant may be moved on the Sabbath. Our Simeon B. Gamaliel gave permission in the case of love because it is food for ravens, our Simeon, for we learned princes may anoint their wounds with rose oil on the Sabbath, since it is their practice to anoint themselves on weekdays. Our Simeon said all Israel are princes, our Ishmael, and our Akibal, for we learned if one was a debtor for a thousand zoos and wore a robe. Hundred maidens in value he is stripped thereof and robed with a garment that is fitting for him, but therein attended taught on the authority of our Ishmael and our Akiba. All Israel are worthy of that robe now on the original assumption that he the debtor was allowed what was fitting for him, whilst that which was unfitting for him was sold. It may be asked as for a pillow and bolster articles of inferior quality may suffice for him, but in respect of the plow, what is there available? Rabbi Rabbi. Replied the mission refers to a silver strigil to the Sarhaga demurred, but let him the creditor say to him, You are not thrown upon me. Abay answered him, Talmud, Mas Baba Metzia, precisely so he is indeed thrown upon him, because it is written, and thine shall be the righteousness the scholars propounded is an assessment made for a debtor. Do we just the law of poverty written here from that evaluations or not come and here for Rabin sent word in his letter? I ask this thing of all. My teachers and they gave me no answer thereon, but in truth the following problem was raised if one says I vow Amena for temple purposes is he assessed our Jacob on the
Surely there should be an assessment for a debtor where the pledge is returned. Scripture writes, but if he be poorer than thy estimation, he but not a debtor, and the other this teaches that he must remain in his poverty from beginning to end. Now in the case of about to hit let it the pledge be returned to minority from a debtor. If it the pledge is returned to a debtor for whom there is no means test, surely it is returned in the case of about to hit seeing that an assessment is made there the writ set that he may sleep in his own raiment and bless thee thus excluding hippish which needs no blessing does it not but it is written when thou hast eaten and art full then thou shalt bless the lord thy god but scripture saith and it shall be accounted as righteousness i.e. a charitable act unto thee hence it the law of returning holds good only for him the creditor for whom the act of righteousness is necessary thus excluding hippish as a creditor which does not require the merit of righteousness rabbi abu ahmed elijah standing in a non-jewish cemetery said he to him is a means test to be applied in favor of a debtor he replied we deduce the law of poverty written here from that evaluations in respect of valuations it is written but if he be poorer than thy valuation according to the means of him that thou shalt the priest value him whilst of a debtor it is written and if thy brother be waxen poor then thou shalt relieve him Talmud, Mas Baba Metziah he asked him further whence do we know that a naked man must not separate terima from the verse that he see no unclean thing and he said he rabbi to him art thou not a priest why then dost thou stand in a cemetery he replied has the master not studied the laws of purity for it has been taught our Simeon Bio he said the graves of Gentiles do not defile for it is written and yea my flock the flock of my pastures are men only are designated men he replied I cannot even adequately study the four orders can I then study six and why he inquired I am too hard pressed he answered he then led him into paradise and said to him remove thy robe and collect and take away some of these leaves so he gathered them and carried them off as he was coming out he heard a remark who would so consume his portion in the world to come as rabbi Abba has done thereupon he scattered and threw them away yet even so since he had carried them in his robe it had Absorbed their fragrance, and so he sold it for twelve thousand denarii, which he distributed among his sons in law. Rabbis taught, and if the man before thou shalt not sleep in his pledge, hence if he is wealthy, thou mayest sleep. Thus, what does this mean? Said our hate this is the meaning, and if the man before thou shalt not sleep, whilst his pledge is in thy possession, but if he is wealthy, thou mayest do so. Our rabbis taught, if a man lends money to his fellow, he may not take a pledge of him, nor is he bound to return it to him, and he transgresses all these injunctions. What does this mean? Our hate said this, if a man lends money to his fellow, he may not himself take a pledge of him, and if he did take a pledge of him by means of a court officer, he is bound to return it, whilst he transgresses all these injunctions. Refers to the last clause. Rabbis said it is thus meant, if a man lends money to his neighbor, he may not take a pledge of him himself, and if he took a pledge of him through the court he must return it now when is this if the pledge was not taken at the time of the loan but if it was taken at the time of the loan he is not bound to return it to him whilst and he transgresses all these injunctions refers to the first clause our shiza be recited before rabba thou shalt return it unto him until the sun goeth down this refers to night attire in any case thou shalt deliver him the pledge again when the sun goeth down to an object of day attire said he to him of what use is an article of day attire by night and a night attire by day shall i then delete it he asked no was his reply it reads thus thou shalt return it unto him until the sun goeth down this refers to an article of day attire which may be taken in pledge by night in any case thou shalt deliver him the pledge again when the sun goeth down to a night attire which may be taken in pledge by day are and said if he took a pledge of him returned it and then he the debtor died he may Dist reigned it from his children an objection is raised. Our mayor said now since a pledge is taken, why is it returned? Why is it returned? You ask surely scripture ordered return it, but say thus since it is returned Talmud, Mas Baba Metzia, why is it again taken in pledge so that the sabbatical year should not cancel it the debt and that it the pledge should not be accounted as movable property in the hands of his children? Now the reason is only that he took the pledge again, but had he not taken the pledge again, it would not be so our Adabi Matina replied, Are you not bound in any case to amend it then amend it thus since it is returned? Why is it taken in pledge in the first place that the sabbatical year should not cancel it and that it should not rank as movable property in the hands of his children? Our rabbis taught thou shalt not go into his house to fetch his pledge as the debtor's house thou mayest not enter, but thou mayest enter the house of the surety to Dist reign and Thus it is written, Take his garment that is surety for a stranger. Also, my son, if thou be surety for thy friend, if thou hast stricken thy hand with a stranger, thou art snared with the words of thy mouth. Do this now, my son, and deliver thyself when thou art come into the hand of thy friend. Go humble thyself and make sure thy friend. Thus, if thou owest him money, untie thy hand to him, i.e., pay him. If not, bring many of thy friends around him. Another interpretation is house thou mayest not enter, but thou mayest enter to dist rain for porterage fees, payment for hiring asses, a hotel bill, or artist fees. I might think that this holds good even if it was converted into a loan. Therefore, scripture writes, When thou dost lend thy brother anything, mission a man may not take a pledge from a widow, whether she be rich or poor, for it is written, Thou shalt not take a widow's raiment to pledge tomorrow. Our rabbis taught whether a widow be rich or poor, no pledge may be taken from her. This is our Judas. Opinion our Simeon said a wealthy widow is subject to distraint but not a poor one for you are bound to return the pledge to her and you bring her into disrepute among her neighbors now shall we say that our Judah does not interpret the reason of the writ whilst our Simeon does but we know their opinions to be the reverse for we learned neither shall he multiply wives to himself that his heart turn not away our Judah said he may multiply wives providing that they do not turn his heart away our Simeon said he may not take to wife even a single one who is likely to turn his heart away what then is taught by the verse neither shall he multiply wives to himself even such as Abigail in truth our Judah does not interpret the reason of scripture but here it is different because scripture itself states the reason neither shall he multiply wives to himself and his heart shall not turn away thus why shall he not multiply wives to himself so that his heart turn not away and our Simeon argues thus let us consider as a general rule we interpret the scriptural reason and scripture should have written neither shall he multiply etc whilst and his heart shall not turn away is superfluous for I would know myself that the reason why he must not multiply is that his heart may not turn away why then it shall not turn away explicitly stated to teach that he must not marry even a single one who may turn his heart mission he who takes a mill in pledge transgresses a negative commandment and is guilty on account of two forbidden articles for it is written no man shall take the nether or the upper millstone to pledge and not the nether and the upper millstones only were declared forbidden but everything employed in the preparation of food for human consumption for it is written for he taketh a man's life to pledge tomorrow Arhuna said if a man takes to pledge the nether millstone he is twice flagellated once on account of the injunction against the nether millstone and once on account of for he taketh a man's life to pledge for the nether and the upper millstones he is thrice flagellated twice on account of the nether and the upper millstones and once on account of for he taketh a man's life to pledge but rab judah maintained for taking to pledge the nether millstone he is flagellated once for the upper millstone he is likewise flagellated once for the nether and upper millstones he is flagellated twice and as for for he taketh a man's life to pledge talmud mas baba mitzia this refers to other articles shall we say that abay and rabba differ in the same controversy as arhuna and rab judah for rabba said if one ate at the paschal sacrifice half roasted he is flagellated twice once on account of the injunction against half roast flesh and again because of the verse eat not but roast with fire if he ate it boiled he is flagellated twice once because of the prohibition against boiled flesh and again because of the verse eat not but Roast with fire for both half roast and boiled he is flagellated thrice on account of the injunction against half roast boiled and the injunction eat not but roast with fire Abbe said one is not flagellated on account of an implied prohibition shall we assume that Abbe agrees with Rab Judah Rabba with Arhuna Rabba can answer you my ruling agrees even with Rab Judah it is only there that Rab Judah maintains his view because for he taketh a man's life does not necessarily imply the nether and the upper millstones hence it must refer to other things but here what is the purpose of say roast with the fire hence it must be for the addition
took a butcher's knife in pledge on his coming before Abbe he ordered him go and return it because it is a utensil used in the preparation of food and then come to stand at judgment for it the dead robber said he need not stand at judgment for it but can claim the debt up to its see the pledge's value now does not Abbe accept that logic wherein does it differ from the case of the goats which ate some husk barley whereupon their owner came seized them and preferred a large claim for damages and Samuel's father ruled that he can claim up to their value in that case it was not an object that is generally lent or hired whereas in this case it is for Arhuna be sent word with respect to objects that are generally lent or hired if a man claims I have purchased them he is not believed now does then Rabba disagree with this reasoning but Rabba himself ordered orphans to surrender scissors for woolen cloth and a book of Agata which are objects that are generally loaned or hired note these two since they depreciate in value people are particular not to loan Talmud, Mas Baba Metzi Abisi Hapter X Mishnah if a house i.e. the ground floor and an upper story belonging to two collapse both must share proportionately in the timber stones and earth we also see which stones i.e. bricks are more likely to have been broken if one of them recognized some of his stones he can take them but they are counted in his chair Gemara since it is stated we see etc. Follows that it is possible to gauge whether it fell through pressure or a shock. If so, in the first clause, why do they divide? Let us see if it fell through a shock, then the timber, etc. of the upper story was broken. If through pressure the lower portion was damaged, it is meant that it collapsed at night. Then let us examine it in the morning. If the debris had been cleared away, then let us see who had cleared it away and ask them. Public workers had cleared it away and departed. Then let us see in whose possession they are now situated so that the other becomes the claimant upon whom the onus of proof will lie. The materials are now in a courtyard belonging to both or in the street. Alternatively, partners in such matters are not particular with each other. If one recognized, etc. Now, what does the other plead? If he agrees, then it is obvious. If not, why should this one take them? Hence, it must mean that he replied, I do not know. Shall we say that this refutes our nomin for it has? Been stated if A says to be you owe me Amina and B please I do not know Arhuna and Rav Judah rule that he must pay Arnaman and Aryohan and say he is not liable it is as Arnaman answered elsewhere e.g. there is a dispute between them involving an oath so here too there is a dispute between them involving an oath what is meant by a dispute involving an oath as Rav's dictum for Rav said if A says to be you owe me Amina to which he replies I certainly owe you 50 zoos but as for the rest I do not know since he cannot swear he must pay all but they are counted in his chair Rav thought this meant in his chair of broken materials thus proving that since he says I do not know his position is considerably worse and said Abe to him on the contrary the position of the other should be much worse for since he knows only of these but of no more he should be entitled to no more and the other should receive all the rest but said Abe it means in his chair of whole materials if so what does it his knowledge profit him in respect of extra wide bricks or well-needed claim in the case of a house and an upper story if the upper story was broken through and the landlord refuses to mend it the inhabitant of the upper story can descend and dwell below until he repairs the top our Jose said the lower one must provide the decrot and the upper one the plastering Gamara broken through over what area Rab said the greater part Samuel said forehand breadths Rab said the greater part but not only forehand breadths because one can dwell partly below and partly above Samuel said forehand breadths one cannot dwell partly below and partly above how is it meant if he the landlord had said to him I rent you the story it is gone but if he simply stated a story then let him rent him another Rabba said it arises only if he stated the scarab which I rent you as long as it stands go up there and when it comes down through the weather descend you Two to the ground floor if so why stated but said our ashi it means that he said to him a story which is upon this house I rent to you thus he pledged the house for the story and this is in accordance with what Rabin son of our ad related in our Isaac's name it once happened that a man said to his neighbor I sell you a hanging vine which is over this peach tree and the peach tree was later uprooted when the matter came before our high he said to him you are bound to put up a peach tree for him as long as the vine is in existence our abbey memel propounded Talmud Mas Baba Metzio, when he the tenant dwells there downstairs does he dwell there alone as formerly or do both dwell there because he the landlord can say to him I did not rent it to you that you should evict me now should you say both dwell there and does he when he makes use thereof use it by way of the lower doors or through the roof do we say it must be as originally just as it was then by way of the roof so now likewise or perhaps he can say to him I undertook to ascend but not to ascend and descend now should you rule that he can say to him I did not undertake to ascend and descend one of two stories one on top of the other now if the upper one was broken through he can certainly descend and dwell in the lower one but if the lower one was broken through can he ascend and dwell in the upper do we say that he the landlord can say to him you undertook whatever is designated ascending whether a greater or a lesser height or perhaps he undertook one ascent but not two these problems remain unsolved our Jose said the lower one must provide the decra and the upper one the plastering what is the decra our Jose be Hanan said the reeds thorns and clay are simian be like said boards but there is no dispute each speaks in accordance with local usage to dwell in a house one above and one below now the plaster on the ceiling between the two became broke so that when the one above washed with water it dripped down causing damage to the one below now who must repair our high Abba said the upper dweller early said on the authority of our high son of our Jose the lower one now the sign thereof is and Joseph was brought down to Egypt shall we say that our high Abba and our dispute on the same lines as our Jose and the rabbis in the mission thus the ruling that the upper one must repair it is based on the view that he who inflicts the damage must remove himself from him who sustains it whilst the opinion that the lower one must repair it agrees with the view that the injured party must remove himself from him who inflicts the injury is it then reasonable to maintain that our Jose and the rabbis dispute with reference to damages surely we know them to hold the reverse for we learned the tree must be removed at least 25 cubits from a pit and in the case of the carob and the sycamore trees 50 cubits whether it be above or level there with if the pit was there first he must cut down the tree but the pit owner must compensate him if the tree was there first he need not cut it down if it is doubtful which came first he need not cut it down our Jose said even if the pit was there prior to the tree he need not cut it down for the one digs in his own and the other plants in his own this proves that in our Jose's opinion the injured party must remove himself whilst the rabbis hold that he who inflicts the injury must remove but if it can be said that they are high Abba and our lay dispute on the same lines as our Jose and the rabbis it is on their opinions as displayed there then wherein do our Jose and the rabbis of the present mission differ in the strengthening of the ceiling the rabbis maintain the plaster strengthens the ceiling and that is the duty of the lower dweller whilst our Jose maintains that the plaster is for the purpose of leveling the depressions and that must be done by the upper tenant but that is not so for our Ashi. Said when I was at Arkahana's college, we said our Jose agrees in the case of his arrows, it means that the water was interrupted and only subsequently fell down. Mishnah, if a house and an upper story belonging to two collapsed, and the owner of the upper story proposed to the house owner to rebuild, whilst the latter declined, the former may build the house, i.e., the lower story, and dwell therein until he the latter reimburses him for his expenditure. Our Judah said, Then this man indeed shall have dwelt in his neighbor's house, and so must pay him rent, but the owner of the upper story must build up the house and the upper story and roof it over, and then dwell in the house until he is reimbursed. Talmud, Mas Baba Metzi Abigamar Aryohan, and said, In three places has our Judah taught us that one may not benefit from his neighbor's property. One, what we learned in the Mishnah, what is the second we learned? If one gives a dire wool to be dyed red, but he dyed it black, or to dye it black, and he Died it red our mayor said he the dyer must pay him for the wool our Judah said if the increased value exceeds the cost of dying he the wool owner must pay him the cost if the cost exceeds the increased value he must pay him for the latter and what is the third that which we learned if a man repaid a portion of his debt and then placed the bond in the hands of a third party declaring if I do not repay the balance within 30 days return the note to the creditor and the time arrived and he did not repay our Jose maintained the third party must surrender the bond to the creditor our Judah ruled he must not return it but whence does it follow maybe our Judah states his ruling here only because there is blackening of the walls or in the second case to be dyed red but he
To elevate the upper story he is not permitted to decrease its height he is permitted what if neither possesses the wherewithal for rebuilding it has been taught when neither possesses money for rebuilding the garret owner has no claim at all upon the land it has been taught our Nathan said the owner of the lower portion receives two thirds of the land and the owner of the upper one third others say the owner of the lower portion receives three quarters and that of the upper one. Quarter Rabbis said hold fast to our Nathan's ruling because he is a judge and has penetrated to the depths of civil law by how much does the law compare the value of the house i.e. the lower story by a third therefore he is entitled to a third mission similarly if an olive press was built in a rock and above it was a garden and the roof of the press was broken through the owner of the garden can descend and so below on the floor of the press until the press owner repairs the vaulting too. Provide a support for the garden above if a wall or a tree fell into a public thoroughfare and caused damage he its owner is free from liability but if he was given a fixed time to cut down the tree or pull down the wall and they fell if within the period he is not liable after that period he is liable if a man's wall was near his neighbor's garden and it collapsed into the garden and when he demanded remove your stones he replied Talmud, Mas Babamitia there become yours he is. Not heated on the other hand if after the latter agreed to the proposal and removed them he said here are your removal expenses and I will take back mine the stones he is likewise not heated if a man engages a laborer to work for him on straw or struggle and when he demands his wages says to him take the results of your labor for your wage he is not heated if after he agreed to the proposal he said to him here is your payment and I will take my property he is likewise not. He did Gemara broken through Rab said the greater part thereof Samuel ruled forehand breadths Rab said the greater part thereof but if only forehand breadths one can so partly above and partly below Samuel said forehand breadths one cannot be expected to so partly above and partly below now both disputes are necessary for if we taught it in connection with the dwelling it might be said that only there does Samuel state his ruling because it is unusual for a man to dwell partly in one place and partly in another but with respect to sowing where it is quite usual for a man to sow here a little and there a little I might say that he agrees with Rab whilst if only the present dispute were stated I might argue that only here does Rab hold this view but in the other case he agrees with Samuel hence both are necessary if he was given a fixed time and what time is given by the court said are you had and thirty days if a man's wall etc but since the last clause teaches here are your removal expenses it follows that he the garden owner has removed them thus it is only because he removed them but why so let his field effect possession for him for our Jose son of our Hannah said a man's courtyard effects possession for him even without his knowledge that is only where he the original owner desires to grant him possession but here he merely seeks to evade him if a man engages a laborer to work with him on straw etc now both are necessary for if only the first were stated that when he proposes let them be yours he is not heated it might be said that that is because he the garden owner has no wage claim upon him here however that he the laborer has a wage claim I might argue that he the employer is listened to because it is proverbial from your debtor except even brand in payment whilst if this clause alone were taught it might be that only in this case once he the worker accepts the proposal is he the employer not heated because he has a Wage claim upon him, but in the former case where he has no wage claim upon him, I might think that he is heated, hence both are necessary. He is not heated, but has it not been taught he is heated? Said Arnaman, there is no difficulty here in the mission of the references to his own work there in the very to his neighbor's rabbi said to Arnaman when he is employed on his own, what is the reason that he is not heated? Because he the laborer can say to him, You are responsible for my wages, but when employed by his neighbor, he can also say to him, You are responsible for my hire, for it has been taught if one engaged an artisan to labor on his work, but directed him to his neighbors, he must pay him in full and receive from the owner of the work actually done the value of the labor whereby he benefited, but said Arnaman, there is no difficulty here, it refers to his own there to that of Hefker Robber raised an objection against Arnaman that which is found by a laborer. Whilst working for another belongs to himself when is that if the employer had instructed him weed or dig for me today but if he said to him work for me today without specifying the nature of the work his findings belong to the employer but said Arnaman there is no difficulty here in the mission of the references to lifting up there to washing rabbis said whether washing affects possession in the case of Hefker is disputed by Tanaim for we learned those who keep guard over the after growth of the sabbatical year are paid out of temple funds our Jose said he who wishes can donate his work and be an unpaid washer said they the sages to him you say so but then they are not provided by the public now surely the dispute is on this question the first Tana holds that washing Hefker affects possession hence if he is paid it is well but not otherwise whilst our Jose maintains that washing does not affect possession of Hefker hence only when the community go and fetch it is possession affected and what is meant by you say etc they said thus to him from your statement and on the basis of our ruling it transpires that the omer and the two loaves are not provided by the public said rabbi that is not so all agree that washing affects possession of hecker but they differ here as to whether we fear that he will not deliver it wholeheartedly thus the rabbis hold that he must be paid for otherwise there is a fear lest he does not deliver it wholeheartedly whilst our jose holds that this fear is not entertained and what is meant by you say they say thus to him from your statement and on the basis of our ruling that we fear that it will not be surrendered wholeheartedly the omer and the two loaves are not provided by the public others say rabbi said all agree that washing does not affect possession in the case of hecker but they dispute here whether we entertain a fear of violent men the first tana holds that the rabbis enacted that he shall be Pay for Zuzu so that violent men may hear thereof and hold aloof whilst our Jose holds that they did not enact thus Talmud, Mas Babamitia B and what is meant by you say they say thus to him from your statement and on the basis of our opinion it follows that they are not provided by the public and when Rabin came he likewise said in our Yohanan's name they differ as to whether we fear the action of men of violence mission if a man takes out manure into a public thoroughfare it must be applied to the soil immediately after being taken out mortar must not be steeped in the street nor may bricks be formed their clay may be needed in the street but bricks may not be molded when one is building in a public road the bricks must be laid immediately they are brought if he causes damage he must make it good Rabin Simeon B. Gamaliel said one may prepare his materials even thirty days beforehand Gamara shall we say that our mission does not agree with our Judah for it has been Taught Arjuna said when it is the time for manure to be taken out a man may put his manure out into the street and leave it heaped up for full thirty days that it should be trodden down by the foot of man and beast for on this condition did Joshua allot the land to Israel it may even agree with Arjuna for he admits that if he thereby causes damage he must make it good but have we not learned Arjuna said in the case of a Hanukkah lamp he is not liable because this was done under authority. Surely that means under authority of the court no it means the authority of the precept but it has been taught all those whom the rabbis permitted to commit a nuisance on the public thoroughfare if they cause damage they are bound to pay whilst Arjuna exempts them hence it is clear that our mission does not agree with Arjuna they said Arjuna Rabbin Simeon B. Gamaliel and Arsimian all maintain that wherever the sages gave permission to do a certain thing and damage was thereby caused there. Is no liability our Judah as stated Rabbin Simeon B. Gamaliel for we learned one may prepare his materials even thirty days beforehand our Simeon for we learned if he placed it a stove in an upper story there must be a flooring of three handbreadths deep under it but for a small stove one handbreadth nevertheless if he causes damage he must make it good our Simeon said all these measurements were stated only so that if he causes damage he is free from liability our rabbis taught once the quorum has delivered the stones for building to the chiseler for polishing and smoothing the latter is responsible for any damage caused by them the chiseler having delivered them to the hollier the latter is responsible the hollier having delivered them to the porter the latter is responsible the porter having delivered them to the bricklayer the latter is responsible the bricklayer having handed them over to the foreman the foreman is liable but if after he had exactly laid the stone upon the row it caused damage all are responsible but has it not been taught only the last is responsible whilst all the others are exempt there is no difficulty the latter refers to time work the former to contracting mission if two gardens are situated one above the other and vegetables grow between them our mayor said they belong to the upper garden our Judah maintained to the lower garden said our mayor should the owner of the upper garden wish to remove his garden i.e. take away the earth
Armenia rules so, but in the former case he agrees with Arjuna, hence both are necessary. Our Simeon said, as far as the owner of the upper garden can stretch out his hand, etc. The disciples of Arjuna said, providing however that he does not strain himself or aim, or according to others, are Jeremiah propounded what if he can reach its leaves but not the roots, or he can reach the roots but not the leaves, the problem remains unsolved. Ephraim the scribe, a disciple of Reshlakish, said on the authority of the latter, the Halacha agrees with Arsimian. When this was told to King Shippur, he observed, let a palanquin be put up for Arsimian.